This is Audible. Stone and a Hard Place. Written by R. L. King. Narrated by Kevin R. Zarnke. Copyright 2013 to 2015, R. L. King. Prologue. Adelaide Bonham was convinced that her house hated her. She clutched her heavy comforter tighter around her bony shoulders, but it didn't help, mainly because it hadn't been the sudden wave of cold rolling through her bedroom that caused the shaking in her wrinkled hands. Not entirely, anyway. The first time she'd heard the voices, a couple of weeks ago, she thought it was the workmen. The house and its grounds were so vast that there were always workers around, doing some task or another, repairing, cleaning, landscaping. She thought it was odd that they were still there so late in the day. But there had been enough exceptions over the years that she didn't worry about it. She mentioned the voices to Iona in passing, then promptly forgot about them. Despite her love for thrillers and cozy murder mysteries, Adelaide Bonham wasn't a woman prone to flights of fancy or unreasonable fears. The second time she heard the voices, about a week later, she didn't tell anyone. She had a good reason. At eighty-nine years old, she was well aware that anything out of the ordinary she claimed she saw or heard would be instantly attributed to that dismissive diagnosis of senior citizens everywhere. Her mind's starting to go, poor dear. Adelaide was certain her mind was not starting to go. Sure, she might have her occasional bout of forgetfulness, but everybody had those. Even Iona, who was young enough to be her own daughter, occasionally forgot where she'd left her reading glasses, or the day's newspaper. The modern world simply moved at a faster pace than it had in Adelaide's youth, and it was inevitable that things sometimes slipped through the cracks. Nonetheless, the night she heard the murmuring while seated in her favorite chair in the upstairs library, she'd simply buzzed Iona and told her she was tired and wanted to go to bed. She watched the nurse's face carefully when she came in, but saw no sign that Iona had heard anything. The voices kept whispering and murmuring, however, a far-off conversation too indistinct to follow, as Iona pushed her out of the room in her wheelchair. Adelaide didn't look back. Tonight she'd gone to bed early, but not to sleep. One of her most cherished pleasures these days was curling up in her big bed under her heavy covers, turning on the cheery lamp on her nightstand, and cracking open her latest mystery novel. Iona made sure to keep her well supplied, and though she'd had to switch over to the large print versions in the last few years, she'd never lost the almost childlike feeling of anticipation whenever she opened a new one. Diving into another beloved world of murder, mayhem, and the amateur sleuths caught in the middle allowed her to forget, if only for a little while, that it had been a very long time since she was young. Sometimes, as she was dropping off to sleep, she fantasized about what it might be like to have a mystery of her own to solve. She didn't tell Iona about this, either. Some fantasies were better kept to yourself. Tonight was one of the best kind for mystery reading, cold and cloudy, with rain pelting a comforting cadence down on the roof. Adelaide loved the rain, at least when she was inside the house. There were few things that made her feel safer and more secure than being warm and dry and bundled up in the midst of a rainstorm, the wilder, the better. She was deep into the latest exploits of James Quillerin and his delightful mystery-solving cats when it hit her. The sudden, inexplicable feeling of being an unwelcome intruder in her own home. There were no words to the feeling, only impressions. But the impressions were clear enough. Hatred. Loathing. Adelaide sat up, her book slipping from her hands. Is someone there? Her voice came out as a quavering whisper. Get out. You are not wanted here. Go while you still can. Then the wave of cold. Like someone had opened a freezer and allowed a slow current of frigid air to creep across the floor. Adelaide's heart pounded. She clutched her comforter and glanced toward the window. She was sure the heavy drapes were closed, and Iona never opened the windows. The murmuring voices began again. Adelaide remained there, her comforter pulled up under her chin, her eyes wide, 
her breath coming in short, sharp gasps. She half expected to see the little puffs of air as they escaped her lips, like you saw when you were outside in the morning chill. But she didn't. What was happening? Get out! Who's there? she whispered. Her terrified gaze darted around the room, but despite the fact that her vision wasn't what it once was, she didn't think anything was moving. She didn't want to do it. She resisted it as long as she could. But as she sat there in her little pool of light, straining to make out what the ghostly voices were saying, her courage finally broke. She scooted over to the edge of the bed and scrabbled at the nightstand for the call button that would summon Iona. As she waited for the nurse to arrive, Adelaide wasn't sure which thought frightened her more. That she was imagining the voices and the cold waves and the feelings of dread? Or that she wasn't? Chapter One Alistair Stone suspected the universe was conspiring against his desire to keep the two sides of his life separate. That suspicion was confirmed the moment he picked up the phone. Who the hell is calling at three bloody thirty in the morning? And heard Walter Yarborough's voice on the other end. Alistair, I'm terribly sorry to bother you, but I'm in a bit of a jam. I need a favor. Stone glanced at the other side of the bed. Megan Whitney, assistant professor of English literature and magically oblivious girlfriend, was stirring from deep slumber. He willed her not to wake up. It would make a lot of things easier. <sighs> easier. That was amusing. Alistair? She rolled over, voice fuzzy. Who's that? Nobody. Then, to Yarborough, just hold on a minute. Can't talk here. Can't talk to who? Megan muttered. Nobody. Go back to sleep. He patted her shoulder, already swinging around to a sitting position. He stuck the phone between his ear and his shoulder and tried to shrug into his robe without dropping it. He could have taken the call here, but that would be a bad idea. Whatever Walter wanted to talk about, the odds were high it would be something Stone wouldn't want to explain to Megan in the morning. Where are you going? she asked. She was still mostly asleep. Her arm flopped across his half of the bed, as if expecting to find him there. Lou, he said, hurrying out. Back soon. Just go back to sleep. He closed the door behind him and headed down the hall to his study. He closed that door, too. All right, Walter, he said, not caring that he was failing utterly to keep the annoyed growl out of his voice. At this time of night, coherent was about the best Walter could expect. Pleasant was pushing it, and cheerful was right out. What isn't that couldn't wait until a reasonable hour? To his credit, Yarborough got to it right away. Oh, bugger, I forgot about the time difference, didn't I? Well, I'm up now, Stone said, his tone dark. All right, then. I'm sorry to ask Alistair, but I don't know anyone else in the area who can do it. There's a boy. His name is Ethan Penrose. Lives with his mother in San Jose. He just turned eighteen, and I was planning on taking him on as an apprentice. He was due to come over here next month. Stone's eyes narrowed. And? And? Well, plans have changed. His mother's taken ill. Some kind of heart issue. It came on suddenly, and it's quite serious. Understandably, he doesn't want to leave her and come over right now. Even taking the portal across, it'd still be a long trip up here to Leeds from London. Even half awake, Stone was already seeing where this was going. Walter... I know, I know. You've always said you didn't want an apprentice yet, but you're a fantastic teacher. We both know that. He's a good lad. You'd like him. And it wouldn't be permanent. Just for a year or so. I'm sad to say it sounds like his mother isn't doing well at all. Why doesn't he just wait until she's better, then? Shouldn't he be taking care of her, not off somewhere learning magic? She's got a nurse staying there who takes care of her, but... The unfortunate truth is that she might not get better. He's helping out where he can, but he's an eighteen-year-old boy. He loves his mother, but he's got nothing else in his life. He hasn't even applied to university, because he thought he'd be too busy with his apprenticeship. His mother only recently told him about the fact that he's got the talent at all. So everything's been a bit of a shock to him these past couple of months. Where's the father in this equation? Stone leaned back in his desk chair and swiped his hand through his dark, unruly hair. 
If the kid's a mage, then the father... His father died when Ethan was very young. We were friends for a long time. I met him back when I was living in New York. That's why I was originally supposed to take the boy on. His mother and I have pretty much assumed that's the way it would go for years. Stone paused, his gaze traversing the bookshelves, wooden desk, ratty leather armchair, and other fixtures of his study. The shelves were lined with row after row of books, from old, moth-eaten tomes with bindings that barely held together, to modern paperbacks, interspersed with skulls, bits of feathers, stone statuettes, and other eclectic objects he'd picked up over the years in his travels. Walter, he began after a long pause, I... Will you at least give it a try, Alistair? It was odd hearing a pleading note in Walter's usually staid and confident voice. That's all I ask. Just meet with him. Talk to him. See if you get on. If there are any expenses involved, I'll take care of them. And since he's local, he wouldn't have to live with you or anything. A pause, and then, I know how much you enjoy teaching. Wouldn't it be a nice change of pace to teach real magic for a while, in addition to all that occult studies rubbish you feed those kids at Stanford? Stone closed his eyes and sighed. The sad thing was, Walter was right. Taking on an apprentice was something almost every mage did eventually. It was the sort of pay-it-forward system that kept the magical society running smoothly. You learned the art from your master, and then later on you turned around and taught it to the next generation of students. At thirty-one, he was already overdue to take his turn, especially given how young he himself had been when he'd begun his own apprenticeship. He'd been putting it off for all these years, not so much because of the teaching part. He loved teaching, and he was damn good at it. But mainly because he didn't want his life disrupted by the responsibility the whole business would require. But... His mind was already betraying him spinning off lesson plans in the background and prioritizing magical techniques according to importance and level of difficulty. "'Fine, Walter,' he said at last, resigned. "'I'll meet him, but that's all I'm promising. If he ends up being an entitled little toe-rag, all bets are off.' "'Wouldn't have expected anything else,' Yarborough said, sounding satisfied. He gave Stone the boy's address and telephone number. "'Just give him a call when you're ready to get started.' I'll call him and tell him to expect you, and warn him about you, <laughs> he added with a chuckle. And thank you, Alistair. It'll mean a lot to him and to me. Next time thank me by not calling me in the middle of the bloody night, Stone grumbled. He hoped Megan would write the whole thing off as a dream, but as she was getting dressed the next morning, she asked, Who called last night? Is everything all right? Fine he assured her. Just a um, distant relative from back home. Always did have a hell of a time remembering there's an eight-hour time difference. She regarded him as she buttoned her jacket. It wasn't hard to tell she didn't entirely believe him, but then again, he hadn't fallen for her because she was stupid. That's it? He shrugged. Actually, it's a bit more than that. If he was going to continue seeing Megan, and he had no intention of stopping any time soon, since she possessed the rare quality of being satisfied with the level of commitment at which they were currently operating and showing no signs of wanting to increase it, he'd have to come up with some sort of cover story to explain Ethan. He's asked me to look out for a young cousin of mine over there. Sort of a mentor thing. His mum is ill and he's having some trouble coping. So you might see him around here fairly often. I never pegged you for the big brother type, she said with a wicked smile. Yes, well, it would seem I'm overdue then, aren't I? Chapter 2 Stone had a light class load that day, so he used one of his breaks to call the number Walter had given him. He spoke with Ethan's mother, and even over the phone line he could hear the weariness weighing down her voice. She was pleased to hear from him, though, and invited him over for pizza that evening to meet Ethan. If you don't mind, Pizza, she said. I'm afraid I'm not doing much cooking these days. He showed up promptly at six o'clock. It was shaping up to be a drizzly, overcast evening, and it took him a while to find the right apartment among the maze of buildings that made up most of the block where Ethan and his mother lived. He glanced around as he walked, pulling up the collar of his black wool overcoat and wishing he hadn't left his umbrella in the car. Almost unconsciously, 
he slowed his normal, brisk walk to a more sedate pace. Do I really want to do this? He couldn't back out of at least meeting the kid, not after he promised Walter he would, but after... he wasn't so sure. Taking on an apprentice wasn't the sort of thing one did without a lot of thought. Even if it were only a year, and Stone had no illusions about the fact that Walter was expecting that if he and the boy hit it off, the apprenticeship would last much longer. It still meant giving up a lot of the freedom and mobility he'd become accustomed to. It was the same reason he hadn't asked Megan to move in. Fond as he was of her, he was sure they probably wouldn't be coming up on six months of mutually pleasurable association if he had. There were certain things Alistair Stone required for proper functioning, and one of them was his own space. Megan was the same way, which is why they'd made it this far. Ah, oh, well, at least he wouldn't have to give the kid room and board. That was something. The Penrose's door was on the second floor, up a steep stairway. His knock was answered almost instantly. For a moment, the two of them just stood there, taking each other's measure. Then the slim, blonde boy spoke. You must be Dr. Stone. Well, I'm fresh out of pizza, so I must be, Stone agreed. He flashed his best engaging grin, the one that put his first-year occult study students at ease when he started discussing ghoulies and ghosties and things that ripped out your innards and wrapped them around your neck in the night. The boy just nodded, then stepped aside and waved Stone inside. I hope he didn't have too much trouble finding the place. It's kind of a rabbit warren around here. I'm Ethan, by the way, but I guess you already knew that. He indicated the space down the hall with a vague nod. Come on in. The pizza's here already, and Mom's in the living room. Stone trailed behind him, frowning. He was usually pretty good at reading people, but Ethan Penrose wasn't sending out the kinds of signals he'd expected to see from a kid who was excited about finally starting on the path to becoming a mage. Hi there. Another voice said as they entered the small living room. Ethan, where are your manners? Take Dr. Stone's coat. Ethan's mother reclined on a large, overstuffed sofa, propped up on two big pillows and covered with a blue blanket. She waved him toward the chair across from the couch. The coffee table in the middle contained a large pizza box and a stack of plates. Have a seat. I'll put the boy to work and then you two can pig out and chat. Stone handed his overcoat to Ethan and settled into the offered seat. He didn't need to study Mrs. Penrose to see that her health wasn't at all good. She was pale under what had once been a good tan, her short blonde hair hung limp around her face, and he could see she'd lost a lot of weight in a short time. Still, her eyes crinkled with good humor. She watched Ethan fondly as he hung up Stone's coat, then brought out glasses and ice from the kitchen, and set his mother up with a slice and some soda. "'Dig in,' she said, when everyone was seated. And don't mind me, I know what's going on, but this is your show tonight. Ethan had perched on the other end of his mother's couch, watching Stone with wary eagerness. When it became clear he wasn't going to speak first, Stone broke the silence. So, why don't you start by telling me what you know, and what sort of arrangement you had with Walter? Ethan shrugged. He's an old friend of my dad's. I always knew my dad had some sort of weird abilities. I don't remember him very well. I was only five when he died, but I do remember him doing things like making my toys fly around the room, turning himself invisible, that kind of thing. He mostly did it to make me laugh. I see, Stone said, nodding. And how long have you known that you also have these so-called weird abilities, or at least the potential to learn them? A year or so? I kind of hoped it might be true before that, but I didn't know for sure until then. Mom said I couldn't start studying until I finished high school. She said they didn't let you start too young. That's true, Stone admitted. There's no hard and fast rule as far as age goes, but most of us won't take on apprentices younger than about seventeen or so. The magical community generally frowns on having children running around using powers before they're mature enough to control them. It's not only dangerous to the children and whoever comes into contact with them, but it puts the entire community in danger of discovery. Ethan nodded. Yeah, Mom was saying that there aren't that many mages around. I guess it could be kind of a pain to try to explain to a cop why you just turned somebody into a frog, huh? For the first time, he smiled. It lit up his whole face. 
Stone reassessed his initial opinion about how excited the boy was about his future. Well, <laughs> he said, chuckling, most of us don't turn people into frogs. Transmutation of living matter is a bit beyond the standard skill set. But you've got the general idea. It's really more that we don't want to end up getting dissected by overeager government agencies who want to find out what makes us tick. Ethan rubbed at his chin. So, what can mages do, then? I thought the frog thing was sort of a classic. Stone sighed in mock annoyance. One bloody idiot sees an illusion spell and gets the wrong idea hundreds of years ago, and we're inextricably linked with amphibians for the rest of recorded time. He paused to take a bite of his pizza slice. But at any rate, we're not there yet. I want to know about your arrangement with Walter. What has he told you about his plans for you? Not that much, really. In a month, I was supposed to go to England and stay with him, but that fell through when Mom got sick. I didn't want to leave her alone for that long, you know? Of course, quite understandable. He said there's some kind of teleportation portal thingy that mages use to travel, and there's one near here and one in England, but it's still three or four hours away from Mr. Yarbrough's place. That's just too far to be away right now. He glanced at his mother, and Stone didn't miss the concern in his tone. And you feel guilty about the fact that you still want to learn magic, don't you? Stone asked gently. Your loyalty to your mother is stronger, naturally, but that doesn't mean you were disappointed at losing the opportunity. Ethan's head came up quickly, his expression startled, but he nodded and became suddenly interested in his plate again. Yeah, he said. But I won't leave her. He added louder. And you won't have to, Stone said. If I agree to take you on, then you can study with me at my place in Palo Alto and have plenty of time to be home and help your mum. What do I have to do, then? The wariness was back in his eyes. What kind of requirements do you have before you'll accept me? Hell, I don't know. I'm making this up as I go along. I've only had a few days to get used to it myself. Stone smiled, but then he got more serious. Tell me, Ethan, why do you want to learn magic? Huh? He shrugged. Just tell me what you want to get out of it. Why do you want to be a mage? It's not all beer and naked nymphs, you know. Well, actually, it's not any beer and naked nymphs. Mostly it's a lot of work. Hard work. It'll take weeks before you can cast your first feeble little spell, and months before you even begin to get your mind around the basics. The whole apprenticeship process takes several years, and at the end of that, you're essentially where you are now in life, a high school student. Which, no offense intended, means you don't really know much of anything useful yet. So, why do you want to do this? Ethan seemed to think about that for a long time before he answered. Stone could see the mental wheels turning behind his gray eyes as he struggled to come up with the right answer, or the answer Stone wanted to hear. At last, he said, Because it's what I was meant to do. My dad was a mage. Mom told me that magic usually goes by sex, fathers to sons and mothers to daughters, and it doesn't always do it either. So I feel like I've been given this awesome opportunity to do something that hardly anybody else can do, and I want to. He cast a nervous glance at Stone to see how his response was being received. Stone considered it, pausing for another bite of pizza as he leaned back in his chair. Not bad, he said at last. Most guys your age think it'd be brilliant at helping them pick up women, and they're not too good about hiding it. Well, that wouldn't hurt, Ethan admitted, chancing a grin. I mean, I'm not going to turn it down or anything if it happened. You won't have time for women, Stone said. If you apprentice with me... You'll be so busy you'll think taking a double load at university will be a breeze by comparison. I'll tailor your training to let you do most of your study at home so you can be near your mum. But that just means you'll have to have more discipline because you won't have me looming over you with a whip all the time. A whip? Ethan's eyebrows came up. Stone shrugged. A metaphorical whip. But if you slack off, there'll be times when you'll wish it was a real one. He leaned forward, his eyes narrowing. Here's the bottom line, Ethan. You'll work, and work hard. If you want to be my apprentice, you have to agree to do what I tell you without question or complaint. Anything having to do with your magical education will be mine to control. 
You won't seek out supplemental training elsewhere if you think you're not moving fast enough. You'll read the books I give you to read, do the exercises I set for you, and you'll put everything you have into the effort. I'm not a tyrant. I know your mum is going to be on your mind, and I'll make allowances for that. But if you want to learn from me, you'll have to prove to me that you're worth my time. Do I make myself clear? He was pleased to see an, oh shit, what am I getting myself into, look pass across Ethan's features. Sure, he laid it on a bit thick, but he also meant every word of it. He still wasn't entirely sure he wanted to do this, but Ethan seemed earnest enough, if a little immature and preoccupied. Nothing like most of the kids who'd grown up knowing what they had waiting for them when they were old enough, impatient to get started and wanting to learn everything at once. This one might actually have potential, and more importantly, this one might not annoy him to the point where he'd end up calling the whole damn thing off after a month. He didn't change his expression. He just kept his gaze fixed on Ethan's face, waiting. Sounds like it'll be hard work, but worth it. If you really can do what you say you can, the boy said at last, a hint of a challenge in his voice. So far, all I have is your word that you can do magic. How about you show me some? Ethan! Mrs. Penrose sounded shocked. That's not... Stone held up a hand. In truth, he'd been waiting for this. He'd have been disappointed if the kid hadn't insisted that he back up his claims. You didn't get far in magic by accepting things without question. So, you want to see some magic, then? Yeah, let's see it. Stone rose, trying not to grin. Tell you what, I'll make you a wager. He put a fresh slice of pizza on a plate and picked it up. See this? You've got two minutes to try to take it from me. If you can't, you'll agree to follow my instructions about your apprenticeship without question or argument. Ethan narrowed his eyes, looking intrigued. And what if I can? I'll let you set up your own magical curriculum, Stone said with a sly smile. I'll teach you anything I know, in whatever order you like, without question. Fair enough? He glanced at Mrs. Penrose. Her eyes glittered with amusement. The boy appeared to consider for a moment. Deal, he said, and lunged across the table toward Stone. He was fast. Stone was faster. He took a step back, a faintly glowing bubble appearing around him. Ethan hit it and slid off, crashing to the floor. The boy scrambled up, puffing as he tried to conceal his surprise. Nice trick, he said, eyeing Stone. Got more? The shield disappeared. Of course I've got more. He made a mocking, come-on gesture with his free hand. Have another go. I won't even use the shield again. Need to keep this interesting, after all. Ethan didn't attack right away this time. He stood back, still panting a little, watching Stone. Then he fainted to one side and dived low, going for the mage's legs. The lights went out, followed by a loud crash as Ethan once again hit the floor empty-handed. What the hell? You didn't think I'd make it easy, did you? Stone raised a hand and summoned a light spell around it, illuminating the room more thoroughly than the single pole lamp had. You're running out of time, Ethan. Best to stop thinking outside the box. He gestured again, switching the lamp back on and dropping the light spell. He was showing off, and he knew it. It wasn't often that he got the chance nowadays. He held out the plate, waggling it a little. Come on, it's right here. Take it. Think about all the things I could teach you, if you can just... Ethan moved before he finished speaking. Snatching a metal horse figurine from the coffee table, he flung it at Stone's head, then followed it with a roar and another lunge at his midsection. Stone didn't flinch. He waved a hand in an almost languid gesture, stopping the figurine in midair a foot from his face. He pointed his other hand at Ethan. The boy yelped and backpedaled as an invisible force shoved him backward and down onto the couch next to his mother. The horse figurine landed neatly and gently in his lap. Enough? Stone asked. The pizza slice on its plate floated with mocking calm next to him. Ethan struggled to rise, but the unseen force held him in place. His face reddened. Yeah, he said through gritted teeth. Enough. Stone grinned, dropping the spell holding the boy down. Right then. Unable to resist a grand finale, and it was so rare he got to let loose like this. It was considered tacky in magical circles. He switched off the pole lamp again, summoned an invisibility spell, and wreathed his body in crackling blue eldritch lightning. When he turned the light back on, he was sitting in the chair he'd vacated, 
calmly taking a bite from his slice of pizza. Mm. So, he said after swallowing, I trust my qualifications are acceptable. If Ethan's eyes had gotten any bigger, they might have fallen right out of his head. He nodded. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Mrs. Penrose laughed. You did ask him to show you what he could do. Ethan didn't answer for a long time. He looked first at Stone, then at his mother. So, what do you think? he asked her. His tone suggested he wasn't asking for her permission, but for her counsel, making her part of the decision. She smiled a wan but proud smile. It's up to you, kiddo. I know you've got it in you, but it sounds like you're going to have to work your butt off to get it. Are you ready for that? If you need a bit of time to think about it, you can give me a call tomorrow, Stone said. It's not the sort of commitment one should make lightly. Sleep on it, if you like. Give me an answer in the morning. Or next week, I'm not in any hurry. But Ethan shook his head. I don't need to think it over, Dr. Stone. This is what I want to do. I accept your conditions. Will you train me? Stone nodded briskly. All right, you've got yourself a teacher. Rising from his chair, he pulled out a business card, scribbled his home address and phone number on it, and passed it to Ethan. I expect you at my place next Monday afternoon, three o'clock. That'll give me some time to prepare a few lessons ahead. Don't be late. Oh, and... He glanced around until he spotted his overcoat hanging on the hall tree near the door. He gestured, and a small red book sailed from an inner pocket and landed next to Ethan. Read this by then. It'll give you a little grounding, so I won't have to trot out the whole tiresome intro lecture. For only the second time that night, Ethan's thin face lit with a smile. Thanks, Dr. Stone. I won't let you down. See that you don't. But Stone returned the smile. Maybe this would work out after all. To his surprise, Mrs. Penrose got up and accompanied Stone to the door, motioning for Ethan to stay put. She gave Stone a faint, tired smile. I'm just so glad you've agreed to take him on, Dr. Stone. He's a good kid, but he just needs a little guidance. Things haven't been that great for him. Losing his father so young, and now... This... She spread her hands, indicating herself. Stone nodded. I'm sure we'll do fine. Her smile grew wistful. I miss Matthew terribly, even after all these years. He used to show me the most amazing things. I wish you could have met him. I think you'd have liked him. He loved magic so much. I'm sure he was looking forward to seeing if Ethan would have it too, so he could teach him. She shivered and looked away. I... I hope you won't take this the wrong way, but the magic isn't the only reason I'm glad you've agreed to this. Oh? She glanced toward the living room, where Ethan still sat. Ever since Matthew died, it's just been Ethan and me. We do all right, but I... I think it will be good for him to have a man in his life. Sort of... a father figure. Stone didn't answer right away. He didn't want to tell her that he was hardly father figure material. This didn't seem the right time. I'll do my best, Mrs. Penrose. I wasn't kidding about the amount of work I'll be expecting from him, though. He won't have time to get into trouble. She chuckled. That's what I was hoping for. It's been the two of us for too long. He needs someone else around to give him something else to care about, especially since there's a good chance I might... She trailed off, but her meaning was obvious. Stone saw no reply that wasn't either dismissive or patronizing, so instead he said, I'll make a mage of him, Mrs. Penrose, if he's willing to work. You have my word on that. Good, she swallowed. I know you will, Dr. Stone. I know you'll do well by him. Walter speaks very highly of you. He says you're probably the best teacher Ethan could have. I know he's in good hands. After Stone left, Ethan waited for his mother to return to the living room. He still held the book Stone had given him, and idly began flipping through it. So? his mother asked, resuming her seat on the couch and gathering her blanket around her. What do you think? He didn't answer right away. For several moments he continued leafing through the book. It was old, bound in leather, with heavy, decal-edged pages and old-fashioned print. Along with the text, there were many diagrams depicting circles with odd sigils and symbols around them 
old-style drawings of naked humans engaging in various magical acts. This gave him a moment of panic. Nobody does magic in the nude, do they? And elaborate mystical formulas that looked like the world's weirdest math problems. He looked up at his mother. Do you think I'll be able to do this? To do... the kind of stuff he did? She smiled. Your father did? And Dr. Stone seems to think you can. What did you think of him? Dr. Stone? He seemed very... focused. And a lot younger than I thought he'd be, she added after a moment's consideration. Yeah. Ethan had spoken with Walter Yarborough on the phone a couple of days ago to get some idea of what to expect. He recalled Yarborough's words about Stone. He's bloody clever, eccentric as hell, and the best mage of his generation that I know. But even with that, the mage had been nothing like Ethan had expected. He'd only met Yarborough himself once a few years ago. The older man was every bit your typical stodgy British stereotype. Salt and pepper hair, impressive paunch, big mustache, gray tweed suit that had gone out of style long before Ethan was born, clothes and fingers festooned with strange pins, rings, and amulets. Maybe not exactly mage-looking, but definitely in the ballpark, and definitely fatherly, if not even grandfatherly, in his demeanor. Stone, on the other hand, was, for lack of a better word, cool. How many mages wore a long black overcoat, jeans, and a queen t-shirt? Yeah, okay, it was a geeky kind of cool, but Ethan understood that all too well, since it was the only kind he himself could reasonably aspire to. He gave a short laugh. Mr. Yarborough said he'd be hard to deal with. Said he's moody and, how did he put it, doesn't suffer fools gladly. But if I can keep up with him, he'll make me into a good mage. And that's what you want, isn't it? Mom asked. She pulled up her blanket a little more, even though the room wasn't at all chilly. I'll probably piss him off. She gave him a fond smile. You might, but I think your natural charm will win him over. Ethan ducked his head, looking away. She was his mother, so she had to say things like that, but he didn't think he possessed very much in the way of natural charm. He didn't think anybody else he knew thought so either. Well, I'll work hard anyway. I want this, Mom. I really do. He closed the book, got up, and bent to kiss his mother goodnight. I'll see you tomorrow. I'm going to be a mage. The thought settled in his brain as he headed down the hall toward his bedroom. In the back of his mind, he was already doing the things Stone had shown him. Before he knew it, he'd be casting spells, slinging magical energy, and never having to worry about anyone disrespecting him again. It was going to be great. He could get along with anybody for that kind of payoff. Chapter 3 Stone spent his next few evenings and the breaks in between his occult studies courses preparing lessons for Ethan. He called Yarborough, making sure to conveniently forget about the time zone difference, to let him know he'd agreed to take the boy on, and Yarborough had been so grateful he hadn't even complained about being roused from a sound sleep. Sunday night he took Megan out to Emilio's, a little hole-in-the-wall Italian restaurant in Los Gatos they'd discovered a couple of months ago. What's the occasion? she asked while they dawdled over after-dinner drinks. Been neglecting you, haven't I? She grinned. You do that all the time. You must be feeling guilty about something else. I can always tell. Wait, don't tell me. It's your little brother, isn't it? You've bonded, and you're planning to adopt him. You found me out. He finished his drink and set the glass down next to hers. You're half right, actually. It is about Ethan. I'm going to be working with him for a while, doing some tutoring to help him catch up with schoolwork he's missed, mostly in the afternoons, so you shouldn't see much of him, but I figured I should warn you in case you drop by and find a strange young man hanging around my townhouse. She nodded. Just as long as you haven't found yourself, what do you Brits call it, a bit on the side? I don't share, not even if he's smoking hot and built like Brad Pitt. He chuckled. I'm all yours, dear. You're already more than I can handle. Megan rolled her eyes. So what's he like, this kid? Sounds like he's had some trouble. He's a bit adrift, I think. His mum fell ill rather suddenly, so not only is he dealing with all of that, but his plans got buggered up, and he's had to scramble to figure out what he wants to do with himself. I take it his dad's out of the picture? Died when he was a child. 
poor kid. Well, I hope you can do something for him. Let me know if there's any way I can help out with anything. He grinned wickedly. Well, I think I can handle the stress. Think you can handle mine? How about we go back to your place and find out? Ethan was waiting on the doorstep of Stone's townhouse when he pulled his black jaguar up into the garage Monday morning. How long have you been here? Stone asked as he came around to let him in. Ethan shrugged. Not too long. He wore jeans and a cyberpop t-shirt, and carried a backpack slung over one shoulder. I wasn't sure how hard it would be to find the place. Mom's letting me use the car since she doesn't drive anymore. Good, good. Stone waved him in. Inside was a short hallway with a staircase on the left and rooms opening out on three sides. Today we'll get started in my study upstairs, since we won't be doing any of the practical stuff that might get messy yet. Did you read the book I gave you? Yeah. And? Stone asked, glancing back over his shoulder as he mounted the stairs. Kind of dry, but interesting, I guess. I didn't know mages had been around for so long. Stone chuckled. Dry is a good way to put it. Bloody boring is even better. But I'll be honest with you. The whole history end of the magic thing was never one of my favorite topics. I'm much more interested in the here and now. Magical artifacts, rituals, spellcasting, using magic. He pushed the door open. Have a seat there on the couch. Ethan did as he was told, glancing with interest at the large, old-fashioned, wheeled blackboard wedged between an ancient leather chair and one of the walls of books. Nothing was currently written on it. So, Stone said, leaning against the edge of his desk. Before we get into anything too deeply, a few questions. How's your mum, by the way? Not so good, Ethan sighed. She almost had to go to the hospital this weekend, but Mrs. Hooper... That's her nurse, was able to get her settled down. He looked up at Stone, an odd light in his eyes. Dr. Stone, can magic heal people? Ethan, pause, then softly, no, not the way you think. There are mages who can heal injuries if they catch them soon enough, but we can't do anything about disease. So there's no, like, Alchemy? Magic potions? It was clear he'd had this on his mind for some time. His tone clutched at anything he could grab. Stone shook his head. No, not really. Not the way you're thinking, anyway. There's some of us who dabble in that sort of thing, but I can't think of anyone off the top of my head who has anything approaching expertise nowadays. And even then, most magical concoctions are more for dealing with things like increased concentration in minor injuries. It wouldn't work on something as serious as whatever your mum's got. He regarded the slump-shouldered boy for a moment, then added, I'm sorry, Ethan. No, it's okay, I, I just... He looked up, stealing his expression. Let's just get started, okay? All right, let's. I need to set you up with some more books to take home, so... Glancing around the room, he directed one hand at one shelf and the other at another gesturing as if conducting an unseen orchestra. One by one, three books sailed from their places, glided across the room, and settled neatly on the couch next to the wide-eyed Ethan. There you go. The first one's an intro text. I'll give you a bit more of the intro today, but that's more in-depth. The second is theory. It won't make much sense to you now, but just start familiarizing yourself with the concepts and terminology. And that third one there, the small one, is sort of an exercise book. Formulae and such. Lots of math. That one's a stretch. If you're feeling ambitious, read the theory book and the formulae book and the exercises and see what you can come up with. I don't expect much from you yet, but it'll be nice to see what you can do with it. Ethan seemed to have only heard about a third of what Stone had said. I still can't quite believe I'm gonna learn to do that, he said in a hushed tone, waving his hand around to indicate the path the books had taken. Stone grinned. That and a lot more, if you listen to me and keep up with your studies. But I'll reiterate, we aren't going too fast in the beginning. I want you to have a good grounding in theory before you start doing the more interesting bits. It's sort of like learning to play sport. You have to build up your muscles before you get started, or you'll hurt yourself and set back your progress. You might learn faster from another teacher. A lot of them are rather slapdash nowadays, sad to say. But you won't learn more thoroughly, so be patient. This is a journey, not a destination. 
Got it? Yeah. He glanced up. I don't have to call you sir or anything, do I? You do, and I will turn you into a frog, Stone said. Now then, sit back, stop thinking about levitating young lady's skirts up, and start listening. I wasn't... You will. Perching back on the edge of his desk, he asked, So, do you know what the difference is between black magic and white magic? I, uh, white magic is good and black magic is evil, right? Sort of. Though good and evil are pretty simplistic terms when it comes to magic. It's entirely possible to do good things with black magic and evil things with white magic. It is? Ethan was clearly confused. Very much so. This is an important distinction, probably one of the most important you'll learn. Almost unconsciously, he got up and began pacing around the room. The difference between the two is how they're powered. Tell me, if you wanted to zap someone with a lightning bolt, would you use black or white magic? I'm going to get to zap people with lightning bolts? Stay focused, Stone ordered. Answer the question. Uh, black magic, I guess. Wrong answer. It was a trick question. You can zap someone with a lightning bolt using either type. So, I'll be able to do both? You will. But you won't want to. Not for long. Not unless you want to give yourself over to black magic in fairly short order. In which case, tell me now so we can call this whole thing off before we get too far in. Why won't I want to? Because, Stone said, walking over to lean on his desk. White magic is powered with your own energies, and with specifically designed items that you construct to contain and store those energies. At its best, it's more subtle than black magic, more permanent, and much more powerful in most areas. If you want to build a magical portal, or put a permanent enchantment on a place or a person, you'd use white magic. Ethan nodded, taking it in. Should I be taking notes or something? Not yet. I'll drill this bit into your head so much that you won't be able to forget it. This is fundamental stuff. Okay, so what about black magic? Black magic is powered by the energy from others. It's ultimately a very selfish, very visceral form of magic. Its power lies mostly in more transient sorts of spells, like those you would cast in a magical battle. But wouldn't I want to get into a magical battle? Stone raised his eyebrow. So, when was the last time you were in a physical fight? Ethan shrugged. It's been a while, he mumbled. And I didn't start him. Precisely. Ever shot someone with a gun? Stabbed anyone? No! He sounded shocked. Stone nodded. Well, there you go, then. Magic is dangerous, especially the kind designed to injure living things. You know how, when you start to learn martial arts and they tell you all that rubbish about your body becoming a lethal weapon, that you should only use it in self-defense? Well, with magic, it's true. And it's damned important that you realize it as soon as possible. I'm not going to teach you those kinds of spells, not any time soon anyway, certainly not during your first couple of years of your apprenticeship. By then you might well be back with Walter, and it'll be up to him to decide whether he wants to. If you come along well in your studies, I might end up showing you something non-lethal that you can use to defend yourself should the need arise. But the point is, magic isn't about hurting people, not for white mages. So, you're a white mage, then? I'm sort of a pale grey. It's hard to actually practice magic and stay completely white. But that's the other thing you're going to need to know. Black magic is addictive. It's like smoking or drugs or liquor. The more you use it, the more you want to. I'll tell you right up front that black magic feels good to cast. There's a rush to it. But the problem is, you get to where you need more and more of that rush to get the same feeling. And every time you use others to gain power, you... He cast about for the right words. Well, corrupt your soul isn't quite right, but you get the idea. You make it so it's harder and harder to do white magic, and eventually you can't do it at all. He fixed his gaze on Ethan. So I'm telling you right now, don't let yourself be tempted. That's why we're taking this slow. Unless you plan on making a career as a serial killer, everything you should want to do with magic, you'll be able to do with the white variety. Understood? Yeah, except the part about... What did you mean when you said that 
you power white magic with your own energy and black magic with others? How does that work? Just like it sounds. Think of it this way. White magic is like running a race. When you're done, you're tired, but you've accomplished something on your own. Black magic is like having someone carry you on their back and run the race for you. You still get the same result, but instead of you getting tired, the other person does. Ethan's eyes widened. So you mean you literally take power from other people? Like, you drain their energy? He shuddered. That sounds like something out of a horror movie. And it is, essentially, Stone agreed. Some black mages have hangers-on that'll agree to supply them with the power in exchange for, well, whatever. Money, influence, sex, whatever they want. Those mages are at what I call the dark grey end of the spectrum. As long as they don't do any permanent harm to their batteries and the fools are willing, then there's not really much that can be said about it. That's disgusting. Ethan leaned forward on the couch, staring at Stone. People actually let them do that? Doesn't it hurt? It tires them out for a while. How much depends on how powerful the spell is. Sometimes it kills them if the mage loses control. That doesn't happen often with willing participants, but I've heard of cases where it did. And so, white mages do this to themselves? So you get tired when you cast spells? That doesn't seem very useful either. White magic isn't really designed for casting quick, harsh spells. We focus more on long-term things, rituals, permanent enchantments, that sort of thing. But we can do it if we need to. And if we know ahead of time that we might need to, we can build items that will help take up some of the heavy lifting. But if you're caught unawares, yes, you'll have to watch yourself and make every spell count, because you won't be able to cast many before you exhaust yourself. Stone pushed himself off the desk. But look at you. Your eyes are glazing over. Don't hesitate to tell me that I'm boring the socks off of you. I've been told that I love the sound of my own voice, and I can't really put up much of a defense. Ethan chuckled. No, it's fine. It's just a lot to take in is all. Best get used to it. Before we're done, I'll be filling you so full of information that you'll be dreaming in magical formula. Chapter 4 Stone was in his office at Stanford late one afternoon a couple of weeks later when there was a knock on his door. He glanced up, curious. This wasn't during his normal office hours, and the building that housed his office was far enough off the beaten track occult studies wasn't exactly a prestigious subject around these hallowed halls that people didn't drop by without a reason. Come in, he called, pushing aside the stack of student essays he was reading. The figure that shoved open the door wasn't a student. Hey there, you old fraud, he called, erupting into the small space like a tussle-headed force of nature. Long time no see, Stone grinned. Tell me, how are you? Professor Thomas Tommy Langley taught medieval history, which meant he had digs in an only marginally nicer end of the campus than Stone did. He was a little older than Stone, about twice his width, and often joined him on sporadic weekend pub-crawling excursions. Stone hadn't seen him in a few weeks, though and figured he must be busy with his course load. Langley shrugged, dropping down into one of the chairs in front of the desk. Can't complain. You? Wondering what you're doing here, actually, Stone said. It can't be that you want to invite me out drinking, because you'd call for that. It would take something much more important for you to actually drag your carcass up here in person. Can't I just have missed you? His grin got bigger. I mean, come on, Al. You know I've always had a thing for tall, skinny English guys. Stone glared. Damn it, don't call me Al. Sighing, he slumped back in his seat. So, really, what are you doing here? You didn't drag yourself all the way up here just to invite me pub crawling, did you? Langley shook his head. Nope. Believe it or not, I've got a problem that demands your uniquely strange set of skills. And what set of skills would that be? Stone asked with a raised eyebrow. You know, the way you're always going on about all that spooky stuff. Langley wiggled his fingers in ghostly emphasis. That spooky stuff is kind of what I do here, Stone reminded him, wondering where this was going. Exactly, which means you've got expertise. That's important. Why is that important? Stone spaced the words out slowly. Langley spread his hands. Okay, so I've got this aunt. 
She's almost 90, rich as Midas, lives in an ancient, enormous house way up in the Los Gatos Hills with her caretaker lady and seven or eight part-time staff. I visit her a few times a year. She's sweet as they come, but, well, a little dotty, if you know what I mean. If she's almost 90, then she's earned the right to be a little dotty, Stone shrugged. But I don't see... His eyes widened. Tommy, you don't want me to frighten her, do you? Because I'm not exactly in the business of... Don't be an idiot. Langley's tone was indignant. I'm quite fond of the old lady. I don't give a damn if she's rich. It's not like I'd have any chance of inheriting anyway. And even if I did, it wouldn't matter. Stone had to allow that that was probably true. Aside from a voracious appetite and a fondness for good beer, Tommy Langley had never shown any inclination toward greed. All right, then. What do you want? Langley picked up a weathered statuette from Stone's desk and toyed with it. Well, she's convinced herself that something's going on in her house. Something supernatural. Supernatural. Stone frowned. What, did she think she saw a ghost of something? He shrugged. She can't explain it. She says she hears things in the middle of the night sometimes, and that the house has developed a, her words, chilly feeling. Naturally, the caretaker lady and the rest of the staff think it's all in her head, but they humor her because she pays them a lot of money. It was actually the caretaker who called me about it. She's worried. Worried about what? It's probably just the house settling. Old ladies get cold easily. Perhaps she should just turn up the heat a bit and... Langley shook his head. You're probably right, but she won't hear any of that. She's convinced something is going on. So what do you want me to do about it? Well, I thought it might help if you went with me and talked to her a little. Me? Why the hell would she believe some stranger off the street? Because it's your field. You know about the occult. You can go on about all that weird shit like you know what you're talking about. I think she'd believe you if you told her there was nothing going on. Stone pondered. This was the first time in years that anyone had asked him to do anything in a professional capacity. Aside from delivering occasional papers at very strange conferences. Tommy, I teach occult studies. I'm not an occult investigator. The whole business is rubbish anyway. Half my students are goths trying to get into each other's pants, and the other half are horror writers looking for material. I know that. And you know that. But Aunt Adelaide doesn't know that. She hasn't got a clue that there isn't even a difference between what you do and somebody who runs around hunting ghosts. Besides, she doesn't think it's rubbish. She still has an astrologer who comes by a couple of times a year to do her charts and read her tea leaves or whatever the hell they do. She believes. Also, he added with a grin, you turn on that British charm of yours and you'll have her eating out of your hand before you know it. Everybody knows all women are suckers for British accents. That's why you've got a hot girlfriend. While I stay at home at night watching Seinfeld reruns with my dog. Stone's eyebrows crept up again. Well... If you put it that way, how can I decline? Langley's grin widened. He levered himself up out of the chair. Excellent. I'll owe you one for this. You certainly will. And don't think I'll forget it either. Megan was amused by the whole thing, but declined to come along when invited. I'd probably burst out laughing when you started talking about all that occult bullshit like you actually took it seriously, she said, grinning. Yes, well, I might have trouble with that myself. Stone admitted. He was wandering around his townhouse, hunting for items that might look sufficiently convincing as the tools of an occult investigator. So far, he'd gathered a couple of old meters that lit up but didn't otherwise work. The skull of something that might have been a ferret, a handful of feathers attached to a leather strap, a set of ancient, oversized headphones, and a microphone that he'd connected to one of the meters. He stowed all of this in an impressive-looking, cracked leather satchel that he dug up in the attic. Might take Ethan along, though. He's into that sort of thing. He might find it interesting. I can pass him off as my assistant or something. A regular little Scooby gang, you three, she said with a chuckle. All you need is a Great Dane and a green van. She'll have to settle for an overweight pug and a black jaguar, Stone said, distracted as he tossed items out of an old chest. Emerging with an odd-looking pair of goggles with purple lenses, he tossed them in the bag along with the rest. Yeah, like you'd let Tommy bring old Charlemagne anywhere near your car. Point, he admitted. Scooby-free, then. 
Ethan, as Stone had guessed, was eager to come along on the mission. What do I have to do? he asked. I don't know anything about pretending to be a Ghostbuster. Stone shoved a notebook into his hand. Just scribble something down whenever I say anything that sounds important, he said. So it's basically just like being your apprentice, Ethan said with a grin. Silence, insolent pup, Stone growled. They picked up Langley at his place in San Jose after dinner that Friday evening, so they could drive up to Los Gatos together. Stone introduced him to Ethan. Every proper occult investigator needs an assistant, he said. Hope your aunt won't mind. Oh, and that said, he pulled the old satchel from his shoulder and handed it to Ethan. Make yourself useful, assistant. Yes, master, Ethan said in his best Igor voice. Langley looked Stone up and down under the porch lamp's glow, taking in his tweed jacket with suede elbow patches, argyle sweater vest, old-style overcoat draped over one arm, skinny black tie, and crazier-than-usual hair. You really went all out, didn't you? Where'd you find that get-up? Doctor Who's garage sale? What, you expect me to show up in jeans and a Pink Floyd t-shirt? We're putting on a show here. Let's do it right. Do I look sufficiently eccentric? You look like a raving nutball. The hair's a particularly nice touch. All you need is some round wire rim glasses and a lab coat. And wait a minute. That sunken eye thing you've got going on? Did you stay awake for three days or are you wearing makeup? Borrowed it from Megan. Just a bit to finish off the look. What do you think? Am I convincing? You're going to scare the crap out of her. Better not forget the charm. Remember, we want to reassure her, not give her a heart attack. Chapter 5 Langley hadn't been exaggerating when he'd said his aunt's house was way up in the Los Gatos Hills. Los Gatos was a tony little village a few miles from San Jose that was home to many of the area's more affluent residents. Affording even the more modest homes in its vicinity required a healthy household income. But the hills that surrounded the town were dotted with the mansions and estates of the truly wealthy. Stone, directing his jaguar around yet another sharp inclined curve, glanced at Langley. You weren't kidding about her being loaded, then? Nope. Her husband was some kind of industrial magnate type. Died years ago. She never remarried. So she's sitting on some pretty serious bank accounts. That's part of why I want to get this handled quietly. If it got out, she'd be hip-deep in quacks who fed her a line about hauntings and infestations and separate her from a hefty chunk of her cash. As opposed to the quacks who want to help her, Stone said with a wry grin. Exactly. Slow down. We're getting close. The turnoff's right up ahead here. Even with Langley pointing the way, Stone almost missed it in the darkness. He had to turn the wheel sharply when he spotted the narrow dirt road, and it took them nearly five minutes to wend their way through the open gate and carefully up toward the house. Wow, said Ethan from the back seat. Pretty impressive, huh? Langley agreed. Old, too. It's one of the oldest houses in the area. The house was indeed impressive. Though it was hard to see it clearly with only the perimeter lights and the cozy glow from the windows for illumination, they could tell it was three stories tall, built in a solid, old-fashioned style, and well-preserved. As they all got out of the car and stood staring up at it, the door opened. "'Hello?' came a female voice from a shadowy figure in the doorway. "'Tommy, is that you?' "'Yep, it's me.' Langley waved at Stone and Ethan to follow him to where a heavy-set, smiling Asian woman of about sixty waited for them. "'Guys, this is Iona Lee. She's a nurse. Been friends with Aunt Adelaide for years, and takes care of her. Iona, this is Dr. Alistair Stone, the occult investigator, and his assistant, Ethan.' Stone bowed slightly. "'Pleasure,' he said with his best charming smile. Iona motioned them in. "'Mrs. Barnum has been waiting for you.' She's very excited to have someone come around who can explain what's causing her odd feelings. She exchanged a glance with Tommy, and Stone realized that she was in on the ruse. She led them down a wood-paneled hallway, lined with paintings that were quite probably Aunt Adelaide's forebears, into a large but cozy sitting room full of antique furniture, opulent but somewhat dusty oriental rugs, and lamps with fussy shades. The whole room looked like it hadn't been updated in at least seventy-five years, and practically screamed, rich old lady. Hello! A quavery, cheery voice called from near the heavy drapes covering the front picture window. They'd almost missed her sitting there in the chair, 
a thin and bird-like old woman with fluffy white hair and a city map's worth of lines and creases on her face. Her bright blue eyes lit up her narrow face as she waved to the newcomers. Please come in. I hope you don't mind if I don't get up. Hello, Aunt Adelaide, Langley said, moving to approach her and motioning for Stone and Ethan to follow. How have you been? He leaned down to plant a kiss on her wrinkled cheek. I'm eighty-nine, she said, chuckling. I'm still alive, so that's about as well as can be expected, all things considered. Her gaze settled on Stone and her smile widened. Well, you're quite the looker, aren't you? You're a friend of Tommy's? Stone was only taken aback for a second. Then he returned her smile. It's a pleasure to meet you, Mrs. Bonham. I've heard so much about you. I'm Alistair Stone. This is my assistant, Ethan Penrose. Oh, yes. She made a tiny little jerk, and Stone could almost see the light bulb go off over her head. You're the young man who's going to figure out what's going on in my house. He didn't tell me you were English. I love Englishmen. I could listen to you talk all day. Langley flashed him a triumphant, See, I told you so, look. Yes, well, suppose we get started. I don't want to disturb your home for too long. She waved him off. You needn't worry about that. I'm sort of a night owl, and I'm used to having people trooping through the house. We've always got little projects going on around here. Had the windows done last year, and the young men doing the earthquake inspection in the summer— Stone nodded, remembering the moderate shaker that had hit the area earlier that year. Megan, a lifelong California native, had been amused at how much it had unnerved him. "'You should see what a big one is like,' she'd teased when he had trouble getting back to sleep. "'I don't even notice them anymore unless they knock me out of bed.' "'Old house,' Langley said. "'They had to do the inspection to make sure there wasn't any damage, but Aunt Adelaide's right. This place is built like a fortress.' Stone perched on the edge of a floral print couch covered in doilies. All right, then. Before I set off to look around, I suppose I start by asking you exactly what's been going on. Adelaide shivered and drew her jacket tighter around herself. I know Iona and the others think I've been getting balmy in my old age, but I know better. I might be old, but there's nothing wrong with my mind, and I felt it. I heard it. Felt and heard what, Mrs. Bonham? She took a deep breath and shivered again. I hear voices sometimes when I'm in bed. Late at night, they, they whisper. Can you understand what they're saying? No, she said, shaking her head. I'm not even sure they're speaking English, honestly. All right, Stone said. And what did you feel? Cold. Like there's a draft in the house— only it feels like it's going right through my clothes and into my soul. Her round, frightened eyes came up. Is any of this making sense to you, Dr. Stone? Have you ever encountered anything like it before? I keep thinking that I've somehow angered a spirit or something, though I can't imagine how I might have done that. When Stone answered after a pause, his tone was careful. Mrs. Bonham, you say you felt a draft. Please, I don't intend any offense— but I have to explore all the angles. Are you sure you didn't just feel a draft? This is an old house, after all. No, no, she insisted. Again she shook her head, more emphatically this time. It wasn't a real draft. For one thing, Tommy is right. This place might be old, but it's like me. It's solid. The only way there could have been a draft was if Iona had left a window open. And since she's the one who gets cold, she doesn't even open the windows. We have central air in most of the house, so we don't need to. Plus, as I said, we had the windows replaced recently. All right. Stone glanced over and was pleased to see Ethan busily scribbling in his notebook. Anything else you want to tell me before I go have a look around? Well, she shifted in her chair. Come on now, he said with an encouraging smile. I can't help you if you don't tell me everything. She was silent for several seconds clearly trying to decide whether she wanted to say more. Then she motioned him closer. When he leaned in, she spoke under her breath. I didn't even tell Tommy about this. I thought he'd just laugh at me. But sometimes I get the feeling that there's something wrong in the house. Something evil, even. Please don't laugh. Stone didn't laugh. 
In fact, he was beginning to wonder if the old girl hadn't picked up on something that the others were too brain-blind to notice. It wasn't common for mundanes with an interest in the supernatural to pick up garbled signals from the real thing, like radios badly tuned to a distant station, but he'd seen it happen before. He gently patted her liver-spotted hand. Don't you worry, Mrs. Bonham. If there's something here, I'll find it. And if I don't find anything, then I'll be reasonably certain that there's nothing to find. That sort of feeling can come from all sorts of things. Even we occult investigators, the ones who are any good anyway, start by looking for ordinary, normal reasons for strange manifestations. For example, I once read about a family who moved into a new house, and one of the kids started feeling constantly on edge and stressed. Turned out he was just sensitive to the subsonic frequency from a nearby electrical transformer. Maybe that's it, Langley agreed, clearly glad to have a straw to grasp at. I don't even know if there are any transformers near here, Adelaide said. Do you, Tommy? No idea, but we could check tomorrow. Stone rose. Come on, Ethan, bring the bag and let's have a look around. Mrs. Bonham, if you could spare Tommy, I'd like to have him come along as well. I don't like wandering about in people's private spaces without a guide. You go on ahead, Iona Lee said, moving over next to Adelaide. I was about to get Adelaide's evening cup of tea ready anyway. And my show is on soon, the old lady said with a twinkle in her eye. I do hate to miss my murder mysteries. Tommy can show you where we'll be when you're done. Take your time, Dr. Stone. I promise you won't be keeping me awake past my bedtime. Stone motioned for Ethan and Langley to follow him back into the hallway, but stopped halfway to the door. One more question, if I may, Mrs. Bonham. Of course, dear. Was there anywhere in particular in the house where you experienced these odd feelings? You said you heard voices in your bedroom, but what about the drafts? Upstairs, mostly, in the east wing and that hallway, she said. I have a lovely library sitting room where I used to like to read, but I don't like to go up there any more now. Thank you. We'll check it out. In the hall, Stone gathered Langley and Ethan into a small huddle. All right, he said. If Aunt Adelaide isn't going to be accompanying us, and she's the only one not in on what we're doing, we can skip all the toys in the bag. But Tommy, if you could show me her bedroom and this library. It makes sense to start where she says she noticed it most. Wait a sec, Langley protested. I thought we were just going to wander around up here for a while and then come back down and tell her nothing's up. Do we actually have to go anywhere in particular? Stone shrugged. Let's make it look realistic. Besides, who's to say we won't find a perfectly normal, non-supernatural explanation? Truth be told, he wanted to check out his hypothesis that the old lady was picking up vibes from somewhere, but he didn't think telling Langley would get him anywhere but laughed at. He glanced sideways at Ethan, who looked intrigued by the whole thing. Fine, come on, the main stairway's this way. Stone and Ethan followed Langley down the hallway and into a wide-open hall. On the other side was an elaborately carved stairway. "'How does she make it up all those stairs?' Ethan asked. "'She doesn't. There's an elevator. But it's easier for us to take them. Let's go to her bedroom first. Adelaide's bedroom was on the second floor, at the end of a wide hallway lined with more family portraits, landscapes, and pastoral scenes. Langley pushed the door open and stepped aside to let them in. As Stone expected, it was your classic, rich old lady bedroom. Heavy drapes, brocade bedspread, elaborately carved antique furniture. The only things that didn't fit the decorating scheme were a couple of pill bottles on the nightstand and a small oxygen tank in a rack next to the right side of the bed. A large print paperback copy of The Cat Who Brought Down the House lay open next to the pill bottles. The drapes were closed. The whole place smelled vaguely musty, with a floral overlay. Langley came in last and plopped himself down in a chair, looking skeptical. You wander around all you want with your magnifying glass and your magic deerstalker hat. Me? I'm going to take a load off. Stone got right to it, pacing the room and reaching out with his magical senses to see if anything caught his notice. Nothing did. Of course, he was doing his best to be subtle about the whole thing so Langley wouldn't ask uncomfortable questions. His examination of the bedroom which included getting down to look under the bed and tapping on various walls, lasted about ten minutes. Then he disappeared momentarily into the bathroom and emerged only a minute or so later. Ethan trailed him, looking like he wasn't sure what he was supposed to be doing. Anything? 
Langley asked, sounding bored. Not a thing, Stone said. If she's hearing voices, they're not coming from in here. Or, you know, there aren't any. That too. All right, take me to the east wing. Langley seemed eager to get out of this all-too-intimate space of his old aunt's. This way. This time he took the lead, with Stone following. Ethan once again brought up the rear. No doubt about it, the house was vast. It took them several minutes to get to the third floor and find their way down another wide painting-lined hallway to the library. Why does she stay in this place? Stone asked. He himself was no stranger to large houses, being the owner of a decaying old manor back home in England that he could barely afford to keep one step ahead of collapse. But this one made his place look like a three-bedroom in the suburbs. Obviously she's got the money to keep it up, but wouldn't it be more comfortable for her if she didn't have to lay in supplies to make the trip from the bedroom to the kitchen? Langley chuckled. Iona adores her, and if she needs to go anywhere, she gets pushed around in a fancy wheelchair. Plus, she absolutely refuses to move out. She says she's got too many good memories here, and she'll leave when they wheel her out in a casket. I guess nobody does stubborn as well as a rich old lady, Stone conceded, following Langley inside. This is the... A wave of light-headed weakness struck him from nowhere. He swayed, reaching for something to grab as he felt himself toppling over. Chapter 6 It was a cliché to refer to someone moving through a space like they owned it. But in the case of the individuals currently holding court at a goth industrial club called Will to Power in San Francisco, it was true. They called themselves the Three, and while they didn't actually own the club or have any idea who did, the manner in which they prowled and stalked its darkened spaces had a way of convincing others to get out of their way, even those who had never encountered them before. More than one hapless club patron, withering under the combined force of their gazes until sufficiently unnerved to give up a desirable table or seed prime real estate on one of the dance floors, was convinced they were vampires. Those who knew better than to believe in such nonsense just rationalized things by deciding that it wasn't a good idea to mess with all three of them at once. Since they were rarely seen far from each other's proximity, that was a reasonable precaution. Currently the three lounged at an out-of-the-way table near one of the club's black-painted walls, watching the ebb and flow of the club-goers and listening to the pounding beat of the band currently on stage. The band was a quartet called IED, and they were doing a good job of living up to their name. The wall of sound was so loud that it was difficult to hear oneself think, let alone carry on a conversation. For now the three were silent, acknowledging with a kind of regal grace those who waved or nodded at them as they went by. Most people just avoided them with the same kind of instinct that kept them away from poisonous spiders and large snakes. But in any evening's crowd, there were always those who wanted to curry favor. The three found this sort of thing amusing. They accepted the free drinks and other courtesies that came their way with haughty disdain. And if anyone noticed that they never provided anything in return beyond a brief acknowledgment of the giver's existence, they weren't brave enough to bring it up. Ten minutes later, IED finished their set. The front man yelled something into the mic that might have been that they were going to take a break. Then all four hurried off stage, and the DJs immediately filled the silence with more pounding music. This was somewhat quieter, though, at least enough that the three could hear each other without resorting to the indignity of having to shout. "'I'm bored!' Oliver Hargraves said, downing the rest of his drink. His handsome features dripped with contempt. "'Let's ditch this fucking place!' Trin Blackburn reached out her hand and stroked down his chest with one long, black-painted nail. The finger didn't stop until it had moved below the table and lingered suggestively over the bulge in his fashionably tight jeans. Patience, was all she said. I like these guys. I want to hear their next set. Across from them, Miguel Torres smiled. Get a room, you two. He glanced up, waved lazily, and immediately another beer appeared in front of him. His own gaze followed the leather-clad ass of the slender, pale young man who delivered it. The three were not vampires. Not in the classic, bite-the-neck-and-drink-the-blood sense, anyway. They'd arrived in San Francisco a year or so ago, blowing in from some unknown location. They never talked about their past, nor what made them decide to move from one big city to another. 
They attended all the right parties and were fixtures at all the right clubs, their unerring instincts steering them away from one venue right before it fell out of favor and toward another at the beginning of its rise. If it occurred to them that their interest in a particular club or crowd might contribute toward the ascendance of its star, they didn't say anything about it. They simply took it as their due. For the most part, all three of them liked Will to Power. They had been coming here for longer than any of the other clubs they visited, long after they'd have given up on any other venue as old news. There was something about the raw vibe here that turned them on, a constant level of energy that went beyond what they might encounter from a typical dance club. This made it a great place to hunt. Not that they had to, of course. Their prey came to them, and willingly, if unknowingly, gave them what they sought. After a night here, they never lacked the energy they needed to power the spells and the dark rituals that they performed in the small hours of the mornings, after most of the city had closed briefly down to prepare for the next morning. All it ever took was a smile, a gesture, a quirked eyebrow. There was never a shortage of willing participants, and if these participants walked away from their encounters feeling a little woozy and disoriented, well, that was simply the alcohol and the afterglow of having been noticed by the beautiful people. That was what kept them coming back. The three weren't here to hunt for any particular purpose tonight. They didn't have anything planned that required them to take on extra energy to power it. That didn't really matter, though, since it had long ago become a habit that they indulged on all of their nightly adventures. Why should they be without power, even if they didn't specifically need it, when there were so many eager batteries around to provide it? Trin and Oliver watched, amused, as Miguel rose, grinned at them, and moved over toward where the slender waiter stood near the bar. He himself stalked rather than merely walked, every step broadcasting supreme confidence and sensuality. It wasn't that he was overly handsome. In fact, next to the blonde Adonis that was Oliver, Miguel had the look of someone with an eclectic collection of perfect features assembled from several different contributors. They didn't quite go together properly, and— taken as a whole, gave him a rather predatory and more than a bit creepy look. Until he smiled. There were very few people, men or women, who could resist the effect of Miguel Torres's smile at full wattage. The waiter was not one of them. Trin and Oliver continued to watch as Miguel initiated a conversation, and only a couple minutes later the two young men had slipped off into a shadowy corner. Only because they knew what to look for could they tell that the waiter's slumping posture was not due solely to Miguel's charisma. "'I'll be back,' Trin said, running the side of her hand along Oliver's jawline. "'You stay here like a good boy, yes?' "'Wherever would I go?' he asked, turning his head to nibble on her finger. She had barely moved out of sight when a woman detached herself from the crowd, where she had obviously been waiting, and dropped down into the vacated seat next to Oliver. "'Hi there.' she said with a sensuous, alcohol-fueled smile. "'Don't have much to say, huh?' Her voice slurred more than a bit, her blue eyes glittering. Oliver revised his estimate. More than just alcohol was in play here. This woman was blasted off her ass. She reached out and mirrored Trin's gesture, or would have, if he hadn't pulled back. Oliver didn't like it when people touched him without permission. People other than Trin, anyway. Not that Trin cared much about things like permission. Something wrong, she purred. I'm Angelique, by the way. She rolled the name off her tongue in a desperate but mostly unsuccessful attempt to sound sophisticated and French. And you are? Not interested, he said, sliding his chair away. If she kept it up much longer, he might consider using her for a little power top-up, but drunken chicks trying way too hard weren't his type. She glared. What are you, a fag or something? Oliver chuckled. Nah. He nodded up at the bar, where Miguel and the waiter were still feeling each other up. My friend's the fag. I just have standards. <laughs> standards? She rolled her eyes. You mean that skinny bitch you were with? You can do better, baby. Trust me. Once more she reached out, this time aiming at his chest in its skin-tight black t-shirt. Problem over here, Oliver? Both of them looked up, 
Trin stood there, arms crossed over her chest, looking both imperious and amused. Oliver grinned. Nah, no problem. This lady just... got lost or something. I think she thought I was somebody else. Ah. Uh, Trin nodded. She looked to Angelique. Wow, that's a pretty good idea, actually. So get lost. Angelique glared at her. For a moment, Oliver thought she might go all spitting cat and take a swing at Trin, but instead she just rose and leaned down low over Oliver, so he had an unobstructed view of her impressively augmented cleavage. Then she produced a pen from her tiny handbag and, taking her time as if oblivious to Trin's glare, jotted her phone number on a napkin, kissed it to make a moist red impression, and pressed it into Oliver's hand. Call me when you get tired of bitchy poo here then tottered off unsteadily into the crowd in search of easier prey. Trin resumed her seat, watching Angelique go. Did you at least make her pay for her nerve? She made a careless gesture at the other woman, who suddenly tripped, pitching forward with a shriek into the arms of two drunken young men. Trin smiled. Oliver shook his head. Didn't want to touch her, he said as Miguel arrived back at the table and sat down. Oliver picked up the napkin with two fingers and looked at it. She dotted her eye with a heart. How fucking sad is that? He made as if to toss it away, but Trin plucked it out of his hand and examined it. Hmm. Then she smiled a most unwholesome smile as she tucked it into her leather jacket. I think we can have some fun with this. You two game? Miguel chuckled. Trin, honey, remind me never to get on your bad side. Chapter 7 Langley spun as Stone stopped speaking, his eyes getting big. Hey, you okay? he demanded. He grabbed Stone's arm to stop him from falling and led him to a chair. Sit down before you keel over. Ethan, looking as weirded out as Langley, clutched the bag as he hung back and waited to see what was happening. Stone didn't answer right away. His forehead was dotted with beads of sweat and his breath had quickened as if he had just exerted himself. He swiped a hand through his hair and just sat there for a moment, getting himself together. Langley squatted down next to him, worried. What's going on? You all right? Stone nodded. I... I don't know what that was. Could I trouble you for a glass of water? Uh, sure, I'll be right back. Langley hurried out. When the two of them were alone, Stone turned to Ethan. Do you feel that? He asked. His voice had a strange edge. Ethan frowned. Feel what? You don't feel it? I don't feel anything. What's going on? Are you sure you're okay? <sighs> Stone took a couple more deep breaths. There's definitely something going on in here, and Aunt Adelaide is definitely not balmy. I can't believe you don't notice it. Ethan turned away, looking around the room. After a moment, he shook his head. Sorry, Dr. Stone. Maybe I'm just not far enough along and might... Langley picked that moment to come back in. He carried a glass full of water, which he handed to Stone. You look like you just saw a ghost, he said, still worried. You, uh, didn't, did you? Of course not. Must have been something I ate. Stone paused to down half the glass of water in one go. That's better. Thank you. You want to keep this up? Maybe we should just go back down and... No, I want to have a look around now that we're here. Don't worry, I'll be fine. He got up, tested his balance, and stood for a moment just looking around. He had to be careful not to let on to Langley yet, at least not until he figured out how to do it without giving away his secret, but this whole business was spooking him far more than he was showing. The moment he'd walked into the library, Stone had been hit with a wave of what he could only describe as cold hatred, mixed with a kind of unwholesome longing. Something in this house didn't want him to be here. Probably didn't want any of them to be here. But most of them were too hopelessly mundane to pick up the signals. Aunt Adelaide had probably only gotten a fraction of it, and it had been sufficient to scare her into calling in a stranger to investigate. What was odd was that Ethan hadn't noticed it either. The boy's progress in learning magic hadn't been spectacular so far, but he'd mastered the basics of magical sight over the last couple of weeks at least. Stone turned back to his friends. Langley and Ethan watched him warily, like they expected him to go green and bolt out of the room any second. Waving them off, 
He took a deep breath and began pacing around as he had in Adelaide's bedroom. This time Ethan didn't follow him, instead choosing to remain near Langley. The boy's gaze followed Stone, but his mind appeared far away. After a few minutes passed and Stone hadn't had a repeat of his strange attack, Langley appeared to relax. He sat down in the chair Stone had vacated and leaned back. It was obvious he thought this whole business was a waste of time, but he was willing to humor his friend. Dr. Stone? Stone paused in his examination of a bookshelf as Ethan spoke. Yes? I need to use the restroom. Is it okay? Of course. Tell me, where is... It's a bit of a hike, but you can't miss it. Down the hall, take your first right, then it's three doors down. I left the door open when I got the water, so you should be able to find it with no problem. Thanks. Ethan set the satchel of bogus occult investigation gear on the floor next to Langley's chair and headed out of the room, and Stone resumed his pacing. You're just putting on a show for the kid, right? Langley said, the light finally dawning. What? You know, all this pacing around and poking at things. You're trying to impress him. Is he one of your students? Sort of, Stone admitted. He's the son of an old friend. He's interested in my field, so I thought he might enjoy seeing a bit of it in action. Did you fake the dizzy spell, too, for dramatic effect? Stone sighed, coming back over. Tell me... He almost said more, but this simply wasn't the time. All he knew was that he would need to come back here, this time with some real detection gear, if he was going to find out anything definitive. And for that to happen... He had to be very careful what he said to Langley. I didn't fake the dizzy spell, he said at last. I told you, I think something I ate disagreed with me. But let me finish this, all right? Then we can get out of here. Sure, sure. Langley plucked a random book off a nearby shelf and leaned back in his chair. Just call me when you're done communing with the spooks. Out in the hall, Ethan moved quickly. His path was purposeful, but he felt oddly detached like he was watching his body from somewhere up above it. It wasn't as if he wasn't in control of his actions, but rather that he was proceeding according to some directive that he didn't even understand. He hurried down the hall, but instead of making the first right as Langley had indicated, he continued in a straight line. He moved unerringly, even as he entered a part of the house that they had not passed through to reach the library. He, or some part of him at least, knew exactly where he was headed. At the end of the hall was a small, unassuming door. He reached for the knob, knowing it would be unlocked, and slipped through, closing it behind him. His fingers found the light switch like he had lived there all his life, his feet mounting the narrow wooden staircase with complete confidence. At the top of the stairway was another door, also unlocked. He emerged into a vast, dark space, illuminated only by the moonlight coming in through the skylights high above. All around him rose the bulky, covered forms of furniture and other stored items, with the smell of dust and long disuse hovering heavily in the air. Ethan didn't look down, only peripherally noticing the puffs of dust raised by his sure steps across the space. Even though his mind wasn't truly here, a corner of it knew that he didn't have long before he'd be missed. He'd have to do this fast. Operating on unseen instructions, he shoved aside a large, sheet-covered object to reveal a taller, narrower one behind it, a few feet out from a wall. He crouched, grabbing the bottom of the sheet and whipping it free to reveal a mirror, taller than he was and surrounded by an ornately carved wooden frame. Then he backed up a few feet and waited, staring into its depths as if he expected to see something other than his own reflection in its milky, grime-encrusted surface. When the glow appeared, he was not surprised, nor was he frightened. He waited in silence, unmoving. After a few moments passed, he nodded. By the time he descended the stairs and reached the familiar hallway leading back to the library, he couldn't remember what he was doing there. It must have taken a wrong turn, he figured, hurrying back to where he'd left the others. Stone was just finishing his inspection of the library's bookshelves when Ethan hurried back into the room, puffing. The mage raised an eyebrow. Took you a while, Ethan. You all right? A little upset stomach, he said with a self-conscious grin. Plus I missed the first right, so I kind of got lost and had to backtrack a little. Yeah, that happens a lot, Langley said, nodding. First few times I was here I could barely find my way back to the main part of the house without a trail of breadcrumbs and a Sherpa. He glanced at Stone. So, have you seen enough? 
Are you ready to go? It is getting kind of late. Stone paused in the middle of the room, took one last look around, and then nodded. I think so, he said. For now, anyway. For now? Langley was confused. What's that mean? Tell you later. Don't worry, I won't frighten Aunt Adelaide. You're right. She really is a delightful old lady. Seemingly mollified, Langley led them out of the room and back down the two flights of stairs. Instead of going to the sitting room where they'd all talked before, he led them in the opposite direction toward a cozy little room with an overstuffed chair and couch, both aimed at a surprisingly small, antiquated television set. Aunt Adelaide and Iona Lee sat at opposite ends of the couch, watching murder, she wrote. They both looked up as the three came in. Well, Adelaide said with a smile, did you find anything, dear? Stone paused, his mind whirling as it considered and discarded responses. If he told the old lady the truth, even a fraction of it, he would probably give her quite a scare. And for what? It wasn't like she was going to leave the house in any case. And so far, whatever was there hadn't done her any harm, beyond making her uneasy. But if he told her he hadn't found anything, and the place was clean, not only would he forfeit any chance to get back into the house for a more thorough investigation later, but as a mage he couldn't bring himself to leave these people exposed to potential danger without at least warning them that it might exist. The old lady watched him with an expectant expression. Well, he said at last, I didn't find anything conclusive. That much was true. He knew there was something there, but he had no idea what it was. Ignoring Langley's what-the-hell glare, he continued, It's probably nothing, but I can't be completely sure without a bit more examination. And for that, I'll need some more equipment. It's up to you. Like I said, it's probably nothing, but... He spread his hands. Now Iona was looking at him with suspicion as well. Obviously, Langley and she were both trying to figure out why he'd chosen to deviate from the agreed-upon game plan. Adelaide, however, was contemplative. Her round glasses shone as she shifted her gaze between her nephew, her friend, and the odd stranger she'd invited into her home. "'I know you two think I'm crazy,' she said at last. "'I don't blame you. I'd think I was crazy, too, if I didn't know for sure that I'd seen and felt what I did. And I know you probably brought this nice young man along to reassure me that everything was fine.' She settled on stone. Are you really an occult investigator at all, Dr. Stone? Langley and Iona exchanged glances. Busted. But Stone was unperturbed. He came around in front of the couch, careful not to block the lady's view of the TV, crouched down, and met Adelaide's eyes. I'm a professor of occult studies at Stanford, he told her. That's where I know Tommy from. I'm not an occult investigator per se, but I do have a fairly extensive knowledge of the occult and the supernatural. Are you sensitive? she asked. If you mean do I notice things that others might not, then yes, mostly because I know what to look for. Behind the couch, Langley and Iona let their breaths out simultaneously. At least it was no longer looking like Aunt Adelaide would chuck the lot of them out of the house for trying to put one over on her. The old dear was sharper than either of them had given her credit for. Adelaide considered. Did you feel what I felt up there in the library? Did you hear anything in the bedroom? I didn't hear anything. Again, the truth was the best course when he could employ it. That would make the half-truths and outright lies he'd have to tell go down easier. And as for the library, I think there could be something there. I didn't feel a draft, though, or a sense of coldness— it was more subtle than that, and again, it might well be nothing. But it might be something. It might, Stone admitted, acutely aware of Langley's and Iona's eyes on him. Then you're welcome to come back and check further, Adelaide said with a nod. And if Tommy trusts you, then I trust you. What do you charge for your services, by the way? Stone looked startled. Mrs. Bonham... Adelaide, please, dear, if we're going to be friends, let's not be so formal. Adelaide, then. And, of course, I wouldn't dream of charging you anything. He deployed a charming grin. As you said, we're friends. I'm happy to help. Pulling a card from his pocket, he handed it to her with a slight bow. Don't hesitate to call if you discover anything else. 
Oh, you're sweet. That's so kind of you. She smiled at him, tucking the card away in her own pocket, and turned back toward the television. I think it'll have to be another time, though. It's getting late, and I do so want to find out who killed poor Mr. Chalmers. Give me a call when you want to come back. What the hell was all that about? Langley demanded when they were back in the Jaguar, and heading back down the twisting road toward Los Catos. You were supposed to tell her everything was fine. Why did you— Because it wasn't, Stone said flatly. What do you mean it wasn't? There's something going on in that house. I don't know what it is. I don't know whether it's supernatural or mundane. But I do know it's there, and I'd like to figure out what it is. Langley let out a loud sigh. <sighs> Look, he said, clearly trying to keep the frustration out of his voice. This isn't what I brought you up there for. She's a sweet old lady, and she's really suggestible about this kind of thing. If I thought you were going to fill her head with all this horse shit about evil spirits... I didn't say a word about evil spirits, Tommy, nor will I. Stone refused to get defensive. Look yourself. I know how you feel about her. I understand. I liked her the moment I met her. I think she's a lot more clever and a lot less dotty than you give her credit for, and I respect her enough to believe her when she claims to have heard something. And now you've given me a puzzle, and as long as she's willing to go on with it, I'm not giving up until I solve it. Another loud sigh. I forgot about that, Langley said, resigned. You and your damned puzzles. Are you sure you didn't have cats in your family tree somewhere? This curiosity thing of yours is going to get you in trouble one of these days. They continued bickering the rest of the way down the hill. Neither of them paid more than a passing glance toward Ethan, who hadn't spoken since they'd left Adelaide's house, and who now sat silently in the back seat. They reached San Jose, and Stone dropped Langley off at his house. At least promise me this, Langley said as he got out. If you want to go up there again, call me first and let me go along, okay? Stone shrugged. Sure, if that's what you want. You'll probably find my next steps pretty boring, though. I intend to get hold of some actual equipment that works and see if I can pick up any readings. That kind of thing can take hours and usually turns up no usable results. That's okay. I'll bring a book. I know you mean well, Alistair, but... A lot of the stuff you spend your days with your nose buried in is pretty freaky for your average, everyday citizen. I just want to make sure you don't end up giving her a heart attack with something you think is perfectly normal. Back in the car, with Ethan now riding shotgun, Stone glanced over at him. You've been quiet tonight. Anything wrong? Ethan shook his head. No, not really. Like I said, kind of an upset stomach. You sure that's all it is? I still find it hard to believe that you didn't feel anything in that library. I haven't felt something that strong in quite some time. What do you think it is? Stone took a deep breath and let it out. I have no idea. Whatever it is, I don't think it's centered on the library. The feeling was strong, but diffuse. It's clearly connected with the house somehow, but it seems odd that she'd only start picking up on it now. That either means that it's only recently arrived— it's been there all along, and something or someone's disturbed it, or something's changed with Adelaide that made her notice it now when she never did before. Or possibly that it's been gaining power, and only now has enough to be able to affect things around it. Any guesses as to which? Not yet. Like I told Tommy, I want to get in there and get a better look. Which means I'm going to have to come up with some more convincing-looking data-gathering gear, so he can amuse himself watching the lights flash and the meters move around while I'm actually getting a look at things magically. He shrugged. Anyway, none of this is helping you with your lessons. Let me drop you off at your place so you can get some rest, and we'll get back to it tomorrow if you're feeling up to it. Sounds good. Stone glanced sideways at him, but didn't reply. Chapter 8 The walls in the attic of the abandoned house that the three used as their ritual space were painted black, dotted here and there with magical sigils spray-painted like graffiti. They had long since cleared the uneven wooden floor of debris and moved in the larger gear they needed for their activities. They didn't worry about anyone getting in and disturbing it. Not only had they gone to the significant extra effort of weaving spells and wards around the place that prevented anyone but the most persistent fellow mage from finding it, but if anyone had managed to break in, 
The enchantments would trap them in place until such time as the three could make use of them. It was kind of like a bonus. It was 3 a.m. on a rainy night. The door flew open and Oliver entered first, dripping, carrying a smaller box stacked on top of a larger one. Miguel came in behind him bearing a pizza box. Trin, of course, carried nothing. She never did. Oliver set the smaller box down and pulled out various bottles of liquor, a baggie of pot, and some rolling papers, setting them down on a nearby table. The larger box he placed in the middle of the floor. The three of them chatted on about their evening at a particularly good party, performing their jobs without needing to discuss them. For a while they just talked, eating pizza, passing a joint around, and downing shots of the liquor. Finally, at about 3.30, Trin pulled something from her pocket. Okay, ready to send that bitch a little fun? She waved the lipstick napkin that Angelique had given Oliver back at will to power. Miguel grinned. What do you have planned? We could make all her hair fall out, Oliver suggested. Trin glared at him. The problem with you, Oliver, is that you don't think big enough. He frowned. You're not going to kill her just for being a skank, are you? He appeared mostly unfazed by the idea, as if he were merely bringing up another suggestion. Oh, no. I thought maybe we could set her house on fire or something, or blow up her car if she's got one. Nice, Miguel said, nodding. Or maybe give her an uncontrollable case of the shits. Less conspicuous, but a lot more embarrassing. Hmm. Trin considered that. Not a bad idea, but a little juvenile. And the fire is going to be tough in this rain. I've got it. Let's flutter out. She'd better hope she can use those implants as flotation devices. The other two recognized the finality in her tone and didn't bother suggesting anything else. Oliver picked up the large box and began passing out various pieces of ritual material, and the three set to work customizing the magic circle they'd painted on the floor. As before, they moved as a single entity and without words, each one knowing his or her role in the ritual so well that they didn't need to consult. An eerie instrumental metal tune wafted over the attic, loud enough to be heard, but not loud enough to disturb them. She nodded to the others, and each stepped to their appointed place inside the circle. Oliver pulled a small knife from his pocket and waved it over the brazier, then used it to make small nicks in both of his palms. He handed it to Miguel, who did the same thing and gave it to Trin. Nicking her own palms, she set it aside, and the three of them clasped hands around the circle. They could each feel the magic already forming, a low current of energy passing between and around them. They had hunted well tonight at the party, drawing energy from many of its guests, including one man Miguel had left stuporous and barely breathing in a back bedroom. They felt flush with power, eager to release it now. They had done variations on the same ritual many times. It didn't pay to piss off the three, because they truly enjoyed the process of revenge. They hadn't killed anyone, yet, but they had discussed the possibility, and considered that it might be something they wanted to try, if the perceived slight was sufficient. Trin, as always, took the lead, beginning a low chant that the other two took up. Their eyes were closed, their nerves singing with the power that they were building between them. They writhed and swayed, punctuating the chant with moans of ecstasy as the power rose higher, joining their individual auras together into a coherent and more potent whole. If anyone had been watching them from the outside, their first thought would not have been of a magical ritual, but of an orgy. The energy around them was becoming visible now, traces of magical power around their bodies, their hands, the circle. Trin shifted her focus for a moment, the napkin rising up from her pocket and moving into the center of the circle. It hovered over the brazier and then settled into it, the flames licking and dancing as they ignited and began to devour the tiny bit of paper. Preparing to send the spell on its way, she gathered the energies from her two companions, wove them into the pattern of the spell, and then joined it with the bit of Angelique from the napkin. Together, the fragments of energy formed a reddish cord that snaked up through the house's roof. The three followed it, their own consciousnesses riding along to its termination point. It didn't take long. After all, it wasn't like Angelique the bar skank had any magical protections. 
In less than a minute, the cord dropped down into a small, unremarkable apartment on the second floor of a three-story building. Most of it was nearly indistinguishable, lifeless to magical sight, but a glowing form was curled up in what looked like a bed in one of the small rooms. Bonus, Miguel murmured. Maybe our neighbors will blame her for flooding them out. Shh, Trin said, concentrating. Help me with this. Neither one of the guys had to ask for details. They focused together, feeding power into the reddish cord, directing it, shaping it to their will. It didn't take much effort at all to find the water pipe leading to the bathroom and warp it until it snapped. They felt, rather than saw, the liquid spewing out inside the wall. Though they couldn't see each other's grins, they all felt the squeezes of their hands. One more to be sure, Trin said. She moved her focus, and the other two followed. In the kitchen, they opted to plug the sink and turn the tap on full blast. They remained there until the sink filled and began to overflow, then went back to check their handiwork upstairs. It would take a while before the water seeped out through the walls, but it would be at least a few hours before anyone in the building awakened. By then, the water would have done its job. It was more subtle than the three's usual plans, but subtlety was good sometimes. Angelique needed to learn some subtlety anyway. They returned at the same time, breaking contact and stepping out of the circle. None of them looked tired or spent from the ritual. That was what the power they'd stolen earlier tonight was for, so they didn't have to be. Tiring oneself out doing magic was for weaklings who didn't have the will to claim the power all around them, ripe for the plucking. Trin began rolling a joint. That was fun, she said. But we need to start thinking bigger. Maybe we kill the next one. You guys up for it? Miguel shrugged. Sure. His satisfied smile was chilling. After all, it's not like anyone's ever going to catch us at it. Chapter 9 Stone wondered if Ethan wasn't going to show up for his next lesson. It was already quarter after three, and there was no sign of the boy. Maybe he really had had an upset stomach last night, but it wasn't like him not to call. Stone thought he'd done a pretty good job of impressing on Ethan the importance of being reliable. Last night had been odd on many levels, aside from whatever was going on inside Aunt Adelaide's mansion, which was quite enough oddness for anyone. Ethan's behavior had set off warning bells somewhere deep in Stone's mind. Not serious ones. Just the kind that made him notice the fact that the boy had been acting strangely ever since he'd returned from the bathroom. Ethan had never exactly been a chatterbox, but to remain almost completely silent for the better part of two hours wasn't like him either. Okay. So if he really had had a stomach bug, he might have been embarrassed about stinking up a rich old lady's bathroom full of potpourri and little cat figurines. Teenagers were like that, getting inappropriately embarrassed over the most trivial things. But something told Stone that this wasn't the case this time. He wondered if Ethan had felt something in the house, and either didn't want to admit it for whatever reason, or else didn't even realize that his strange behavior had been brought on by forces he didn't quite grasp. That had happened to Stone himself when he was an apprentice, similar to the story he'd told Langley about the child and the electrical transformer, except that in his case... It had been the floating miasma of negative magical energy hovering around an old, abandoned graveyard back in England. It had turned out that a particularly nasty spirit had taken up residence in a crumbling mausoleum, and the mages he'd been with had quite a time dealing with it. He himself had been mostly useless, watching wide-eyed as they'd done battle with it, and eventually sent it back where it had come from. That was one thing Stone had learned in his over fifteen years of practicing the art. No two people responded to it the same way. Sure, there were the basics and the commonalities, but every individual approached it from their own perspective, bringing with them all the baggage and detritus that their psyches had accumulated throughout their lives. That was why there were no magic schools, and why those like Stone, who possessed both magical talent and the knack for teaching, were in such demand. Magic was very much a one-on-one -on -one kind of process, and the master-apprentice system, as archaic as it was nowadays, remained the best way to impart knowledge from one generation to the next. He pushed aside the drapes to look out the front window of his townhouse. Past the small, well-kept yard, the tree-lined street was quiet and empty. Maybe Ethan had car trouble on the way over, or... 
He was about to let the drapes fall back and make a phone call to Ethan's mother when he spotted the familiar blue four-door flying around the corner at significantly over the speed limit. It pulled into his driveway, and Ethan tumbled out, snatching his backpack and running to the house. Stone waited for him in the open front doorway. "'I'm sorry,' <laughs> Ethan puffed. "'I know I'm late, but Mom had another attack, and I had to help Mrs. Hooper get her to bed. Thought I could still make it in time, but—' "'Ah, of course.' He stepped aside and motioned the boy in. How is she doing? Ethan sighed, his shoulders slumping. Not so good, he said in a dead tone. She's getting worse. She might have to go to the hospital. Sit down. Stone waved him toward one of the stools at the breakfast bar and began putting together a glass of iced tea. He set it in front of Ethan and leaned on the counter. I'm sorry to hear that. Are you sure you should be here? If you... No... It's okay for now. Ethan shook his head. She's sleeping, and Mrs. Hooper said she probably would be for a few hours. She's better off with her than me anyway, since she at least knows what she's doing. His tone sounded bitter. Stone watched him for a few moments while he drank his tea. He almost said something else about Ethan's home situation, but decided there really wasn't anything else he could say that wouldn't sound like a platitude. Instead, he ventured, Ethan... If you're sure you're all right being here today, I wanted to discuss something with you before we start. Uh, sure. What is it? His gaze came up from where he'd been staring into his glass. It's about what happened last night. What about it? Stone watched him carefully as he spoke. Are you quite sure that you didn't feel anything last night? Nothing at all? I already told you I didn't. He looked a little defensive. You don't think I'm lying to you, do you? No. He kept his tone even and non-confrontational. But I wonder if perhaps you might have felt something and not even realized it. Well, how could that be? Well, you said you had an upset stomach. That's one of the ways magic can affect someone who's sensitive to it and doesn't know what he's experiencing, similar to Mrs. Bonham's chills. Ethan thought about that. Well, then, I don't know. Maybe I did feel something, but I sure didn't notice it. I take it your stomach problems are sorted? Yeah, I felt better in the morning. A pause, and then... Are we going back up there? To Mrs. Bonham's? He nodded. Why, do you want to? I don't know, Ethan said with a shrug. I just thought maybe if you went, I could go along. You know, to see if I feel something this time. Now you've got me curious. I don't like thinking that something's affecting me, and I don't even realize it. Stone pushed himself off the counter. I'll think about it. But for now, come with me. We're already half an hour late starting your lesson, and I want to try you on something new today. Instead of heading for the stairway leading up toward the study, Stone moved toward the back of the house and opened a door on another stairway downward. Ethan looked confused. Where are we going? Aren't we— Today I thought we'd get in a little lap work, Stone said, motioning him ahead which means I really don't want Mrs. Oliveira discovering us in the middle of casting a spell. Mrs. Oliveira was Stone's part-time cook, housekeeper. Ethan had met her briefly last week, when Stone had introduced him as a distant cousin. Ethan's eyes widened. We're actually going to do real magic? Maybe. That all depends on you. He switched on the light, illuminating a large open basement with concrete walls and a few scattered rugs on the floor. Pushed back against the walls were various work tables and bookcases, a ratty old couch, and two large chalkboards, one of which Ethan recognized from upstairs. In the center of the room was a small table with two chairs facing each other, and a thick candle in a holder in the middle. Sit down, Stone said, indicating a table. He headed to one of the work tables and puttered around for a moment. After a couple of minutes he returned with something in a small silk bag, which he tossed on the table. It clinked as if it contained pieces of metal. With two quick gestures, he lit the candle and turned off the overhead light, leaving the candle as the room's only illumination, and sat down opposite Ethan. The candlelight flickered in his glittering, unblinking eyes. All right, then, he said softly. Let's see how you do with this. Picking up the silk bag, he withdrew a small coin, which he tossed on the table between them. Levitate that, he ordered. Ethan's eyes widened. What? You heard me. But how? 
You've been reading the books I've told you to read, haven't you? Yes, but it's all there, if you were able to put it together. Go ahead, try it. I want to see what happens. He made a languid gesture, and the coin slid across the table and came to rest on Ethan's side. Ethan looked at him for a moment, then dropped his gaze down to the coin. Stone doubted it was a type the boy had ever seen before. It was neither American nor British, and had an odd portrait on it, of something that didn't quite look human. Ethan stared at it, clearly willing it to rise up off the table. After several seconds, however, it remained resolutely immobile. He took a deep breath, squared his shoulders, and squinted at the coin. When it didn't move after nearly a minute, he raised his hands and put his fingers to his temples. Stone rolled his eyes. You look like a telepath in a bad movie, he teased. Well, how am I supposed to do it, then? Ethan grumbled, glaring. You're supposed to be teaching me how, not giving me books and saying go. I wanted to see how much you got out of the books, Stone said, unperturbed. It's all right, though. Honestly, I would have been surprised if you'd been able to do it this soon and with no guidance. He fixed his eyes on the coin, and it rose smoothly off the table and returned to his hand. Magic, he said, in the tone of a lecturer, switching his focus to Ethan, or at least the variety I practice, and you'll be practicing soon enough, is all about the will. The will? Stone nodded. What our abilities allow us to do, what the average mundane person wouldn't be able to do even with all the magical knowledge in existence at his command, is to impose our will upon the world and make it do our bidding. Now that sounds pretty grandiose, and in some ways it is. But in the main, all it means is that we can make things happen with our minds. The stronger the mind and the will behind it, the stronger the magic. That's the reason why I'm so concerned about your distractions. I know that some of them aren't your fault, but it's hard enough to teach willpower to someone your age without having the extra difficulty that comes from your mind being fragmented over other things. You mean that being worried about Mom is making it harder for me to learn? Quite probably, and I'm not at all surprised. It's always harder to learn anything when your mind isn't fully engaged. But as I said before, I knew that was a factor when I took you on, and I'm prepared to work around it. All it means is that our progress might be a bit slower than it otherwise would have been. But you'll get there, I promise. He quirked a tiny grin. I've never lost a student yet. Tossing the coin back on the table, he magically nudged it back over in front of Ethan, then got up and went to the chalkboard. He drew a complicated pattern and then stepped back, illuminating a glow around his hand to make reading it easier. Do you remember this? Ethan studied it a moment, then nodded. It was in the workbook. Right. And do you see how it relates to what you're trying to do there? Again he studied it, eyes narrowing. I think so. I'm changing the properties of the air, or gravity, or something like that. Good. What you want to do is impose this pattern over the small space where the coin is, then use your will to grab hold of the coin and raise it up in the air. You make it sound so easy, Ethan said with a sigh. It is easy, once you know how to do it. It's like riding a bike, or learning to see those 3D pictures that always give me a frightful headache. It takes a while to get your mind around it, but at some point it just snaps into place, and you wonder how you ever managed not to see what was staring you right in the face. He came back over and sat down opposite Ethan. The thing you need to always remember, though, is that your brain isn't like everyone else's. The thing that makes you a mage is what makes it possible for you to do this. The first time is always the hardest, because you have to believe. Our kind of magic isn't about faith. It's about knowledge and study and discipline. But even here, you have to take that first leap of faith and believe that you're capable of doing this. I'm telling you that you are, and I know what I'm talking about. So if you can't believe in yourself yet, believe in me. All right? Now, try it again. Picture the pattern, make it real in your mind, and then impose it on the coin. Ethan took a deep breath and leaned over the table again. Glancing at the chalkboard, he stared back at the coin. His breath came faster, he gritted his teeth, and small droplets of sweat popped out on his forehead. For a moment, Stone thought that nothing was going to happen. But then after several moments, the coin rattled against the table and moved an inch to the right. Ethan was so surprised, he let his concentration slip, 
and the coin stopped. Did I do that? he demanded. Was that me? All you, Stone assured him, amused. No, seriously, you're not messing with me, are you? Because that would be... Ethan, that was you. All you. Now you've got the trick. Do it again. Stone tilted his chair back, arms crossed over his chest, watching the boy with the same pride he always experienced upon seeing a new mage actually harnessing the talent for the first time. He remembered his own first time, many years ago. The sense of accomplishment that was so strong it was almost tangible. It had been one of the best feelings he'd ever experienced in his life. It was better than sex, though he'd never tell Megan that. It was why he loved teaching so much. Go on, he nodded at the coin. You've got the pattern now. Let me see you lift it right up off the table. Once again, Ethan hunched over the table, grabbing hold of it with both hands. He took a couple of breaths, as if preparing to heft a heavy weight, then leaned in and glared at the coin. It moved sooner this time, shifting over to the left about two inches. Now lift it up, Stone murmured. It's the same pattern, just go up instead of over. The air can hold it up as easily as the table can if you force it to. The coin rattled. It shifted crazily back and forth, and then after several more seconds, it rose two inches off the table and hovered there. Hold it there, Stone ordered, still keeping his voice low and even. Long as you can now. For a second, it seemed as if Ethan had startled himself sufficiently that he would lose his concentration again. The coin pitched and yawed, spinning a couple of times in the air before he got hold of it again. He was already sweating, his hands shaking as they gripped the edge of the table. Stone watched him passively, offering no further comment. After nearly two minutes, Ethan let out his breath in an explosive blast and slumped. The coin clattered back to the table. "'Well done,' Stone said, smiling. "'Very well done for a first time.' Ethan was puffing like he'd just sprinted two or three laps around the block, but his face split in a big grin. I did it! You did indeed. He leaned back, still puffing and sweating. But is it supposed to be that hard? Picking up the coin, he turned it over. This thing, it weighs nothing, but I feel like I'm going to puke. It will get easier. You just asked your brain to do something it's never done before. It's like exercising any muscle. You have to work at it. He gestured and the light came back on. Blowing out the candle, he stood up. And that's your homework for next time. I want you to go home and practice what you've learned. Stay with light things. Coins, pencils, that sort of thing. I don't want you to try anything heavier than that for now. What I do want you to do is practice your control. See how high you can make it float. Try moving it around the room. See how long you can hold it in one place. If you get too tired, stop and rest. Once you demonstrate proper control over a small object, we'll move on to something larger. Rest for a bit now, and we'll try it a few more times to get you used to the feeling. So, how large can you do? Ethan asked, shoving his sweaty hair off his forehead. Me personally, or mages in general? He shrugged. Either one? How much do you weigh? Grinning, he waved a hand and Ethan rose up, chair and all, and floated in mid-air. When the boy scrambled to hang on and nearly toppled to the floor, Stone lowered the chair gently back down. Ethan stared at him, eyes wide, mouth hanging open. That's... that's... Stone shrugged. You have to understand, I don't go around levitating things just to see if I can. But I think if I had to and was properly prepared, I might be able to lift a small car. Briefly, anyway. I couldn't fling it around like Superman or anything, at least not without putting myself in a hospital for a week. And how good is that, compared to other mages, I mean? Ethan, he said with a chuckle, it's not a contest. We don't have the magical Olympics or anything, we... He stopped as a red light over the door flashed. Phone's ringing, he said. Excuse me a moment. He headed upstairs. After a few moments, he reappeared in the doorway. It's for you. The boy hurried up the stairs, took the phone, and listened for a moment, his expression growing concerned. Okay, thanks, he said in a monotone. I'll be there just as soon as I can. He handed the phone back to Stone and just stood there. What happened? Stone asked gently. Your mum? 
She's in the hospital, Ethan said in the same dead tone without looking at him. They took her off in an ambulance. I need to get over there. They're saying it's really bad this time. Chapter 10 When the three went clubbing again a few days after flooding Angelique's apartment, they had no particular plan in mind. Plans were boring. It was much better to go where the night took them, making their decisions based on the situations that presented themselves. That way, they never had to miss an opportunity. They might even have passed the evening pleasantly. A few drinks, some good music, maybe a little weed to loosen them up. They might not have decided to kill anyone after all. They didn't do everything they talked about. Not even everything Trin talked about. Oliver and Miguel half expected her to forget about the whole thing. She almost did, too, until she overheard some drunken douchebag at the bar bragging to his friends about how he was going to get that fag out in the parking lot and fuck him up. Trin didn't mind people calling Miguel a fag. Hell, she called him a fag. Miguel called himself a fag half the time. The chance that mere words would arouse her ire depended entirely on her current mental state, and tonight she was feeling pretty good. But threatening any of the three, even when the threat came from someone who was obviously so wasted he probably couldn't get out of his own way, was an entirely different matter. It didn't take her long, after the guy's friends had departed, to chat up women in other parts of the bar, to slink up and convince him to buy her a drink. Once she had him believing she thought he was the hottest thing in the club, pathetically easy given his wasted state. It took even less time to slip the clasp on his expensive watch and drop it into her pocket. Then she flashed him her best seductive smile and excused herself to the ladies' room to freshen up. Miguel, Oliver, and she were in their SUV and halfway back to their ritual space by the time he figured out she wasn't coming back. So, you really want to do this? Oliver asked an hour later, while putting the finishing touches on their circle. It had taken a little longer this time. Trin insisted that everything had to be just right. The odds of anyone tracing the magic back to them were low, but the precautions only added a few minutes to the setup time. Why? You wussing out? Trin asked. Nah, just getting tired. He took another pull on his joint. I could sleep for a week. You can sleep when we're done, Miguel said, plucking the joint from his fingers. I still think we should have just ashed the guy back at the club. All that wasted energy. I want to try this ritual, Trin said. It's a new one I found, supposed to kill without a trace. Might be useful if we ever want to make somebody disappear long distance. Eh, whatever, Oliver said. Let's get it over with. I want to crash. They took their positions around the circle. They had augmented its basic structure with a fair bit of extra detail, most of which Trin had copied from a book while Miguel and Oliver stood back, passed the joint between them, and watched. Okay, she finally said. This one's a little deeper than the usual stuff, so don't lose focus. I don't want to get my brain fried because you two chuckle fucks are stoned off your asses. We got this, Miguel assured her. Come on, let's do it. Trin propped the book open on a stand next to her position, then took the douchebag's watch from her pocket and placed it on a small table in the center of the circle. Each of the three did as they'd done the previous time, nicking their palms and then clasping hands to initiate the contact. The power began building almost instantly, rising to a low, humming thrum as Trin consulted the book and recited the words of the incantation in a low, steady voice. All of them noticed that the power flow was different this time, less electric, more primal. It passed through their bodies, gaining potency as it went. Trin kept chanting for several more minutes, then gripped Miguel's and Oliver's hands. Okay, she said, ready to send the energy. This is where we have to really focus. Concentrate on the watch, and we'll... Something happened. One moment they were all standing, hands clasped around the circle, the energy zipping and twisting between them like a mad thing straining to be released, and then the next moment they were... somewhere else. They all felt the shift. The glowing tendrils of power disappeared, the black walls and brazier and spray-painted sigils replaced by something deep, earthy, and unwell. 
It was as if they were standing in a damp cave, suffused with the smell of a thousand rotting corpses. Something spoke in their minds. Spoke wasn't quite right, though, because there were no words. Whatever it was, it communicated by images, by nuance, by suggestion. It reached into their minds one by one and hovered there, sifting and examining what it found with the clinical detachment of a scientist, and it told them things. The three didn't try to fight it, or to break the circle. Partly they were afraid to. Whatever this was, they'd never experienced anything like it in all the times they had performed these rituals. They weren't sure what would happen if they tried to interrupt it, or even if they could. But mostly it was because whatever this thing was, this formless, powerful thing paging through their minds and their experiences, somewhere deep within them, they understood it. They understood what it wanted, and they understood what it could offer them if they helped it to achieve its goals. They had no idea how long they stood there, hands locked together, legs shaking, eyes clenched shut. As the thing became more familiar with their minds, as its alien thought processes slowly meshed with theirs, its communications became clearer. Still not words, but the images and concepts grew incrementally more lucid. It showed them four, repeatedly, entwined with a melange of others. A large house, a nondescript apartment building, a blonde teenage boy, and a slim, dark-haired man. At first they were confused, and sent that back to it. They had never seen the buildings, the boy, nor the man before, nor did they have any idea what the thing wanted with them. They could sense its frustration at their inability to understand it, but also a deep, abiding patience. It had time. Now that it had made contact with someone it could communicate with, it had all the time in the world. Chapter 11 as much as Stone hadn't been sure he'd wanted to take on an apprentice, he found to his surprise that he was missing the time he'd been spending with Ethan. It had been three days since the boy had hurried out of the house, scared that if he didn't get there soon enough, his mother might die and he wouldn't get to say goodbye. He'd politely declined Stone's offer to drive him to the hospital and raced to his car, leaving at the same high rate of speed at which he'd arrived. He'd called back a day later with news. His mother wasn't dead and they'd managed to stabilize her to the point where she would most likely survive this episode. Things were still very touchy, though, and she would have to remain in the hospital for the next couple of weeks at least. Ethan had apologized, but told Stone there was no way he was going to be able to make it up to Palo Alto for a while. He promised to keep up with his studies and practice the levitation spell, but that was the best he could do. What could Stone say? No, you're my apprentice now, and damn your mother's precarious health. I want you here promptly at three o'clock. Yeah, no. Instead, he told Ethan to keep him posted, and not to hesitate to call if he needed anything, and gone back to splitting his time between his job and Megan. You seem distracted, she said a couple of nights after Ethan had called. Something wrong? He reminded himself again that her quick and perceptive mind was a big part of what was appealing about her in the first place. Just a bit concerned about Ethan, I suppose. Why? His mum's taken a bad turn, so he's spending most of his time at the hospital with her. What's wrong with that? Nothing's wrong with that. I'm just concerned about him. She's not doing well. If she dies, then he's not going to know what to do with himself. She moved in closer, snuggling her head against his shoulder. You were enjoying that mentor thing, weren't you? You're missing it. He shrugged. Perhaps I am. That wasn't quite it, but of course he couldn't tell her that. In truth, the time he'd been spending teaching Ethan had made him realize just how little effort he'd been spending actually doing magic lately, as opposed to studying it and reading about it. And realizing that made him also remember how much he loved doing magic. Well, she said gently, he's going to need you if something happens to his mother. He lay there staring up at the darkened ceiling and not answering, for several minutes. Finally, he said, I think I'll give Tommy a call tomorrow. Tommy Langley? She seemed startled by the abrupt change of subject. Why? Again, he shrugged. I won't have another look at his aunt's house. This is as good a time as any. It'll give me something to do. You want to go back there? 
I thought you were just supposed to tell her that everything was fine and there was nothing haunting her towel closet or whatever. She rolled over to face him, her eyes getting big. Alistair, you're not telling me you believe that nonsense, are you? You don't really think something weird's going on in that house. I don't know what I believe, he said, a little defensive now. Who's to say there aren't things going on out there that we don't understand? She rolled her eyes. You're starting to believe your own course descriptions. I knew it would happen eventually. Look, he said, you don't have to go. You don't have to be involved with it at all. I'll just nip out there with Tommy for a couple of hours, have a look around, and then come back and we can go check out that new sushi place you found. All right? Bribes, she said, snuggling into his shoulder. Hey, if you want to be a nutcase in your own time, that's none of my business. Just don't ask me to believe it. Fair enough, he agreed. Langley, as Stone expected, was reluctant to sanction another expedition to Adelaide's house. I still think the whole thing is all in your head, he said when Stone showed up at his office the next day. You and Aunt Adelaide are feeding on each other with your stories. Hell, maybe you just want to impress her, I don't know. But I don't believe in spooks, and I thought you didn't either. I just want to have another look, he said, neatly sidestepping the issue of spooks. That's all. I promise not to tell Aunt Adelaide anything frightening. I just want to see if what I felt there the other night is still there, or if I was just tired. Langley sighed. I don't like it, Alistair. I'd really rather you didn't. It's just... weird. Stone stood and began pacing in front of his friend's desk. Listen, Tommy. First of all, you have my word that I have nothing but your aunt's best interests in mind. I shouldn't even have to tell you that, should I? How long have we known each other? Do you honestly think I'd do anything to purposely frighten an eighty-nine-year-old woman? Of course not, Langley said, not looking at him. But you know as well as I do that you get kind of, well, okay, strange, about this sort of stuff sometimes. I've seen you do it. I know you don't believe all the hooey about the occult, but... His eyes came up, and he was frowning. But shit, you told her you were sensitive. You said you could feel the same kind of stuff she was feeling. You lied to her so she wouldn't bust you for being a bogus occult investigator. I didn't lie to her, Tommy. Stone dropped back down into the chair. This wasn't going to be easy. He'd have to be very careful about what he said next. Sometimes he wished he could just tell the world that he was a genuine, real-deal mage. It would make things easier in situations like this. A lot tougher in most others, though, which is why he kept his mouth shut. What do you mean you didn't lie? Are you telling me you are sensitive, whatever the hell that even means? I'm trying to tell you that there's a reason I chose the field I did, and it wasn't just because I wanted to write bad horror novels and impress goth women. So you believe in this stuff? Ghosts and werewolves and vampires and all that shit? You told me it was all rubbish. That was your exact word. So you did lie to me? No, I've never met a ghost, a werewolf, or a vampire. That much was true. But I do believe there are forces in the world that we humans don't understand yet, and I believe that they can affect people who are sensitive to them. I think your aunt is one of those people. Langley sighed, putting his face in his hands and shaking his head. Alistair, sometimes I wish I'd gone looking for drinking buddies in the physics department or something. You're a hard guy to be friends with sometimes. Let me remind you, Stone pointed out, that you called me about this. And you did it precisely because of my area of expertise. Why not let me finish what I started? I'm not going to hurt your aunt. If anything, I might be able to get to the bottom of the problem so she doesn't have to deal with it anymore. Or at least give her a different perspective so it doesn't frighten her. For several seconds, Langley didn't respond. Then he looked up and rolled his eyes. Okay, one more trip, that's it. Do you promise? Well, that will be up to Aunt Adelaide, won't it? At Langley's glare, he added, All right, fine, then, one more trip. If I don't find anything definitive, I'll just tell her it was a false reading, and we'll go on our way. All right? Langley looked at Stone like he was trying to figure out what his angle was. Finally, he dropped his hands to his desk. Fine, I'll give her a call. You want to go tonight? The sooner we go, the sooner we can get it over with. This time, instead of one satchel full of bogus gear... 
Stone showed up with the satchel and a pair of boxes in the trunk of the Jaguar. He had also ditched the crazy occult investigator outfit for jeans and a Who concert t-shirt underneath his ubiquitous black wool overcoat. At Langley's raised eyebrow, he pointed out, She already knows I'm not a real investigator. Might as well be comfortable. So what's in the trunk, then? A few bits of measuring equipment I borrowed from a friend. That wasn't true. He'd actually made an afternoon trip to the Weird Stuff warehouse in Sunnyvale and picked up a selection of things with interesting meters and flashing lights. What about your assistant? He won't be joining us today. He has other commitments. Lucky him. Aunt Adelaide was happy to see them, insisting that they sit down and chat for a few minutes over a cup of tea. Are you still experiencing the strange feelings? Stone asked. She nodded, fear showing in her eyes. Not so much the voices now, but I still don't like going into that library. What are you going to do tonight? Just a bit more checking with some new equipment I've brought along. You're welcome to watch if you like. She shook her head. No, thank you. If you don't mind, I'll just stay down here. She shivered a little in emphasis. Pressing Langley into service to help carry boxes, they took the elevator this time, Stone set off for the third floor. He kept his senses open all the way up this time, focusing on anything that seemed out of the ordinary. Now that he knew what he was looking for, there was no question in his mind that it was here. What it was, however, was another matter entirely. He had no idea. Probably wouldn't have had much chance of finding out without doing an actual ritual. And he didn't think his odds of getting one of those past Langley were too good. All he could tell with his limited ability to probe the area was that it was most likely malevolent and it was probably a good deal more powerful than it was letting on. In fact, if anything, it seemed less potent than before. It's hiding, he thought. It knows I'm here, and it knows I can find it, so it's trying to make that difficult. Hey! Langley's voice broke in on his musings. Did you hear me? What? Uh, no. What did you say again? How long do you think this is going to take? No idea. Depends on if I find anything. He took the lead this time, heading for the library. Before entering, he made a quick gesture hidden by his body and felt a shield settle over his mind. He couldn't shield himself completely, not if he wanted to pick anything up, but at least it should keep him from keeling over in a faint if the thing decided to pull any tricks of its own. Langley set down the boxes and moved over to the chair he'd sat in before. You don't need any help, do you? No, you're fine. Quickly, Stone opened the boxes and made a show of setting up his detection gear as quickly as he could. He plugged it in and switched on the various pieces, pleased to see that they were performing as he expected them to. Langley looked up with interest, examining the flashing lights and meters. That stuff is going to help you find the evil boogeyman? he asked in the same sort of tone he'd used to converse with a four-year-old about Santa Claus. Hope so. Stone continued to focus on watching the meters until he heard Langley pick up his book and settle back into his chair. Then he closed his eyes and cleared his mind, reaching out with his senses. Even without the extra effort, he could feel it in here, stronger than outside, but not as strong as before. He was almost certain this wasn't where it lived, though. It was in the house somewhere, or perhaps on the grounds nearby, its power emanating outward. But what was it? Why was it trying to hide from him? If he was going to find it, he'd have to... From far off came a distant popping sound, followed by a scream. Immediately, Stone snapped his senses back and whirled. What was that? Downstairs! Langley was already pulling himself out of the chair. Before he made it up, though, Stone was out of the room and moving fast, taking the stairs downward two at a time at breakneck speed. He skidded to a stop when he reached the ground floor. Adelaide! he yelled. Iona? Are you all right? In here! Iona called from the direction of the TV room. Langley had reached the top of the second floor stairs now, huffing badly. Stone didn't wait for him. He ran into the room and stopped, taking in the scene. Adelaide sat on a chair near the doorway, shaking, her face in her hands. Iona hovered over her, her head swiveling back and forth between the doorway and the television set. The television tube had exploded. Shards of glass and metal covered the rug, the coffee table, and glimmered on the couch where Adelaide and Iona had been sitting. What? Stone began. Langley came barreling up behind him. What happened? he demanded. Then he got a look over Stone's shoulder. Holy shit! At Adelaide! 
He shoved past Stone in the doorway and crunched his way over to his aunt. It... we were just sitting here watching it. Iona was just helping me to the bathroom, and as we were leaving the room, it exploded, Adelaide said, her voice shaking. It was horrible, Iona agreed. Tears streamed down her face. Thank God we'd gotten up when we did, or... Are you hurt? Stone asked. He moved over to the television set, which was still sparking, and surreptitiously used magic to pull the plug from the wall. No, we were far enough away that none of the glass hit us, but look at the floor! Langley looked frazzled. Oh, man, he breathed. If you had been sitting here in front of this... That's it, Aunt Adelaide. You're getting a modern TV, and that's all there is to it. You could have been killed. He took her arm and helped her up. Come on, let's go sit in the other room. You shouldn't be tracking this glass and stuff around. Adelaide allowed Langley to lead her out of the room, with Iona trailing behind them. Coming? he asked over his shoulder to Stone. In a minute, Stone replied, distracted. When the three of them had gone, he squatted down and took a closer look at the destroyed television once again reaching out with his magical senses. He had a suspicion. The explosion had occurred just as he had begun ranging out to try to pinpoint the location of the entity in the house. The entity that didn't want to be found. That was way too much of a coincidence to be a coincidence. It didn't take long. There you are, you bastard, he murmured in triumph. It couldn't completely hide its traces from someone with his power, and now there was no doubt in his mind. The entity, whatever it was, knew he was here and didn't want him to find it, and it was willing to put people in danger to prevent that. He sighed, rising up from his crouch. This was going to make things even more difficult. Before tonight, he'd suspected it was here and didn't know it was dangerous. Now he knew it was both here and willing to hurt the residents of the house. Preoccupied, he headed back out to where the others had gathered in the sitting room. Should probably have an electrician over to look at the wiring, Langley was saying. But I'm guessing that ancient TV you've had practically since I was a kid finally gave up the ghost in blue. Probably, Adelaide conceded. She looked less shaken now, though Iona was still trembling. The old lady looked up as Stone came in. Are you all right, Dr. Stone? You look... odd. Langley shot him a warning look from behind his aunt, and he nodded. I'm fine. I think we should clear out and leave you two alone, Langley said. Promise me you won't go back into that room until you've had someone in there to clean up the mess and haul the TV away, all right? Iona nodded. Don't worry, we won't. I'll have Maurice and Corey come clean it up tomorrow. They're the handyman and one of the landscapers, she added to Stone. Langley, apparently assured that his aunt and Iona had recovered from their shocks, shepherded Stone upstairs to gather his gear. Stone followed willingly, but slowly. What's up? Langley asked him. You look like you're a million miles away. Stone shook his head. Nothing. I'm fine. His mind was moving fast, still trying to figure out a way that he could get himself invited back to the house without either pissing Langley off for breaking his promise or unnecessarily frightening Adelaide. It was getting more imperative now since the entity, whatever it was, had shown that it was willing to do more than just sit back and bide its time. But... He rationalized while disconnecting the meters and stowing them back in the boxes. Maybe I'm the reason it did what it did. It was afraid I was going to find it, so it did something to cause a distraction. If I weren't here... He slung the strap of the leather satchel over his shoulder. He knew it didn't work that way. If there was something here, and it was trying to make contact, it wasn't going to give up. Even if it was willing to wait for now, eventually it would get impatient. If it was gathering power... It would soon grow potent enough that it could do more than frighten mildly sensitive old ladies. He couldn't let that happen. But for now, he was fresh out of acceptable ideas. Back in the car, after they'd bade the ladies good night and put the boxes in the trunk, Langley glanced over at him. That was damned weird, he said. I've never even heard of a TV blowing like that. Not even one that old. Did you ever think perhaps it wasn't the TV? Stone asked carefully, eyes on the road. What do you mean by that? Of course it was the TV. You saw the mess all over the... Wait a minute. He shifted in his seat to glare at Stone. Are you trying to tell me you think this had something to do with all that bullshit you were doing upstairs? Stone shrugged. 
I'm not saying that. I'm just saying that the possibility exists. I was getting some good readings when your aunt screamed down there. Langley let his breath out in a long, loud blast. When he spoke again, his voice held a dangerous edge. Alistair, you promised. You are done with this. There are no spooks in Aunt Adelaide's house, and I'm not going to let you keep scaring her because you've got some wild idea that there are. You got it? Yeah, he said, unwilling to fight about it right now. I've got it. They made the rest of the trip down the hill to Los Gatos in uncomfortable, stony silence. Chapter 12 Ethan shoved the cart up and down the supermarket aisles, his head down and his feet shuffling. Occasionally he'd pause, consult his scrawled list, and toss some item into the basket. He'd been doing this for the last half hour, and had only worked his way through half the list. Part of this was because his mind wasn't even close to being here. His body moved by rote, but his thoughts whirled, chewing with relentless tenacity over the same topics. He wished he could just make them shut up for a while. Nothing was going right. It had been a week and a half since they'd taken his mother to the hospital, and she was still there. He visited her every day, spending hours sitting next to her bed, making small talk when she was lucid, trying to reassure her that everything would be fine and she'd be back home soon even though he couldn't bring himself to believe it any more. When the hospital people or his mother finally kicked him out and ordered him to go home and get some rest, he'd just collapse in front of the television set, turn on something mindless, and spend his evenings in a half-stupor without the motivation to get up and do anything. Every time he thought it might be a good idea to do something other than sit on the couch, his brain steadfastly refused to cooperate. His life had become a groove worn between the apartment and the hospital. He'd thought about calling Stone a couple times, but decided not to. Stone was a strange guy. Ethan couldn't decide whether the mage gave a damn about him as a person or not, or whether he was even supposed to. Ethan was his apprentice. That just meant that Stone was responsible for his magical training. He hadn't signed on to be some kind of father figure or somebody Ethan could dump his load of emotional baggage on. Alistair Stone didn't seem to have a lot of patience with emotional baggage. For that matter, Ethan couldn't really picture him as anyone's father. Stone had actually called twice, but Ethan let the calls go to the answering machine and deliberately waited until he knew the mage would be at Stanford before returning them, so he could leave a vague, I'm fine, I'll let you know when my mom's doing better, message, and not have to talk to him. He didn't know exactly why he didn't want to talk to Stone, but he didn't. Brains were funny like that. Sometimes you just knew you were doing something that didn't make sense, but you did it anyway. He had spent quite a bit of time practicing the levitation spell. In fact, aside from visiting his mother and vegging in front of the TV, the spell was the only thing that motivated him. He had not yet gotten over the fact that he, Ethan Penrose, childhood beloved of bullies everywhere, was now capable of making coins and pencils hover in the air with the power of his mind. It wasn't just coins and pencils, either. He had started out following Stone's directive, lining up bits of change, paper clips, pens and pencils, and other light items on the coffee table in the living room. He practiced visualizing the pattern as Stone had taught him, imposing it on the world and the area occupied by the item, and lifting it up. When he'd gotten to where he could do that, he practiced moving it around until he could make it zip around the room and settle back down in front of him. He couldn't believe how tiring it was, though. Whenever he finished his session of practice, he felt like he'd just spent two hours pumping iron in the gym. Or, more correctly, how he imagined someone must feel after doing that. Ethan had nothing but contempt for the kinds of people who spent their time at the gym lifting weights. He wondered how Stone was able to do the spell so effortlessly. Was it just practice? Experience? It did seem to get a little less exhausting as he went on, but not much. Midway through the previous week, his impatience had gotten the better of him, and he'd started trying larger objects. First one of his mom's pill bottles, then a paperback book, and finally the smallest of the collection of magical tomes Stone had lent him. He'd quickly discovered that the heavier the object was, the more energy he had to expend to make it do his bidding. His first attempt at lifting the magic book had left him bathed in sweat, nauseated, wilted into the couch cushions like he was trying to become a part of them. Was this ever going to be easy? And Stone had said that if he had to, he could lift a small car? Either he was lying, 
or he was a hell of a lot more powerful mage than he was owning up to. Ethan wasn't sure which, and he wasn't sure whether the thought of his being that powerful pleased him, because having a powerful teacher would be a good thing, or frightened him, because the consequences for any screw-ups could be dire indeed. In any case, Stone did seem to be holding up his end of the bargain. Ethan was now capable of performing magic, albeit in a very limited manner. He wanted more, though, and he didn't think Stone would have too much patience with that attitude. He wondered if all apprentices were like him, impatient, dazzled by the potential of what they'd be able to do some day, and chafing at having to wait months, possibly years, before they'd be able to even start thinking of themselves as real mages. Ah, well. It wasn't like he had a choice. He could read the books Stone gave him and try to learn what they taught, but he didn't exactly know where to go to buy more magic books and he doubted that there were any other mages in the phone book he could call for some supplemental training. He was at the mercy of Stone's schedule, and that was all there was to it. But until his mother was stable and able to come home, it wouldn't do him any good to get back into the habit of studying regularly with Stone. That was just a reality he'd have to accept. Maybe it was the universe's way of teaching him patience. He'd finally broken away from his grueling schedule of visiting the hospital, sleeping in front of the TV, and levitating objects around the room, when he'd hauled himself up to get something to eat and found the cupboards and fridge nearly bare. When Mom had been home, Mrs. Hooper had taken care of most of the shopping, with Ethan being sent out to pick up occasional one-off items. But now that Mom was in the hospital, there was no need for the caregiver to be here. That left things up to him. Fortunately, Mom had left a credit card that he could use for groceries and household emergencies, so he'd taken a fast shower, thrown on some clean clothes, and set off for the supermarket. And that was why he was walking around in a half-stupor, trying to track down the items on his list and get back home in case the hospital called. Hey, watch where you're going! Ethan was startled out of his fog by a sharp female voice. He looked up quickly. A woman a few years older than he was had ducked down and was in the process of picking up several cans that had scattered when he'd apparently hit her with his cart. I, I'm sorry, he said quickly, moving to help her gather her stuff. Oh, wow, I'm so sorry. I wasn't looking at all. I... She balanced three of the cans on top of each other and rose, flashing him a grin. Don't worry about it, she assured him, reaching out to take the two that he'd picked up. Should have gotten a basket. She was tall and slim dressed in tight, artfully ripped jeans, and a t-shirt from a band Ethan had never heard of. Her dark red hair was cut short, her makeup in an understated punk style. Ethan sighed. I really am sorry. Hey, it's okay, she said. Seriously, no big deal. She looked him up and down with appraising eyes. Have I seen you around here before? You look familiar. Uh. For a moment, he literally couldn't think of anything to say. It was like the gear that connected his brain to his mouth slipped, and his thoughts were spinning their wheels. Maybe, he finally said, mentally kicking himself. Smooth, real smooth. She had a series of intricate tattoos on her forearms, and her fingernails were painted a deep blood red. I don't bite, she said, laughing. I promise. Not unless you want me to, anyway. He laughed a little, hoping he didn't sound forced. She was very attractive. You know, I'm sure I've seen you around here before, she said. I'm good with faces. My name's Trina, by the way. I'm, uh, Ethan. How can you forget your own name? Ethan Penrose. I guess you might have seen me. I don't live too far from here. Ethan Penrose. Why does that name sound familiar? She considered for a moment, then shook her head. I can't remember. I'd swear I've heard it before. She shuffled the five cans in her hands when one started to slide off. Hey, Ethan said quickly, recovering his manners and indicating his cart. Why don't you put that stuff in here for a minute and I'll go get you a basket? That's the least I could do after I tried to murder you with my cart. Sure, she said. Thanks. He returned after a moment, doing his best not to run. You know what? she asked as she retrieved her items from the cart and stacked them in the basket. I notice you don't have anything frozen in there. There's a Pete's, a couple of doors down from here. Want to go get a cup of coffee or something? I'm still convinced I recognize your name from somewhere, and I want a little more time to try to figure it out. 
She punctuated her words with a smile that made something deep inside of him feel very pleased with itself. He tried not to stare. This woman, this attractive, sexy, older woman, who clearly had no idea the effect she was having on him, actually wanted to have coffee with him? She didn't want to get away from his geeky, awkward self as fast as she could? Uh, sure. Yeah, that, that'd that be cool, he said before she could change her mind and realize who she was talking to. I'm almost done here. I'll just finish up and... Sure thing, she said, smiling wider. Tell you what, I'll just go pay for my stuff and stash it in my car, then go over there and wait for you. She reached out with one red-nailed hand and touched his arm briefly. See you soon, Ethan Penrose. He waited for her to disappear around the end of an aisle before he let all the air out of his lungs in a rush, gripping the cart's handle for support. He had no idea what that had been, but he wasn't going to argue with it. It had taken him half an hour to finish the first half of the list. He did the second half in five minutes. Hurrying to the checkout line, he let his thoughts spin off freely, weaving all sorts of scenarios. Some of them even seemed plausible. He stowed the groceries in the trunk of his mother's car and forced himself to walk nonchalantly down to the coffee shop, in case she was watching out the window. He half expected that she wouldn't even be there. Girls had pulled that one on him a few times during his early years in high school. But no, there she was, sitting in a secluded corner. She waved as he came in and motioned him over. He looked around, seeing but not really noticing the other patrons. A woman with a laptop computer, an older man reading a newspaper, and two young men a little older than he was, seated on the opposite side of the room. Ethan dropped down in another chair opposite Trina. Hold on she said. Let me get us something. She headed off and returned in a few moments with a couple of steaming cups of coffee. Once she'd settled back in, she smiled at him. So, I've still been trying to figure out where I know you from. I don't think we went to school together. I'd remember you, I think. She tilted her head. How old are you, anyway? Twenty or so? Yeah, twenty. Almost twenty-one. It slipped out before his mental sensors could amend it. She nodded, sipping her coffee. Wait, I know. Maybe it was at a club. What kind of music are you into? Ethan had never been to a club in his life, but he wasn't about to admit it. Instead, he shrugged, trying to look nonchalant. I like lots of stuff. Punk, metal. He glanced down at her t-shirt. Those guys local? She looked down. Oh, IED? They're based up in the city. Ever been to Will to Power? Nah. He decided to risk a little bit of the truth. My mom's sick, so I mostly stay down here and help take care of her when she needs it. Aw, that's nice, she said. Nothing serious, I hope. He didn't answer. Instead, he took a sip of coffee and caught himself once again looking at the tattoos on her forearms. They were very intricate, and the more he looked at them the more he couldn't shake the nagging feeling that he'd seen them, or something like them, somewhere before. "'See something you like?' she asked wryly. "'Oh!' His eyes came up and he chuckled, suddenly more self-conscious than before. I "'I'm sorry. Uh, I, uh, that's some awesome ink you've got there.' She grinned. "'Yeah, isn't it? The artist did a great job. Hurt like a bitch, though, and he had a hell of a time getting them right.' And then suddenly he realized why the tattoos looked familiar. He'd seen versions of some of them in the magic books Stone had given him to read. Something must have changed in his expression because Trina frowned. You okay, Ethan? You look strange all of a sudden. He swallowed and shook his head, trying to figure out a way to bring up what was on his mind without sounding like a total idiot if he was wrong. I'm... yeah, I'm, I'm fine. After a moment, he nodded towards the tattoos and asked, What do they mean? If it's okay to ask, I mean, if they're personal... She smiled. Well, they are personal, but I don't mind if you ask. They're magical symbols. Her green, unblinking eyes met his. Magical. Yep. He forced himself to grin. So, are you like a witch or something? Her expression didn't change. Yep. She nodded. You can leave if you want. I won't mind. Sometimes it puts people off. Or else they don't believe me. I get that a lot. 
Ethan didn't leave, though. Instead, he reached down and fumbled in his backpack. He still had one of Stone's books inside, along with a sweatshirt and some notebooks. Not sure he should really be doing what he was doing, he pulled it out of the pack and set it on the table next to his coffee cup. He didn't say anything. Trina looked at the book, then at Ethan. Her expression was neutral, revealing nothing of what she was thinking. She indicated the book with a head motion. Mind if I... G go ahead. Ethan felt strange, almost disassociated from himself. He felt like he was standing on the edge of a precipice, or in an open doorway, and that his next actions, whatever they ended up being, would be some of the most important he'd ever taken in his life. Be careful, a little voice told him. Don't let this get away from you. Smiling encouragement, she glanced around to make sure nobody was watching, then made a small gesture and the book floated up into her hands. She leaned back in her chair and paged through it, occasionally nodding or murmuring something to herself that Ethan couldn't hear. Ethan watched her, sitting stiffly forward, scared of what she might say. She'd just proven it. She wasn't lying about being magical. He suspected she'd done that on purpose, to put him at ease. It wasn't working too well. After several minutes, she set the book back down on the table. Well, she said with an odd, faraway smile, I guess that explains where I might have heard of you. Really? He was surprised. How? You're an apprentice, aren't you? Ethan swallowed. He was wishing now that he had never run his cart into this very attractive young woman. This was all moving way too fast. I'm not sure I should be... She laughed. Don't worry about it, Ethan. I won't tell anyone. Why would I? It sounds like you and I are the same. You're an apprentice, too? He looked up at her. She seemed too old, and far too sure of herself to be at the same stage of her training as he was. Well, I didn't mean it like that, she said. I'm not. Not anymore. I just meant that we're both students of the art. Not that many of us around. It's good to find each other, right? I'm not sure, he began. He took a deep breath. I'm not sure I'm supposed to be telling anyone. Why not? Her laugh was amused. I mean, of course we're not supposed to tell anyone who isn't one of us, but what's the harm in meeting others? Doesn't it feel lonely sometimes, being the only one? Only having your master to talk to? He had to nod. He couldn't even talk about magic with his mother. Not really. It wasn't just that she was so sick that he didn't want to bother her with it. It was that he didn't feel like he could really explain it to her even if she was healthy and wanted to hear it. Aside from her, there was only stone. I... Yeah, sometimes it does. Mind if I ask who your master is? She was still looking neutrally interested, like she was enjoying having a chance to chat with someone who shared her favorite subjects. He hesitated. Wow, you are a newbie, aren't you? Again she laughed, but this time it held the tiniest hint of mocking. Don't worry, Ethan. Seriously. It sounds like whoever he or she is, they've got you pretty worried about giving anything away. So you don't have to tell me if you don't want to. Suddenly Ethan felt stupid and embarrassed. Here he was, talking to the only other mage he'd ever met in his life besides Stone, and his father long ago and he was acting like a frightened five-year-old. His name's Alistair Stone, he said, his voice taking on a little defiance. He lives up in Palo Alto. She considered. Stone. Hmm. Sounds familiar. Oh, right. British guy, early thirties. Tall, thin, dark hair, kinda hot in a geeky way. Something burned a little inside Ethan when she said kinda hot, but he shoved it down and nodded. That's him, yeah. Do you know him? No, of him. Never met him. We don't exactly travel in the same circles. I can see why you're so scared of letting anything slip, though. She tossed the book back on the table. Why is that? Ethan finished up his coffee and stowed the book in his pack. She shrugged. Stone's kind of old school. He's young, but he was trained by the old guard, and it shows. He's actually a pretty big deal power-wise, but you'd never know it since he kind of does his own thing. Don't tell me, she added, grinning. 
He gets all authoritarian on you and gives you these big lectures about what you are and aren't supposed to do and tells you it'll take you years to get through your apprenticeship. Ethan nodded, torn between how great Trina's tight t-shirt looked as she breathed and not wanting to say anything against Stone. Yeah, kind of. But he's a good teacher, he added quickly. Oh, I'm sure he is. I've heard he's a fantastic teacher. And if you can stand working with him until he decides you're done, he'll probably teach you some great stuff. She smiled and glanced at her watch. Hey, listen, Ethan, I've got to get going. But I'd like to get together again, if that's okay with you. He nodded. That'd be cool, he agreed. He was relieved that she wasn't talking about Stone anymore, but also didn't want their conversation to end. Tell you what, there's a little thing at the dark wave in Sunnyvale this Friday night. I'm going to be there with some friends. You want to join us? It's 18 over, so it's okay that you're not 21 yet. Ethan forced himself not to sound too eager. This was the first time in his life that anybody had invited him to this sort of event. He thought briefly of his mother, but it would be at night. Visiting hours would be over anyway. She'd probably be happy that he was finally getting himself a social life. Yeah, he said. I'd like that. Pause, and then, are your friends? She grinned. Yeah, so you'll have a chance to meet some more of us, if you want. She reached into her small leather bag, pulled out a card, and wrote a time and an address on the back next to the words, Nightmare Room. Here's where the party is. Starts at ten, but things don't really get going until midnight. If you have any trouble getting in, just tell him you're with me. She handed him the card, brushing his fingertips with hers. I really hope to see you there, Ethan. Oh, she added, getting up. One more thing. He was studying the card and trying to hold on to the tingle in his fingers where she'd touched him. What's that? For the first time she hesitated, looking nervous. I hate to say this because I don't want to encourage you to do anything you're not comfortable with, but would it be okay if you didn't mention to Dr. Stone that we met? Like I said, he's pretty old school, and I'm not sure he'd approve of you meeting other mages this early in your training. I really don't want him showing up at my place going all wrath of God on me for messing with his apprentice or telling you he doesn't want us getting together anymore. She rolled her eyes. Trust me, from what I've heard, that guy might seem nice, but you don't want to piss him off. And I'd feel pretty guilty if he decided to cut you loose because you're not lockstepping along with his rules. Ethan nodded. I won't tell him. He felt weird about that. Keeping secrets from his master this early in his training didn't seem like the right thing to do. But Stone didn't have to know everything about his life. It wasn't like Trina was going to be teaching him any magic or anything like that. They were just going to hang out, talk a little, and maybe he'd get somebody else's perspective on the way things worked in the magical realm. Hell, Stone had even mentioned that most people who were talented knew about it when they were a lot younger than he was, and that probably meant that by the time they started their apprenticeships, they knew a lot more general stuff about the arcane than he did. So, what would be the harm? Great, she said. Damn, but she had a nice smile. She leaned down and brushed a kiss on the top of his head. See you Friday, then. I think you and my other friends will get along great. And then she was gone, leaving Ethan to sit in his chair and watch the door where she'd exited. His thoughts were already far away, though. He didn't even notice anything odd when the two young men, one blonde, one dark-haired, got up and left the coffee shop a couple of minutes later. And it was several minutes after that when he remembered that he had a trunk full of groceries he really needed to get home. Oliver was laughing his ass off as the three drove north towards San Francisco. You played that kid like a rented violin, he told Trin from the driver's seat. I wonder if he's even been that close to a girl before, Miguel said from the back. Shit, I feel bad for the coffee shop guy, having to clean up all that drool off his chair after he leaves. Now, now, Trina said with a wicked grin. He's a nice boy. I just showed him a little attention is all. She stared out the window, thinking. It'll be a little harder than I thought, though. I didn't know his master was Alistair Stone. So? Miguel asked. She shrugged. Stone's a strange one. He's an academic, mostly. Keeps to himself. But he's got a reputation for being smart and good at reading people. 
not to mention dangerous as fuck if you get him pissed off. We'll have to be careful. The kid said he wouldn't mention us to him, but he's weak. If Stone catches on that something's up, he'll have it out of the kid in five minutes. And then we could be in trouble if we haven't gotten what we need from him yet. Oliver made a contemptuous noise. Come on, Trin. No way Stone could stand up to all three of us. He's a white mage, right? That means he'll suck in a fight. We'd wipe the floor with him. Maybe, but I'd rather not have to, she said. Not directly, anyway. We can't be personally involved. But it would be better if Ethan didn't talk to him before Friday. Let me talk to a couple of people and see what they can do for us to make that happen. Sometimes the mundane way is the best way of dealing with this sort of thing. Chapter 13 Stone was working late in his office on Thursday night. His course on modern occult practices was particularly popular with the horror writer's set, which meant that any essays he assigned usually came back with far more detail than he'd asked for, or really wanted to read. He liked their enthusiasm, but always had to allow extra time for grading their essays. He leaned back in his chair after finishing up one particularly purple specimen, raising his arms in a stretch and luxuriating in the satisfying pops up and down his back. A glance at the clock told him it was already after eight. He'd been here, hunched over his desk, for more than three hours following his last class of the day. There were still at least ten more essays to go. If he did them tonight, he wouldn't get out of here for at least another couple of hours, and he'd half-promised Megan that he'd take her out to dinner. They hadn't seen each other for a few days, since preparing upcoming final exams for their respective courses had taken up most of their time. Right now, Stone wasn't missing his time with Ethan. If he'd had the boys' magic lessons in addition to his course load, even the few hours of sleep per night that he'd been getting lately would have become a luxury. He wasn't exactly glad that Ethan hadn't called, but he hadn't done anything about it from his end either. Sighing, he ran a hand through his hair a habitual gesture that tended to make the front of it perpetually stick up in random, untidy spikes, and rose from the chair. Tomorrow, he muttered, gathering the ungraded essays, stuffing them in a folder, and filing them in his desk. The graded ones went into a different folder in the same drawer. Then he picked up the phone and tried Megan's office on campus. She wasn't there. Well, at least somebody has the sense to leave work at a proper time, he continued under his breath hanging up and dialing her home number instead. She didn't answer there either, but that didn't surprise him. She was probably on her way home or stopping to run errands. He left a message telling her he was leaving and that he'd pick her up in an hour, then shrugged into his overcoat, picked up his briefcase, and locked the office door behind him. The building was deserted, as was the area around it, but this didn't concern Stone. In the distance, he could see the pinprick lights of students' bicycles as they rode by, heading toward the more central areas of the campus, along with the occasional car's headlights filtering between the trees and the buildings. The ancient, ivy-covered building housing his office was about as far as it could be from the middle of campus and still be part of Stanford proper. It amused him more than offended him that cult studies was one of a number of small fringe programs that didn't get much respect next to their more prestigious counterparts in the sciences, arts, and medicine. After all, He'd known the way things were when he'd accepted the post in the department two years ago, which had brought the number of faculty members associated with it to exactly three. The other two were a stodgy old woman named Edwina Mortensen, who'd been threatening to retire for the last several years, and a failed horror author named Mackenzie Hubbard, who did as little as possible while using his free periods to pound out more unsaleable prose. Neither of them thought much of Stone who had come in and revitalized the department with his youth and charismatic lecturing style to the point where enrollments were actually up. The program was, for the first time in its history, not living in perpetual fear of landing on the chopping block next time there were budget cuts. Stone exited the building and headed for his car. There was a parking lot closer to his building, but he chose to park the Jaguar in one a couple of blocks further away due to the fact that he didn't like leaving it under trees and dealing with the leaves and bird droppings he'd find on it every day. The lot wasn't quite deserted. There were still quite a few evening courses that hadn't let out yet. The Jaguar was right where he'd left it, three spaces down from the nearest overhead light. He was already going over possibilities for restaurants to suggest to Megan, 
when he drew close to it and noticed that its rear driver-side tire had gone flat. "'Oh, bugger,' he muttered, dropping his briefcase and leaning down to examine it more closely. He, or rather his mechanic, kept the car in good repair, and there was certainly no reason why the tire should have died on its own. He must have run over a nail or something. Frustrated, he bent over more, wondering if he should risk a light spell to see if he could spot the damage. He also wondered if he should try to change the tire on his own, or if he'd need to trudge back up to his office and call campus services to come and do it for him. Either way, this was definitely going to make getting home on time to have dinner with Megan problematic. He was so preoccupied with his thoughts that he didn't hear the silent figures approaching until they were upon him. One grabbed the back of his collar and pulled him upright, while another, dark, shadowy, and masked, drove a meaty fist into his stomach and doubled him back over. He dropped to his knees, all the air forced out of him by the punch. He tried to form the pattern of a spell, but his attackers didn't let up long enough to allow it. The one that had hold of his collar let go, instead grabbing his arm and yanking him back up to a standing position, locking it behind his back in an iron grip. The other thug gave him a couple more shots to the gut, followed by a cross to the jaw. The first attacker released his arm, and he staggered back, slammed into the jaguar, and fell to the ground. Lights danced in front of his vision. He could feel himself starting to black out. Again he tried to form a spell, but again his head lit up with pain, and the pattern skittered away, eluding him. With no other ideas presenting themselves, he drew his legs up into him and tried to protect his head with his arms. He hoped that whatever they wanted, it wasn't to kill him, since he couldn't see any way he could stop them. The two were silent and efficient in their work. Stone heard nothing but their breathing as they snapped three hard kicks into his ribs, then one to his head that he was able to deflect most of by shifting position at the last minute. He heard a moan and realized it was coming from him. A far-off voice yelled something that sounded like, Hey! Hands fumbled in his coat, and then the sound of running feet. He tried to force himself out of his fetal position, to fling a spell at the retreating attackers, but the pain was coming from everywhere at once and only got worse when he moved. I wonder where that voice came from. He was his last thought before he passed out. He opened his eyes to find two blurred, worried-looking faces hovering over him. Oh, God, one of them breathed. Female. He's awake. Stay still, sir. We don't know how bad you're hurt. Paul's gone off to find an ambulance. He was still on his side, still tightly pulled up into the fetal ball. He tasted hot blood and felt small rocks from the parking lot cutting into his cheek. A crumbled candy wrapper lay a few inches from his face. He tried to say something, but it came out as an inarticulate groan. "'Please don't move,' another voice urged, male this time, young. They both sounded like students, and both sounded scared. "'Help's coming soon!' Ignoring them both, Stone gritted his teeth and tried to straighten his legs. "'Big mistake.' His entire midsection burst with pain, as if someone had lit him on fire. A weak little scream forced itself out between his teeth as he rolled himself onto his back, eyes clamped shut. Here, hold on. The female student's voice shook. She fumbled for a moment, and then there was something soft under his head. Better? He nodded, not trusting his voice. Lying still now, he tried to take inventory past the layers of cotton wool that were packing his brain. His stomach hurt, and he was vaguely nauseated. The back of his head throbbed, a dull, digging ache that hurt like the world's worst migraine. His jaw stung, and he still tasted blood, and worst of all, his lower ribs felt like each one was traced with its own personal line of white-hot fire. Might be cracked, but he was afraid to move any more to check. The female student put a warm hand on his forehead, shoving his damp hair back. "'What's your name, sir?' He had to give that some thought. S stone Do you teach here? We couldn't find your ID. Stone opened his eyes. The female student was crouched next to him, while the male was upright, keeping watch, either for the ambulance or to make sure that the thugs weren't coming back. I... He nodded. Y yes He waved vaguely and immediately regretted it. Please, you shouldn't talk any more. Just lie still. Listen he whispered. When the girl leaned in, he continued, Call, call Megan. Megan 
Whitney English Department. Tell her I'll be late. Then the cotton wool finally closed in, and he didn't get to find out whether she'd gotten the message correct. Chapter 14 When Stone dragged himself back up to consciousness, the students were gone. He was lying on a narrow bed with rails that were surrounded by a fabric curtain and lit with harsh fluorescence. Beyond it were the sounds of hurried footsteps and busy people calling to each other. There was a chair next to the bed, and sitting in the chair was Megan. She looked up, startled, from the magazine she was paging through. Relief washed over her face. Alistair, oh my, my God, what happened? Someone called me. She reached out and gently clutched one of his hands. They said someone beat you up in the parking lot at your office. He nodded. Risking the pain, he pulled himself up slightly so he could get a look at himself. His shirt was gone, and the lower part of his ribs wrapped in heavy white tape. An IV tube snaked from his arm up to a plastic bag of clear liquid. Reaching up with his other hand, he felt the back of his head. No bandage there. "'You've got a nasty lump back there,' she said. "'I should let the doctor give you the details, but it sounds like you got lucky. Two cracked ribs on your right side, but nothing badly broken— and they don't think you have any internal injuries. Possible mild concussion. They said they want to keep you overnight for observation. Sorry, he murmured, trying for a smile. Guess I'll have to give you a rain check on dinner, won't I? He looked around. What time is it? He tried to make his voice sound stronger, but it came out as a weak croak. About ten. I got the call from some girl, a student. I guess she must have found my number somewhere. She said she and her friends came upon you getting beaten up by two thugs next to your car. Can you tell me what happened? He looked around. Wherever he was, it didn't look like a hospital room. Where is this? His voice sounded a little stronger now, but putting any volume behind it hurt. Emergency room, she said. The doctor should be in soon to talk to you. Once he figured out you weren't in any danger, he went off to deal with other patients. She squeezed his hand. Do you have any idea why someone would beat you up? He shrugged, which also hurt. He could already tell this was going to be inconvenient. No idea. Robbery, possibly? Did they take my wallet? I vaguely remember someone feeling around in my coat before I passed out. I think they must have. They didn't find it on you when they took your clothes. She sighed. Did you get a look at them? He thought about that, trying to picture them. No, never saw one of them, and the other one was wearing a mask. All I saw was that he was big, heavier than I am, but not as tall. Not much help, I'm afraid. I'm sure the police will want to talk to you when you're feeling better, but for now try to get some rest, okay? How do you feel? Ghastly. Why haven't they given me any of the good drugs? I thought that was the whole point of hospitals. I think they wanted to make sure you weren't masking any pain that they needed to pay attention to. She squeezed his hand again. He nodded. I really appreciate you coming, Megan, but you should go home now. I'll be all right. There's no point in you sitting here watching me lie around in bed, and I don't fancy worrying about you being out late when there are dangerous sorts running loose. He gave her a pained smile. Don't worry about me, really. I'll be fine. I'm tougher than I look. That wouldn't be difficult, she said, chuckling, leaning down to brush a kiss on his lips. Then she grew serious again. I hope they catch the guys who did this soon. I hate to think they're running around campus and this might happen again. As Megan had predicted, they kept Stone overnight at the hospital for observation to make sure that his minor concussion wasn't anything more serious. The fact that he didn't protest would have told anyone who knew him that he wasn't feeling well at all, because he normally hated anything to do with doctors or hospitals. A young policeman showed up in the morning to take his statement about what had happened. The campus police had recovered his wallet not far from where the Jaguar was parked. It was missing the cash and his credit cards, but fortunately, they'd left his driver's license. He told the cop what he knew, which wasn't much. The doctor finally sprung him around noon on Friday. 
Megan took time off from her classes to pick him up and take him back to his townhouse. She found him in his hospital room, standing in the bathroom clad only in jeans and examining the blossoming collection of bruises on his chest, abdomen, and chin in the mirror. They already took off the rib wrap? she asked. Apparently they don't do that anymore. Something about pneumonia. You look a lot better than last night, even with the bruises. That's because they've got me dosed on so many painkillers that you could hit me with a baseball bat and I wouldn't notice. He grinned, a little glassy-eyed. And I've got a prescription for more. Oh, nice. Well, let's get you home and you can spend some quality time resting. No argument. And no baseball bats. Yes, ma'am, he said. She helped him get dressed, and he followed her slowly out toward her car. Where is the Jaguar, by the way? At your place. They fixed the tire and dropped it off over there this morning. Oh, you might be interested to know that you didn't run over anything. Somebody let the air out of it. He frowned. Which means they were lying in wait for me. Odd. He filed that thought away for the moment as the nurse came in with his discharge papers. Megan took him home and hovered over him until he was safely in bed. Mrs. Oliveira, who was there cleaning the place, promised to check in on him periodically. I'm not a bloody invalid, he protested, glaring at both of them. Both of you, I appreciate your concern, I really do, but I'd appreciate it even more now if you'd both just clear out and leave me to recuperate in peace. Megan kissed his forehead. I'm going now, but if you're a good little boy and listen to Mrs. Oliveira, I might bring you some ice cream tonight. Off you go, he ordered, making a shooing motion. Once he was alone, the first thing Stone did was call Ethan. The boy wasn't home, but he left a message on his machine asking about his mother and informing him that it would be at least Monday before he could get back to any further magic lessons Ethan might want to restart. Then he lay back on the pillows in frustration. Alistair Stone was a terrible patient. He hated inactivity more than almost anything else, and the thought of being stuck in bed for even the next day or two annoyed him. Another thing that annoyed him was how easily he'd been jumped. No two ways about it. He simply hadn't been paying attention. And worse, he hadn't been prepared. If he'd been in any kind of magical fighting trim, he could have summoned up a shield and a stun spell, and had the two attackers laid out on the pavement before they'd done more than hit him once. Instead, he'd let himself be a victim. Indirectly, in Stone's somewhat skewed way of looking at the world, this made his injuries his own damned fault which meant that they didn't deserve coddling when there were things to be done. Frowning, he sat up, testing his ribs. They didn't hurt much right now, due to the pain pills, and neither did the rest of him. The doctor had told him that moving around wouldn't do him any harm as long as he didn't overdo it, though it might be better if he'd just rest for at least the first day. The hell with that. He got out of bed, pulled on jeans and his favorite Pink Floyd t-shirt, and headed slowly downstairs. In all likelihood, he would never be attacked again, but if he was, he was bloody well going to be ready for it. Managing to avoid Mrs. Oliveira as he worked his way down toward his basement workroom, he closed and locked the door behind him. Yes, it was a little dangerous if something went wrong and he passed out again, but he always kept this room locked. Wouldn't do to have one's housekeeper, or one's girlfriend, finding one's magical sanctum. Far too many messy questions to answer. Moving slowly, he gathered the items he'd need, glad he'd stocked up a few weeks ago. Practicing magic while in the grip of powerful painkillers was one thing, but he thought if he tried to leave the house and drive, Mrs. Oliveira would wrestle him to the floor and sit on him until he saw sense. The thought amused him as he dumped the items on the table in the middle of the room and set about his work. Chapter 15 It was 11.30 on Friday night. Ethan looked at his watch again to verify it. Was this late enough, or should he wait until midnight? He was sitting in his car a couple of blocks down from Dark Wave. The club took up an entire block of Murphy Street and Sunnyvale, which was a small street mostly full of ethnic restaurants and smaller dance clubs. He'd driven past it and could already hear the pounding beat coming from inside. Several knots of people, dressed in everything from ripped jeans to leathers to sleek suits, mini skirts, and slinky gowns, lounged around outside, smoking and chatting. 
If it hadn't been for the memory of Trina's dazzling green eyes and the way she'd smile at him when she'd given him the card with the information about the party, Ethan would have just driven on past and back home. This wasn't his kind of place. Sure, he desperately wanted it to be, but all through high school he had steadfastly lacked whatever gene was necessary to understand the vagaries of the cool kids. Even when he tried to get the latest hot fashion item, listen to the latest hot band, or otherwise poke hopefully at the edges of that rarefied territory, it always seemed like he was a week late and everyone else had moved on. The cool kids didn't exactly bother him about it. By high school he'd grown sufficiently, and was attractive enough that he didn't fit in with the habitually bullied either. But sometimes he thought what they did was even worse. They pretty much ignored him. He was halfway convinced that when he arrived inside, Trina and whatever mage friends she'd promised to bring along wouldn't be there. Sure, she'd showed up at the coffee shop, but this was different. Girls, women, like her, weren't into guys like him. That was just the way of the world. He'd never know if he didn't try, though. The worst that could happen was that he'd have to hang out there by himself for a while before heading home. He might even meet somebody else. He really did need a social life, even if it didn't involve other mages. He'd been thinking about that a lot today as he sat on the couch watching a mindless game show after visiting his mother at the hospital. She was doing a little better, but the earliest she might be able to come home was next week. Aside from her, his only regular contact with other people was Stone, and he wasn't exactly best buddy material. He'd heard the phone ring today, and listened as Stone left the message saying he wouldn't be available until Monday. He'd sounded oddly strained. Sick, maybe. Ethan wasn't sure he was glad about it, because it meant he didn't have to keep putting the mage off, or resentful because Stone was supposed to be teaching him magic, never mind the fact that he himself was the one who'd been slowing things down. He sighed, getting out of the car. He checked himself in the side mirror, black IED t-shirt he'd picked up at Paramount Imports, the trendiest jeans he owned, hair artfully must. It was the best he could do. He hoped it was enough not to get him laughed out of the place. As he walked up, Ethan felt the eyes of the lurkers outside on him, scrutinizing, evaluating, judging. They didn't say anything, though, at least nothing he could hear. The doorman didn't look twice at him, just took his cover charge, checked his ID, said, have fun, and motioned him inside. Inside, the music was even louder. It pounded all around him, getting into his bones and making him feel alive. He didn't know the band, but he didn't care. Ducking off into an alcove, he consulted the card Trina had given him, and her offhand scrawl was a name, Nightmare Room. He glanced around, but didn't see anything by that name, so he moved further into the club. The place was packed now, writhing bodies on the dance floor mingling effortlessly with the knots of people on the sidelines drinking, talking, and soaking up the music. The band on stage pumped out the decibels with enthusiasm, their lead singer running all over the stage and occasionally diving into the crowd. When this happened, a cheer went up, and hands shuttled him back to the edge of the stage, ripping at his clothes and screaming their approval. Ethan headed to the bar. It took him a while to get the attention of the attractive female bartender, but finally she smiled at him. "'Sorry, honey,' she said, pointing at his arm. "'No wristband, no alcohol. Club policy.' "'What?' He hadn't even been thinking about alcohol, so her words confused him for a moment. Oh, no, I don't want a drink. I'm trying to find the nightmare room. The what? A cheer had gone up again as the singer had tossed himself once more into the crowd. The nightmare room, he yelled. Oh. She pointed towards some stairs on the far side of the room. It's up there. Invitation only, though. He grinned at her. I've got an invitation. I hope. She flashed him a dazzling smile and a thumbs up, then went back to her duties. Doubt rose within him as he mounted the stairs. He was certain he was about to be humiliated. At the top were double doors painted black and festooned with frightening figures in fluorescent paint that glowed under the club's black lights. Two large men in matching suits lounged on either side of the doors. When they saw Ethan, they looked at each other and smirked. Back downstairs, kid, one of them said pointing back the way Ethan had come. Invitation only up here. Here goes nothing. I'm with Trina's group, he said, 
injecting as much confidence as he could into the words. My name's Ethan Penrose. Calling on the memory of his elation when he realized he really was a mage, he met the speaker's gaze with a steady one of his own and waited. The two bouncers glanced at each other. Yeah, right, said one. But the other one held up a wait-here hand and slipped inside. After a moment he came back, looking stunned. Damned if he isn't, he muttered. Ethan had to read lips to get it, but he grinned as the other one, looking equally flummoxed, opened the door and motioned him inside. The nightmare room was much smaller than the one downstairs, and once the door was shut, almost all of the sound from there was blocked, replaced by the beat of another band Ethan could see on a stage at the other end of the room. This music wasn't pounding or loud. It was eerie, atmospheric, and downright creepy. Ethan loved it. Feeling much more confident now, he glanced around, taking in the scene and looking for Trina. The room was dotted with tiny tables only big enough for two people, three if they were very friendly. Opposite the band was a small bar, manned by a slender young man in a black suit. There was sort of a dance floor in the middle, but nobody was dancing. The closest was that a few couples, both opposite sex and same, stood around with their arms draped over each other, swaying in time with the strange rhythm of the music. Ethan wondered how many mages there were in here. Then he spotted Trina. She was sitting at a table at the edge of the room, lounging in her chair like she owned the place, and flanked by two young men, one blonde and one dark. All three were dressed in black, leather and ripped denim and hints of velvet and silk. Even fashion-blind Ethan could tell that they weren't following trends here. They were setting them. A flash of jealousy rippled through his mind at the sight of the men. He wondered if they were the friends she'd spoken of, and realized that subconsciously he just assumed they'd be female. She spotted him and grinned, motioning him over. She said something to the blonde man who got up, grabbed a chair from another table, and plopped it down. He and the dark-haired man pushed their chairs back to make room. Trina herself didn't move. Hey, she greeted. I hoped you'd make it, was beginning to wonder. The door guys didn't give you any trouble? It was still a little hard to hear in here, but much better than downstairs. Nah, Ethan said, trying his best to sound nonchalant. Excellent. She indicated first the blonde man, then the dark-haired one. These are my friends, Oliver and Miguel. Guys, this is Ethan, the one I was telling you about. He's one of us. Oliver nodded to him. Another one, huh? Cool. Not many of us around the area. He motioned at the chair. Take a load off. Miguel looked him up and down as he settled into it. Hey, was all he said. Trina raised a hand, and in a few moments a cocktail waitress in a leather miniskirt and bustier came over with a tray, setting drinks down in front of each of them. You do drink, don't you, Ethan? Uh... He glanced at their arms. None of them were wearing the wristbands from downstairs. Sure, he said a little defiantly. Thanks. Picking up the glass, he took a sip. It was spicy and had an odd aftertaste. So, she continued to the other two, Ethan's an apprentice. Yeah, I miss those times. Pain in the ass, but looking back, it was a hell of a trip. Having all that potential and knowing what you're going to be able to do. Miguel nodded. You got that right. Addressing Ethan, he said, So, what are you learning? How long have you been at it? He threw back half his drink and fixed him with a snaky smile. Still pretty new, Ethan admitted. My, um, master likes to take things slow. The word sounded so strange, so old-fashioned. Miguel raised an eyebrow. Really? So do I. Maybe I should hook up with him sometime. Trina shot him a look, but he just grinned. Don't worry, Trina said. It might seem slow now, but before long you'll be doing things you never believed were possible. That's what rocks so much about magic. There's really no limit to what you can do. Well, no limit except your own will, and how far you want to take it. We could help you with that, you know, Miguel said, watching the band. You can? He shrugged. Sure. 
We could show you a few things. That's the way it is with mages. We learn from each other. Ethan hid his nervousness under taking another sip of his drink. What had Stone told him about seeking out supplemental instruction? He'd made a huge point back at the beginning about setting the pace, and Ethan would just have to live with that. I... He took a deep breath. I probably shouldn't. I'm not really supposed to be studying anything outside of what Dr. Stone's teaching me. Oliver snorted. <laughs> yeah, of course not. He'd say that, wouldn't he? He just wants to control you, man. They're all like that, the old guard. They want to keep everything under wraps. They don't even understand the way magic can sing if you let it. He's not old, Ethan protested, nettled. He just wants to make sure I learn it right. Yeah, come on, all, Trina said, giving Ethan an encouraging smile. Don't try to mess with his training. That's not cool. It's up to him what he wants to do. Okay, yeah, Oliver conceded. Sorry, man. They fell silent for a while, listening to the music and watching the writhing bodies. Miguel got up at one point and said something to a slim man in a tank top and tight jeans, and a couple of minutes later the two of them were draped over each other, swaying on the dance floor. The sight of them drained a little bit of Ethan's jealousy away. Oliver caught him looking. Miguel's a slut, he said. What can I say? Ethan didn't know how to respond to that, so he just shrugged and smiled. He was hoping that Trina would ask him to dance. There was no way on earth he was brave enough yet to ask her. But she seemed content to just lean back and watch the room. Occasionally little groups of people would filter by their table and greet her and Oliver like they were some kind of royalty. They even smiled at Ethan, and he realized that somehow he'd finally managed to work himself into the circle of people who were genuinely cool, even if he was only a little way in. It was better than he'd ever done before. Are there a lot of mages here? He asked, leaning in closer so no one outside the table would hear. Trina shook her head. Not really. A lot of wannabes, but I haven't seen any others with the real deal, besides us. He nodded. Dr. Stone said we're pretty rare. It felt good to say we. And that's why we've got to stick together, she said, smiling at him. Ethan couldn't help smiling back. Something about her eyes and the way she looked at him just turned his insides to jelly. He glanced down and realized he'd finished his drink without even noticing. So, I take it you didn't have any trouble getting away? She asked as Miguel came back to his seat. Didn't you say your mom was sick or something? She's in the hospital, he said. There's nobody home but me right now, and she wants me to get out and have fun. Trina nodded. What about Dr. Stone? Did you have to clear it with him? Nah, Ethan shook his head. I think he might be sick or something, too. My lesson schedule's been spotty because of my mom, but he called this afternoon and said we wouldn't be starting again until Monday at the earliest. He sounded kind of weird on the message. I didn't tell him I was going out tonight. Way to go, Oliver said, exchanging a glance with Miguel. Just because he's your teacher doesn't mean he runs your life. Yeah, Ethan agreed. Yeah, he doesn't. He accepted another drink from the leather-clad cocktail waitress and smiled. Chapter 16 Stone didn't remember falling asleep, or maybe passing out, on the old leather sofa in his basement sanctum, but the pounding on his door snapped him out of an uneasy dream of blood and screams, and something about a carnivorous house eating a television set. The first thing he realized when he awoke was that he was face down, with one leg hanging off the edge of the couch and his foot dragging on the floor. The second thing he realized was that every part of his body was screaming at him. Bugger, he muttered, glancing at the clock. After seven, he'd missed his next dose of painkillers by nearly three hours. The door pounded again. Alistair? Megan. Are you down there? In a minute, he tried to call, but it came out as a feeble croak. This was not going to end well. He reached down, put his hand on the floor, and tried to push himself up, but the only thing he succeeded in doing was to set off some sort of large-scale explosion centering around his cracked ribs. 
clamping his teeth around a shriek of pain, he rolled over and landed on his back on the floor. It was a very good thing that this was one of the spots where he'd covered the concrete with a rug, and another that the old couch was so saggy that he didn't have far to fall. Even so, his ribs throbbed anew. He lay there, panting, and considered his next options. Somehow, he was going to have to get up, stagger across the room, and drag himself up the stairs, all before Megan freaked out and called the fire department to break the door down. Wait, wait, he told himself. She doesn't know you're down here. Where the hell else would I be? The car's still here. She's not going to be thick enough to think I just nipped out for a walk. Why had he given her a key to the place again? He was wasting time. Gritting his teeth, he reminded himself that this whole thing was his fault. And if he hadn't been such a lazy mage, he wouldn't have gotten himself hurt in the first place. Pain wasn't a valid excuse when it was your own doing. He crawled over to the table, every movement feeling like someone was stabbing him in the side. When he got there, he grabbed the edge and hauled himself to a kneeling position. At least his knees were all right. That was something. With some satisfaction and very little memory of having finished them, he noticed several objects laid out on the table. A half-dozen crystals, a ring with a blocky purple stone, and a necklace with a pendant in the shape of a miniature felinoid skull with horns. He shifted his sight a bit, which caused his already pounding head to throb warningly, and noted that all of them glowed with power like tiny suns. At least he'd done what he'd come down here to do in the first place. It was probably why he felt even worse than he should. Infusing focus objects with power took a lot out of him. But at least he'd taken the first concrete steps toward making sure that he'd be ready if somebody tried to jump him again. The thought gave him a bit more energy. By sheer effort of will, he pulled himself to his feet, swaying back and forth like a drunken toddler. Fighting down a wave of nausea and dizziness, he began moving toward the stairs. Alistair, are you down there? Megan's voice sounded far away. The door was quite thick on purpose, bound with metal on the inside. The fire department, should she decide to call them, would be in for quite a surprise if they tried to knock it down. Gathering all his strength, he called, Coming! He hoped she heard him, because he wasn't going to be able to do that again. He'd nearly shouted himself off his feet, and there were still the stairs to deal with. You never truly think about how hard it is to climb a simple flight of stairs until various parts of your body are registering their protests in ways that are impossible to ignore. Stone gripped the railing and used his arms to drag himself up one step at a time, pausing on every third to get his breath back. That was another thing about cracked ribs. It hurt to breathe. By the time he made it to the top, he was swaying again, blinking back the gray fog settling around his head. He grabbed the doorknob, yanked the door toward him, staggered out and closed it behind him before Megan could do more than stare at him in shock. Then he took two more steps forward, tripped, and barely caught himself before his full weight fell into her arms. Evening he managed, trying to summon up a cheery smile. Megan caught him and held him up long enough to hustle him over to a chair. Her expression warred between anger and worry in equal measure. Alistair, what the— Pausing to compose herself for a moment, she continued, What the hell were you thinking, locking yourself down there? What were you even doing down there, in the basement? He leaned forward, letting his head drop into his hands. Don't shout, Megan, he slurred. I'm sorry. I lost track of time. She sighed, a long-suffering sound that anybody who spent more than a casual amount of time with Stone was very familiar with. How long were you down there? He considered shrugging, decided that wasn't smart, and rolled his head back and forth in his hands. I don't know. Feather sleep. Three, four hours or so, I think. In the vague periphery of his senses, an interesting aroma wandered by, food of some sort. He realized he hadn't eaten since this morning, and he was ravenous. Something smells good. I brought Chinese, figured you wouldn't want to go out. But I'm wondering now if I should be taking you back to the hospital. She made a move like she was going to smack him in the head. God, you were such an idiot sometimes. You couldn't have just stayed in bed like a good boy. He shook his head. I'm a bad boy, Megan, he muttered. You can spank me later. Might be fun. 
Right now, though, be a love and bring me my happy pills from upstairs, would you? Then I'll be delighted to join you for Chinese food and bad television. Half an hour later, the painkillers had kicked in, and Stone was feeling significantly better. He sat slouched into one side of the overstuffed sofa in the living room, poking at a carton of Kung Pao chicken with chopsticks and paying no attention to whatever terrible rom-com Megan had found to watch. She wasn't paying any attention to it either. She fished her briefcase from off the floor, dug in it, and tossed something in his lap. Saw that today. Thought you'd like a copy for posterity. It was the Stanford Daily, campus newspaper. Unfolding it, he saw his own face, taken from his university ID card, staring at him from beneath the headline. Professor attacked, robbed in campus parking lot. He skimmed the article. The details were sparse, and neither the campus police nor the Palo Alto department had managed to catch the attackers yet. The article urged students and faculty to be cautious when walking on campus after dark and to use the buddy system whenever possible or call for an escort. He tossed it back at Megan. At least they spelled my name right. The whole thing makes me nervous, she said, clutching it. Thinking there are thugs wandering around campus, a couple of my colleagues are scared to walk to their cars now. Stone leaned back, trying to remember something that had caught his interest before. The medication fogged his mental processes a bit, but he almost had it. Something relevant to what she was saying. Then he remembered. Megan, you said something about the air being let out of my tire, didn't you? She nodded. That's what they told me, yeah. Why? Maybe nothing, he said slowly, pondering. But I'm just paranoid enough to wonder if perhaps they were after me specifically. She stared at him, chopsticks full of chow mein hovering halfway between her carton and her mouth. Why would you say that? Why would anyone want to beat you up? You don't have any enemies you haven't told me about, do you? If only you knew. It just seems odd that they'd do that rather than just jumping me. There were two of them, and at least the one I saw was bigger than I was. They wouldn't have had any trouble with me if they'd attacked, rather than risking being seen messing about with my car. I'm not exactly that imposing. Physically, anyway. Unless they knew he was more than he appeared to be and they wanted to make sure they got their hits in before he could fight back. But I don't get it. What would they gain by it? What would make you a better target than someone else? He shrugged. It didn't hurt, which was nice. He decided that he really liked his happy pills, and wouldn't forget to take them again no matter how preoccupied he got. No idea. Perhaps the combination of driving a nice car and parking in a remote area made them think I'd be easy money. There are plenty of people around who drive nicer cars than I do, but most of them park in more populated lots. Of course, this wasn't what he really believed, but once again he had to come up with a plausible explanation that would satisfy Megan. Maybe so, she said, but she didn't sound like she believed it either. Oh, one other thing before I forget. Tommy Langley was asking about you. I saw him at the cafeteria today. He said to tell you he hopes you heal up quick so your little group can all go out and get drunk again soon. She rolled her eyes, clearly indicating her opinion of this activity. "'I'll get right on that,' he assured her. They settled back, ostensibly to watch the movie, but Stone's mind was actually far away. Megan's mention of Langley had sent it off in a different direction, reminding him of what had been going on up at Adelaide Bonham's mansion. He wondered if she'd had any more incidents, and remembered that even if she had, his promise to Langley effectively prevented him from investigating them. His foggy brain then served up the absurd possibility that the thing in her house and what had happened to him could be linked, but the thought almost made him chuckle aloud. As far as he'd ever seen, frightening entities hiding in dusty old mansions didn't hire thugs to beat up mages, no matter how powerful they might be otherwise. As he felt himself beginning to doze off against the soft cushions, he didn't fight it. His last waking thoughts were that he was going to have to find another way to find out about Adelaide's house and somehow figure out who had jumped him, and why. And, just as a stray side thought, he wondered what Ethan was doing with his Friday night, and hoped his apprentice was having a more exciting time than he was. Chapter 17 Ethan wasn't at all sure he was doing the right thing, but at the moment, he didn't care. His head rested against the window in the back seat of a black SUV, 
Miguel was next to him, and in the front were Trina in the shotgun seat and Oliver driving. It was 2 a.m., and the music blasting from the SUV's top-end stereo system mixed with the air coming in from the open front window to drive off the worst effects of the three shots of liquor he'd consumed back at the club. About an hour ago, Trina had looked around the nightmare room and abruptly announced, This place is a snooze. Let's get out of here. Ethan, his lifetime of geekiness convincing him that they were about to ditch him, felt a moment of panic, but then Trina smiled at him. You want to see a real club, Ethan? Uh. Yeah, none of the suburban crap, Oliver agreed. Come on, Miguel urged. Live a little. Get out from under old Stone's boot. One look into his mocking eyes, combined with the liquor, sealed the deal. Yeah, he said firmly. Yeah, I would. Let's go. He wondered where they were taking him, and how he was going to get home, since he'd left his car parked down the street from Darkwave. But part of him didn't care about that either. For once in his life, he was going to actually do something spontaneous. If that meant having to catch Bart back, and use some of his savings to get a cab ride the rest of the way, then so be it. It wasn't like he had anything else to spend it on. His mother didn't have to know and neither did Stone. The SUV flew up Highway 280, making good time in the sparse traffic. At first he thought they were going to Palo Alto, but they flashed by all the exits for that town and continued north. So, he ventured, where are we going? That club you mentioned up in San Francisco? Trina shrugged. Maybe. Getting kind of tired of that place, too. She grinned, twisting in her seat to fix him with her captivating green gaze. Hey, I know. What? Oliver glanced sideways for a second, then turned back to watch the road. Screw clubs. I'm sick of them anyway. Same old boring grind. Why don't we show Ethan some real magic? Ethan stiffened, his eyes widening. Going to clubs with these people was one thing, but he'd given his word to Stone that he wouldn't get involved with any other magic. Um, he started, but they ignored him. Great idea, Miguel said, turning his electric grin on Ethan. Give you some idea of what you'll be able to do some day. I don't think... Geez, Ethan, you worry more than anybody I've ever met, Trina said. She was still smiling, and there was a fondness in her tone, but also an edge of impatience, like she was growing tired of his constant hesitation. It's not like we'd ask you to join in or anything. I doubt you're far enough along that you could anyway. We just want to show you what it looks like. Even Stone couldn't object to that, could he? Most apprentices have seen all kinds of magic by the time they start their training. I know I did. Didn't you? Not really, he admitted. I kind of found out about it late. His insides squirmed at her tone. Taking a deep breath, he said, I just don't want to get in trouble with Dr. Stone. If he kicks me out and says he won't train me, then... Look, Miguel said. First, he doesn't have to know about it if you don't tell him. Mages can't read minds. If he tries to tell you he can, he's full of shit. And second, we're not going to be doing anything wrong. Like Trin said, you're not going to be doing any magic, just watching it. Come over, dude, Oliver urged. It'll blow you away, trust me. We can do some pretty cool shit when we get going. Don't you want to see what you'll be able to do someday? Ethan considered. His mind was in turmoil. On the one hand, he was scared to death that Stone would somehow find out what he'd been up to and terminate his apprenticeship. That would effectively mean the end of his magical training, since even if Walter Yarborough agreed to go back to the original deal, there was no way Ethan was going to go that far away from Mom when she was so sick. On the other hand, maybe Miguel was right. It wasn't like he was going to be performing any actual magic, and Stone didn't have to find out. Ethan wasn't going to see him until Monday at the earliest anyway, so even if he ended up with a hangover, he'd have the weekend to recover from it. And then there was Trina, or Trin, as her friends apparently called her. He wondered if he'd ever be close enough to call her Trin. She was smiling at him now, her eyes full of encouragement and mischief and... something else? No, that part was all in his mind. It had to be. She couldn't be looking at him that way but that was okay. 
the possibility that it might happen someday wasn't as completely remote as it had been earlier that day. Take a chance, a little voice in the back of his head said. You'll end up kicking yourself if you don't. Let's do it, he said, grinning. Trina nodded approvingly. Good deal. They drove into the heart of San Francisco, and after a time Oliver parked the SUV in front of what looked like a rotting, abandoned house. Ethan said nothing, but once again he was beginning to rethink his agreement. It doesn't look like much, Miguel said, apparently picking up on his apprehension. But wait till you see what we've done with the place. They led him upstairs to the attic, and he stared at their ritual area, at the black painted walls, the graffiti-style magical sigils, the circle laid out on the floor. What do you think? Trin asked. Cool, Ethan said, and he meant it. This was much cooler than Stone's basement. Come on, Oliver said. Let's get started. Instead of grabbing ritual materials, though, he picked up a bottle of tequila from a rickety table and took a swig, then offered it to Trin. They passed it around. Ethan didn't really want to drink more, but he wasn't about to turn them down. When they finished the bottle, they began constructing the circle. By that time, Ethan was feeling quite the buzz. When the circle was complete, the three of them took their places, leaving a fourth place for him. Okay, Trin said. Here's the deal. We all join hands, and we'll start building up power. You don't need to do anything yet except watch us magically and see what we're doing. Once you think you have a handle on it, just see if you can step into the flow and channel some of the power yourself. If that works, you'll feel it. Then, concentrate on feeding more power in, adding to what's already there. Think you can do that? I can do it, he said. But you said I wasn't going to be doing any magic. This isn't really doing magic, Trin said, waving a dismissive hand. You aren't going to be controlling anything, just helping us deal with the power. Simple stuff. Think you can handle it? Ethan swallowed. He had no idea if he could, but Trin's tone of challenge made him game to try. The alcohol was giving him courage. He nodded. Yeah, I can handle it. Good. Let's get started then. She held out her hand for Ethan to take it. He did, and grasped Miguel on the other side. Slowly, the three of them began to chant, and Ethan shifted to magical sight. He could see the pattern already beginning to grow, very simple and rudimentary at first, but taking on power and complexity as he watched them weave bits of themselves into its structure. It took him a while, but eventually he thought he grasped what they were trying to do, and gently reached out to take part of it and begin weaving his own power into the tapestry. Good, good, Trina murmured, nodding. Just keep that up, and when you're in, start feeding power in. Ethan did as he was told. The pattern continued to build until it became a thing of beauty, complex and mathematical like some kind of perfect equation. He almost lost control of his part of it when he grew enraptured with just watching the way it moved and shifted as the participants made small adjustments to variables. He'd always loved math in school and had been good at it. This was like math made tangible. Careful, Ethan, Trin said, smiling. You're starting to lose it. Don't stare at the pretty lights. Be the pretty lights. He snapped his attention back and once more fell into the pattern. He let it sing through him until at long last the others began to draw back, slowly dismantling it until it faded into nothingness. Oddly, he was sad watching it go. So, what did you think of that? Trin asked. That... That was the most amazing thing I've ever seen, he said, and he meant it. He wondered if Stone was ever going to show him things like that, or if he even could without more mages to participate. Yeah, we get that a lot, she said, amused. Oliver was already fetching another bottle of liquor, and Miguel was digging some pot and rolling papers out of a cigar box. Come on, sit down and we'll just talk for a while. Take some time to come down off a magical high like that. Let's go for something a little more conventional. They all settled back and began passing around the bottle in the joint. Ethan was hesitant at first, but after sharing that amazing ritual with these three, he felt a kind of oneness with them. He didn't want to be excluded from their group. He barely noticed or cared that when the bottle went around, 
The other three were actually drinking very little and hardly touching the joint at all. Eventually, Miguel and Oliver got up and drifted out of the room, leaving him alone with Trin. She lounged back on the pile of pillows they'd scattered on the floor, reaching out to run her nail gently down Ethan's cheek. Pretty fucking amazing night, huh? Totally, he agreed, lying back next to her. His mind floated on a cloud. He felt like when he spoke, his voice was coming from another place. I'm really glad we could share that with you. I love seeing you mages discover things. She rolled over on her back, staring up at the ceiling. I hope you can come back and do it again. Oh, yeah, he whispered. I really want to do that. Great, she said, smiling. She paused for a long time and then said softly, Hey, Ethan? Yeah? I was wondering if maybe you could tell me something. Anything. She reached over and stroked his chest with her fingernail. I heard that Dr. Stone is doing something at this old house down by where you live. Do you know anything about that? Ethan shrugged. Sure. You do? Yeah, I've been there, he said proudly. Really? That's great. So what's the deal with it? A little suspicion poked its way through his alcohol and marijuana-fueled fog. Why? She kissed the tip of his nose. No real reason. It just sounded cool as all. A haunted house. He grinned. Don't know if it's haunted. There's something in there, though. Something big, Dr. Stone says. Does he know what? Not yet. He's trying to find it. But he hasn't yet. Not yet. She nodded. Just curious, where is this house? It's in Los Gatos, up in the hills. It's really big, huge, he added with a big, goofy grin. He could feel himself beginning to float off on a brightly colored cloud with Trina's face on it. Really huge, with these old ladies, nice old ladies. That's great, Ethan. Thanks. It sounds like it's a pretty cool place. She stroked his hair. You go on to sleep now. I'll wake you up when it's time to go back. Okay, he whispered. His words were slurred now. You know what? I really like you, Trina. I like you too, Ethan. Now go to sleep. He slipped into deep slumber, the big, goofy grin still plastered on his face. Chapter 18 Stone couldn't get Adelaide Bonham and her haunted house out of his mind. He woke up the next morning stretched out on the couch with a blanket over him. Megan was gone, but she'd left a note saying to call her if he needed her. The Chinese leftovers were in the fridge, and thanks for a night of torrid and acrobatic passion, which he probably didn't remember a bit of. He chuckled and pocketed the note. After a breakfast of painkillers and cold kung pao chicken, he dragged himself upstairs for a shower and a change of clothes then went down to the basement and retrieved the items he'd built yesterday. He donned the ring and the amulet, stuffing the feline skull under his shirt, then stuck a couple of the crystals in his pocket and left the rest on the kitchen table. At least if anyone tried to jump him again, he'd have a fighting chance of showing them the error of their ways. Of course, even without the focus objects, he didn't think they'd catch him by surprise again. Laziness about the world around him was a luxury he could no longer afford. He lowered himself into the nearest chair and tried to figure out what to do next. It was Saturday, so he had no classes. It was nearly eleven o'clock. He supposed he could call Megan, but decided not to. Like him, she needed her alone time, and he didn't want her to feel obligated to hover over him like a protective mother bear. He was actually feeling better today, especially after the shower. He'd only taken one pain pill. He thought he'd even be all right to drive, should he have anywhere to go. One thing was sure, he couldn't go back to Adelaide's house, not if he wanted to keep his friendship with Langley. It wasn't like the two of them were best buddies or anything, but Stone did like him enough that if he was going to break a promise, he'd need a better reason than, there's something there and it might be dangerous. He wasn't even completely certain that the entity had been behind the TV explosion, but if someone had offered to bet him, he would have taken it. 
If he couldn't go to the house, he'd have to come up with some other angle to pursue. He leaned back in the chair and thought about it, halfway wishing that Ethan was there to bounce ideas off. The boy might not be far along in his magical training yet, but he was smart and picked things up quickly. And Stone did his best thinking when he had an audience to lecture to. He thought about the entity, the spirit or ghost or whatever it was. Why was it there? He'd suggested some ideas while talking to Ethan at the house itself, that it had always been there, gaining power, that something had happened to awaken it, that it was newly arrived. He didn't think the latter was true. Things that powerful tended to put down roots and associate themselves with particular areas, buildings, or people. But if it had been there all along, then why was it only now causing trouble? How long had it been there? The house was very old, Langley had said, one of the oldest in the area. Had it been there since the house was built? Hmm, he said aloud. If it had been there that long, maybe it had caused trouble before. Some similar spirits waxed and waned in their power, going dormant for many years before waking up again. Maybe this was one of those. The next step, then, was to find out more about the history of the house. Fortunately, he had one of the best sources around for such things, easily available to him. Pleased to finally have a plan, he first drove to Green Library on the Stanford campus. After an hour of digging, he determined that what he wanted wasn't there. The house was in Los Gatos, so perhaps the library there was more likely to have the information he sought. The Los Gatos library did have some documents about the Bonham house. He had to ask the librarian to get a hold of them, but she set him up with a couple of large bound books full of early newspapers, a box of microfiche reels, and a small stack of books chronicling the history of the town. He left two hours later, his notebook full of scribblings that he jotted down while reading through the books and periodicals. None of it was much help, though. The house had been built in the early part of the century by the father of Edgar Bonham, Adelaide's late husband. The elder Bonham had been a wealthy steel magnate, and had built the house as a gift for his beloved wife, who was sickly and couldn't take the climate back east. As far as Stone could determine, the house didn't have any kind of checkered past. He couldn't find accounts of any murders or other crimes in or near it, and by all accounts, Edgar Bonham Sr. had doted on his wife and she on him. He had died in the mid-1920s, and she'd followed almost ten years later. Edgar Jr. had been their only child. This was interesting in a general sort of way, but it wasn't giving him what he was looking for. He drove back to Palo Alto with a sense of frustration. He wasn't sure what he'd been expecting to find, but he'd hoped that whatever it was, it would be sufficiently compelling to convince Tommy Langley to let him go up there again. Good as the information he'd found was, it wasn't going to get him his wish. He'd made it as far as Mountain View, driving back up 280, when he realized that there was one more place he could check. Mentally, he almost kicked himself for not thinking of it before, or actually first. He sighed. He'd been out of the game too long, spending most of his time lately playing occult studies professor, and too little staying connected with the magical community around the Bay Area. That was going to have to change and no time like the present for it to start. The only thing that East Palo Alto shared with its high-class sister city was part of its name. It was mainly a working-class town, but parts were becoming increasingly run down, vacant, and in the process of being overrun by the sort of people that the police worked hard to keep out of Palo Alto. And the law-abiding, working-class majority in EPA worked hard to keep out of their neighborhoods. Stone never felt particularly comfortable driving through it, but the place he was headed was smack in the middle of one of the town's worst business districts. If he wanted the information, he'd have to go where it was. Parking the Jaguar, he glanced around to make sure no one was obviously watching, then summoned a small enchantment around the car to make it blend in with its surroundings. The eyes of anyone who wasn't specifically looking for it would just slide over it like it wasn't even there, or see it as the sort of car that routinely parked in the neighborhood. He'd have to make this quick. The initial enchantment wouldn't last long unless he spent some effort shoring it up. There were few active businesses or shops on this street. Most of them were closed, their doors boarded up, their windows covered with graffiti-strewn sheets of plywood and stout bars. He headed directly for a small, nondescript door between two defunct shops, a liquor store and a purveyor of adult novelties, both of them awash in trash and gang symbols. The door itself was not marked. 
In fact, Stone knew that it had a more permanent version of the same enchantment he'd put on his car. He knew this because he'd put it there several months ago. That was the only reason he could see the door without uttering the passphrase that the establishment's other customers would need to get past the blending spell. Opening the door, he slipped inside and quickly shut it behind him. Inside, things looked significantly more upscale, if still a little threadbare. There was a carpeted stairway leading down and ending in another closed door. This one had a small bell hanging next to it with a dark red silken pole. Stone took the stairs slowly, favoring his ribs even though they didn't hurt at the moment. When he reached the bottom, he tugged once on the pole, causing the bell to jangle an odd note, and then waited. He hadn't been here for quite some time. In fact, the last time he had been here was to renew the enchantment on the door. It was a favor to the shop's proprietor, in exchange for some help the man had given him in the past. The place didn't exactly make him nervous, but it did make him more watchful than usual. No sense taking chances. The door swung open on a room that looked like a turn-of-the-century shop, all dark, soft carpet, glass cases, and wooden fixtures and shelves. The chandeliers hanging from the ceiling were lit with actual candles, adding a flickering eeriness to a place that was already strange enough as it was. Stone strode past the shelves full of odd books, bones, desiccated animal parts, and similar objects without really seeing them. They weren't what he was here for. At the back of the store was an old-fashioned roll-top desk, and sitting at the desk was a man. He rose and bowed as Stone drew closer. Well, Alistair Stone, it has been a while. To what do I owe the pleasure? Surely the door... He got a good look at Stone, and his eyebrows rose just a bit, but he did not ask. Hello, Stefan. How are you? Stefan Kalinsky was somewhere indeterminately between fifty and sixty-five. He was a tall man, almost as tall as Stone, but more powerfully built, with dark hair swept up from a high forehead, glittering dark eyes, and a hawk-like profile. He wore a tailored black suit, somewhat old-fashioned of cut, without a wrinkle in it. Kalinsky was one of the few people around who could make Stone feel almost chronically underdressed, even though he'd been told that he actually cleaned up quite nicely on the rare occasions when he had to attend something formal. I am well, thank you. Kalinsky's voice was soft, with an unidentifiable accent. But may I ask why you've come? I suspect that you aren't here to bruise my wares. He looked rueful. Not today, no. Stone glanced around the shop, making sure they were alone. Pity, Kolinsky said, shaking his head. One day I hope that you'll see the error of your ways, and realize how much you choose to limit yourself. Stone raised an eyebrow. I thought you'd given up on that by now. Their words had the feel of familiar banter, like they were getting something out of the way before getting down to business. It wasn't far from the truth. Stone didn't exactly like Stefan Kalinsky, but he did respect him. He couldn't help it, since the man was one of the finest magical minds on this side of the country. It was merely inconvenient that he played for the other team. As long as you kept a close eye on him, and were very careful about the favors you asked, he could be a valuable source of information about all sorts of interesting things that most white mages wouldn't go near. Kalinsky chuckled. Never. Tilting his head, he looked Stone up and down. What's happened to you, old friend? You don't look... well. My own fault, Stone said, shrugging. Possibly related to why I'm here, but I doubt it. I'll get right to it if you don't mind, so I don't have to go back out and hide the car again. When are you going to get better premises, by the way? This place suits me, he said serenely. If you say so. Anyway... I'm looking for information about an old house. Probably nothing you'd have anything on. But I figured if you can't put your finger on anything interesting, it probably isn't there to find. Indeed. Kalinsky's eyebrows rose like the ears of a dog who's been offered an enticing scent. Any particular old house? He gestured, sliding another chair over next to the desk, and motioned for Stone to sit down. Stone smiled. This was the reason he kept coming back to old Stefan. Not because his magic was as black as his suit, 
not because he ran the only place south of San Francisco and north of Los Angeles where you could buy some of the more exotic items on his shelves, including the ones in the back that only the most selective customers ever got to see. No, it was because in addition to being a purveyor of things dark and arcane, he was also a formidable magical historian with a particular interest in the Bay Area. If it had to do with magic, and it happened around here in the last two hundred years, odds were that Stefan Kalinsky could lay hands on some documentation about it. Or at minimum, he could come up with some pretty reliable rumors. It's in Los Gatos, up in the hills, he began. He told Kalinsky about the house, about Aunt Adelaide's strange feelings, and about his own first impressions and subsequent suspicion that whatever was there, it was trying to hide from him. I'm thinking that perhaps it's been there for a while, he finished, and possibly either gaining enough power to be troublesome, or else it's coming into a potent period after a long dormancy. Either way, I need to know anything I can about what it might be, and whether it's been seen before. Kalinsky thought about that, leaning back in his chair and steepling his fingers. Why not simply go there again and find out for yourself? he asked at last. I am certain that you have the means to perform a ritual that would locate it and more precisely identify its nature. Stone blew air through his teeth. Well, there's the rub, he said. He told him about Tommy and his determination that Aunt Adelaide wasn't to be frightened by what he called that fake occult bullshit. Then it will be on him if something should happen to his aunt, Kalinsky said, his tone revealing no emotion. Why does this become your problem? Because I don't want to see a charming old lady hurt because her nephew's mind is hopelessly stuck in the mundane, Stone said. That and... Kalinsky smiled a snake-like smile. That and your curiosity is eating you alive. You want desperately to know what this thing is, what it can do, and how to get rid of it. Stone had long ago accepted that putting one over on Stefan Kalinsky was only somewhat easier than pushing liquid uphill. Well, yes, if you want the truth of it. I like Adelaide, and I don't want to see anything happen to her, but this is big, Stefan. Whatever it is, it's powerful, and it's growing, and I want to find it. He nodded as if that had been obvious. I will see what I can do. Unfortunately, I won't be able to give you the results of my research until at least Monday. I was preparing to close the shop when you came in. I have out-of-town business that will take me away from the area for most of the weekend. Stone studied him silently. Stefan? No, no, Alistair, it's true. You don't fully trust me, and I understand. But you should know me well enough to know that I have no interest in searching out your little problem ahead of you, fascinating though it might be. I am content to discover the information in my own ways, and share what I find with you. For the standard arrangement, of course. He cocked an eyebrow at Stone. Stone nodded. There was no way around it, and he knew Kalinsky was right. That was a good portion of the reason why he valued his relationship with the Black Mage as much as he did. Kalinsky was like a spider, sitting back and watching what went on at all the far-flung reaches of his web. But Stone had never known him to do anything with the knowledge, unless it affected him directly. He seemed, as far as Stone could tell, content to merely collect information and hoard it like a dragon sitting on a pile of gold. And he could be persuaded to part with bits of it for a price. Standard arrangement, then. Kalinsky's smile widened. Excellent. Excellent. Contact me on Monday, and I'll tell you what I've found out. This one will be intriguing, I think. It will require me to dig up some reference material I haven't looked at in a very long time. He stood, politely indicating that the meeting was over. It's good to see you, Alistair. I hope you're feeling better soon, and I hope I'll be able to find something to interest you. Chapter 19 Ethan jerked awake at the sound of someone rapping on his car window. He jumped, nearly hitting his head on the roof, and his eyes widened when he saw the helmeted, sunglassed head of a motorcycle cop peering in at him. He rolled the window down, hoping he didn't look as bleary as he felt. Uh, good morning, officer. The officer nodded, his expression stern. 
Ethan could see his own haggard face reflected in his mirror shades. What are you doing here, kid? I, uh... For a moment he didn't remember. He'd been in San Francisco with Trina and the others. How had he gotten back here? But then a vague memory resurfaced of jostling along in the back seat of their black SUV. They must have brought him back to his car. I was at the club last night, and I stayed pretty late. Realized I was too tired to drive home, so I figured I'd sleep it off to be safe. Are you drunk, son? No, sir. He hoped he wasn't anyway. The clock on the dashboard said 8.07. That should have been enough time for it to get out of his system. He hoped. The cop made him get out of the car, dig out his ID and registration, and take a breathalyzer test. Okay, he said at last, grudgingly after he'd taken down all the information. You can go. I don't believe you that you weren't drinking, but I can't prove it. So, you're on your way. Just don't let me catch you again. Got it? Yes, sir. Ethan got out of there fast. Well, as fast as he dared, as soon as the cop rode off. He pulled into the parking lot of a fast food joint and checked to make sure he still had his cash, then went inside for a big cup of coffee and an unhealthy breakfast. As the coffee seeped into him and brought him back to some semblance of coherence, he looked out the window and let his mind drift over the events of the previous night. His emotions were in turmoil. He was still terrified that Stone would somehow find out what he had been up to and kick him out on the street. But he also felt energized at the taste of what it felt like to do real magic. He wasn't sure why Trina and the others had been interested in the old house in Los Gatos, but it didn't matter to him if they knew. That was Stone's thing, not his. Something in the back of his mind, maybe his conscience, was appalled at the way his attitude was developing. Stone had never been anything but fair to him. Sure, he was a taskmaster and a little hard to get close to, but that wasn't anything personal. As far as Ethan was concerned, Stone was doing a great, if somewhat slow, job of teaching him magic, and he had no doubt that if he kept up his own end of the bargain, he'd come out of this as a damned good mage. But Trina and her friends, they were different. Walter Garborough had told him that Alistair Stone was one of the most powerful mages he knew, but Ethan had a hard time believing it. Thus far, he hadn't shown Ethan that he was capable of much more than levitating a few small things around the room, going invisible, and turning lights on and off. And he was so, what was the word, blasé about it. He just acted like a normal kind of guy his age who was a little eccentric. Trina, Oliver, and Miguel, on the other hand, practically exuded power. He hadn't missed how they strode around the club like they considered everyone else in it their inferiors, or their subjects. People respected them, looked up to them, cared about their opinions. They didn't spend their time hanging out in an old house with dusty books and a musty old basement. They got out there in the world and made things happen. That, and he couldn't get it out of his head the way Trina had looked at him several times last night. He didn't think she'd seen him looking, but she was watching him like, well, like she wanted him. Geeky, skinny him. He slugged down some more coffee, ashamed of himself. This was crazy, and he knew it. He'd agreed to be Stone's apprentice, to follow his rules about magic, and he'd already broken his promise because he'd been dazzled by three flashy young mages who seemed to want him to be part of their group. The best thing he could do right now was to drive up to Stone's place, admit to what he'd done, and ask forgiveness. Naturally, he had no intention of doing that. Mr. Yarbrough had said that Stone didn't have any patience for that kind of thing. What if he admitted what he did and Stone still told him to get lost? No. He'd just have to be good from now on, that was all. He'd call Stone back on Monday, tell him he was ready to get back to his lessons, and put this behind him. No more magic with Trina and the others. But, he thought as he finished his coffee and prepared to leave, there was no harm in just seeing them, right? Maybe just talking with Trina, if she wanted to get together again? He hoped she wanted to get together again. Even though he was sure he was wrong about how she'd looked at him, it was always possible he'd been right, and more than talking would be involved. The three met at their San Francisco ritual space on Saturday evening around five o'clock. From the look of them, they hadn't dragged themselves out of bed much earlier than that. So, what's the plan? 
Oliver asked, lounging in an old chair and popping a beer. I take it you got enough from that twerp to tell you where we need to go? Fuck, that kid's annoying, Miguel complained. Affecting a childish voice, he sing-songed, Oh, should I take a chance? Should I be doing this? What will Stone think? I need a new diaper. He dropped a leg over the arm of another chair and slouched into it sideways. We better get this done quick. I don't think I can stand being around him much longer without smacking him in the head. Trina chuckled appreciatively. Come on, he's not that bad. We need to take this slow. I think we got him drunk enough that he won't remember exactly what he told us, which is good. But if we're going to do what we need to do, we might need to go down there a couple of times. I want to know more about what we're up against before we do it for real. We'll only get one chance. What about Stone? Oliver asked. He gonna be a problem? She shook her head. Shouldn't be. I heard back from my guys, and they worked him over pretty good Thursday night. Put him in the hospital, they said. Remember how the kid said he sounded sick on the phone? Even if he's home, with any luck he'll be curled up with his blanket and slippers and out of our hair for the weekend. Okay, so where are we going, and when? Miguel asked. Tonight. The house is in Los Gatos, up in the hills. The kid said there's just a couple of old ladies who live there, and some gardeners and stuff that might be around. We gonna have to go in? Oliver took another swig of his beer. Not yet. Tonight's just recon. We can set up a circle outside of the grounds and try to get in touch with it from there. She smiled an unwholesome smile. You guys were there when it contacted us. It wants to use us. But we've got other plans. Miguel matched her smile. I don't much like being used. Unless he's gorgeous and has a big... Yeah, yeah, Oliver interrupted. We're not gonna fuck this thing, Mig. I don't care how hot it is. Well, maybe we are, metaphorically, Trin said, her eyes sparkling in the same way that was so successful at curdling Ethan's hormones. That's why we need to be careful. It's powerful. But I think if we do it right, the relationship's going to end up a little different than it expects. Chapter 20 Stone had finally gotten comfortable. It was late, had to be well after midnight, and the combination of a recent pain pill, a soft, comfortable bed, and Megan's warm presence lying next to him were coming together quite nicely to drive off all his stray thoughts about Payne and Ethan and Stefan Kalinsky and why anyone would want to attack him in a parking lot. He lay on his back, Megan's arm draped over his chest, and her head snuggled into the crook of his arm, dozing. Things were good. He'd gotten home around five o'clock to find her message on his machine, wondering where he'd gone. After calling her back and assuring her that he was quite capable of driving, he felt better, and he just had some errands to run. He'd smoothed over the last bit of her concern by proposing that she choose what she wanted to do with the evening, and he'd go along with it. She had shown up two hours later with a couple of bags of groceries, a bottle of good wine, and her usual teasing remarks about his appalling lack of cooking skills, and the fact that he never had anything decent to eat in his townhouse unless it was one of Mrs. Oliveira's nights to cook. I'm going to make you dinner, she said, and you're just going to sit back, relax, and stop stressing your body out instead of acting like you're eighteen and can heal overnight. Yes, ma'am, he said meekly. You know, I could get to like this whole being waited on thing. Well, don't get too attached to it. You still owe me dinner from Thursday night, remember? She'd whipped up a quick but tasty pasta dish, and they'd taken their time over it, sipping wine and chatting about completely mundane subjects for the next couple of hours. He'd insisted on taking care of the dishes, after which they'd retired to the dimly lit living room for some soft music and no television. See, she'd said, leaned back comfortably into him. This is nice. No essays to read, no students, no skulls or little old ladies or parking lot thugs. Mmm, he agreed. Quite nice. You're turning me domestic, my dear. She snorted. Yeah, right. Next stop, white picket fence and 2.5 adorable children and a Labrador retriever. How about one adorable child and 2.5 Labrador retrievers? Or better yet, just the picket fence. One thing had led to another, and they'd ended up in the bedroom. 
and despite the fact that they'd had to be more careful than usual because of his injuries, they'd managed to have an enjoyable evening. Stone had dropped off to sleep contented, for the first time in days not feeling like something was hanging over his head. He slipped in and out of deep, restful sleep, his racing mind finally slowing down while Megan slumbered on next to him. The phone rang. Bloody hell, he whispered, jerking fully awake and wincing as his injured ribs protested. Megan stirred as he quickly rolled over and tried to snatch it up before it rang again. According to the clock on the nightstand, it was 1.32 a.m. Walter, if this is you again, he muttered into the phone. Dr. Stone? The voice was trembling, female, and sounded terrified. It took him a moment to identify it. He stared as Megan stirred again, draping her arm back over him. Mrs. Bonham? Whoever was on the other end sounded like they were on the verge of hysteria. Dr. Stone, is that you? It's me, Mrs. Bonham. What's wrong? Is something wrong? He sat up a little, propping himself up on his pillows. Megan's arm slid down over his stomach, but he didn't even notice that she was there. Something's here, she quavered. Something's happening. He was fully awake now. Carefully, he moved Megan's arm and sat on the edge of the bed. Calm down, Mrs. Bonham, please. I'll help you if I can, but you have to tell me what's happening. I don't know, she sobbed. It's like the whole house hates me. Noises, cold winds, things slamming. Is Iona there? Can you put her on for a moment? There was a shuffling sound, and then a different voice spoke, sounding almost as frightened as Adelaide Bonham had. Dr. Stone, this is Iona. He took a deep breath. Iona, what's going on? Is Mrs. Bonham... She's not imagining things, the woman said. In addition to sounding frightened, she sounded like she couldn't believe what was going on. I can hear them, too. The noises, the feelings. It's horrible, Dr. Stone. Something's going on. Another deep breath. All right, all right. Uh, listen to me. Ask Mrs. Bonham... If there's a place in the house where she feels particularly safe or comfortable, go there. Lock yourselves in it if you can and wait. I'll be there as soon as I can. Shuffling around, and Adelaide went back on. Should I call Tommy too? No. No, just do as I said. Go to where you feel safest and wait. I'll get there as fast as I can. He was already getting up, painfully pulling on his clothes as he held the cordless receiver between his head and his shoulder. He broke the connection and dropped the receiver on the bed. Alistair, Megan's voice sounded muzzy from sleep. What's going on? Was that the phone? Go back to sleep, he murmured, shrugging a sweater on over his t-shirt. I have to go out for a bit. I'll be back soon. He sat down on the bed and hurriedly began pulling on socks and shoes. You have to go out? She was more awake now. Wait a minute. What time is it? It's late. Shh. Go back to sleep. I'll be back before you know it. I hope. Where are you going? She rolled over on her back, staring at him. You can't go out now. It's the middle of the night. He didn't have time for this. Leaning over, he kissed her warm forehead. I'm sorry, Megan, but I have to go. Go back to sleep, and I'll be here when you wake up in the morning. Before she could protest, he hurried out the door. He heard her calling to him as he reached the top of the stairs, but he didn't pause. Breathing hard, acutely aware of how long it would take him to drive from Palo Alto to Los Gatos even at this hour when there would be next to no traffic, he forced himself to pause when he reached the ground floor. He took a quick inventory and hurried downstairs to his basement sanctum, donning the ring and amulet and stuffing all of the crystals in his pocket. He'd need all the power he could get if something big was happening down there. And after the last couple of days, his personal power level wasn't at its highest. Next, he found a bag on a shelf and began tossing various candles, jars of sand, incense sticks, and other ritual materials into it. He had no idea if he'd need them or even have a chance to use them, but better safe than sorry. Back upstairs, his gaze fell on the bottle of pain pills by the sink. He snatched it up and stuck it in his pocket, but didn't take one now. He couldn't afford to dull his senses. He'd just have to deal with the pain unless it got so bad it was causing its own problems. He grabbed his black overcoat and threw it on, then hurried out through the garage door. 
A couple of minutes later, he was on the road headed towards 280, his mind thrumming with possibilities about what could be going on. He wished he'd thought of consulting Stefan Kalinsky earlier. If the man could have come up with anything, he might have a better idea what it was he was dealing with. He hated going in blind. It was about 25 miles from Palo Alto to Los Gatos, not counting the smaller roads that went up into the hills. He opened up the car on the freeway as much as he dared. Getting pulled over now would slow him down more than if he just drove the speed limit. All the while, his brain continued to spin horrific scenarios of some potent, malevolent force having its way with the two helpless women trapped inside the house. Why had it chosen to make its move tonight? There was nothing mystically significant about the time period. It was merely a cold, slightly foggy night in early December, no different from any other. He couldn't imagine how Adelaide or Iona could have done anything to provoke it. The only thing he figured was that perhaps he'd been right that it had been gaining power on its own, and it finally hit the tipping point when it could affect the material world in a more direct way. That was bad news, especially since he had no idea what it was, and thus no idea how to fight it. Bugger Tommy and his mundanity, anyway. If he hadn't been so insistent that Aunt Adelaide not be frightened by what he believed to be bogus concerns, Stone could have done more tests, and maybe taken more of the thing's measure before it became too dangerous. Ah, well, no point in focusing on that now. He just hoped he'd be able to keep his promise to Megan and be back by the time she woke up the next morning. Or that he'd at least be alive by the next morning. It was close to 2.30 when he slewed the Jaguar right onto the turnoff leading up to the house. He couldn't see anything in the distance. No pyrotechnic light shows or anything as blatant as that. This wasn't necessarily comforting, though. A lot of magical entities were quite a bit more subtle. He pulled the car over for a moment and stopped, leaning over the steering wheel and closing his eyes, willing up his mental defenses to their maximum. It would take a bit of his energy to sustain them. But if this was one of the more subtle varieties of mystical baddies, he'd be grateful he'd taken the effort later. Continuing up the road, he reached the gate. It was closed. Damn, forgot to tell them to open it before they hid. He jumped out of the car, leaving it running, and tried to open it. It was locked tight. Of course it was. A cold, biting wind sliced through his coat. With a sigh, he went back to the car, pulled it off to the side, and gathered up his gear from inside. He hadn't wanted to waste magical energy yet, but he was going to have to get over that gate, and there was no way he was going to climb it. He didn't know how long the fence around the place extended, and he didn't have time to find out. He slung his bag over his shoulder, focused his will, and levitated himself up and over, dropping down neatly on the other side. That spell came easily for him, fortunately, so he was barely breathing hard when he touched down. Ahead he could see the bulk of the house rising up like a dark presence all its own, lit only by its perimeter lights. No cheery inside lamps now. He wondered where Adelaide and Iona had chosen to hide, and hoped they'd chosen wisely. He kept to the side of the road as he moved up toward the house, reaching out with his magical senses to see if he could get any more information about the entity before he had to go inside. Immediately he picked something up. It was all around him. The thing was agitated. But the strange thing was, it didn't seem any more potent or powerful than it had the first time Stone had touched it, back when he and Tommy had made their first visit. Odd, he thought, almost like something's disturbing it. There was also something else, something he couldn't quite put his finger on, a trace of a different sort of magic in the air, less powerful, more focused, more familiar. Was there another mage here? No, that was absurd. What would another mage be doing out here in the middle of nowhere on a night like this? He checked again, and the odd trace was gone. He pulled up the collar of his overcoat against the wind and resumed his trudge toward the house. When he got there, he pounded on the door. "'Mrs. Bonham!' he yelled, wondering if she'd even hear him from the inside the vast house. "'Iona! It's Alistair Stone! Open the door!' His voice was nearly carried off by the rushing wind. Nothing happened. He stood there, hands in his pockets, teeth gritted, glancing constantly around him as if expecting something to sneak up on him for nearly five minutes. He was beginning to wonder if he'd have to try getting in through one of the windows when the door opened. A wide-eyed Iona was on the other side, dressed in robe and slippers, her dark hair in disarray. Oh, Dr. Stone, thank God you're here. Come in, come in. 
She grabbed his arm and tugged him inside, then slammed the door shut behind him and locked it. She was breathing like she'd just run two circuits around the grounds. Stone's gaze took in the entry chamber. Nothing looked out of the ordinary here. Iona, are you all right? Where's Mrs. Bonham? Come with me. She led him out of the room and down a long hall to what looked like a smallish office. Unlike the rest of the house, which showed strong leanings toward Adelaide Bonham's old lady decorating tastes, this one had a distinct masculine feel, with paneled walls, shelves lined with old books, and even a couple stuffed deer heads. The furniture was heavy wood and leather, overstuffed and comfortable in a functional way, and another door led to a tiny bathroom at the far end. The room had no windows, only a single exit door. Iona waved Stone through it, and then closed it after a quick peek outside to make sure nothing was following them. Adelaide was perched on one end of a brown couch, clutching a handkerchief and trembling in her quilted pale blue dressing gown and slippers. She looked up as he entered and tears sprang to her eyes. Oh, Dr. Stone, I'm so sorry to drag you out of your bed at such an hour. And what happened to your face? He crouched in front of her, taking her hand reassuringly. Think nothing of it, Mrs. Bonham. I'm fine. Now tell me, what's got you so frightened? She didn't have to tell him, though. As she drew breath to answer, the house made a sudden loud creaking sound, low and rumbling and sustained from somewhere deep in its bowels. This was followed by the sharp slams of several doors opening and closing, and then a low, agonized moan. Adelaide and Iona made little screams and clutched at each other, trembling. Oh, dear God, Iona whispered. What is it? What is it? Stone was not trembling. The initial creak had startled him. But when it continued to draw out, he pulled himself to his full height, shifting his perceptions over to get a better look. He stood there, jaw set and grim thousand-yard stare fixed somewhere out beyond the confines of the house for almost a minute after the moan died out. The two women looked at him, for a moment appearing almost as frightened of him as they were of what the house was doing. Dr. Stone? Adelaide ventured at last. He shook his head quickly as if clearing it and his gaze switched back to the here and now. Sorry, he said. He let his breath out and sat down in a nearby chair. His mind was still far away, but he forced himself to focus on the two ladies, just trying to figure out where that was coming from. What was it? Iona asked, voice shaking. Stone took a deep breath. Here was where things were going to get interesting. I don't know what it is yet. I'll need to do more tests to find out. But whatever it is, it's somewhere inside the house. Iona and Adelaide exchanged terrified looks. In the house? Adelaide echoed. She looked around like she expected to see something come crashing through the closed doors. Yes. How long has it been doing this? Is that what frightened you initially? Adelaide nodded, eyes wide. Y yes. It started a couple of hours ago. Not long before I called you. I had just gone to bed about half an hour before that, and so had Iona. Her bedroom is near mine, so I can call her if I need her for anything. And then suddenly the house just started doing... that. She waved her hands around to encompass what had just occurred. That, but nothing else, Stone asked. Nothing flying around or breaking? Nothing like when your television set exploded? Iona shook her head. Not unless all that crashing was things falling off shelves or something, but nothing dangerous around us, right, Adelaide? Again, the old lady nodded. No, just very, very frightening. Her pleading gaze fell back on Stone. Dr. Stone, please tell me you can help us with this, because if you can't... Stone patted her arm. Don't worry, Mrs. Bonham. I think I can help you. But what I want you to do for now is to stay put in here. Is this the place you feel safest in the house? Yes. It used to be my Edgar's little study, where he went when he wanted to just get away from the world for a little while. We used to spend a lot of time in here, just the two of us. That's why I never changed the furnishings or anything. Stone nodded, most of her words beyond yes not even registering as his mind continued working through possible causes and solutions. All right, then. Stay here, and don't come out until I either come back or it's morning. Can you do that for me? I won't be as effective if I have to worry about you two out and about. Adelaide reached out and took his hand, holding it between her two cold ones. Uh, 
Are you going to be safe, Dr. Stone? If something happens to you... He patted her hand, exuding a confidence he didn't entirely feel. I'll be fine, I promise. You just stay here, and I'll be back as soon as I can. Oh, would you trust me with a key to the house? He added. If I have to go outside, I don't want to leave the door unlocked or ask you to come and let me in again. Of course. She nodded to Iona, who pulled a key off a smiley-faced fob from a nearby drawer and handed it to him. All right, then, he said with a slightly manic grin, squaring his shoulders. Time to go find out what this thing is, what it wants, and why it's being so rude. Chapter 21 Far out on the spacious ground surrounding Adelaide's house, hidden from view by the thick growth of trees, the three continued their magical ritual. They'd been at it for nearly two hours now. This was no symbolic link ritual like the ones they often did to get back at hapless club patrons for minor slights. This one had the potential to go horribly awry if they didn't pay careful attention to what they were doing. They didn't want to get this wrong, so they'd take an extra time to set up their circle. After all, it wasn't like anyone was going to come out here and catch them at it. They'd had a bit of trouble finding the place, since Ethan's directions hadn't been precise, and he hadn't remembered the house number. Miguel, who excelled at that sort of thing, had hunted it down using the old woman's name, and they'd poured through the Thomas Guide for the area until they'd identified the twisty little road that read to the place. Thwarted by the locked gate, they probably could have used magic to break the lock, but they didn't want to draw any attention to themselves. They'd driven a few yards off the road, hidden their vehicle, and levitated themselves over. Once they located the house proper, it was an easy matter to head out into the woods, find a suitable clearing, and set up the materials they would need. So far, they hadn't heard anything out here but the wind and a few small animals. But they had set a couple of magical warning devices thirty yards or so away. One toward the house, and one in the direction of the road. If anyone blundered near... They'd know about it and could take appropriate action. The three stood inside the circle they'd made, hands clasped, each concentrating on his or her specific task. Individually, none of them was highly accomplished at this sort of thing, but to their fortune, magical ritual's power multiplied significantly depending on the number of people involved in casting them. And when you added that to the fact that they worked together for so long that they could practically read each other's thoughts— it meant that their individual deficiencies in skill were largely negated by the sheer amount of power and focus they could bring to the table when working together. They had tried to anticipate any potential difficulties in casting the circle and performing the ritual, things like bringing along tall enclosures for the candles to shield them from the wind, and a large barrier to put around the brazier in the center for the same reason. They had each provided a bit of blood to fuel the casting, usually one contribution was sufficient for their minor rituals, and had made a point to stop by a nightclub for an hour or two earlier that night to top up their power so they would be at their strongest. All of this, when it came down to it, was because they were afraid. They'd never admit it, of course. The three never admitted to being afraid of anything. But when the entity, whatever it was, had taken control of their previous ritual, transported them to a different location in magical space, and imposed its images and impressions upon their minds, they realized that they were dealing with a being of vast power, one that had far more experience manipulating arcane forces than they did. And it wanted out. That's what it had told them. It was imprisoned. Though the bars of its confinement were beginning to slip enough that it could communicate with those who were sensitive to the vibrations of the supernatural world, it was impatient. It didn't want to wait any longer. The blonde boy knew where it was held, but he didn't have the power to release it. The dark-haired man had the power, but he was wily and dangerous and difficult to tempt. And so it had reached out to the three, with promises of power and forbidden knowledge, if they could aid it in breaking free of its prison. They had listened to its offer and agreed to help. And then the ritual had ended, and the three, as they were inclined to do, began to wonder if there might be a way that they could turn this situation more to their own advantage. The entity, they had no idea yet what else to call it, had been imprisoned. That meant someone had imprisoned it, and if it could be imprisoned, perhaps it could be bound. The ritual tonight was not designed to bind it. In fact, if all went as they planned, it wouldn't even notice what they were doing. 
although the three were young and impatient for results themselves. Even they wouldn't attempt to harness power of this thing's level without some serious advanced reconnaissance. It would be equivalent to trying to disarm a powerful bomb while possessing neither the schematics nor even a basic understanding of what kind of bomb they were working on. In other words, very bad idea. The reason they were here tonight, then, was to perform that reconnaissance. Their aim, should they pull off the ritual successfully, was to get a better idea of what kind of magical thing they were dealing with, and what kind of power level it had. Was it a spirit? A physical being with magical powers? An extra-dimensional entity of some sort? Or something they'd never even seen before? If it turned out to be any of the first three, they had a chance of being able to deal with it. They didn't have that knowledge now. But part of Miguel's most valuable contribution to their little cabal was his unsurpassed skill at research, surveillance, and other similar things he called magical spy stuff, which often included stalking, but that wasn't relevant to the subject at hand. So far, the casting was going well. It had taken them over an hour to set up the circle, and once they joined hands and began channeling their power into a shared spell, they found what they were seeking nearly immediately. There was something there and it was somewhere inside the house. They did their best to be subtle, to search around the edges of its consciousness without alerting it to their presence. As far as they could tell, its mind, or whatever you called it in the case of an entity like this, seemed to be elsewhere or disassociated, as if it were asleep and dreaming. They got too close a couple of times and felt it stir, reaching out to try to find them. But they pulled back and held off their continued search until it had quieted once again. It wasn't the kind of work they enjoyed doing. All three of them preferred their magic faster, more visceral, more immediately gratifying. But so far, this seemed to be working as they hoped. They didn't have much left to do tonight. Maybe another half hour's work at most, plus whatever time it took them to dismantle the circle. If they were successful, they could go back home, do their research, and prepare a trap. Sure, they would help the entity break free of its prison but it didn't have to know that they were preparing another, even more permanent one for it to occupy. Chapter 22 Stone buttoned up his overcoat. The wind was picking up, whistling through the trees and slicing at him, even through the coat's thick wool. His ribs were beginning to ache, and he wondered if he should take another pain pill. Not yet. Not until I find out more about this thing. He'd quickly determined that if he was to have a hope of triangulating on the thing inside the house, he'd have to start outside. The mansion was simply too large, with too many haphazard passageways and long corridors. It was like trying to find something in the middle of a maze, and he didn't have time to keep backtracking every time he chose the wrong path. Outside, he could figure out the general part of the house where it was located, then try to home in more carefully inside without having to explore the entire place. It was almost three o'clock now. The fog obscured the moon, so there wasn't much light once he got out past the boundaries illuminated by the perimeter lighting. He summoned a small light spell centered around his hand and held it up to show him the way. He'd have to move out some distance if he wanted to do this quickly. Keeping his magical senses open, he left the lighted area and headed out into the forest. It was hard to track the creature and walk through the uneven terrain at the same time. Twice he almost tripped over a root or branch and had to shift back to mundane vision to avoid it. Even so, though, he could still sense the entity. It was stronger now, but still diffuse. He couldn't explain why. The best way he would describe it, if asked, was that it felt like only a subset of a greater whole was actually here, but that a significant part of it existed somewhere else. As he had inside the house on the first night, he sensed both a deep, abiding hatred and a longing for something, but he wasn't sure for what. He moved further out, keeping his little light spell glowing on his hand. It wasn't much help, as it only lit an area about three feet or so in diameter around him. But it was better than nothing, and if he moved slowly, he could watch both the mundane and the magical worlds without too much fear of catching his foot on something. He was getting closer. He could feel it. The three were jolted out of their concentration by the sound of their magical alarm going off. What the— Miguel began, looking around. Fuck! Somebody's out here? Oliver, too, began swiveling his head to try to spot the intruder. Damn it, hold it together, you two. Trin's voice sounded strained as her companions let their grips slip on their parts of the pattern, and she struggled to pick it up. 
Miguel, go check it out. Oliver and I can hold this for a few minutes, but make it fast. We don't have time to start over. Her green eyes met his. If you find somebody out there, take him out, then get back here quick. With pleasure, Miguel said, grinning. He paused, closing his eyes and carefully taking himself out of the pattern the three of them were weaving, waiting until Trin and Oliver had picked up the threads before stepping out of the circle. Once his eyes had adjusted to the darkness, he faded into the forest, pulling a spell around him to obscure him from the view of anyone who might be nearby. He found a spot away from the circle, hid behind a tree, and waited. His hands hummed with power, itching to release it on whatever unfortunate fool had blundered into their business. It was only a minute or so before he saw the approaching light. Someone was definitely coming. He glanced back over toward the circle. He could barely see its flickering candles through the trees, but only because he knew what he was looking for and where to look. Would the intruder spot it as well? He waited. The intruder approached closer. A tall, thin, dark-haired man dressed in some kind of long coat. He held a flashlight in his hand, and... Wait a minute. Miguel strained to get a better view. That wasn't a flashlight. His breathing quickened a bit, more from excitement than fear. There was another mage out there. He forced himself to be patient, to wait for the man to approach closer. He didn't have a lot of time to wait, but he wanted to be sure what he was dealing with. If this had been a mundane intruder, there would be no defense. He could just hit him with something that would be certain to take him down. But with a mage... There was always the element of uncertainty. He'd probably only get one chance, so he'd have to make it count. For now, he focused on keeping his blending spell up and watched as the mage moved into his line of sight. Miguel had never seen Alistair Stone before, but he'd heard Trin's description. He stared. Could it be? How could Stone be here? He thought Trin had said her thugs had put him in the hospital, but he seemed to be moving fine, if a bit slowly. He held his light spell in front of him and stepped gingerly over fallen roots and branches, all the while heading in the general direction of the three's circle. Had he seen it? Miguel grinned. It didn't matter. In a couple of minutes, it would all be over. Stone continued picking his way through the uneven terrain, trying to watch both directly in front of him and out into the forest at once. He was still getting closer. He sensed a significant source of magical energy up ahead somewhere now. He hoped he could find it soon, as the cold was really starting to seep in through his overcoat and do a number on his ribs. Once he'd identified the location, he could go back inside. Magically, it might not be safer, but at least it would be warmer, and he wouldn't have to keep moving around so much. He was looking toward the house, trying to spot the source, when something caught his attention from the corner of his eye, further out in the forest. Odd he murmured. There shouldn't be anything out there. He was sure whatever he was looking for was coming from the house. Still, he was nothing if not thorough. Stopping, he focused his attention on the direction where he thought he'd seen something. For a moment there was nothing, but then he picked out several tiny glows down close to the ground, and magical energy. The same magical energy he'd noticed a trace of before. Bugger, there's another mage here and then something bright lanced out of nowhere and slammed into him, driving out all further thought. Got him! It took all his self-control for Miguel not to whoop aloud in triumph when his concussive blast hit Stone square in the chest and blew him backward out of sight. So much for the so-called powerful mage. He might be powerful, but by the three standards he was old. Old and slow. Miguel wondered if he'd killed him. He listened for a moment, heard no sound, and thought about going after him to finish the job. But Trin had said to come back quickly, or there was a risk that the whole ritual would fail. Much as he hated it, he knew that was more important. With one last glance back toward where Stone had gone flying, he grinned again and loped off back toward the circle. Stone couldn't think straight. He blacked out for a moment, but when he came to, every nerve in the core of his body was on fire. His ribs felt like someone had snapped them. What the hell was that? He thanked whatever gods or lucky stars looked out for him that he'd spotted the movement behind the tree just quickly enough to get a shield up, or he'd probably be dead now. With no time to react, it hadn't been much of a shield. 
but at least it had soaked the worst of the damage when his body had slammed hard into a tree. Still, he was afraid he might have collected a couple more cracked ribs for his trouble. Concussion blast, he thought grimly, struggling to his knees. That wasn't the kind of magic every mage knew, not by a long shot. There was no prohibition about mages learning combat spells, nor was there any governing council or other body that dictated what they could and couldn't do or learn. But he was the only white mage he knew who even bothered with that sort of thing. Combat magic was very difficult stuff for white mages, due to the way it was powered, just like long-term enchantments were difficult for black mages, which meant that he was most likely dealing with a black mage. He was disgusted with himself for taking so long to arrive at that conclusion. He couldn't afford to be out of it now. Quickly he glanced around to make sure that whoever it was, he or she wasn't now sneaking up on him and preparing to deliver the final blow. With effort he re-established his shield, stronger this time, using one of his crystals to power it. They wouldn't catch him by surprise this time. He grabbed the tree and dragged himself up the rest of the way. His chest and sides were on fire. He thought about taking one or two of the pain pills in his pocket, but decided against it. The pain was bad enough, but a dulled brain, when going against a black mage, would be worse. If the mage wasn't coming after him, it had to mean one, or possibly both, of two things. That they thought they'd killed Stone or incapacitated him, or that they had more pressing things that they had to deal with. The lights. Whatever was going on, they were the key. Slowly, carefully, Stone began moving in the direction where he'd seen the lights. He didn't use his own light spell this time, fearful that the other mage would spot it. He didn't want to take another hit, even with his shield up. Still, he had to hurry. The small crystal wouldn't power the shield spell for long. He wove a blending spell, using another crystal to power it, then moved forward again, hoping that the mage wouldn't hear him huffing like a freight train as he crept through the forest. He was having a hard time getting a deep breath. One way or another, he was going to have to deal with this soon, because before long, he wouldn't be able to. Miguel reached the circle, grin still fixed on his face, and stood waiting at its edge. Trin, face focused on her task, shifted concentration a bit to provide an opening for him to re-enter. Did you find anything? Miguel stepped back in, joined hands with Trin and Oliver, and picked up his part of the pattern before he replied. It was stone, he said. Fuck, Oliver breathed, glancing out as if expecting him to be standing there. Don't worry, I took him out. Miguel sounded pleased with himself. How? Trin began. He didn't even see me coming. I might have killed him, even. You're not sure? You said come back fast. We can check after. I don't think he'll bother us, though. Trin wasn't so sure. Let's wrap this up, she said. If he's still out there somewhere and you didn't kill him, I want to be out of here before he wakes up. This was just getting worse and worse. Stone stood behind a tree, shield and blending spells up, watching the magical circle. There were three of them. Not just one. Three. And what the hell were they doing? They stood in a circle, hands clasped, and with his magical sight, Stone could see that they were calling up a significant amount of power. But why? He stayed quiet, trying to still his breathing so they wouldn't hear him, but they seemed completely occupied by what they were doing. He recalled the ruined beacon he'd passed. How had he missed it the first time? That had probably alerted them to his presence in the first place. Whatever they were trying to accomplish here... They didn't want anyone else to see it. Were they somehow responsible for what was going on in the house? He studied them. The woman looked vaguely familiar. Tall, dark red hair, tattooed forearms. He didn't think he'd ever met her, but he'd seen her in some context before. He recognized the circle construct, though. The three of them were definitely black mages. This was an odd ritual for their type to be doing. Spells like the concussion blast were much more their style. This ritual didn't even look like it was designed to hurt anyone. Instead, it appeared to be set up to study something. But what? And then he understood. They were doing the same thing he was, trying to figure out what was in the house. The tendrils of magic that carefully, subtly, since one were black mages that young subtle, Stone had never met one who was, creeping out and toward the house, had been designed and constructed to gather information. But why? 
How did they even know about the thing? Had Adelaide Bonham contacted someone else before she'd talked to him? Had Tommy told someone? Had they just somehow picked up on the magical emanations coming from the house and followed them back to their source? He didn't have time to worry about it now. The ritual was reaching its climax, and if he didn't do something soon, they'd get what they wanted. If they then tried to come after him after they finished, he wasn't sure he'd be able to fight them off. Or worse, if they tried to go after the ladies in the house, so they'd have the place to themselves without interference. Stone gritted his teeth. He wasn't going to let that happen. This wasn't subtle, and it was going to hurt like hell, but it had to be done. Gathering energy around him, pulling in the power from another of his crystals, the ring and the amulet, he held it in place and waited. He still had two crystals in reserve. But if what he was trying to do failed, he'd need them to defend himself. The trio of mages in the circle were chanting now, something low and guttural, and not in any language Stone was familiar enough with to understand. They raised their hands and turned as one toward the direction of the house, their voices rising to a crescendo. Off in the distance, a rumble came from the house. Stone pulled a deep, shuddering breath, pointed his hands, and let loose with a column of magical energy that slammed down into the middle of the circle like a glowing hammer. The brazier went out, and one by one the candles' enclosures popped and died. Screams echoed from the three mages as they were assaulted physically and mentally by feedback from the ritual's abrupt destruction. One, a blond man, clutched his head and dropped like his strings had been cut. The other two staggered, flailing their arms and yelling out curses and cries of pain. Fuck! yelled the dark-haired young man. It's Stone! Get him! Stone stared. They know who I am? This had just gotten even more interesting. But he didn't have time to think about it now. Even with his focus objects helping him, that spell had been a huge expenditure of energy. He could feel grayness closing around his mind and deliberately twisted his body to light up his ribs again. Bright pain lanced through him, but his head cleared instantly. Can't let them see weakness. He steeled himself, trying to draw in more power from his remaining crystals. But the woman, it seemed, was wiser than the man. No, take all and let's go. She leaned down and hefted the unconscious, or worse, blonde man's shoulders and glared out into the woods. This isn't over, Stone. You're a dead man. She flung a random bolt of magical energy in his direction, then said something to her other friend. He picked up the blonde man's feet, and together they moved off into the forest with their burden. Stone let them go. He didn't have much more in the tank. And if he went after them and cornered them, he might not be able to handle what they threw at him. He waited several minutes, doing his best to get his breath, then moved forward with the blending spell still up to examine the smoking remains of the three mages' circle. It was completely destroyed, blasted and dead. He was actually a little amazed by how much power he'd managed to pump into that spell, but it had done its job. It was impossible to even tell what the circle's purpose had been, and its power had faded to nothing. He reached out and tried to touch the house again. Its energies had gone back to what he'd noticed before, still there, but calm and unruffled. Resting, perhaps. Waiting. His right arm clutched around his middle, hunched over like an old man. He staggered back up toward the house. He fell to his knees twice, but kept going, driven on by sheer force of will. He couldn't pass out here on the grounds. Adelaide and Iona were counting on him. They were waiting for him huddled on the couch together with big, round, terrified eyes as he opened the door to Edgar's study. When they got a look at him, they both gasped. "'Oh, my God!' Iona exclaimed, getting up to hurry to him. "'Dr. Stone!' He let her help him into a chair, dropping into it on the last of his energy. For a moment he just sat there with his eyes closed, struggling to get a deep breath. "'I'm going to call an ambulance,' Iona stated, moving toward the phone. Stone shook his head. "'No,' he whispered. "'I'll—' Be all right. But you're bleeding, Adelaide protested. That was news. He reached up and touched his face, feeling wetness around his nose and mouth. His fingers came away red. It's all right, he said, trying but not succeeding to make his voice louder. Nosebleeds and such were the unfortunate side effects of channeling too much magical energy at once. Normally, he would have been fine with the focus objects doing the heavy lifting, 
but his body was so exhausted that even they hadn't been enough. Just a tissue or something, if you'd be so kind. I'll be fine. He coughed a couple of times, which was a mistake. He hoped none of the blood was coming from that instead of simple magical exhaustion. Iona looked at him fearfully. Dr. Stone, is it safe to leave the room? Did you find... Adelaide began. I think so, he said, nodding. It's still here, but I don't think it was the problem tonight. Not directly, anyway. It was so hard to talk, to form coherent thoughts around the grayness. Iona disappeared into the little bathroom and returned with two wet washcloths. Refusing to listen to his protests, she used one to wipe the blood from his face, then urged him to lean back in the chair and put the other one on his forehead. How's that? she asked, all nurse now. Better. Very nice. Thank you. Adelaide scooted over closer to Stone's chair and put her hand on his arm. Dr. Stone, what did you mean by not directly? He didn't answer for a long time, trying to gather his thoughts together sufficiently that he didn't say anything he'd have to explain or regret later. There is something in the house, he murmured. It's potentially powerful and potentially dangerous, but it's still weak now, dormant. I think it's trying to draw power. Power for what? Don't know yet. I found some other m people on your grounds. They were trying to do the same thing I was, find out about whatever it was and what it could do. Other people? Iona was confused. At this time of night? Tell me, Stone whispered, still looking at Adelaide. Did the house shift or moan or whatever about twenty minutes ago? Like it did before. The two women nodded. It did, but then it just stopped? Stone grunted wearily. You know why, don't you? Adelaide asked. He nodded. These people were, well, let's just say they were disturbing it as they tried to find out about it, sort of like poking it with a stick. What, what happened to them? Adelaide glanced toward the door. Are they gone? For now, yes. I don't know if they'll come back. I don't know what they wanted from it. He reached up and rubbed the washcloth around on his forehead, closing his eyes. It might be best if you hired on a bit more temporary security, though, just to be safe. Adelaide was silent. When Stone opened his eyes to see why, he discovered she was staring at him with an odd expression. Dr. Stone, do you mind if I ask you a question? He shrugged just a little. Go ahead. What are you exactly? You're more than just a professor at Stanford, aren't you? Now they were both staring at him. He took a ragged breath and let it out slowly. It's hard to explain, he said at last. But yes, I am. This is real, isn't it? The supernatural. This thing that's in my house. And you deal with this kind of thing, don't you? He gave her a small, pained smile. I try to. She squeezed his hand again. I won't ask you to tell me your secrets. I'm grateful to have you on our side, whatever you are. Pause. And then her voice took on a tentative, frightened edge. Do you... Do you think this thing will stay dormant? If these people are gone, I mean. Before tonight, I was the only one who noticed it. Well, except for you, of course. Do you think that will stay true? Stone frowned. What are you getting at, Mrs. Bonham? He could tell from her tone that there was something she wasn't saying. She and Iona exchanged glances. Well, she said, it's just that I've got a very important event that's supposed to be happening here next week, and it's too late to cancel it. Stone closed his eyes. Event? What kind of event? When she spoke after a moment's pause, she sounded like a schoolgirl preparing to deliver a bad report card to a stern father. It's... A charity function. A ball. I donate a great deal of money to charity every year, and we have the ball here each year around this time. It's got a Christmas theme. When Stone didn't say anything, she pressed on. 
We raise money for homeless and abused children, Dr. Stone. The ball and the silent auction generate considerable amounts of money for the charities. It would be a terrible blow if we had to cancel this late. Why didn't you tell me this before? Stone asked without opening his eyes. He realized that the question sounded abrupt and somewhat harsh. But he felt terrible, and his sense of tact, even in the face of kindly old ladies, was getting a bit frayed around the edges. Well, it didn't really seem relevant at the time, she said. She scooted a little further away from him on the couch, as if afraid he might snap at her. I mean, everyone was telling me that all of this was in my head, and no one believed me. I thought, well, maybe there was a chance that they were right. He sighed. And you can't reschedule it, change the venue, anything? She shook her head. Not this late, I'm afraid. The invitations are all sent out, and this time of year everything's all booked up. We've already taken in thousands of pledges. Stone didn't answer. Tears sprang to her eyes. I'll cancel it if you tell me it's not safe, but the children... He sighed again, scrubbing at his hair. Nothing was ever easy. How late can you cancel it, if you have to? Um, I suppose up until the day before, though that would obviously not be desirable since people travel to attend. And it's in a week. A week from last night, yes. She watched him, her expression intent, hopeful, and frightened. At last he nodded. All right, then. I've got about five days to figure out what the hell this thing is and deal with it. He started to get up, but his ribs were having none of it. He fell back in the chair with a grumble of frustration. I'll start tomorrow. Chapter 23 Fuck, fuck, fuck! Miguel was practically yelling out the open window as he drove the black SUV at breakneck speeds up 280 towards San Francisco. Trin, in the back seat with Oliver's head in her lap, glared up at him. Shut up, Mig. We'll get through this, and Stone's going to pay. She looked down. Oliver was still unconscious, his complexion gray and clammy. He rolled his head back and forth in her lap, muttering something she couldn't understand. Damn fucking straight he'll pay, Miguel agreed. As soon as we get Oliver someplace where he can get some help, I'm going back down there, and... No, you're not. Trin's eyes were hard. We're sticking with the plan. We didn't get everything we could from the ritual, but we got enough to start with, and we're not going to lose our one chance because you want revenge. What you're going to do is what you're good at. Research. You know where the house is now, and you know what we got from tonight. Take that and see what you can come up with. But stoned, don't worry. We'll deal with him once we've got that thing under control. And besides, I don't think he got a good look at us. We can use that. I think I'm going to give little Ethan another call soon, and see what we can do for each other. When Stone arrived home at a little after eleven on Sunday morning, Megan was gone. She'd left him a note asking him to give her a call when he got in. The wording was more abrupt and chilly than her usual chatty style. All he wanted to do right now was go upstairs, crawl into bed, and sleep for another seven or eight hours. But he couldn't do that. He didn't have time. Iona had insisted on letting her check him over after he'd nearly passed out in the chair. She'd found the cracked ribs. He'd been right. He now had another one in the back to add to the two in the front he'd started with. But he'd convinced her that the injuries had all come from the accident at Stanford. That had been the first that either she or Adelaide had heard about that, and he managed to deflect them from too much further inquiry by giving them the short version of what had happened. Then he'd feigned exhaustion. It hadn't taken much feigning and Iona had hustled him off to a spare bedroom to sleep for a few hours before she let him go. He slipped himself another pain pill when she wasn't looking, and managed to sleep from around four until eight. Before he left, he had the presence of mind to ask Adelaide if she had any books, diaries, newspaper clippings, or anything similar about the history of the house. She'd said she thought there might be some old things in the attic, but obviously she couldn't look for them herself, and she wouldn't ask Iona to go up there but he was welcome to do so himself as long as he wasn't afraid of spiders. He thanked her and told her he'd be back to do just that. He also asked her to try to remember anything she could about the house, anything her late husband had told her, family anecdotes, anything at all. She promised she would. Finally, he'd asked her not to mention the events of the previous night to anyone, 
including Tommy and the rest of her staff, and to make sure she hired her supplemental security people from a reputable agency. Do you think those horrible people will come back? she'd asked, fearful. I don't know. I hope not, but let's be safe, shall we? Home now, Stone showered, changed clothes, and contemplated his next move. He could go back to Adelaide's and hunt through her attic, but he decided to leave that for tomorrow after he saw what Stefan Kalinsky managed to come up with. He had another question for Stefan tomorrow as well, whether he might have some idea who the three young black mages were. There weren't that many mages of any moral persuasion in the Bay Area, possibly a couple dozen if you stretch the definition hard, and old Stefan had his finger on the pulse of the black magic scene far more than Stone himself did. But he couldn't do that until tomorrow. He called Megan. She wasn't home, so he left a message that he was fine, apologized for disappearing on her, and told her he'd try calling back later. He also said that he quite understood if she didn't want to see him today. He hung up the phone, stared at it for a moment, then picked it up and punched in Ethan's number. He expected the machine to pick it up and was surprised when it was answered on the third ring. Hello? Ethan, it's Alastair Stone. How are you? There was a long pause. Uh, hi, Dr. Stone. I'm fine. How are you? It wasn't at all hard to tell from the boy's tone that Stone had not been the call he'd been expecting. Much better, thank you. How's your mum doing? Still not so good. She's still in the hospital, and they don't know when she'll be able to come home. I'm sorry to hear that. If there's anything I can do, thanks, I appreciate it, but I'm fine, really. Getting along okay. Pause. And then, did you need something, Dr. Stone? No. Just checking in to see if you might want to get back to your lessons tomorrow. No rush. If we wait too long, we might need to go back over a few things, but that's easily done. Have you been practicing your levitation spell? Yeah, I'm getting pretty good at it. He sounded proud of himself. Uh, sure, we could start up again tomorrow. Mom's bad, but they tell me she's pretty stable right now. I can work lessons around visiting hours, if that's okay. Of course. Just let me know when you can be here, and I'll arrange it. I will. I'll call you tomorrow. Uh, I have to go now, though. I'm making lunch, and I think something's starting to boil over. By all means, then. Take care, Ethan. I'll wait to hear from you. Ethan sighed and hung up the phone. He wouldn't have answered it if he'd known it was Stone. For whatever reason that he still couldn't quite articulate, he still didn't want to talk to the mage. He felt stupid, though. Yeah, sure. She's gonna call you. Dream on, geek boy. You probably made a fool of yourself Saturday night, and you're lucky they even bothered dragging your sorry ass back to your car. You'll probably never hear from her again. I bet they're all laughing at you. Even with all that, he was reluctant to leave the house to go visit his mother, which made him feel even more guilty. She was asleep when he arrived, and he didn't wake her. She was asleep a lot lately. Part of him wanted desperately for her to wake up, to be her old self again, so he could confide all this to her. A near lifetime of being all each other had made her unusually adept at sorting out Ethan's snarled emotions, his moods, his confusions about wanting to do the right thing, but always managing to screw it up somehow. He thought about Stone as he sat there next to her, listening to the beeping of the machines and the low, distant murmur of nurses' and doctors' and visitors' conversations. Maybe he could talk to Stone about all of this. The maid had been a teenage boy once. Maybe he'd understand, if Ethan just gave him a chance. After all, that was part of taking an apprentice. You took responsibility for more than just their magical development. A lot of apprentices, even nowadays went as far as to move in with their masters to make the teaching relationship more convenient, especially if the apprentice didn't have a job or another place to live. That implied a certain amount of pseudo-parental guidance. Hell, the man was a professor in his other life. He must have at least some experience dealing with young people. Just tell him everything, said a voice in the back of his head that sounded uncomfortably like his mother's. Just tell him about Trina and going to San Francisco and watching the magic ritual. Tell him you got caught up in the moment, and you won't do it again. That's all it'll take. He might yell at you a little, but then he'll forgive you and forget about it, and you can move on. That was, he realized abruptly there in the hospital, 
why he was so reluctant to go back and resume his magical training. I don't deserve him. I lied to him. I didn't follow his rules, and he's going to know right away as soon as he sees me. And all because I couldn't stop thinking about Trina and the way she looked at me. Some things are just more important than that. I mean, seriously, you're going to give up the chance at learning magic because you can't stop thinking with your dick? He sat up straighter, gently taking his mother's hand. I've got to tell him, Mom, he whispered. Standing, he leaned over and kissed her warm forehead, pushing her hair off her face. I'll be back tomorrow. I love you. He felt like a load had been lifted from his mind as he drove home. He still didn't know if it was the best decision he could make, but he knew it was the right one. He'd call Stone as soon as he got in, maybe even meet with him tonight if he was willing. He shoved his way into the apartment, tossed his backpack on the sofa, and headed straight for the phone. He wanted to do this before he lost his nerve. The red light on the answering machine was blinking. He almost, almost didn't listen to it. Don't do it. Call Dr. Stone first. Set up the meeting so you can't get out of it. That way, even if she... He punched the button. Ethan, it's me. You there? Pick up if you are, okay? No. Okay, well, I just wanted to say that I had a great time on Friday night. I hope you did, too. I'd like to see you again, if you want. Tonight, maybe. Don't worry, nothing you're uncomfortable with. I just thought we could talk a little. If you want to, meet me at Printer Zinc on Castro in Mountain View tonight at 8. I've got an errand I need to run down that way anyway. I'll wait till 9. Hope you get this, and I see you there. Bye. Ethan swallowed. She sounded so animated, so happy, like she was actually looking forward to meeting him. Maybe he'd completely misjudged what had happened Friday night. I should call Dr. Stone. He sat there, staring at the phone for a long time and not moving, his mind in turmoil. I should call him, and I should just not show up tonight. But she was going to come all the way down from San Francisco just to see him. How rude would it be for him not to even show up? Damn, 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 why did this all have to be so complicated? You could call him and tell him, but say that you're just going to meet her to be polite. That you're going to tell her you can't see her anymore. He was going to do that, wasn't he? Ah! He growled aloud, flinging his backpack across the room where it slammed into a wall. Look, said the voice reasonably, you're going to see Dr. Stone tomorrow. You're planning to tell him everything, right? So why not just wait until then? Go meet with Trina tonight, see what she wants, and then you can tell her that Stone doesn't want you hanging out with her anymore. He doesn't have to know you were going to tell him today. He won't know unless you tell him. Remember, Miguel said mages can't read minds? He fell back against the couch. He had to admit that did sound like a reasonable course of action, and it still meant that he would tell Stone. Just tomorrow instead of today. Chapter 24 Stone tried calling Megan early Sunday evening. This time, she answered. Alistair, I got your message. Are you okay? I'm fine. Are you still speaking to me? There was a pause. I don't know yet. She sounded more resigned than angry, though. Well, to go get something to eat? I still owe you a dinner. Sure. Nothing too fancy, though. I think we need to talk about this a little more. They didn't say too much over dinner, which was at a quaint little bistro in downtown Palo Alto. Stone asked neutral questions about Megan's day, and she answered them just as neutrally. He felt like he was picking his way through a field of eggs filled with poisonous spiders. Finally, she looked at him over her wine glass. What's going on, Alistair? He raised an eyebrow. What? She shook her head. Something's going on. It has been for a while now, but I can't figure out what it is. I feel like there's a part of your life that you've walled off from me and won't let me near. Stone sighed. This conversation was inevitable at some point in all of his relationships. It was the reason his last three girlfriends had decided to pursue other interests. It was always cordial and they always remained friends, but the results, up until now, had been predictable. Usually it had happened sooner, though. 
His previous record since moving to the Bay Area from his home in Surrey had been four months. Megan... She held up a hand. No, Alistair, let me say this. I've been thinking about it all day. She paused, taking a sip of wine. Look, I know what you're like. I know you've got your own things going on, and you're not the type to be joined at the hip with anybody. I'm that way, too. That's why we get along so well, but... Another deep breath. I hate feeling like you've got this... I don't know, almost like secret life that I don't know anything about. If you were anyone else, I'd think you were running around on me. I'm not sure whether to be flattered or insulted, Stone murmured. She gave him a look he couldn't quite pin down, but he shut up nonetheless. I don't think that. But what I do think is that I'm concerned about some things around you. Like the fact that your basement is locked up and you won't ever let me see what's in there. He was silent. There wasn't anything he could say that would make things anything but worse. Instead, he waited, watching her with a neutral expression. Finally, she said, I just don't know what to think about that. I mean, yeah, it's possible you're a serial killer or a vampire or something, and you're using the basement to stash bodies, but that's really kind of crazy. The thing is, I can't really think of anything it could be that's not wrong. She looked at him. Why else would you keep it such a secret? I don't want to intrude on your privacy, but I can't help but think that one day the police are going to show up with a camera crew and they'll find something horrible down there. Always the quiet ones, he agreed. Then before she could glare at him, he waved it off. Megan, listen. I know you don't believe me and there's no way I can prove it to you, but there's nothing nefarious going on in my basement. No bodies, no enormous pornography stash, no smuggled illegal contraband, or clandestine collections of Barbie dolls or stuffed animals. Can you tell me anything about it? Anything at all? He thought about it for a moment. It's sort of a workroom. A laboratory. Oh, God. A little color drained from her face. Alistair, are you cooking drugs down there? No! His answer was instant and shocked. Is that what you think? I don't know what to think. And then last night you got that phone call and left in the middle of the night. Are you in trouble? Are you mixed up with organized crime or something? Is that why you thought those guys who beat you up were after you specifically? He glanced around to see if anyone else was paying attention to them, then reached out and touched her arm. Megan, this is all fairly absurd, but if it will make you feel any better, I give you my word that I am not involved in organized crime. I am not brewing drugs or any other illegal substance. In fact, I give you my word that I am not doing anything illegal down there. That much was true. How could magic be illegal if nobody in mainstream society even knew enough about it to make laws? She sighed, looking down at her hands. Where did you go last night? Can you tell me that? I went to Los Gatos, to Tommy's aunt's place. Her eyes came up. She was clearly surprised, both that she'd gotten an answer at all and that it wasn't anything close to what she expected. The old lady in the mansion? He nodded. But why? I'd given her my card, told her to call me if anything strange happened. At one thirty in the morning? Well, he said, quirking a smile. I didn't exactly put a time boundary on it. What... Did she want? She was frightened. She heard odd noises in the house, and she wanted me to check them out. At one thirty. In the morning. She poured herself another glass of wine. So, did you find out what was causing them? Sort of. Only to be going up there again. Possibly several times in the next few days. She's got some sort of huge charity thing happening soon, and she wants to make sure that this is sorted before then. I told her I'd help her. She looked at him like she wasn't sure he wasn't putting her on. Alistair, I know she believes in this occult stuff, but you don't. You're humoring her. I, I get it. She sounds like a nice old lady, but to spend this much time... Does Tommy know about this? Not about last night, and I'd prefer it remained that way. You're not going to tell him? Not yet, no. She frowned. Is that right? 
She's an old lady. He's her relative. You're just his friend that he called in to convince her that her house wasn't haunted. Tilting her head, she said, He's going to be pissed when he finds out, you know. I have to take that chance, he said. He leaned forward. Megan, here's the bottom line. I like what we have. I hope you do too. I'd be very happy if it continued. But if we're going to have anything together, you're going to have to trust me on some things. There are parts of my life I can't share with you. I promise you none of them are illegal or nefarious or harmful. They shouldn't affect you at all, beyond the occasional late-night phone call. But they're things I've made commitments to long before I met you. All I can do is ask you to understand that, and outside of it, I'll do my best to make you happy. She looked down into her wine glass for a long time, then back up. The candlelight flickered in her eyes as she met his. Nothing illegal. Nothing dangerous. He shrugged minimally with a rueful smile. Nothing illegal. I can't promise the other bit, though. Not completely. All I can promise is that I'll be as careful as I can. She continued to watch him, unblinking. I've got it. You're in the CIA. Or... No, wait. You're Batman. He chuckled, feeling the ice finally breaking and the spider-filled eggs beginning to recede. You figured me out, my dear. Always knew you were brilliant. Why do you think I insist on doing my own laundry? Mrs. Oliveira does your laundry, she pointed out. Hmm, maybe I'll bribe her to look for gray and black tights. Hey, if that's what you're into, I'm willing to give it a go. She shook her head, her face getting serious again. All right, Alistair, I'll give you the benefit of the doubt. I like what we have, too, and I don't want to be one of those women who drives a man off by being too suspicious, but just be aware that this is bothering me, this not knowing. I'll deal with it, but I won't like it. That's about the best I can hope for, he said softly. He reached out and took her hand. You're really quite amazing, Megan. Did you know that? I did, yeah. She smiled. Come on, let's go back to my place tonight. That way I won't be tempted to drug you and pick the lock to your secret basement lab while you're sleeping. Unless you're worried that the old lady is going to call you back again. Just this once, let's live dangerously. Chapter 25 Trin was waiting for Ethan when he arrived at Printer's Inc. She was sitting at a table in the back with a cup of coffee, leafing through a book. She smiled as he approached. Hey, she said. I was afraid you might not come. She waved him to the chair across from her. He sat down, smiling back. The book she was reading, he could see now, was called Magic in Theory and Practice. She grinned when she caught him looking at it. Crowley had the right idea, she said, tossing it aside. But he didn't take it far enough. I think he felt inadequate that he didn't really have the power. You want something? Cup of coffee? He shook his head. Thanks, I'm fine. Okay, cool. She sipped her coffee. Glad you could join in with us on Saturday. That was pretty awesome, wasn't it? One of our better ones, actually. I hope you got something out of it. I did, he said, remembering how it had felt to have the magic coursing through him, even with the small role he'd had in the ritual. It was like being truly alive for the first time in his life. It was great. I hope I'll get to do more stuff like that with Dr. Stone. Oh, you will, she said. He'll show you the ritual stuff. That's pretty standard for most teachers, because you use it so often for so many things. But it's always better with more people. They feed on each other, pump in more energy. When you get enough people all on the same magical wavelength, it's like a big old mystical orgy. She grinned at him, her eyebrows raising suggestively. Her eyes were very green and very beautiful. Ethan swallowed. Tell her now. Tell her you can't see her anymore. So, uh, what brings you all the way down here? Seems like a long drive just to have coffee. She shrugged. I wanted to see you. You kind of remind me of myself when I was an apprentice. You know, impatient. Always wanting more. I shouldn't be that way, he said. Why not? Mages should always seek knowledge and new techniques, and new ways to use their powers. 
That's what we're all about. She leaned back and crossed one leg over her knee. She was wearing very tight, very ripped jeans. But that's okay if you don't want to talk about magic. Like I said before, I don't want to get you in any trouble. Tell her, said the voice in his head. Tell her that you've got to go. She just gave you an out. Use it. He snorted. <laughs> don't worry about it. I do want to know more. That was incredible on Saturday night. It'll be hard to going back to levitating coins and stuff after that. Well, she said, rubbing the back of her head with her hand as if thinking something over. You know, there's really no reason why you can't. I don't want to get you in trouble, but if you really want to range out a little bit, expand your horizons, we might be able to help you out with that. Dr. Stone wouldn't even have to know about it. But only if you want it, she added hastily. There's no way I'm going to get between a master and his apprentice unless he asks for it. We? he asked. You, Miguel, and Oliver? Yeah, we've been working together for a long time now. But I'll be honest with you, we might have room for one more in our circle, once you're up to speed. You did a really good job helping us channel the power the other night. I can already tell you've got the talent for it. You just need the training. I don't know, he said, looking down. Stop it, you idiot. Stop looking at her. Just tell her and get out of here before you end up in big trouble. You guys seem to have a pretty good group going, and you and Oliver... She laughed. Oliver and me? Seriously, you thought that? Oliver's a good fuck, that's all. Pure animal attraction. And Miguel... Well, if you didn't already figure out that he's into outies, not innies, then you weren't paying attention. Well, yeah he admitted. Hard to miss. Besides, she said, reaching out to run a black polished nail down his forearm. You're not one of those jealous types, are you, Ethan? Nah, he said too quickly. Somewhere down below the level of the table, his body was making itself very distracting. Did she really say that? I didn't hear what I just wanted to hear. Hey, she said. You know, you could really help us out if you wanted to. Me? How? Despite his hormonal flip-flops, his suspicion ramped up a bit. Well, we've been working on a new ritual for a while now, but Oliver got sick yesterday and he can't do much until he's better. Don't know if Dr. Stone has told you this yet, but it gets a lot harder to channel magic when you're sick or hurt. Something about the body pathways or some shit like that. I don't care about the details. If I wanted to study anatomy, I'd be a doctor instead of a mage. All I know is that it doesn't work right. Sick? What's wrong with him? She shrugged. Bad cold or something? He'll be fine. But he's too sick to sling the spells. We could use somebody to stand in for him for a couple of days if you're interested. Otherwise we'll have to wait until he's back. And before you say anything about not knowing enough, she added, holding up a hand to forestall him. It's okay. You don't have to know a lot. Miguel and I can handle the detailed stuff. We just need you to help channel the power like you did the other night. Think you can do that? Damn it, you idiot. Tell her you can't. You're gonna go talk to Dr. Stone tomorrow. Don't make this worse. Uh, sure. Depending on when, though. Tomorrow night? You could take the bard up. We're not far from the station. She smiled encouragingly. Up to you, Ethan. I'm not going to force you, but I think you'll really like it and really get something out of it. He almost said no. He almost got up and walked out. But then he got another look at her. Her eyes, her smile, her body. Sure, sounds like fun. Her smile turned to a grin. Excellent. She stroked his arm again, her fingers lingering. I knew I could count on you, Ethan. She stood up, and he thought she was going to leave. Instead, she said with a look of mischief and something more, Come on. I know a much better place to hang out than here. Pause. If you want to. Yeah, he said, getting up. I want to. Chapter 26 Stone showed up to teach his Monday morning class, but persuaded old Hubbard to take the afternoon one so he'd have more time to work on Adelaide's house problem. His students all looked surprised. 
By now everyone had heard what had happened to him on Thursday night, and they were eyeing him like they expected him to fold up and collapse in the middle of the lecture. He assured them that he was alive, well, and fully functional, and pissed them all off by dropping a last-minute pop quiz on them near the end of the hour, before reminding them of the final schedule for the rest of the week. He waited until lunchtime to call Stefan Kalinsky. He even answered the phone, which was rare. Ah, yes, the black mage said. Come over whenever you like. I've unearthed some very interesting information for you. Have you had lunch? There's a little place over on University I've been wanting to try. Of course, Stone bought lunch, and of course Kalinsky let him. Kalinsky was clearly amused by making him wait for the information, but Stone did nothing to show his impatience. He made small talk and entertained Kalinsky with anecdotes about his occult studies students, not even fidgeting when the man decided he simply had to have one more glass of the excellent wine before they left. That was just the way he was, and there was no point in trying to change him. It wasn't until they were back at his East Palo Alto shop that he smiled at Stone across his old roll-top desk. Well, Alistair, I must tell you, you gave me quite an interesting research project. As I said, I had to dig back through some reference material that I haven't looked at for many years, so I thank you for that. Stone waited, leaned back in his chair. He was fairly certain at this point that Kalinsky had found something good. The more he stalled, the better the data he'd come up with. Usually. Kalinsky reached into a cubby on his desk and pulled out a yellowed sheaf of paper, which he spread out on the clear surface in front of him. Your house was built near the turn of the 20th century, 1901 to be precise, by a man named Edgar Bonham Sr. He glanced up to see if Stone showed any recognition. That would be Adelaide's husband's father, most likely, he said. She mentioned that her husband's name was Edgar, but even given that he died many years ago, the ages would still be wrong for it to have been him. Kalinsky nodded, making a note of it on a small pad. Edgar Bonham Sr. was an extremely wealthy man. His main business was steel, but he had his fingers in many pies, railroads, heavy industry, mining, that sort of thing. He was mostly a silent partner, which is why his name isn't as well known as some of the other industrial magnates of the era. He looked through his sheaf of papers, extracted one, and held it out. Stone took it and examined it. It was a wedding announcement. Edgar married... Amelia Hastings, two years before the house was completed. Yes. Kalinsky took back the clipping and returned it to the stack. Miss Hastings was apparently a rare beauty, and quite sought after. But Edgar won her hand, and took her back with him to his home in Boston. But it quickly became apparent that the eastern climate didn't agree with her. She was always frail, but the winters and the pollution were simply too much for her. When she became increasingly more ill, and at one point almost died, Edgar set out to build her a magnificent home, in a climate more fitting to her constitution. Stone nodded. All right, that explains why they came out here, but so far I'm not getting anything out of the ordinary from this. And you won't, until many years have passed, Kalinsky said. He clucked in mock admonishment. So impatient, Alistair. Let me tell this story. You know I'm a showman at heart. Forgive me, Stone said. Take your time, Stefan. I've got nowhere to be for a while. Thank you. So, the house was magnificent, yes, and Edgar's money guaranteed that it was built as quickly as it could be. It was smaller than it is now. They added on to it many times during their marriage. Amelia flourished in the California climate. And by all accounts, their time together was a very happy one. They had one child, a son, but it was a difficult birth, and Amelia was not able to have any more children after that. She was heartbroken. But she still had Edgar, and now she had her son as well, so her life was good. He rifled through the stack of papers again and took out a clipping, which he passed to stone. A few years after that, however, more tragedy struck for the family. Stone examined the clipping. It was an obituary. Edgar Sr. had been the victim of a freak accident at the age of 56 when an open-air car he was driving was hit by lightning during a storm. He looked up at Kalinsky. He died young. Yes, 
And this is where things begin to get interesting. Once again, he returned the clipping to the stack, then put the stack aside and pulled out a large, leather-bound book. As I'm sure you're aware, given your line of work, many people, especially upper-class people, have been interested in the supernatural over the years. They stage seances, consult mediums and Ouija boards, have their tarot or tea leaves or astrological charts read, all in the service of things like divining their futures, coercing the objects of their affection to reciprocate their feelings, attempting to contact dead loved ones, and so forth. Stone nodded. He taught a whole course on the occult in modern America and Europe. It was mostly fake, though. Sometimes a real mage would get down on his or her luck and resort to that sort of thing, but usually it was charlatans trying to make money from gullible people. Indeed, Kolinsky agreed. But as you said, not always. Emilia Bonham had always had an interest in the spirit world and the supernatural, from the time she was a child. But everything I can find prior to her husband's death indicated she considered it merely a diversion, something to have fun with at parties and to entertain her friends. There's no indication that she believed in any of it. That changed after her husband died? Stone was beginning to get the first faint glimmering of an idea where this was going. Yes. She was utterly distraught at Edgar's death, to the point where her friends and his servants began to think it would drive her mad. But then she found a purpose. She began reaching out to spiritualists and mediums in hope of finding someone who could help her contact her husband from beyond the grave. She refused to admit he was gone and became obsessed with communicating with him. Stone nodded. Let me guess. She actually managed to find herself someone who wasn't a charlatan. A woman named Selina Darklight. Or at least that's what she called herself. Her real name was apparently Mara Jones. Contacted Amelia and told her she might be able to help her. He looked up at Stone. Now I'll bet you can figure out where this went next. They set up some sort of ritual to attempt to contact Edgar's spirit. Stone shrugged. It wouldn't work, though, even if this Selina Dark Knight was the real thing. You can't contact dead loved ones using magic. It's not possible. Well, Kolinsky said with a little nod of agreement. That is, of course, true. But Amelia didn't know that, and Selina, despite being a bona fide mage, wasn't exactly the most ethical person around. That, and she needed money. But you haven't heard the best part of the whole thing. And that is? Kalinsky opened the leather book to a page he'd marked with a red silk ribbon. This isn't widely known at all. This is the part I had to dig through a lot of dusty piles of books to find, so I hope you appreciate it. But it seems that Amelia was one of us as well. Or at least had the potential to be. Stone stared. Amelia was a mage? Yes. And Selina saw that potential in her, naturally, since she knew that it wasn't possible to contact Edgar's spirit per se. It was in her best interest to do all she could to extend the duration of their association as long as she could. And so she told Emilia about her potential and offered to train her. She convinced her that she'd have a much better chance of contacting Edgar directly than through a medium and hoped that in the meantime she could figure out some way of faking the contact, Stone added. Exactly. Amelia proved to be a very quick and motivated study. Naturally, she had to keep her activities secret from everyone. But the house was large enough by then that it wasn't difficult to do so. And as time passed, Amelia became an extremely talented black mage, with a strong specialization in rituals and spirit summoning. Wait... Stone said. Don't tell me, let me guess. Selina figured out a way to summon something up and pass it off as Edgar. Kolinsky raised an eyebrow and frowned. Don't get ahead of me, Alistair. Though you are somewhat close to the truth. Because you see, Selina had plans. For many years she had sought to summon a particular spirit. You might even call it a demon, if you were inclined to that sort of thing. And to harness it to her will. She was wise enough now to know that she didn't possess sufficient power to do it herself, even though she knew its true name. 
Training Amelia at last gave her another potent mage to add to the casting. She arranged to have several other less powerful mages, former students of hers, arrive, and Amelia thought they would at last be joining together to summon Edgar's spirit back into our world. Stone leaned forward, his gaze locked on Kalinsky. Things didn't go as well as Selina had hoped, Kalinsky said. This was the other part that was very difficult to find, mainly because most of the principals died that night. Indeed, Stone murmured. They attempted the summoning, but somehow lost control of it. My sources don't say why. Perhaps the demon had grown in power since Selina had last touched it, or perhaps someone in the circle lost their nerve. I don't know. Or perhaps Amelia was brighter than Selina gave her credit for, and realized that the ritual wasn't what it had been billed as, Stone said. Kolinsky nodded. Or that. But at any rate, they managed to open a gateway to its home and to bring it over. But Selina couldn't control it. My sources don't report specifically what happened to it. But when it was all over, everyone but Amelia had disappeared. Disappeared? Stone frowned. Back into the demon's home dimension? Probably. The only one left to tell the tale was Amelia, and she wasn't talking at the time. When the servants found her, she was wandering the halls of the house, speaking in gibberish. She was sent to an asylum for several years, where she later died. The account I've given you comes from one of the nurses there, who wrote down some of the things she said when she became a bit more lucid. The nurse didn't believe them, of course, but she thought they were entertaining, and perhaps she could write them up as a story some day. For a long time Stone was silent, staring at nothing. Finally he said, So, what do you think happened to the demon? The question is, what do you think? Kolinsky asked. You're the one who's been in the house. I think it's still there, he said in a monotone. Indeed? He nodded. That's got to be it. I felt something very powerful, very malevolent the first time I was out there. But then the next time it was less so. I think it's hiding from me. He got up and began pacing. Stefan, you know more about summoning rituals than I do. Could it still be there? If Selina's ritual had gone awry, would it have been easier for them to contain it somehow than to send it back? Yes, of course, Kalinsky said. He swiveled his chair around to watch Stone. Are you saying that you think they imprisoned it in the house for all these years? It's the only thing that makes sense, Stone pointed out. I doubt old Adelaide or Iona are out there summoning demons in between episodes of murder, she wrote. If it's been there all this time, perhaps something's happened to weaken its prison. Or else it's just weakening on its own after all these years. Kalinsky pondered. So what do you propose to do about it, then? I have great respect for your abilities, Alistair, but I don't think you're strong enough to send something that powerful back on your own. Especially not when you aren't at your best due to your injuries. I know, Stone muttered. I know, but I have to do something. I think the best you can hope for is to fortify its prison again, long enough for you to buy some time and perhaps enlist some help. You're going to need a powerful circle to send it back, I think. Unless... Unless what? Stone's gaze came up quickly. Well... Kolinsky said, unless you can somehow get hold of its true name, then you might have a chance, given that it's already partially imprisoned. You wouldn't have to fight all of it, merely close the door between the dimensions and shut the part of it that's here back in its own domain with the rest of it. Stone shook his head, and finding that is about as likely as me being crowned King of England— I don't suppose you have any reference books lying around that might contain that kind of information? I fear not, Your Majesty, Kolinsky said with a rueful smile. In any case, I don't envy you your task, Alistair. I wish you luck and success, but I don't envy you. I don't suppose you'd be willing to help? Stone asked, raising an eyebrow. Alas, no. My forte is research, not action. 
I'll leave that for younger and braver mages than I. Stone didn't even try to argue with him, since he'd already known the answer. At least old Stefan was honest. All right, then, just a couple of other questions, and then I'll leave you to whatever it is you were doing. Kolinsky inclined his head. If I'm right, and this thing is imprisoned, and its prison is starting to fray, how fast do you think that will happen? And will having a lot of mundane people in proximity to it cause the process to accelerate? Ah, Kolinsky said, smiling a little. Of course, I hadn't put it together until you said that. The charity ball. How did you know about that? I received an invitation. Naturally, I declined, but... Well? He shrugged one shoulder. I couldn't say. It's possible that if it senses all that energy nearby, it might redouble its efforts to break through. But it's also possible that if it wants to break through surreptitiously, it might go quiet while the house is heavily occupied. Or it might simply continue as before. So, in other words, you have no idea. I believe that's what I said, yes. <laughs> Stone sighed. All right. Thank you, Stefan. I owe you a big one for this. I'm sure you'll come up with some creative way to collect, but I'd ask that you wait until after next week. I think I'm going to have plenty to occupy my mind until then. Of course. It was a pleasure, as always. He made a little half-bow in his chair. Stone had made it halfway across the room toward the door when he remembered something. Oh, uh, Stefan? Yes? One more thing. Sorry, but I'd forgotten about it in the middle of all the rest of this. He turned and came back over. I know you're fairly familiar with the, uh, darker side of the magical community. I'm wondering if perhaps you might be able to help me identify some of them. Kolinsky tilted his head. Identify? Long story. There were three of them. They were working together, all of them fairly young. Two men and a woman. I didn't get a good look at them, but they seemed to know who I was. Well, you are one of the more accomplished practitioners in the area, Kolinsky said with an arch little smile. Any particular reason you want to know about them? They tried to kill me Saturday night, and they're interested in the house. I have no idea how they might have found out about the demon, but I caught them outside with a circle trying to contact it. Interesting. Kolinsky thought about it for a moment, then quirked an eyebrow at Stone. This is, of course, a separate arrangement. Of course. Kolinsky pondered. I don't know their names, but I think I've heard of them. If they're the same ones you're referring to, they arrived in the area a couple of years ago. I believe they're based out of San Francisco, and they spend much of their time there, which is why I don't have more to give you. He looked disapproving. They're arrogant, hedonistic, lacking in discipline. Nothing to speak of separately, but they have an unusual report that makes them dangerous when together. I believe they refer to themselves as the trio, or the three, or some ridiculous thing like that. The three. Ah, youth and their pretentiousness. Are you sure you don't have names? Sorry, Kolinsky said. The only other thing I can tell you is to be careful. As I said, separately they aren't that formidable. But from what little I've heard, they have few qualms about causing injury to get what they want. Stone nodded. I intend to. And if you do happen to find out anything else, please give me a call. Remember, if I'm dead, I won't be able to repay you for your help. Unless you need some slightly beat-up body parts for your reagents. Kolinsky's only reply was a sly smile. Chapter 27 Stone arrived home around 2.30, still thinking over everything Kolinsky had told him. It all seemed absurd, but he couldn't afford to treat it that way. Whatever was in Adelaide's house, whether it be spirit, demon, or something else, it was dangerous. If nothing else, he'd have to see about temporarily reinforcing its prison in the short term. He wanted nothing more than to call Adelaide and tell her to cancel her charity ball, but that would be taking the easy way out. He still had time to do this. First he had to find the thing, though. That was going to be the hard part. He glanced at his answering machine. No flashing light. That meant that Ethan hadn't called to tell him when he could come over. 
He didn't expect to hear from Megan, as she was working, and her late class didn't finish until six o'clock. He wanted to go to Adelaide's house and search through her attic, though at this point he didn't think he'd find out anything that Kalinsky hadn't already given him. He might even be able to spend some time poking around looking for the spirit. He refused to call it a demon. Even things most people call demons were merely some kind of nasty spirit from another plane of existence. Before he could do that, though, he had to find out what was up with Ethan. He was a little annoyed that the boy hadn't called him already, even if it was just to tell him he couldn't make it for whatever reason. Picking up the phone, he punched in Ethan's number and wondered if he'd get the machine again. He didn't. It picked up on the second ring. Hello? The voice sounded a bit breathless. Ethan, Alastair Stone. Pause. Hi, Dr. Stone. Another pause. Oh, man, I was supposed to call you. <laughs> I'm sorry. I was down visiting Mom. Then I got in the middle of some stuff and, uh, lost track of the time. Stone had seen less evasiveness in Antelope trying to avoid becoming Lion Chow. Ethan, if you'd rather not come up for your lesson... Oh, no, of course I want to. I can come right now if you want. Why don't you do that, then? He went over the timetable mentally. It would take Ethan about half an hour to get to his house. If the lesson lasted an hour, he'd still have time to get down to Adelaide's before it was too late. We'll see you in a bit. A little more than half an hour later, Ethan's little blue car pulled into the driveway. Stone watched him come up the walk with a slight frown. He looked different somehow, but Stone couldn't quite put his finger on it. Something about the way he carried himself. Once inside, Ethan was again quick to apologize. I want you to know I'm really sorry for the last few days. It's been crazy with Mom, and... Hey, what happened to you? Stone raised a questioning eyebrow. Your chin's all bruised, and you're walking funny. What happened? He waved it off. Nothing to worry about. I'm fine. Now then, come with me. I'd like to talk with you before we go downstairs and you show me how well you've been working on that levitation spell. Ethan seemed reluctant, but he followed along to the sitting room and sat down on the overstuffed chair where Stone indicated. Stone himself sat in his usual chair. He leaned forward and silently studied the boy for several seconds. Ethan was clearly trying not to squirm under his scrutiny. Uh... What is it? I don't know, Stone replied slowly. Something's changed about you, and I can't decide what it is. Changed? He nodded. You seem... different. His gaze sharpened. Ethan, are you sure you're being completely honest with me? I get the feeling that you might be holding something back. Ethan met his gaze. Different? I don't know what you mean, Dr. Stone. Different like how? I don't know. I can't quite identify it. But I'm usually fairly good at reading these kinds of things, and I can't shake the feeling that you're hiding something from me. Absurdly, he was taken back to the conversation with Megan just last night. Now he was on the other side. His sympathy for what his girlfriend was experiencing went up a notch. What have you been doing with all this time you've been at home? Spending time at the hospital visiting Mom, like I told you, and practicing the levitation spell. I guess maybe I did go a little further than you told me to, but I got tired of lifting coins. Oh? Ethan nodded. Yeah, I can do books now. Just one at a time and just small ones, but I'm getting pretty good at it. Excellent. You'll have to show me. But that's for later. Listen, Ethan... I told you when I first agreed to take you on that you were going to have to make it worth my while. That you'd have to agree to follow my orders as far as magical training went and work as hard as you can. You remember that, don't you? Sure. And I have been. Just the tiniest hint of something defiant touched his tone. Have you? Stone's expression was neutral. Sure I have. His voice rose a little. Look, Dr. Stone, I'm sorry if I'm not the perfect apprentice. I don't even know what that is. But I've been pretty stressed out lately with Mom being so sick. I'm trying to do the best I can, but... Stone held up his hand, still expressionless. Ethan, stop. I'm not saying that you're not doing a good job, given the circumstances you have to deal with. It's just that... I feel as though you've been avoiding me these past few days, and I'm not sure why. 
I don't think it's entirely because of your mother. Am I wrong? Ethan didn't answer for a long time. No, he finally said. You aren't wrong. Why, then? I don't know, he said. Everything's crazy. I want to learn magic, but there's so much going on that I have to do at home, and... And? He looked down at his lap. And nothing. I've just been having trouble concentrating. Stone sighed. All right, Ethan. All right. We'll play it your way for now. If you don't want to tell me, you don't have to. I want you to know this, though. I'm happy to teach you magic. I like teaching. I like helping the next generation of new mages learn. But I won't stand for being lied to or deceived. I'm not one of those hide-bound old fossils who insist on absolute obedience. These are new times, and things have changed from the way they were when I was an apprentice. But one thing hasn't changed. I expect you to work, and I expect you to take this seriously. As long as whatever extracurricular activities you've got going on that you aren't telling me about don't interfere with your studies, that's fine. Do what you want. I don't care. But if they do... They won't, Ethan said, sounding defensive again. He looked up from his lap. Let's go downstairs, Dr. Stone. Let me show you what I've been doing. Then you can decide for yourself whether I've been following your lesson plan. Reluctantly, Stone motioned him up and led him down to the basement. He settled himself in a chair, tilted it back on two legs, and nodded at the boy. All right, show me. Ethan watched him for a moment, then reached in his backpack and pulled out the book he had been practicing on. He set it down on the table, focused his concentration, and the book rose from the table and began a slow, meandering circle around the room. It bobbed a couple of times and slowed down halfway through, but for the most part it maintained a smooth path. Stone watched it go, saying nothing until Ethan, puffing, dropped it gently back down on the table. Then he nodded. Very well done, Ethan. Very well done indeed. I hadn't expected you to get that far yet. Ethan grinned, and for a moment whatever oddness Stone had been trying to identify in him disappeared, replaced by honest pride. Thanks. It's one of the things I've been frustrated about, not having anything new to practice. I got tired of doing coins, so I started on bigger things. I hope that's okay. It's fine. You did a good job. Stone leaned forward, the chair coming down with a clunk. And I think that kind of performance does deserve a reward. So I'm going to give you something new to focus on. Yeah? Stone glanced at his watch. This was going to take longer than an hour, but Ethan had earned it. I think it's time for your first lesson in circle casting. Ethan brightened. Cool. I'm just going to show you a very simple one today, and then I'll give you a couple of books to take home and read. Do you have a place at your apartment large enough to draw a circle four feet or so in diameter and safe to burn candles? I guess in the kitchen I could, at least while Mom isn't home. After that, I'm not sure. Well, once your mum is home, you can do them here for the time being until you find a better location. Stone prowled around the room as he talked, pulling boxes off shelves and amassing a small pile of things on one of the work tables. Do you know anything about circles? I don't think there was much in the books I've given you so far, was there? Not a lot, he said. A little in the intro text. You make them with candles and chalk and sand and stuff, right? Sometimes. Except for very specific exceptions, what you use to make them isn't as important as the power and intent you infuse into them. In essence, a circle is simply a barrier to keep things in or out while you're working magic. They're a way to concentrate your energy and channel it in specific ways, but your own willpower and control are still the most important parts of the process. He picked up some of the items and moved to the large open area in the room. Come over here and watch what I do. Ethan did as he was told, dragging his chair over. Stone didn't take a lot of time building the circle, since it didn't need to contain or keep out anything harmful. He drew the circle itself with sand, then sketched in a pattern in the middle with colored chalk and anchored its edges with candles. This is Circle 101, he said. It's the equivalent of using child's building blocks to build a house. But shift over and watch with your magical senses while I power it. He waited until he thought Ethan had complied, then stepped into the circle and completed the circuit. Dim lines of power flared between its endpoints, illuminating the pattern. See? Cool, Ethan said, leaning forward in his chair. 
Now come over here and step inside with me. Be careful not to smudge the chalk lines or disturb the sand. That's the first thing you need to learn about circles, especially when you're depending on them. Don't do anything to tamper with their structural integrity. At best, you'll get a bugger of a headache. At worst, something might eat you or suck you into another dimension somewhere. That's never convenient. Carefully, Ethan got up and stepped into the circle, watching where he put his feet. It wasn't a very big circle, and the position put him uncomfortably close to stone. Uh... Yeah, I don't like it any more than you do, Stone said. Let's make this quick. Just watch what I do and see if you can get enough from it to duplicate it yourself. He stepped back, putting as much distance as he could between himself and Ethan, and Ethan did the same. Stone closed his eyes and began murmuring under his breath. His eyes were closed, but Stone's magical senses were well aware of what was going on. He continued to murmur, gathering energy to him and shaping it into a pattern. He was planning to show Ethan a simple sending spell, one of the easier rituals to recreate. Suddenly, though, he felt a shift in the pattern. Refocusing his senses, he almost took a step back in shock when he saw what was happening. Ethan had picked up part of the pattern and was holding it in place, feeding more power into it. How the hell was he doing that? Stone cracked open an eye to look at the boy with normal sight. Ethan was standing there, his own eyes closed, his face looking like he was putting out some effort, but not an unusual amount. He held the pattern steady without even seeming to realize he was doing it. He was even supplying some of his own power to it. Without letting on that he'd seen anything, Stone continued with the ritual as if Ethan wasn't participating. He completed the pattern, held it for a few seconds, and then let it go. All right, he said, stepping out of the circle. Did you get that? I think so, Ethan said. I saw what you did. I'm not sure I can do it myself, though. Give it a try. That's all I expect right now. Once you get the basics down, there are all kinds of things you can do with a ritual like that. Let me get that book for you, and then I'll let you go for today. I'll also give you some basic ritual materials, though, as I said, it's not really important that you use anything specific for one this simple. What I want you to do for homework is read the book, attempt to recreate the circle, and use it to send a communication to me stating that you've done it. The book will give you the details on how to do this. And I want to see you back here on Wednesday afternoon. Call me if you can't make it. But unless your mum is having trouble or you're ill yourself, I expect you here. All right? Ethan nodded. I'll be here. Thanks, Dr. Stone. He gathered up his backpack and put the book he had been levitating back inside. Stone gave him a small box of ritual materials and the book he'd referred to, then saw him out, bid him good afternoon, and closed the door behind him. Only then did he let his shoulders slump. He leaned against the inside of the front door, letting his breath out. Something was definitely going on with Ethan, something he didn't want Stone to know about, and something that had to do with magic. It was the only way he could have learned to do what he'd done. Somebody else had showed him how. He'd been thinking the boy had perhaps found a girlfriend, or was spending time with friends from school instead of doing his lessons. But if he was getting magical instruction from another source... Stone sighed. Another problem he didn't have time for. Why did everything have to happen at once? Chapter 28 Miguel had spent most of the day doing research, tracking down information about Adelaide Bonham's house and what might be in it. He didn't often admit to it because he thought it might make him look like a geek, but he was very good at this job. Usually he used it to find out details about the marks that Trin had set her sights on, things like where they lived, what their habits were, and so forth, so the three wouldn't have to waste power and time on doing it the magical way. He had a harder time with this one, however. By the time the early evening rolled around, all he'd been able to track down was the historical information about the house, Edgar Sr., Amelia, and the birth of Edgar Jr. Sorry, he told Trin when she asked him how things were going. Nothing about whatever it is that's down there. The best I could get was that the woman Amelia might have been involved with the occult, but a lot of people were back in those days. Most of them were fakes. She probably was, too. Trin frowned. I wonder if Stone found out any more, she muttered. We can't have him getting ahead of us on this. Miguel shrugged. We could just hit him again. If he's dead, he can't go after us. No, she said, shaking her head. 
Too dangerous. He's bad news, and he's going to be harder than ever to surprise now that he's got his full defenses up and knows somebody's after him. Look what he did to Oliver. We still don't know when he'll be okay. They'd taken Oliver to a hospital when he hadn't responded by the time they reached San Francisco, and he was still there, in some kind of half-awake, half-comatose state. The doctors weren't sure what was wrong with him. They suspected drugs, but they couldn't find any evidence that he'd taken any. We can't just let him get away with fucking up Oliver like that, Miguel protested. Trin's eyes narrowed. Trust me, Stone's gonna regret ever messing with us. But not yet. Let's wait until he's not expecting it. We've got more important things to do now. What about the kid? Miguel asked. Did you fuck him yet? She smiled, and it wasn't a pleasant sight. I fucked his brains out last night. He wouldn't say a word against me if you put a gun to his head. So use that, he said. Get him to tell you what's up with Stone. He's his apprentice. He's got to know something. Maybe Stone's found out more than we have, and he's told the kid about it, or he can ask. Not a bad idea, she said, nodding. I'll have to handle it right, but if I promise him another night like last night and toss in a little subtle magic, I could probably get him to hand over his mother to me. She ran a hand down the back of her head, smoothing her hair. He's coming up here tonight to help us out with some of the ritual stuff. Let's see about building some bits into it that'll help us work on him some more. The more I think about it, the more I think he's going to end up being the key to this. Oh, one more thing, Miguel said. Don't know if it's relevant or not, but I found another bit of info about that house. There's going to be a humongous charity thing of some sort this Saturday night. All kinds of rich, stuck-up types drinking too much and giving money to orphan baby seals or something. I don't know the details, but it's going to be at the house. Hmm. Trin thought about that. This Saturday? Yeah. Interesting. Let me work on that. It might just be the break we need. Stone called Adelaide and asked if he could come to the house that night. Of course, she said. You don't have to ask. Just come down whenever you have time. He also left a message for Megan that he would be going down there, and probably would be there for most of the evening. He didn't really want to go spend all that time puttering around the house and grounds, and possibly the attic, but he was running out of days. It was already Monday evening, and he only had four more days to do something he had no idea if he could do. That, and deal with those three mages if they turned up again, and figure out what the hell was up with Ethan. Nothing like having a full plate. At least he wouldn't be bored. He grabbed a quick dinner on the way down and arrived at the house a little before seven. It was already dark, and a light rain was falling. Great. On top of everything else, he'd track mud all over everything. This time he took the time to set up a simple circle in front of the house before he went in, searching for any sign of the three. He found none, which he supposed was one good thing. Iona came out while he was finishing up. Dr. Stone? Is that you? What are you doing? Just checking something, he assured her, picking up the circle components. Nothing to worry about. Well, come in out of the rain. She took his arm and hustled him inside. Adelaide was waiting in the sitting room. What are you going to do tonight? Spend some more time looking for where this thing is, mostly, he told her as Iona deftly slid him out of his overcoat and hung it by the fire to dry, then steered him toward a chair. If you're feeling it in the library, then odds are it's somewhere on that side of the house. Does your attic extend across the entire place? Yes, she said, but it's divided into smaller sections, if I remember correctly. I haven't been up there in probably twenty years. It's all full of old trunks and clothes and furniture and dust and spiders. I'm not even sure it's safe up there, to be honest. Promise me you'll be careful if you go. What about a basement? Have you got one of those? Same thing, she said. Very big, divided up into sections and full of old furniture and things like that. Part of it's more accessible than the rest, Iona added. There's a big larder down there where we keep large non-perishable foods and serving items we use for various functions we hold here, and a large wine cellar. Those are the only parts I've ever seen. The rest of it is locked off. Do you even have a key, Adelaide? I'm not sure, she said, looking fretful. I don't think anyone's even looked for it since those young men were here inspecting for earthquake damage a few months ago. They never did end up going down there. 
Are you going to need to go down, Dr. Stone? Probably, he said. I can, uh, deal with the lock if you can't find the key, but my way will be rather permanent. Permanent? You'll need a new lock, is what I mean. Iona stared at him, eyes wide, but didn't comment. Well, Adelaide said, if that's what you need to do, I haven't the faintest idea where the key is. Stone nodded. No more incidents since Saturday night? Nothing, Iona said. She hesitated, then asked, Do you think, well, is there any chance that whatever it is, it's gone? Unfortunately not, Stone said. I can still feel it. It's still here. But don't you worry. I'll deal with it. He spoke with more confidence than he felt. Then to Adelaide, Did you happen to remember any of the historical information I asked you to think about? I'm sorry, she said. I didn't... It's all been so long ago. She spread her hands. Like I said before, if there's anything to find, it's probably in the attic. I'm sure there are trunks and boxes full of old papers up there, but finding them is going to be hard, especially on such short notice. There's so much junk up there. Don't worry, Stone said, getting up and hefting his bag full of paraphernalia. I'll get to the attic soon, but I want to start with the basement. If you'll just show me the way down there, I'll get started so I can be out of here before it gets too late. Iona took him out of the sitting room, through the big main room, and down a couple of hallways to a part of the house he hadn't seen yet. This is the kitchen, she said, leading him through a pair of double doors into a large, gleaming area full of long counters and expensive appliances. She pointed to another set of doors. Through there is the main dining room, and beyond that is the grand ballroom where the charity event will be. But we are going this way. Continuing through the kitchen, she went through a single door on the far side and out into a hallway that was much more utilitarian than anything Stone had seen so far. This part of the house is where a lot of the service work is done, laundry, dishwashing, and so on. Most of it when we have functions. There are other ways to get to the basement, but this one is the most convenient and the only one that leads to the parts that are easily accessible. Stone nodded, just following along. A year or so ago, he'd visited the Winchester Mystery House in San Jose with a former girlfriend who'd wanted to see the Halloween flashlight tour, a visit he preferred to think about as rarely as possible, as it had led directly to another ex-relationship, and been impressed and a little amazed by the size and haphazard construction of the vast house. Adelaide's place, while laid out with more logic and far less insanity, certainly rivaled it for sheer size. Iona opened one more door and led him down a stairway to a hall with several other doors. She pointed to the one at the end. That's the one you want. Like I said before, it's locked. I'm sure if we looked around long enough we could find the key, but unless you've got some sort of skeleton key... I'll take care of it, he assured her. Go on back to Adelaide. You needn't accompany me. I'll be fine on my own. She looked dubious, but finally nodded. Good luck, Dr. Stone, and be careful. If nothing else, there are rats and spiders down here. Maybe even bats. He smiled. I've dealt with far worse than rats and spiders, Iona. Don't worry. She gave him one last odd, frightened look, then turned and headed back toward the main part of the house. When she was gone, he turned his attention to the door. As he suspected, there wasn't much to it. It only took a small spell to break its flimsy lock. He pushed it open and walked inside. It was very dark here. He looked around for a light switch and found one, but when he flipped it, nothing happened. This time, though, he'd come prepared. From his bag, he pulled a large flashlight and snapped it on. He could have used his light spell, but he didn't want to waste energy to power it. If he found what he was looking for, he might need all the energy he could summon to deal with it. He moved down the hallway, the flashlight casting eerie shadows on the stained, unpainted walls. There was nothing elegant or opulent about this part of the house. It looked weathered and sinister. Stone suspected it had not been updated since the days when it had first been built. It was cold down here, too. He shivered. He was wearing a sweater over his T-shirt, but he wished he'd remembered to reclaim his overcoat. The cold was making his ribs ache more than usual. Too late to worry about it now, though. He moved further in. The hallway ended in a T-intersection. He shined the flashlight down both directions, then reached out with his magical senses to try to get a feel for which way he should go. The feeling was vague and diffuse. Still, though, he sensed something else. Brief flutters of activity. Was it asleep? 
Was it watching him from somewhere while trying to keep hidden? He put a bit more focus into his search and was rewarded with what he thought was the correct direction, to the right. He was getting closer. The feelings were definitely stronger down here. He rounded the corner and continued on, moving slowly. No doubt about it, this place was creepy. It was mostly silent, but every couple of minutes something would creak ominously off in the distance. Stone was sure the creaks were simply the house settling, but as he moved further away from the door leading upward, they became correspondingly more eerie. Couple that with the faint, distant skitterings of rats, and most sane people would have given up on the mission and headed back for the light already. Stone wasn't most sane people. Still, he found himself wishing that he could have brought Ethan along. If nothing else, it would have given him the chance to talk to the boy, to find out what he was up to, or even to talk to him about anything. After all Stone had seen in his magical career, it wasn't easy to frighten him. But even then, he wasn't fond of the overly dark and creepy. There were occasional doors along the hallway he was following now. He ignored most of them because his magical senses were telling him what he sought was still ahead. But a couple times he tested them and when he found them unlocked, shoved them open for a quick look inside. In both cases, they led to small rooms packed full of the large, bulky shapes of covered furniture. The moldy, musty air that rolled out of each was nearly visible in the chilly air, and in the second one, a large furry form darted out through the doorway, scampered over Stone's right foot, and disappeared into the darkness ahead. He didn't open any more doors after that. He did notice that the hallway was sloping subtly downward as he continued. After what seemed like a very long time, but in actuality was probably only about five minutes, the hallway opened up. Stone paused at the entrance, panning the flashlight back and forth to get a better look before he stepped out into the space. The area was huge, a wide open expanse of concrete floor surrounded by more towering, shadowy forms of shrouded furniture, building materials, and rusty old gardening items. The ceiling here was higher too, rising about fifteen feet up, from where he was standing, Stone couldn't see any other doors leading out, but it would be easy to hide them in the midst of all this clutter. He took a couple more steps in, then stopped. "'Anyone there?' he called. His voice sounded dead, muffled against the decaying cloth covering the furniture. It didn't echo at all. High above him he thought he heard the flutter of wings beating, the bats Iona had spoken of. Looking around, he tried to spot them. If they were here, they had to have some way to get out. But given that the floor was covered in dust and not bat droppings, he suspected that he and Iona were just imagining them. All right, he muttered to himself, just to hear some sound. Let's get on with this. Moving to the center of the open area, he closed his eyes and reached out again with his magical senses. The feeling of the thing was very strong here. He was close, and it couldn't fully hide itself from him any more. Where are you? he whispered. You know I'm going to find you, so why don't we just get it over with? The room creaked ominously, and a couple of the cloth-shrouded towers of piled furniture swayed back and forth. Oh, that's the way you want to play it, then, is it? Stone hurried back over to the safety of the entrance and watched the room to see if the swaying got any worse. If that thing dropped an armoire on him, by the time anyone was brave enough to come down here and find him, there'd be nothing left but bones and a few shreds of clothing. Just to be safe, he put up a physical shield and powered it with one of his remaining crystals. It wouldn't be strong enough to stop anything seriously heavy, but if they were stacking things that heavy that high up, then more was wrong here than just demons in the basement. Staying close to one side and glancing up every few seconds to make sure nothing was about to fall on him, Stone crept forward and explored the room, magical senses at the ready. He'd been right. There were small walkways between the piles, radiating out toward the edges of the room. Some were blocked by items that had already fallen, probably many years ago or during the recent earthquake. The creaking wasn't repeated. He wondered how long it had been since anyone had been down here. Had it been back in the days of Edgar Sr.? Had the disastrous ritual that had taken the lives of Selina Darklight and her students, along with Amelia Bonham's sanity, been the last time anyone had ventured down? It seemed unlikely but the items here easily looked like they could have lain undisturbed for all those years. The musty smell of a long, unaired space was getting stronger. Stone wondered briefly if the air was even safe, but decided it must be if the rats were getting in and out. 
Even so, he wished he'd brought a scarf or a mask or something to avoid having to breathe the dust he was sending up with every footstep. Bad idea of breathing all that dust notwithstanding, his ribs weren't going to stand for too many coughing fits. Remind me again why I'm doing this? he muttered aloud. He could have been back at home, sharing a good dinner and a lovely evening with Megan. Because I'm an idiot, that's why, he answered himself, and moved forward again. The feeling was growing stronger as he approached the back of the room, farthest away from where he'd entered it. He stood for a moment staring down one of the narrow walkways through the junk, focusing his senses. Whatever it was, it was in this direction. Making sure his shield was at full strength, he crept down the walkway. He had to pick his way over a smashed dresser and the remains of a player piano that disgorged a family of mice as he stepped past it. He shone the flashlight up ahead, wondering what he'd find when he reached the other side. It was a dead end. The way was blocked by a large bookcase, full of moldy old tomes and stacked with yellowing newspapers. He stopped, frustration growing. The feeling was so strong here. Perhaps the next walkway over might be the one, but... Wait... He glanced behind him to make sure no one, or nothing, was approaching, then brought the flashlight in closer and examined the bookcase in more detail. He stepped back and looked at the floor. It was covered in the same layer of dust that the rest of the basement was, but he could just see faint, semicircular tracks that indicated that something had been moved here, though not recently. Setting down the flashlight, he moved his hands around the edges of the bookshelf, then skimmed his gaze over the titles of the books. Most of them were boring. Old encyclopedia volumes, classics from the early part of the century, and similarly unexciting books. But on a lower shelf, a leather-bound tome caught his eye. Its title was in a language he didn't recognize, a series of squiggly lines that made him uncomfortable to look directly at it for long. He paused a moment, then hooked his finger on top of the book and tugged. The bookshelf swung out, rusted hinges protesting with every inch. Stone grabbed hold and pushed harder. It wanted to swing shut again, so he forced it open, grabbed his flashlight, and slid through. As soon as he let go of it, it immediately slammed shut behind him. He spun and pushed at it, and was relieved to discover that he could still shove it open. It hadn't locked behind him. Stone let his breath out slowly and just stood there for a moment, getting his bearings. Well, he murmured, this looks promising. Chapter 29 he stood in a large room, though not nearly as large as the one he'd just left. This one, however, was not piled high with the cast-offs and detritus of the house's former residence. Instead, the floor was empty, except for a large, permanent ritual circle that had been built directly into it, laid out using different colored stone and tracings of gold and silver metal. Stone examined it carefully, shining his light around the entire border. It was one of the most complex circles of its type he'd seen in many years, certainly more complex than anything he'd used in his work recently. This was the kind of circle you use to do big things. Summon or control powerful entities, send spells at large numbers of people at once, or perform the kinds of transformations that nobody did anymore because they were so difficult and costly. It was also the kind that you didn't use alone. He estimated that the ritual that would need a circle this complicated would require a minimum of four people to power and direct it. He was pretty sure he'd found the site of Selina Darklight's disastrous summoning attempt. Dragging his attention away from the circle, he looked around the room. There were no bones or bodies, but he could see dark patches on the floor and the walls that, even covered in a layer of dust, looked very much like old, long-dried blood. Great chunks had been ripped out of the wood paneling that covered a couple walls. On the far side of the room was an oversized wooden armoire. Its doors were closed, but didn't quite meet in the middle. Tables and bookshelves lined one side of the room, all stacked haphazardly with dusty tomes and piles of yellowed paper covered in diagrams and cramped writing. On the other side were a series of rotting, empty wine racks attesting to what this room's original purpose must have been before Amelia and Selina Darklight appropriated it for their own use. Stone's curiosity was on fire. If the books and other materials were what he thought they were, he'd just found a treasure trove of magical information. He could easily spend many days or weeks down here, studying them one by one. There was no time for that now, though. 
He could practically feel the energy of the creature straining against its bonds. It knew he was here, and he knew that it could well be in the same room with him, half-shifted between dimensions, invisible even to his magical senses. In order to see it, he'd have to set up a ritual of his own. And if he could see it, he hoped he could set up wards or other protective enchantments that would keep it contained temporarily, at least until after Adelaide's party, to give him more time to see what he could do about it more permanently. Picking up his bag, which he'd left just inside the room's bookcase entrance, he began pulling out items and placing them on a nearby table. He'd have to make his own circle. There was no way he could or would use the existing one without further study. He glanced at his watch, a little after 8 p.m., if he was lucky, he could finish this up in a couple of hours and be home by eleven. He carefully constructed his circle behind the larger one, making sure every bit was secure, that there were no gaps, and he hadn't skipped anything or written any of the sigils incorrectly. He felt a buzzing in his head now, almost like a low-grade background count of distracting energy. It didn't quite hurt, but it did make it difficult to concentrate on what he was doing. It's fighting me. Despite the cold down here, he was getting warm from the effort of setting up the circle. He stripped off his sweater and tossed it on the table, leaving just his black T-shirt. That was better. His body couldn't decide whether it should shiver or perspire, so it did a bit of both. He pushed his damp hair off his forehead and stood back to inspect his handiwork. The circle, which had taken him about an hour to construct, looked sound to both his mundane and magical senses. It was about six feet across and glowed with power easily contained within its confines. No point in waiting any longer. Stone took a few deep breaths, stretched, and stepped into the circle. He felt its protective enchantments weaving around him, creating a barrier between him and whatever might be out there. Inside the circle, the irritating hum faded away to the faintest of sounds. He closed his eyes, centered himself, and reached out. His senses were drawn to the armoire at the end of the room. With the altered perceptions that were heightened by the circle's power, he saw a crack in the door where an unwholesome sort of light shone out. It crept around the edges of the floor, testing the boundaries, trying to find a way to force them open further. He also saw that the armoire was more than just an armoire. Powerful enchantments still surrounded it, wrapping it in nearly unbreakable mystical chains. Nearly unbreakable. He nudged his perception open a bit more, probing for information. What are you? He didn't expect an answer, but his mind was suddenly flooded with images that flew by too fast for him to make sense of them. Gritting his teeth, he tried to slow them down or, barring that, to pick out individual frames. A large room, a hellish domain seething with creeping, crawling creatures, magical sigils spinning in a mad circle, several robe-clad people standing in a circle, hands clasped, a desperate attempt to stop something, to slow it, to send it back darkness. A vast rumbling as the earth moved. A tiny crack in the structural integrity of the prison that held something back. Stone probed further. He didn't think he'd be able to get it to reveal its name, even imprisoned as it was. He felt it probing back, poking around the edges of his mind, trying to gain any knowledge it could of him. Who he was, why he was there, whether he could be persuaded or coerced to help it. And all the while, he felt the sheer malevolence of it. This thing could not be allowed to go free. Once, a long time ago, he'd seen a poster depicting the side view of an iceberg. The part that emerged above the level of the sea was only the tiniest fraction of the vast bulk floating below the waterline. He couldn't get a good look at the thing from here, not without a much more complicated ritual and probably at least two more participants but he could tell that the part of it that was emerging into their plane of existence was a similarly small fraction. If the whole thing were allowed to come through, the entire area, and perhaps much more, would be in peril. He couldn't allow that. But how the hell was he going to stop it? A whole ritual group, led by a woman who was probably every bit the practitioner he was, and assisted by another powerful mage and several lesser ones, hadn't been able to do more than imprison it temporarily. And they had had its name. All he had was his resolve, his experience, and a body in no shape to be throwing around forces anywhere near potent enough to deal with something like this. 
He couldn't send it back, not yet at least, but he could do his best to reinforce its prison. Gathering his strength, he began weaving patterns and enchantments, taking cues from those that were already there and interweaving his own with them in much the same way that one braids a series of thin ropes together to form a stronger one. He knew it wouldn't hold for long, but if he could stay its momentum long enough to gather some more mages, then maybe it would be enough. He would call Walter Yarborough, and a few others he knew. The crack was widening. The light around him was changing. The world shifted. He stood still in the center of the same room, though it didn't look the same now. His circle was gone. The room was lit by candles and sconces along both of the long walls, as well as a large brazier in the middle. Flames licked up from the brazier, creating a strange-smelling, cloying purple smoke that wound up to the stone ceiling and then dissipated. Stone looked around. The dust, the smell of mold and disuse were gone. Everything in the room looked new and fresh, including the paneled walls, now blood-free, and the brilliant circle in its center. Several robed and hooded figures, a quick count revealed seven, stood swaying inside the circle, six arrayed around its inside perimeter, their hands clasped and energy coursing between them. The seventh figure stood in the center, hood lowered, gathering the energy flowing from the points around the diameter and weaving the separate threads into a powerful hole that glowed like a small sun. Stone had to squint as he looked at it, but he could tell the level of power it contained was immense, certainly far more powerful than anything he could call up on his own. He stepped forward. The circle occupants didn't appear to notice him, or if they did, they didn't react. They continued swaying and chanting, feeding power to the tall, olive-skinned woman in the middle. The woman herself was turned away from him, focused on the other end of the room. Stone followed her gaze. The armoire was there, looking solid and substantial, but its doors were open. More light, as brilliant as that inside the circle, but an unhealthy red-purple shone from inside, illuminating the entire end of the room with its eerie glow. The woman in the center of the circle chanted loudly, her body writhing with either ecstasy or agony. It was hard to tell which. Stone edged farther forward, his gaze never leaving the group in case they noticed him, and saw sweat streaming down her face. He couldn't make out any specifics in her chant, though he struggled to pick out anything intelligible. And then something burst through the armoire's doors, pouring out into the room. For a moment Stone just stared, unable to believe what he was witnessing, a series of things boiled out through the opening, moving toward the circle. The creatures were humanoid, barely, made of tentacles and flayed flesh and great glowing greenish eyes. The sounds they made weren't anything close to human, and each time they moved, it sounded like flesh being ripped from bone. Behind them, dark slime trails stretched back to the armoire. They surged toward the circle. One by one, the six participants around the edges became aware of them, shifting position, crying out in alarm. The woman in the middle yelled out an order and directed some of the power she was handling toward the first couple of creatures. They screamed and exploded in sprays of ichor. The other creatures were not idle, though. Two of them reached the circle. They grabbed the two closest figures and pulled, seemingly unaffected by the circle's protective power. Stone watched in horror as the creatures yanked the hooded figures out of the circle and began devouring them, accompanied by screams and great, wet, rending sounds. The others screamed too, but the woman in the center barked a command. The remaining four figures around the outside quickly moved to clasp hands, while the center woman adjusted her chant. The power coursing around the circle changed, and the light in the center shifted from bright white to a deep red. She yelled something and directed the red light toward the armoire. Something else was coming through. Something big. The four remaining participants looked as if they might panic at any moment and flee, but they held it together for now. Stone had to summon rarely tapped reserves of will to do the same, and he still wasn't sure how long he could do it. His heart pounded. His mind screamed for him to run, to flee, to get himself away from this thing as fast as he could before it pushed itself through into the light. He had trained most of his life to deal with things that shouldn't exist, but this... this was an entirely new level. 
he was reminded suddenly of the H.P. Lovecraft stories he used to read back in his university days. Whatever this was, he'd never seen anything even remotely like it, and he was becoming more and more sure that he didn't want to. Stone forced himself to move around the rear of the circle, wondering if the creatures could see him, wondering if he could help. He saw now that they had changed their tactics and were attempting to seal the Amwar gateway. He knew he couldn't join the circle. He wasn't sure how the creatures had gotten their two terrified victims out without breaking it, but he had no confidence that he could do the same if he tried to step in. Instead, he focused on one of the creatures and flung a concussion spell. The creature was knocked off its feet, or tentacles, and sailed back toward the armoire opening. The circle participants paid him no attention, but unfortunately, the other creatures did. More were coming through now and the ones that were already here changed direction to head toward stone. Inside the circle, the four remaining edges and the woman at the center continued their chanting. The Amor door was closing, but slowly. Stone took two steps backward and summoned a shield spell. It came up around him just as the first creature reached him. He had a better look now and wished he hadn't. The thing had two long arms ending in wicked, clawed hands. It shambled like a zombie, Ikor drooling from its open mouth. It reared back and swiped at him. His shield flared red, but the attack didn't get through. Stone backed off another step. The shield won't hold long. Those things are bloody strong. He risked a glance at the armoire again. The doors were nearly closed, but more creatures had gotten through. They were heading for the circle. Another creature took a swing at him. The shield blocked it again, but even as it did, it flared a second time and went down. Hastily constructed shields like that weren't designed to fend off more than one or two attacks before they failed. Stone backed off again, but found his back against the far wall. The creatures moved in closer. He could smell them now, wet and moldy and impossibly disgusting, like a dead, gassy body found floating in a hot, fetid swamp. Gritting his teeth against his rising gorge, Stone blew another creature back with a concussive blast. The woman's voice rose in triumph, and he spared another glance over. The armoire was nearly closed now. She directed the red light, and two more of the creatures flew back through the tiny opening, flailing their strange arms. There were only a few left now. Stone couldn't look any more, though. Two more of the monsters had reached him. He struggled to erect another barrier, but before he could manage it, the closer of the two swung at him. Its claws were like a sloth's long and wicked, extending out past the ends of its hands for several inches. His feint to the left was too slow. The claws raked across his chest and abdomen, shredding his t-shirt and leaving bloody trails. He cried out and flung himself sideways, heedless of the pain. Beyond him, he could hear the shrieks of the circle participants as the creatures went after them. The entire room smelled of rot, blood, and terror. Barely able to get a breath, Stone threw another concussive blast at the closer of the two creatures. His head pounded with the effort, but he knew he couldn't hold back this time. If he didn't get out of here, he would be dead. The other creature, however, had other plans. It fell on top of him, raking its claws across his arms, his chest, his legs. Beyond coherent thought now, he screamed, trying to shove it away. It was far too heavy for that, though, and in any case, he had no strength left. It grabbed his arm and began dragging him back toward the armoire. He felt his shoulder pop out of its socket, and new waves of agony washed over him. No! He cried feebly, struggling to break free. The creature's claws sunk into his arm as it dragged him toward the opening with relentless strength. His last conscious thought as he finally blacked out was to wonder if anyone would ever find his body. Chapter 30 The first thing Stone noticed when he awoke was that he was chilled to the bone. He lay on his back on a surface of cold stone, crumpled like a broken doll, every muscle shivering despite his efforts to quiet them. Fearful of what he might find, he opened his eyes. He was in total darkness, so thick that he couldn't hope to pierce it. He heard no sounds at all, no screams, no skittering of rats or flapping of bats, no ripping skin-on-bone sounds from the horrific creatures that had poured through the armoire's open door. The only thing he could hear was the ragged sound of his own breath as it wheezed in his throat. He coughed, and must have passed out again from the pain. 
After a few moments, or perhaps it was a few hours, he had no way of knowing. He struggled again to consciousness. This time he didn't try to move, doing his best to take inventory from a still position. Why am I not dead? Those things ripped me up. Very carefully, still shivering and miserable, he moved his arms to his stomach. He was terrified of what he would find there. There was no crust of dried blood, no sudden flare of agony. His thin T-shirt had ridden up when he'd fallen. He shoved it up the rest of the way and probed the skin off his chest and stomach with tentative fingers. He was whole and unslashed. He pulled the shirt back down, though it did nothing to alleviate the bitter cold. What the hell? He lay there, listening. Still no sound, but he smelled the musty, dusty odor of the room he was in. He realized why it was dark. The flashlight's batteries died. How long have I been out? Convinced now that whatever grievous injuries the creatures had inflicted had somehow only been in his mind, he dragged himself up to a seated position. His ribs still burned, and he was unable to stop shivering, but aside from that he seemed to be mostly unhurt. He risked a light spell. He was sitting on the stone floor of the circle room. The armoire was still there, still slightly cracked open, but a quick look with his magical senses confirmed that he had managed to supplement the protective wards around it before things had gone south. He was fairly certain that as long as no one tampered with it, it would hold long enough for Adelaide's charity ball to go off safely. Still, complete certainty was a luxury you didn't get very often with this kind of magic. He struggled up to his feet. His legs felt like limp rubber, his whole body weak, as if he'd exerted himself too hard for too long without a break. His head throbbed from the strain of channeling too much magical energy, and he tasted the sharp tang of blood, probably from another nosebleed. He staggered over to the table where he'd left his sweater, and shrugged into it. That was a little better. At least the shivering abated somewhat. Then he glanced at his watch. He'd started the ritual around nine, and it was a little after ten-thirty now. He'd been unconscious for about an hour. Gripping the table, he fought to understand what had happened. What had he seen? Had the creature showed him something? The night it was imprisoned, perhaps? Why? Had it wanted something from him, and he'd managed to fight it off? He had no idea. Right now he didn't care very much, either. He still had a long way to go before he even reached the main part of the house, and he wasn't sure his legs were up to the task. He wanted nothing more than to lie back down and let the blackness have him again, but he couldn't do that. Not yet. Somehow he made it out of the hidden room. The bookshelf was a struggle. He'd never been the strongest of men physically, and right now he wouldn't bet on himself in a fight versus a reasonably robust kitten. And back through the enormous room full of piled-up furniture. There was no creaking or swaying now. Either the thing was truly locked back away, albeit temporarily, or it had expended enough energy in putting on its little stage show that it was resting. Either way, Stone slowly headed back, retracing his steps until he reached the stairway to the service area and the door where he'd broken the lock what seemed like a very long time ago. Barely on his feet now, he moved down the hallway, back through the kitchen, and continued until he reached the main part of the house. He didn't know where Adelaide and Iona were, but if they were still awake, he guessed they were probably in the sitting room, especially if she'd had a new television delivered by then. As he drew closer, he was rewarded by the sound of the TV and the faint voices coming from the room. Holding onto the open door frame, he called, Mrs. Bonham? She turned, and her eyes widened as she got a look at him. After a second, Iona turned, too. Oh, dear God, Dr. Stone, what happened? You're white as a ghost, and covered in blood worse than the other night, she protested, steering him toward a chair. Adelaide moved closer, her blue eyes huge with fear. She was about to say something when another voice came through the open door where Stone had just come in. Alistair? What the hell are you doing here? Stone sagged in the chair even as he turned toward the new voice. He already knew who it was, though. Tommy Langley stood in the doorway, his face dark with anger. Stone closed his eyes. It hadn't been his night thus far. Why start now? Tommy... His voice sounded infinitely weary. 
Langley stumped up and stood over him. What the hell? He started to repeat, then got a good look at Stone. What happened to you? Iona had left the room and now returned with a washcloth, which she used to mop Stone's face. Leave him alone, Tommy. To Stone, she said, Dr. Stone, what happened? Your nose is bleeding again, and you're so pale. I should call someone. He put a limp hand on her arm. He couldn't summon the energy to fight her. No, it's fine. Really, just... <sighs> so tired. Adelaide just stared at him, eyes big in her pale face. Dr. Stone, she ventured, very tentatively. Did you find... He nodded. Is it? He struggled to open his eyes. I think you'll be all right. For now. His words came out on little rushes of air, barely audible. It isn't gone, but it's contained. Then we can have the ball? It's safe? I want to come back again tomorrow. Do a few more checks. But I think so. Wait a minute, Langley protested. You're not coming back. You're not even supposed to be here now. I don't know what's going on here, but you promised me you wouldn't do this. You gave me your word, Alistair. You... Stone wasn't sure how it happened, but sitting there in that chair, exhausted to the bone, ribs aflame with pain and barely able to draw a full breath, something snapped inside him. He couldn't do this anymore. Who cared if anyone knew? What difference did it make? Why was he making all this effort to keep what he did a secret when all they wanted to do was hinder everything he tried? Gritting his teeth, he struggled to his feet and glared at Langley. Shut up, Tommy, he growled. What? Langley's eyes got big and he took a step back. This dead, pale, blood-streaked madman wasn't the cheerily sarcastic Alistair Stone he went drinking with on Friday nights in Palo Alto. You can't, I can, and I will. Stone's anger, his rage and frustration at his inability to fully deal with the situation and the ignorant mundanes who kept getting in his way gave him energy. He took another step forward, and Langley took another one back. Adelaide made a little moan of fear, but both men ignored her. Listen, Langley began, his own anger rising. No, you listen. Stone's voice wasn't loud. In fact, Langley had to watch him closely to make all of it out. But there was something in it, a quality of authority and cold steel, that drew Langley up short. I'm bloody tired of trying to keep you happy in your ignorance, Tommy. I won't do it any more. I can't. Not now. What are you talking about? Sit down before you fall down. Instead, Stone took another step forward. He had a good four inches of height on Langley and used it to his advantage, looming over the shorter man like some kind of bloody, avenging spirit. His eyes locked onto Langley's. What you want doesn't matter, Tommy. Not a bit. Not any more. Wait a minute. Shut up! He paused, getting his breath. The anger-fueled energy was still there, but it wouldn't last for long. You're going to listen to me now, Tommy. Not another word. Your aunt is in danger. This house is in danger. There's something here that needs dealing with, and I'm going to deal with it. Somehow. And you're bloody well not going to get in my way while I do it. Langley stared at him. You're crazy, Alistair. You're insane. And you've got my aunt scared to... You think I'm a fake? Stone growled, gritting his teeth again, his eyes blazing. You think I'm a charlatan, and all of this is a sham? He pointed his hand at Langley, and, still not blinking, sent him reeling backward onto a large couch a few feet behind him. Adelaide and Iona both yelped in surprise. Stone ignored them, moving implacably forward until he towered over the terrified Langley again. I'm not a fake, Tommy. I'm the real deal, and the danger here is real, too. I'm not going to let some hidebound mundane with no imagination drive me off. I plan to see to it that this lady and her home are safe, as long as it's in my power to do it. Do I make myself clear? The last sentence came out like spaced bullets from a gun. He held up his hand, letting blue energy crackle around it. Lightning danced in the dim light. 
Langley stared at it, transfixed. He shoved himself back on the couch, clearly trying to put as much space between himself and Stone as he could. What are you? he whispered. But before Stone could answer, Adelaide did. Her voice trembled, but her words were clear. He's a friend, Tommy. He's a good man, and he's helping us. I know you don't believe, but I've seen. So is Iona. Next to her, Iona nodded. She, too, was trembling. Langley's gaze darted back and forth between Stone and his aunt, settling once again on the mage. You... She's right, Tommy. Stone was swaying now, the power going out of his voice. The lighting around his hand fizzled and died. His outburst spent, his energy was draining away like water, and his exhaustion was coming back and bringing friends. This is too big for you to stop now. Just either help me or get the hell out of my way. His legs buckled and he dropped, slumping across the other end of the couch where Langley was cowering. Oh, God, Iona breathed. Dr. Stone, let me call someone. He wasn't quite out, and he struggled to stay focused against the rising tide of grayness creeping inexorably across his brain. No, just let me use your spare bedroom again. I'll be all right in a few hours. He wasn't even sure if he was actually speaking the words or just thinking them. The last thing he remembered before the grayness finally won was Iona's stern voice ordering, You heard him, Tommy. Make yourself useful and take him to the bedroom. Chapter 31 Ethan rested his head against the window in the BART train, looking out at the rain. It was nine o'clock on Monday night. He wore a heavy parka, and his ubiquitous backpack rested on the seat next to him. On top of it was a slip of paper containing the directions Trina had given him for the club where they'd start the night. He'd already visited his mother today. She'd been a little more awake, so he told her that his magic studies were going well, and that he'd met a woman he liked and who liked him. She could do little more than smile at him and weakly squeeze his hand, but he could tell she was happy for him. He'd kissed her forehead and left with a feeling that if his mother approved, things must be okay. His mind drifted back to his last night with Trina. It was doing that a lot lately. So much so, in fact, he'd started wearing baggier pants in addition to carrying his backpack to use for cover if need be. It was an occasionally embarrassing side effect, but he wouldn't have traded the experience for anything in the world. He hadn't told her he was a virgin, but he suspected she'd known anyway. She didn't tease or laugh at him. She was incredible. That was all he could say. He couldn't even be jealous about the fact that she'd certainly done this many, many times before. All those times didn't matter now. She was doing it with him. And the twinkle in her eyes, the curve of her smile, the way her body responded to his told him that she liked it. She'd used her hands, her body, her mouth to drive him to levels of ecstasy that he didn't think it was possible for a human being to experience. She only let him have a little alcohol beforehand. Don't want to dull your senses, she'd said with a grin. And afterward, she lay stretched out naked next to him on the pillows, quite unselfconsciously, and shared a joint with him. They lay there for what seemed like hours, just listening to her odd, spooky music and watching the candles flicker. He didn't remember much about the trip home, because the theater of his mind insisted on playing back every detail over and over, so they would be seared indelibly into his consciousness forever. He didn't ever want to forget that night. And now, maybe tonight, after he helped them out with their ritual, maybe he and Trina could do it again. He slumped a little against the window when he thought about the ritual. He didn't want to think too much about it, because it made him feel guilty. He'd even been defensive with Stone this afternoon, and he knew that was dangerous. Stone had seen something. He knew it. But how much? Ethan thought he might have managed to deflect some of Stone's suspicions by showing him how well he'd done with his levitation spell, but this was different. The other night had been a one-off. He hadn't expected to be doing anything more than watching the last ritual, and had been surprised and nervous when they'd pulled him into it. This time he was going to San Francisco to meet up with Trina and her friends for the express purpose of doing another ritual, and this time they actually needed his help with it. He let his breath out. I shouldn't be doing this. I should turn around and go home, 
He's going to find out, and if he does, he'll kick me out. But if he didn't go, then he wouldn't have a chance of another night, maybe many more nights with Trina. His mind spun myriad exciting possibilities. Perhaps she'd like him enough that she'd give up her other lovers and hook up with him exclusively. Maybe he'd even think about moving up to SF after Mom got better. Maybe he could move in with Trina. She had mentioned that they might have another spot open in their circle. Really, what did he have to learn from Stone at all anymore? The thought shocked him, and the way new thoughts that hadn't ever occurred to you before tended to do. He hadn't even considered that option. Did he have to learn from Stone? He was a mage. He had the stuff. He'd proven that. He could learn from anybody. Sure, the original plan had been that he'd apprentice for Walter Yarbrough in England, but Yarbrough was an old family friend. A friend of his dad's. Who was Stone? A friend of Yarbrough's, sure, but Ethan had no particular obligation to him. Did he even want to learn magic in Stone's old-school, rigorous, and discipline-heavy style? Trina and her friends were powerful, respected mages, and they had fun with their magic. They used it to help them, to get what they wanted, to revel in the power flowing through them and what it could do for them. For Stone, it seemed like some kind of... responsibility. For Trina's friends, it was a tool, a game, a weapon even. Ethan wasn't quite ready to explore such a subversive line of thought. He realized he didn't have to, though. Not yet. If he could keep his extracurricular activities from Stone, then he might be able to live his double life long enough to figure out what he really wanted to do. If he could learn from both Stone and Trina's group, that would give him a leg up on his magical education. Trina already knew about Stone, and didn't care. If he could keep Stone from knowing about Trina, then... He smiled. He could do this. And then he wouldn't have to give up his nights with Trina. After what he'd experienced the other night, he was pretty sure if Stone ordered him to stop seeing her, he'd just tell him to go to hell and that would be the end of it. The train clattered to a stop at his station, and he hefted his backpack and exited with several other people. He barely even noticed the pouring rain. The club where Trina had told him to meet her was two blocks from the station. By the time he reached it, his whole body was damp and chilled, even through his parka. He paid the cover at the door, checked his coat and backpack, and headed in to look for her. Even then, after all this time, he still experienced a quick panic that she'd stood him up. Some old habits died hard, and some corner of the back of his mind still saw himself as the awkward geek that girls wanted nothing to do with. But no, there she was, right where she said she'd be. There was a small knot of guys around her who appeared to be trying to get her attention, but when she saw Ethan, she waved them off and motioned him over. Hey she said with her ubiquitous grin. You look like something the cat dragged in. There was no malice or teasing in her words, though. It's a little damp out there, he admitted, sitting down. She smiled. We'll warm you up, don't worry. Where's Miguel? he asked, looking around. He has some other guys, uh, things, to do for a while, she said, shrugging. He'll be around for the ritual. How's Oliver? Still sick? He's a little better, but still piled up under about nine blankets and bitching that he needs more Kleenex. She snorted. Guys are just such fucking babies when they're sick. It's because we like it when hot girls take care of us, Ethan said without thinking. It just sort of popped out. He followed it with a sheepish, apologetic grin. She just laughed. Yeah, ain't that the truth. But come on, do I look like Florence fucking Nightingale? She waved at the bar, and after a moment, drinks appeared for both of them. She scooted her chair a little closer to his. So, she said, you ready for this? Ethan noticed that whenever he was with Trina, nobody seemed to care that he was obviously underage. He picked up his drink and took a sip. I'm ready, he said. No guilt about what Stone might think? He shook his head. I don't care what he thinks. He won't find out anyway. That's the spirit, she said, smiling and touching his arm. You've already come so far, Ethan. It's kind of cool to watch. I hate seeing mages being slowed down by the old guy's stupid rules. Let them take it slow and easy. The power's there to grab. Why not grab it and make it your bitch? 
They sat in silence for quite some time, sipping their drinks and listening to the pounding beat of the music. It was a small club, and the band wasn't very good, but they were loud, and the crowd seemed to appreciate them. Eventually, Trina leaned back, stretching in a most alluring manner and looking Ethan up and down. So, I want to show you something before the ritual tonight. Something that'll help. You game? Sure. Not even going to ask me what it is? I don't care, he said with a grin. Her eyes sparkled. She reached out and ran a hand gently down the side of his face, smiling when he shivered. You know, Ethan, when I first met you, I wasn't sure about you. But you're all right. She cocked her head toward the crowd. Okay, so I'm going to go dance with a guy. Don't get jealous. It's part of what I want to show you. Just shift to magical senses and watch what I do, okay? He nodded, and she got up and headed out to the dance floor. It only took her a few seconds to call a young man from the group, slipping her arms around his neck and leaning in close to him. Ethan fought down a wave of jealousy, but did as he was told, watching them closely with magical senses. His eyes widened as some sort of energy began to swirl around them, focused around the man's head. It was almost like it was rising from him, glowing brighter than his dull yellow aura. Everybody had an aura, he knew. The more powerfully magical you were, the brighter it glowed unless you did something to hide it. Stone had showed him this during their lessons early on, and since then he often amused himself looking at them when he was bored. Most normal peoples were fairly dull, only flaring brightly when they were agitated or emotionally charged. Colors varied all over the rainbow. Ethan's own aura glowed pale yellow, while Stone's, when he wasn't hiding it, was a brilliant purple tinged with gold. Trina's was a strong, clear red. Right now, as Ethan watched, Trina's aura seemed to flow out and engulf the man's head and shoulders. He slumped into her, resting his head on her shoulder as they continued to dance, and she kissed the top of his head. After a few seconds, she gently pushed him away. He swayed on his feet for a moment and then tottered off into the crowd. Ethan noticed that his dull yellow aura seemed even duller than before, while Trina's blazed correspondingly brighter. Her smile was electric as she returned to their table and sat down. So, did you see it? He stared at her. What did you do? For a moment he almost forgot that this woman had the power to completely curdle his hormones with a smile. I just borrowed a little of his power. Nothing to worry about. He'll be tired for a couple of hours, but it'll come back. It's just like he did some exercise. He'll think he drank too much and party too hard. And you? I'll have a little extra something to use for the ritual, she told him. She leaned forward, pulling him in with one hand on the back of his head and kissing him hard. Her other hand caressed his chest through his t-shirt. It's wonderful, Ethan, she murmured, pulling back a little. It really is. You don't have to try it if you don't want to, but why not? I promise it doesn't hurt them. And they don't even need the power. Don't even know they have it. Why let it go to waste? She moved in for another kiss, her tongue probing insistently into his mouth. Trembling, every nerve ending on fire, Ethan fought warring instincts. How could he have been so stupid? Stone had told him about black mages, how they stole power from others to fuel their work. How had he not realized what Trina was? But still, said a little voice that was having a hard time getting past his rising physical excitement as Trina's hand on his chest worked its way slowly downward. Is it really so bad? The guy's fine. He's still dancing, even. She didn't hurt him. Mm, he began. Trina withdrew her tongue just enough so he could speak. Hmm? You... You took energy from him, but it didn't hurt him. Nope, she agreed, her hand reaching for the waistband of his jeans. He's just fine, and he'll feel completely normal in a couple of hours. You're a black mage. His voice held no accusation or judgment. He was merely stating a fact. Sort of like, you're a woman, or you look amazing in that outfit. I don't like those distinctions, she said dismissive. Under the table, her hand went lower until she gently grasped him and began a slow massage. Those are for old people like Stone. Or did he tell you that black mages were evil? She drew out the word, dripping with sarcasm. 
that we eat kittens for breakfast and rape baby seals and want to take over the world. Damn, but it was hard to think with her hand probing his lap. He hoped she'd never stop. No, he said, sounding muddy and slurred. He didn't say that. I'm surprised. What did he say? Ethan shrugged, but it turned into a squirm as her grip tightened just a little. Oh, God, it felt good. He was glad that the club was barely lit, and the table was between them and the rest of the crowd. He... he said it's about how it's powered. That black mages can do good things, and white mages can do bad things. Really? He's more open-minded than I thought. She smiled. But it doesn't matter. He's right, you know. It's not about morality. It's all about power, and whether you're willing to take it. It's about how far you're willing to go to get what you want. She tightened her grip again, ever so slightly, and grinned as he writhed under her touch. Do you like that, Ethan? Does it feel good? Oh, yeah, he whispered. She gave him one more stroke and then pulled back. He slumped back into his chair like he couldn't get up if he wanted to. I'm glad, she murmured. More where that came from later, after the ritual. I'd just skip it and we could go now, but I promised Miguel. No, it's okay. His voice was still slurred. Oh, God, Trina, that felt so good. She stroked the side of his face. You know, Ethan, my friends call me Trin. Now, you want to try my little trick? All he could do was nod. Chapter 32 Stone stood in the middle of a long room lit by flickering candles in sconces. Dressed only in a thin hooded robe, he shivered against the frigid cold as the red light at the far end disgorged creatures one after another. They marched toward him inexorably. He tried to move, to run, but his bare feet were rooted to the floor. His brain struggled to remember the formula for a spell, but the knowledge skittered maddeningly away. The things grew closer, closer, reaching out their hideous, long-clawed hands. Dr. Stone, wake up! An urgent voice cut into the creature's gibbering advance. Stone gasped and opened his eyes. Iona was leaning over him, backlit in her quilted bathrobe, looking worried. She put her hand on his forehead. Are you all right? You are having some sort of nightmare. For a moment he had no idea where he was. Then, through the vague haze of grayness, he remembered Tommy half-guiding, half-carrying him to the elevator, and installing him in the same guest bedroom where he'd slept off the effects of the fatigue last time he'd been here. I, I don't know, he muttered. What time is it? He sat up, flinging off the covers, heedless of the pain in his ribs, and realized he was clad in nothing but his shorts. Iona, he protested, yanking the covers back up. Oh, don't be silly, she said, waving him off. I need to check you over for injuries and clean you up a bit. I'm a registered nurse, remember? You haven't got anything I haven't seen a thousand times before. Now, are you all right? How do you feel? Stone took inventory. His headache was gone, as was the grayness. The fatigue was still there, but at a fraction of its former intensity. All that was left was the pain in his ribs. Not bad, all things considered, he said. What time is it? About 2.30. Adelaide's gone to bed and Tommy went home. He wants to talk to you when you're feeling better, though. He said he'd call you later today. Great, he muttered. Just what I need. Another round with Tommy. Realizing that Iona was right about his misplaced prudishness, he pushed aside the covers again and sat up. Where are my clothes? I need to be getting home. You won't leave this late, will you? You're welcome to spend the night and leave in the morning if you like. No, I really need to get home. I'll come back tomorrow. His mind went over the events of the evening, checking to make sure he hadn't overlooked anything. I want to take another look at what I did to make sure it really is as safe as it's likely to get, and I also want to look in the attic. Of course, she said. She pointed over to a chair next to the bed. Your clothes are there, but are you sure you won't reconsider? You were in pretty bad shape. The blood. He shook his head. It's nothing serious. 
Looks worse than it is. It happens when I overdo it sometimes. Seriously, it was mostly just exhaustion, and most of that's gone. I still have a lot to do, and I need to pick up some things from home before I do it. He got up and began pulling on his jeans, t-shirt, and sweater. Iona didn't watch him dress, but she obviously had something on her mind. Dr. Stone? Yes. She looked at him, silent for a long moment. Finally, she said, What? What's really going on? What is it that you do? What did you do down there, and how do you know it's going to work? He took a deep breath. It isn't going to work for very long. What I did amounts to nailing plywood over an open doorway to keep a tiger out. It's going to get through eventually. I can only hope that the plywood holds it off long enough to come up with a more permanent solution. And this... tiger... what is it? He sat back down on the edge of the bed and pulled on his socks and shoes. Iona, I'm not sure you really want to know. It's something horrible, isn't it? He nodded. Yes. And how did it get down there in the first place? It's a long story. I'll tell you, but not now. After this whole thing is over, I'll tell you. But I really think that you and Adelaide should consider going somewhere else for a while after your event is over. I'm not at all comfortable with you even letting it go on, but I understand the impact if you cancel it, and I think I've held off the problem long enough that things should be fine. She pondered that for a few moments. Why are you doing this? Hmm? He finished tying his shoes and stood. Have you got my coat, by the way? It's out front. I'll get it before you leave. But I really want to know, why are you doing this? It's obviously dangerous for you. You've already been injured trying to fight whatever it is down there. You barely know us. Why would you put yourself at risk? He gave her an odd smile. Honestly, Iona, I don't know. I've never been particularly chivalrous, so the save the damsel in distress thing doesn't tend to work on me. Perhaps it's just that I like puzzles, and this is quite an intriguing one. Well, that, and I've grown fond of you and Adelaide. I don't want to see you hurt. You didn't do anything to deserve this. You're just in the wrong place at the wrong time. She nodded slowly. Well, I'm glad you're here, for whatever reason. He tipped an imaginary hat to her and headed for the door, but stopped before reaching it. Ah, that reminds me. When you get a chance, please talk to Adelaide. I'll be needing an invitation to the event. I want to be there to keep an eye on things, just in case our basement-dwelling beastie gets up to more mischief than expected. Besides, it'll give me an excuse to get my tuxedo cleaned. Chapter 33 Ethan was pretty sure that if he felt any better than he did right now, he'd have to check and make sure he hadn't died and gone to his own personal vision of heaven. It was very late. He lay next to Trina, Trin, he reminded himself, in her bed. Both of them were naked and spent. Trin had spent the last hour showing him several different ways she knew to blow his mind and thoroughly pickle his hormones. The only reason they were taking a break now was because after two times, He'd been unable to rouse himself for a third without a pause to recharge. She dozed now, her arms draped possessively across his chest. He went over the last several hours. The evening had been quite an education, far more, his traitorous brain acknowledged, than almost anything Alistair Stone had taught him as of yet. He had broad new horizons to explore, and many decisions he'd have to make. He had tried Trent's trick of siphoning energy from another person, and it had been amazing. He chose a girl and asked her to dance, then did his best to duplicate what Trin had done with the man. She'd given him some pointers beforehand, warning him to be careful and not take too much, no matter how good it felt. We don't want to kill anybody, she warned, and we don't want people to get suspicious. Just take a little from each person, so they feel tired. There's no way they can trace that back to us. And so he did. His arms around the girl, he reached out with his magical senses and engulfed her aura with his own, feeling her life energy flowing into him. He stopped probably too soon, worried that he would hurt her, and she just sagged a little in his arms, giggling about having drunk too much. Ethan, meanwhile, felt like his nerve endings were on fire, a good kind of fire that burned away any dullness or pain or uncertainty. 
He felt alive with power. When he'd returned to Trin's table, she was grinning at him. Way to go, she said, stroking his arm. Very nice for a first time. You could have taken a bit more, but better to go easy while you get a feel for it. That was incredible, he agreed. And we can power our spells that way? We don't have to get tired? He remembered his first few attempts at levitating a coin, where he'd felt like he'd run a marathon at the end. Was that how Stone and other white mages like him did magic? It seemed so limited. Even with the power objects, you still had to use your own power to infuse them. It made you vulnerable. Ethan was tired of being vulnerable. That's right, she said. Why waste our own energy when there's so much out there just ripe and ready for the taking? Like I said, they'll never miss it. They each repeated the performance twice more before they left the club for the three's ritual space. It wasn't far from the club, so they walked. What are we doing tonight? Ethan asked. What's the ritual about? It's just something we've been working on, to gather detailed information about a subject. It's really Miguel's thing. He loves all that research shit, mostly because it helps him stalk all his slutty boyfriends. But sometimes it's useful to know things about people. If you know things, you can use them. Remember that. He nodded. She leaned in and kissed him, giving him a taste of what was to come later. The ritual, aided by the power he'd claimed from the other clubgoers, had been a tremendous rush. Miguel had been waiting for them, and already had the circle halfway set up and ready. Trin helped him finish it, and then the two of them had given Ethan instructions on what they wanted him to do. Mostly it was like the other night, help hold the pattern steady and feed power into the circle. But they taught him the incantation they would be using, and told him he would be joining in. Just watch how we set it up, Trin told him, squeezing his arm encouragingly. You'll see where there's a break in the pattern that we leave for you. Just weave yourself in. It'll be more obvious when you see it. She was right. It had. He had little trouble doing what he was asked to do, and the extra power he was wielding sang through his body like a drug. Rather than feeling spent and nauseated when at last they unclasped their hands, he felt like he could go out and run around the block a couple of times. He stared at Trin. I didn't know it could be like this, he breathed. Old Stone was holding out on you, Miguel teased. He didn't tell you how awesome it is, did he? He said it was a rush, but a dangerous one. Addictive. Trin laughed. Only addictive if you care about doing weak versions of magic. Otherwise, it's the only way to go. Miguel had left shortly after that, and Trin had set about taking Ethan on a journey he would never forget. He shifted a little under her arm now letting out a long sigh of utter contentment. She rose from her light doze. Ready to go again? Not quite yet, he said. Soon. Ah, uh, youth. She stroked his chest. So much energy. Rolling over on her back, she put her hands up behind her head, seemingly oblivious to the show she was putting on. Ethan, can I ask you something? Anything. What are you going to do about Stone? What do you mean, what am I going to do about him? She shrugged. I saw the way you were tonight. It's like you were born for this. I'll have to talk it over with Miguel and Oliver when he's feeling better, but I'm pretty sure we do have a spot for you in our circle, if you want it. He stared at her. Really? Yeah. We might not be classically trained mages or anything. Her voice clearly demonstrated her contempt for the concept. But we've got a good thing going here, and having another mage in our group will make us even stronger so we can do bigger stuff. Plus, she added, rolling on her side and letting her hand trail down his chest and abdomen and disappear beneath the covers. That way I can keep you around more. He shivered at her touch. I'd like that, he said. He paused. But the thing is, with my mother sick, I can't really leave her. You wouldn't have to leave her, Trin said. We only do rituals a couple of nights a week, unless we've got something special going on. You could come up for those, and sometimes I could come down there. You could show me the South Bay. Maybe even introduce me to Mom. 
He nodded, not allowing his mind to engage in any further speculation. This was already better than he dared to hope. I was thinking, he said. Yes? Her hand continued its wanderings, and she took hold of his with her other one and encouraged it to do some wanderings of its own. Well, I thought maybe I could keep things up with Dr. Stone for a while, too. You know, not tell him about this yet. Her smile was sly. You want to keep learning from him and us, too? You're devious, Ethan. I like that. Well, you did say knowledge is good. It is, and more is better. He won't be able to tell, will he? Ethan suddenly looked nervous. I mean, by just looking at me with magical sight, he can't see that I've been doing... She shook her head. As long as you don't do anything dark around him, he won't be able to tell. At least not for a while. Don't worry, Ethan, she teased. Everything's gonna be fine. His smile was a little goofy. Yeah, it is. Hey, listen, she said, gently stroking him in an effort to get things going again. You know, if you're going to stick with Stone for a while, maybe you can help us out too, if you wanted. Yeah? Mm-hmm. I don't know if you remember the other night. You were pretty drunk. But I was asking you some questions about that old house in Los Gatos that Stone was interested in. Yeah, I remember that. Some old lady, and there's something going on in her house. Do you know anything else about it? Like what? He shivered, feeling himself begin to stir again. I don't know. I was just kind of interested in it, and I was hoping you might know some more. Not really. I went with him that first night we looked around, but I haven't been back since. Do you think you could... Her hand moved expertly. Find out a little more? He shivered again, looking confused. You want to know about the house? I want to know what Stone knows about it, she said. Can you get him to tell you? From everything I've heard about him, if you can get him into lecture mode, he'll talk your ear off about whatever he's got a hard on about at the time. Just see if you can get him talking. Then come back and tell me what he says. She smiled as her efforts down below the covers began to bear fruit. Hmm, speaking of hard-ons, there we go. Do you think you could do that for me, Ethan? And don't let on about why you want to know, of course? He didn't trust himself to speak. Yeah, he grunted. Yeah, I can do that. You're fantastic, Ethan, she said, green eyes twinkling invitingly as she moved in for round three. Chapter 34 Stone got home around 4 a.m. and was pleased to see that there weren't any messages on his answering machine. That probably meant that Megan had been busy and hadn't tried to call him which meant he didn't have to explain to her what he had been doing out all night. He fell onto his bed without bothering to take off anything but his shoes, and slept nightmare-free until around eight. He thought about not going up to campus, but this was the last week before the Christmas break, and he remembered that his occult in Europe and America final was today. Maybe he'd see about finding Tommy and figuring out where they stood, then head back up to Adelaide's house after lunch. He wanted to verify that the reinforcements he'd put up around the demon's prison were holding, and would likely continue to do so. If they were solid, he planned to spend some extra time examining the books in the ritual room, then head upstairs to tackle the attic. Mrs. Oliveira was due to come in today and clean up the place. He plunged deep into his walk-in closet and found his tuxedo, which he took downstairs, and left her a note asking her to take it to be dry-cleaned. He hadn't worn it in at least a year not since he attended another charity shindig for the university in the company of his girlfriend at the time. At least he didn't have to worry that it wouldn't fit. He'd always been one of those types that couldn't gain weight if he tried. Right now he was glad about that, since his usual form of exercise, long-distance running up at the Stanford campus, was pretty much out of the question until his ribs healed fully. With just a hint of vanity, he regretted that he wasn't planning to invite Megan to accompany him to the ball for her own safety in case anything went wrong. More than one former girlfriend had told him he looked quite dashing in formal dress. Ah, well. He wasn't going to be there to enjoy the festivities anyway. The final went well. 
All he had to do was sit in front of the room and read the paper with his feet up on the desk while his students toiled away on his rigorous essay questions. When the last student dropped her paper on his desk and left, he headed back up to his office and found a message. Tommy Langley wanted to see him, if he had time. He'd be in his office until noon. Sighing, Stone set off toward the other side of the campus. The weather was drizzly and overcast, not quite willing to commit to rain in earnest, but not ruling it out either. He pulled up his overcoat collar and made sure his simple shield spell was in place. He doubted anyone would try jumping him in broad daylight, but he wasn't taking chances. He saw the light through the open door of Langley's office before he got there, then paused in the doorway a moment. Unlike Stone's office, which looked like he bought all his decorations at Creepy Shit R Us, Langley's was full of old Stanford sport memorabilia, piles of history books, and a large neon sign from one of the local craft breweries. Langley himself was sitting behind his desk, going through a stack of what looked like essays. Tell me, Stone said softly in greeting. Langley looked up, startled. Hey! Um, you look a lot better today. He nodded. May I come in? Uh, yeah, sure. Uh, just toss that stuff on the other chair. It's not important. There was an odd edge in Langley's voice, almost like nervousness. Or fear. Stone closed the door behind him, then shifted a pile of papers to the second guest chair and sat down. For a moment, he watched Langley without speaking. Langley shifted nervously in his chair. Alistair, I... <sighs> he blew his breath out. I don't even know where to start. I don't know what to say to you. You're afraid I'm going to send you flying across the room again. Or worse. What the hell are you? Langley blurted, unable to conceal his fear. I thought you were just a guy who taught a quack subject about spooks and things that go bump in the night, but... But, Stone said softly without moving, things really do go bump in the night sometimes. How did you do that last night? How did you make me... Stone dropped his gaze into his lap. Here it goes. I wasn't kidding about being the real thing. The real... What, though? Magic is real, Tommy, and I'm a mage. Langley stared at him. He didn't blink. Then he shook his head back and forth, raising his hands in a defiant denial. No way. I'm sorry, Alistair, but that's bullshit. There isn't any such thing as magic, or mages, or witches, or ghosts, or any of that fairy tale shit. I don't know what I saw last night, but... Stone was watching him closely, though and he could already see that Langley's resolve was cracking. He was saying the words, but he didn't believe them. You saw what you saw, Tommy. Watch. He raised his hand, and several items from Langley's desk rose up, flew around the room, and settled back into their places. Langley didn't quite scream, but he did shove his chair rapidly away until he smacked it into the rear wall of his small office. Holy crap! What the fuck? I didn't want to tell you. It's not something I spread around. But what's going on is bigger than what I want now. It's bigger than what you want. That thing in your aunt's house is real, and it's dangerous. It has to be dealt with. I was serious when I said I don't have the time or energy to indulge your skepticism now. This is too important. I have to make you see. Stone almost felt sorry for Langley. Watching him... He saw a man who was being forced to come to terms far too quickly with the idea that several fundamental tenets on which he'd based his life were wrong. That couldn't be easy for anyone. Under normal circumstances, he'd have been more understanding, tried to help Langley accept the truth. But these weren't normal circumstances, and there was no time for gentleness. Here's the bottom line, Tommy. You don't have to get involved. You don't have to help. You don't even have to believe. All you have to do is stay out of my way. I'm sorry I had to break my promise to you not to go to Adelaide's house again, but she called me. Langley nodded, not looking at him. I know. She told me after... after you passed out last night. And Iona chewed me out good. His eyes came up. Listen, Alistair. I'm sorry that I... 
Stone waved him off. Don't worry about it. No apology needed. I just need you to know, and I know you're not going to like this, but that isn't relevant at the moment, that you aren't going to stop me. I'll do whatever I need to do to get this sorted. For a very long time, Langley said nothing. He stared down at the mess on his desk, shuffled a few papers around and squared them up into a stack, and rearranged several pens into a line. Then, without looking up, he said in a barely audible voice, I want to help. Stone wasn't sure he'd heard him correctly. What? Langley looked up, meeting Stone's gaze. I said, I want to help. Tommy. Look, he said, his voice laced with stubbornness. She's my aunt. She's family. I love her. If she's in trouble and there's something that can be done about it, I want to be involved. Stone closed his eyes for a moment. You can't, Tommy, he said softly. There's nothing you can do. Dealing with this takes abilities you just don't have. No, Langley shook his head. There are things I can do. If nothing else, I can lug jars of Eye of Newt or whatever around for you, so you can make with the Hocus Pocus. He let his breath out. <sighs> I don't want to believe any of this. I really don't. Magic is... It's for kids' stories. It's not something real. But if Aunt Adelaide and Iona are in trouble, and I have to believe in magic in order to help them deal with it, then make with the fairy dust and let's get to it. Stone stared at him, making no attempt to hide his amazement and respect for Langley. This kind of thing simply didn't happen in his experience. Usually, on the rare occasions when a mage had to reveal him or herself to a mundane in times of emergency, the mundane either shut down completely and refused to acknowledge that anything was happening, or ran out of the room and found excuses to avoid the mage, usually permanently. Stone had seen more than his share of friendships end over most mundanes' inability to accept what was going on right under their noses. Tell me. No, no more chit-chat. There's stuff to be done. Just tell me what you want me to do, and I'll do it. Once we get through this, then maybe we can talk more. Right now, if I keep talking, I'm gonna run out of this room and straight to the guys in the white coats. He squared his shoulders and stood up. So what's the plan, Mandrake? Stone had to smile at that. Sit down, Tommy. And if you've got a tuxedo, make sure it's clean and you can still button it over that vast gut of yours. You're coming to the bowl. Langley grinned, even though his eyes were still fearful. Oh, Al, I thought you'd never ask. But you better bring me a nice corsage. Green, to match my eyes. And I'm warning you now, I never put out on the first date. Stone was still amazed when he thought about it later that afternoon. He was back at Adelaide's house, pleased to see that she'd taken his advice and hired some security people. They prowled around the house in official-looking jackets and sunglasses. The rain had finally stopped for now, bringing with it a rare and welcome sunny day, and even stopped him and checked his ID before letting him pass. His plan was to spend the first part of the afternoon in the ritual room in the basement, double-checking his reinforcement of the demon's prison and adding to it if necessary and going through the stacks of books and papers in the vain hope that somebody might have written down its true name somewhere. Honestly, he didn't expect to find that, but his fingers itched to open the tomes and explore the mysteries inside. He was already formulating a plan to ask Adelaide if he could buy the collection from her once all this unpleasantness had been dealt with. He suspected she'd let him have it cheap, if she charged him at all, but he didn't care what she asked. He would pay it. As far as he was concerned, these books were priceless. He was thinking about Tommy when he pushed aside the bookcase and entered the room. The man had frankly astonished him. From hidebound mundane to willing, albeit reluctant, assistant in such a short time, that showed the kind of mental fortitude that Stone didn't often see. Although, he acknowledged, Adelaide had it too. Maybe it ran in the family. He just hoped it didn't end up getting Tommy killed. The armoire looked as he'd left it. Shifting to magical sight, he saw that the additional bonds he'd added were holding. Nothing was showing any signs of fraying. He decided he'd come back every day until Saturday, or at least as often as he could manage it, to ensure that was still true. He knew the hard work wasn't going to start until after the charity ball, but he could worry about that later. His only concern right now was that the event went off 
without turning into a massacre. He sighed, setting up the lamp he brought along with his flashlight and switching it on. He knew he shouldn't be allowing this. He should have told Adelaide to just cancel the ball. Okay, it would mean losing a big pile of money for the orphans and the homeless, but was that worse than a house full of dead people if that thing got out and ran amok? He had no illusions about his abilities, nor any false modesty. He was good. Damned good, in fact. One of the best when he was in top form. But he wasn't in top form now. Nowhere close. Even if he were uninjured, he was out of practice. And even then, his best would be barely more than a fly trying to stop a freight train if that thing got loose. If he had its name, he might, might, have a chance of sending it back. Without it, well... He just had to hope that the plywood he'd put up would be sufficient to hold off the tiger. He gathered up the books and piled them on the table along with the stacks of papers. He just glanced through them at first to figure out if any of them jumped out at him, and then... The dull pain in his ribs finally made itself sufficiently annoying that Stone looked up from his studies. Startled, he realized that the lamp's light was dimming as its battery died. Bugger, lost track of time. He glanced at his watch. It was already eight o'clock. He'd gotten here at three. Stretching, he heard several things pop, and his ribs twinged again. His shoulders ached from hunching over tomes filled with faded and hard-to-read text. He'd managed to get through quite a few of the books by skimming their contents, though he wanted nothing more than to dive back in and read them in depth. They covered several esoteric aspects of summoning, including several that were uncomfortably dark in their origins. As far as he could tell, though, there was nothing about this particular demon, and certainly nothing that might have been a clue as to its name. The papers, which had been apparently written by Selina Darklight, showed ritual diagrams, incantations, and notes on things she planned to work on in the future, but once again no names. Had she even written it all down? Perhaps she'd thought it was too dangerous to do more than just hold it in her own head. He ran a hand through his hair and stood up. He'd planned on heading up to the attic tonight, but he was tired and sore and very hungry. A quick glance at the demon's prison revealed that nothing had changed. I'll just come back tomorrow, he decided. Do the attic, then. Maybe I can even bring Ethan up here to help me search if he's free. That decided, he packed up his gear and left. Behind him, the eerie light behind the armoire's skewed doors shifted a bit, following his progress until the door closed behind him. Chapter 35 Stone more than half expected Ethan to come up with an excuse for not showing up to his lesson Wednesday afternoon, and was surprised when the blue car pulled into his driveway promptly at three o'clock. "'I take it your mum's doing all right,' he said when the boy came in. "'She's stable,' Ethan said. "'Still bad, but at least she's not getting any worse for the moment.' Stone nodded. "'Any luck with the circle yet?' I didn't get a chance to try it yet. Yesterday I spent most of the day at the hospital. I was planning on working on it this weekend, if that's okay. That's fine. Actually, come to my study. I want to talk to you about something. Ethan looked nervous, but followed. He sat down on the couch and tossed his backpack down next to him. About what? I'd like your help, if you have the time. My help? With what? You remember old Adelaide Bonham and her house in Los Gatos, right? Yeah, sure. Well, I'm still dealing with some trouble down there, and I'm running out of time. She's having a big charity ball this Saturday night, and I'd like to get some things done before then. Unfortunately, what I want to do involves poking around in an enormous dusty attic looking for some bits of information. It'll go a lot faster if I can get your help. If your mum can spare you, of course. Uh... Yeah, sure, I can do that. When, though? How about tomorrow afternoon? We'll head up there around this time, and with any luck, we can find something useful. I'd also like you to attend the ball itself, if you can. Having an assistant with magical ability will be invaluable. Even if all you do is keep watch with your magical senses. Do you think you might be able to do that? Ethan nodded. Sure. Would I need a suit or something? Rent a tuxedo and send me the bill. Okay. Ethan paused. Dr. Stone, what's going on down there? Did you ever find out? Yes. 
there's some sort of nasty spirit or demon or whatever you want to call it imprisoned in the house's basement how it got there is a long story i'll tell you tomorrow when i show you where it is it'll be easier to understand with context and the stuff you're looking for is related to dealing with it how does that work quite likely it doesn't i found some books and papers in the basement but they don't seem to be related to what's imprisoned there i'm hoping we might find more in the attic perhaps packed away in a trunk or an old bookcase or something what i really want to find is the spirit's true name but i doubt anyone wrote that down its true name stone nodded that's the best way to deal with spirits sometimes the only way if you know a spirit's true name you have a lot of power over it you can imprison it enslave it or send it back to where it came from you hope anyway there's still the matter of pitting your power and will against its they don't exactly want to go along with what you have planned and they'll fight you every step of the way in this case all i'm hoping to do is send a bit of it that's in our dimension back home with the rest of it and close the opening between the two he raised an eyebrow that's all I make it sound like this will be easy. It won't. But at least we won't have to deal with the whole thing. So only part of it is here? Yes, or we wouldn't have a prayer of doing this. The people who imprisoned it did a good job, but their efforts are slipping after all these years. The prison is failing, and some of it is bleeding through. Ethan nodded, taking it all in. I'll see what I can do to help, he said. I downstairs the doorbell rang excuse me a moment stone said and headed out of the room it was megan hey she said i was in the area so i thought i'd stop by and see if you wanted to do something tonight she glanced past him oh i didn't realize you had company stone turned around ethan had drifted out of the room and stood at the top of the stairs watching them it's just ethan to the boy he said I really don't have that much prepared for you today, Ethan, if you want to take off early. Come back tomorrow and we'll go to Adelaide's, and don't forget to see to that tuxedo. Ethan nodded, coming down the stairs. What time do you want me to be there on Saturday? What time does the ball start? I think it starts at seven. Be there at six so we can decide on our plans. You got it. He nodded goodbye to Megan, waved at Stone, and headed out the door. She closed it behind her ball what ball just a little thing adelaide's having down at a house on saturday night stone said trying to sound like it was the most uninteresting thing in the world are you going to a party and you didn't ask me to go with you megan didn't look angry but she did look a little hurt i'm not going to have fun megan i'm going to work this is part of what i'm doing to help adelaide with a house problem Ethan's going to be assisting me. Still, she said, reaching out to stroke his jawline. I heard you say tuxedo. Are you going to be wearing a tuxedo? Stone could see there was no easy way to get out of this. Yes, I'm going to be wearing a tuxedo. I've never seen you in a tuxedo. I want to. She grinned. Between the accent and the tux, you'll be irresistible. Besides... It'll give me an excuse to break out the sexy black dress I bought a couple months ago and haven't had a chance to wear yet. And even better, for one time since we met, I might actually be able to see the front of your hair laying down like a normal person's. She reached out and ruffled it, making it worse. So, am I coming with you to the ball, or are things going to get ugly? And by things, I mean a certain Dr. Stone's love life. Her eyes twinkled to take the sting from her words. Seriously, Alistair, is there any reason we can't go together? I suppose not, he said, still reluctant. Though I won't have a lot of time for dancing and whatnot. As I said, I'll actually be working, keeping an eye on things. In case the ghost or whatever it is decides to disrupt the party. Something like that, yes. I'll watch out for ghosts, she promised. And I'm sure I can find somebody to dance with if you're not around. Tommy Langley, maybe? Now, how about you let me treat you to dinner for a change? You need a break. You can go back to ghostbusting tomorrow. Fair enough? Fair enough, he agreed. 
He tried to forget about the horror in Adelaide's basement and focus on a pleasant evening with Megan. They had dinner at a new restaurant in Saratoga, then went to see a movie that both of them had expressed interest in and hadn't gotten around to yet. They ended up back at Stone's place a little after eleven, and shortly after midnight they were both asleep, snuggled close together under the covers. I'm going to kill you, said a voice in the darkness. Stone stirred, opened his eyes. He was still where he thought he was, Megan's cheek warm against his bare chest, his arm draped protectively over her back. He listened for a moment, then shook his head. He must have imagined it. Or maybe it was the wind. He glanced at the clock on the nightstand. 1.42 a.m. Megan muttered something and snuggled closer to him, and he settled back. I'm going to kill you and everyone you ever cared about. As soon as I am free, I will rip their entrails from their bodies. His eyes flew open again. He sat up a little, looking around then shifted to magical sight. Nothing was out of the ordinary on either the mundane or the magical plane. Who's there? he whispered, not wanting to wake Megan. I will flay your skin from your body and boil your eyeballs until they pop. You will beg for death. Stone looked around, trying to identify the source of the voice. At first he saw nothing but then a faint light caught the corner of his eye. He turned. There was a crack in the door to his walk-in closet. A thin line of unhealthy-looking greenish light shone from it, creeping out into the room. And the line was getting thicker. Stone sat up the rest of the way, carefully moving Megan's arm. She murmured something, rolled over, and began to snore softly. The greenish light crept inexorably closer, but that wasn't the only thing going on in the room. As he watched, horrified, the dresser drawers slid open one by one, and glutinous tendrils oozed from them, flailing as they reached toward the floor. The bed began to shake. For a moment Stone thought they were having another earthquake, but the other furniture wasn't moving. The bed rocked back and forth, then bucked a few inches forward. Next to him, Megan slept on, oblivious. Soft, mocking laughter echoed through the room. Once again shifting to magical sight, Stone nearly cried out in surprise as the entire room lit up with magically active energy. The ooze coming from the dresser glowed with a reddish aura, and the entire floor under the bed flared a sickly radioactive green. Something wet and dark trickled down the walls on all four sides, puddling on the floor and creeping toward the bed. They had to get out of here. He prodded Megan's shoulder, but she just mumbled something about it not being a school day and shoved him away. Megan, you have got to get up, he urged. Something dropped onto his head. That time he did cry out, reaching up to claw at it with both hands. It was soft and yielding, and everywhere it touched it left burning trails behind it. Megan, he yelled, wake up! Wake up! The bedroom door flew open with such force that it slammed into the wall behind it. Stone, kneeling on the bed and still flailing at whatever was on his head, stared in horror. The creatures from Adelaide's basement ritual room had found him. They were flowing through the door, shambling one after the other, their wicked sloth claws reaching for him. He tried to gather the energy to throw a spell, but the oozing thing on his head dropped down over his eyes, probing its ropey tendrils into his nose, his mouth, his ears. He tried to scream, and a tentacle plunged down his throat. Another one reached down further and wrapped around his neck, and the third gripped his shoulders, shaking him. Alistair, wake up! Oh, God, please, you have to wake up! He snapped awake. For a moment he had no idea where he was, where the creatures had gone, or even why he was still alive. The room lights were on. There were no creatures, no ichor. Nothing dripping down the walls. He was kneeling in the middle of the bed, drenched in sweat, his arms up as if trying to ward something off. Megan knelt in front of him her eyes wild with terror, her hands gripping his shoulders. Alistair, what are you doing? she demanded. Her voice was pitched high and bright, radiating fear. For a moment he just stayed there like that, his breathing coming so hard and fast that his ribs shrieked in protest. Megan. 
It's okay. It's okay. You're all right. It was just some kind of bad dream. Her voice shook. He could hear her trying hard not to sob. She reached out, trying to pull him into a hug, but the memory of the slimy thing shoving a tentacle down his throat caused his gorge to rise, and he knew he was going to be sick. He shoved her away and dashed for the bathroom, barely making it in time. When he finished, he just slumped over the bowl, shaking, shoulders heaving, deciding that maybe death might not be such a horrible thing after all compared to this. And then Megan was there kneeling next to him, putting a gentle arm around him. You okay? She asked softly. Don't... Don't touch me, Megan. He muttered, miserable. Disgusting. He reached up without raising his head and flopped his hand around until he found the flusher. Oh, I've seen a lot worse in college, she assured him, brushing his hair back from where it was plastered to his forehead. Let me get you a glass of water. She got up long enough to get him one, then dropped back down next to him. Come on, honey, drink this. It'll make you feel better. Putting her arm back around him, she tried again to pull him into a comforting embrace. This time he let her. He took the glass and drank down the water. Thank you, he whispered, lowering his head until his face was buried in her shoulder. They sat there on the floor like that a long time, and Megan held him and stroked his back until he stopped shaking. When he at last looked up at her, a little color had come back into his face. What was that? she asked, clearly afraid that even asking might set him off again. A nightmare? I've never seen one so bad. I've never seen you even have one before. He shook his head. It was a nightmare, yes, but I think there was more to it than that. More to it? He nodded. I had a similar one the other night at Adelaide's place. Not as bad, though. He sighed and dragged himself slowly up to his feet. Let me take a shower, Megan. I feel ghastly. She looked uncertain. We're not in any kind of danger, are we? No. Not yet. Go on. Get back in bed. No need for you to be cold. I'll be in shortly. It was obvious she didn't want to go, but she took one last look at him, nodded, and left the bathroom. Stone stood for a moment, gripping the sink, staring at his sunken-eyed, corpse-pale reflection in the mirror. What the hell was that thing doing? How could it reach out to him from such a distance? If it could do that, then it had to be even more powerful than he'd feared. He met his reflection's eyes. Standing there at nearly two in the morning, bruised and sweating and tired in both his mind and his body, he wondered how he even thought he was going to be able to fight this thing. I don't really have a choice, though, do I? If I don't do it, who will? He pushed off the sink and turned on the shower. He didn't have an answer for that question. He might be able to call in some other mages, doubtful on such short notice, even with the portals, but so few of them nowadays were equipped to deal with these kinds of threats. There were still a fair number in this country, in England, in Europe, but most of them never pursued the art this far anymore. It just took too much effort, too much time to really get good at it, and most of them would never even come near the kinds of threats that required Stone's level of magical ability to combat. Most of them contented themselves with learning a few techniques, enough to make their lives easier, and let it go at that. He'd be sending them to their deaths if he asked them to fight something like this with no preparation. You're a dinosaur, he told his reflection, then got into the shower. Megan was waiting for him when he came out, towel wrapped around his waist and damp hair sticking up in all directions. Better? she asked. Much. He noticed that she must have gone downstairs because there was the most beautiful bottle of scotch in the world sitting on the nightstand. Ah, Megan, you are brilliant. Thought you might like that. She poured him a glass and handed it over. He drank it down, reveling in the feeling of the burning liquid as it warmed him all the way down. Just what the doctor ordered, he said with a satisfied sigh, crawling back into bed and tossing the towel on the floor. He turned to her and gave her a tired smile. Thank you, Megan, for everything. She tussled his hair. 
Now you have to take me to that party, you know. You owe me one for tonight. Just because you don't have long hair to hold doesn't mean it's not the same idea. He nodded, realizing that it didn't matter anyway. He wasn't keeping her safe by refusing to take her to the ball. If that thing in Adelaide's basement got out, she wouldn't be safe wherever she was. What had it said? I'll kill everyone you ever cared about. Better to keep her close by, where he could keep an eye on her. I'd be on it. You might even convince me to dance. Let's not go too far, she said, reaching over to shut off the light. You sure you're going to be okay? I'll be fine. He leaned over and kissed her. Go back to sleep. I promise not to scare you again. See that you don't, she murmured, moving over to snuggle close to him. He stroked her hair gently until she dropped off to sleep a few minutes later. He himself lay awake for the remainder of the night. Chapter 36 Stone picked up Ethan in San Jose on Thursday afternoon. He only had one final to administer that day, so they got an early start. The boy climbed into the Jaguar's front seat and tossed his backpack in the back. So, ghost hunting again, he said as Stone drove off. Nothing so exciting, I'm afraid, he said. Mostly information hunting today. But I do want to show you where the spirit is imprisoned in case I need to send you down there on Saturday. That, and I want to reinforce my defenses again. Ethan nodded and settled back, appearing deep in thought. Stone glanced at him a couple of times as he drove, still convinced that something was going on with him that he was keeping secret. He wanted to ask about it, but right now he didn't have the time or the energy to deal with the inevitable defensiveness it would cause. He was still curious about where Ethan had learned the trick with the circle, but it wasn't like it was anything particularly impressive or dangerous. It was a simple technique taught to every student of circle casting. In fact, it was possible, not likely, but possible, that Ethan had just picked it up instinctively on his own. Stone himself hadn't, but he'd known a couple of mages who had an inherent affinity for circles, and were able to do things like that even before being taught. Maybe that was where Ethan's talent lay. He made a mental note to investigate it further on Saturday, but for now, it had to be a lower priority. They reached Adelaide's house around 1.30. Again, Stone had to show his ID to the patrolling security guard and introduced Ethan as his assistant. The guard waved them through, and before long they were sitting in Adelaide's living room with cups of hot coffee delivered by Iona. I know you want to get right to it, Adelaide said, but I just wanted to tell you how grateful I am that you're doing this for us, Dr. Stone. It means so much to me. This is a horrible thing, but I have every confidence that you'll be able to take care of it. You have more confidence than I do, Adelaide, Stone said. But I'll do my best to make sure that your party isn't disturbed by anything supernatural. They got away as soon as they politely could, and Stone led Ethan down to the basement. The boy looked around nervously as they went through the room with the towering stacks of furniture. This stuff looks like it could fall on us any minute. Stone nodded. Yes, and I think has done in the past, he added indicating the ruined player piano. I wish I'd taught you a shield, but there's no helping it now. Just look sharp and keep your wits about you. I'm hoping that I've got that thing locked up tight enough that it won't be able to pull off any more shenanigans, but never take that for granted. He pulled open the secret bookcase door and motioned Ethan inside. For a moment the boy could do nothing but stare. Wow, he breathed. That is some circle. It is indeed. You need a big circle to deal with a big spirit like this. But we don't have time to stay here and study it, the attic calls. Just take a look at the creature's prison magically, and watch while I add a few touches to the barrier I've put up. Ethan did as he was told. After Stone finished, he followed him back out of the room, and Stone slid the heavy door shut behind them. Upstairs they found Adelaide again. She was in the sitting room with Viona, watching a soap opera. Sorry to interrupt, he said from the doorway, but can you show us how to get to the attic? Of course, Iona said with a small shudder. I'm glad it's you and not me going up there, though. There are all sorts of nasty things. I hate spiders. Please be careful. She took them up to the third floor, 
down a side hall to a nondescript door. It's up there, she said. You should be able to reach the whole thing. It's mostly a big open space, with a few smaller spaces. I don't know if the furniture and stuff have shifted around, though. You might have trouble getting through some of it. Do the lights work? Stone asked, eyeing the bag of gear Ethan was carrying, which included two heavy-duty flashlights and a lamp. They should. Well, that was something. All right, then. Let's go. He opened the door and mounted the narrow staircase. Ethan followed him. At the top was another door. Stone shoved it open and stepped into the attic, moving aside to let Ethan in. They stood near a wall. Stone hunted around until he found a light switch and flipped it. To his surprise, several naked bulbs high overhead blazed to life. It wasn't much light for such a large space, and it created more eerie shadows than illuminated areas. But at least they could see where they were going. Hold on to that bag, Stone ordered. You'll need the lights when we separate to search. If the overheads go out, I can make my own light if I need to. That's another thing I have to teach you soon, he added as an afterthought, his mind already on the task ahead. He began walking forward, then stopped. That's odd. What? Stone pointed at the floor. There's a lot of dust up here. But look there. Looks like recent footprints. Somebody's been up here, and not too long ago. Wonder who it was. Ethan shrugged. Maybe one of the workmen? Probably, Stone agreed. I doubt Iona would come up here, and in any case those are definitely a man's prints. Come on, let's see where they go. They followed the footprints, which were quite easy to see in the thick dust. They didn't go far. They'd only walked for a couple of minutes before the prints veered off to the right and stopped at the end of a jumbled pile of random furniture. A large wooden-framed mirror stood there next to the crumpled form of the sheet that had obviously covered it until recently. Stone stopped, examining the mirror. Not dusty, he said. Whoever was up here, it was definitely recent, and it looks like they pulled the cover off this. I wonder why. Dunno, Ethan said. Maybe they were looking for stuff to sell and thought it was something else. Stone leaned in for a closer look. There doesn't seem to be anything odd about this. He shifted to magical senses. Interesting. Interesting? He nodded. There are traces of magical energy around it. Very faint, but they're there. Are mirrors magical? Ethan asked. Not inherently. I've seen a couple of enchanted ones, but this one doesn't seem to be enchanted. Just seems like something magical might have occurred near it recently. He looked down at the footprints again, then shook his head. Another mystery I'd like to get to the bottom of, but I'll have to wait until later. We need to get on with this. He turned back around and shooed Ethan out of the main aisleway. All right, he said, glancing around. You go left, I'll go right. Look for any bookcases, chests, anything that might contain books or papers or anything like that. Use your magical sight, but unless it's got words on it or it's glowing with magic, I'm not interested in it. If you see anything that looks likely, grab it if you can, otherwise mark where it was and then come and find me. All right? Ethan nodded. Okay. Anything specific I'm looking for? If you find anything with the name Selina Darklight on it, or anything that looks like it might be the name of the thing downstairs, call me right away. Other than that, just use your discretion. You know what magical texts look like. We don't have time for a thorough search, so we'll have to do what we can. Meet me back here in a couple of hours, and we'll decide what to do from there. Ethan hefted his backpack over his shoulder, picked up the bag Stone had given him, and set off. It was cold up here. He was glad he'd worn his parka. He hoped he would be able to find something. Ideally, he would run across something that he could show to Stone, along with information he could take back to Trin. He had no idea what she and the others wanted to do with the thing downstairs. In fact, the thought made him a little nervous. From what Stone was saying, it sounded like whatever it was, it was incredibly powerful. Did they want to try to control it? He didn't think they'd be interested in sending it back. That didn't seem like their style. But he wondered if they had any idea how powerful it was. Even the small glimpse he'd gotten today had shown him it wasn't something to be trifled with. Did Trin and her friends have the power to deal with it? Stone was powerful, and he obviously was concerned about being able to handle it. 
That's why he kept adding bits to its prison like a desperate homeowner nailing up new scraps of wood over his window. He remembered what Trin had told him, though, about how she and Miguel and Oliver were good at joining their power together and making things happen. Individually, they might not be as strong as stone, but together? Besides, it wouldn't just be the three of them. He'd be there, too. He wouldn't be much help yet, but every little bit added to the shared power. Picking his way over bits of broken furniture, rusting toys, and piles of ancient yellowing magazines, he wondered if he was even going to have a chance to find anything. The attic was huge, and there was so much junk up here. Who let stuff accumulate like this? It wasn't like they were ever going to use it again. He turned back to see if he could still spot Stone. He wasn't sure, but he thought he saw the mage's light spell bobbing away from him, far off in the distance. He hoped Stone wouldn't find the information first, if it was even here to begin with. Time passed, and he grew increasingly discouraged. He'd poked through the drawers and dusty dressers, opened chests, examined bookcases, pulled apart piles of haphazard, broken objects, looked inside armoires, and even gone through a pile of brittle movie magazines he found in a corner. He'd encountered countless spiders, mice, and evidence of where mice had been, the skeletons of three small creatures that might have been large rats or small raccoons, and more dust than he wanted to see again for the rest of his life. He'd resorted to pulling up his T-shirt to cover his mouth and nose to keep from breaking out in coughing fits. A couple of times from far off in the distance, he heard Stone coughing as well. He glanced at his watch. Almost four. It was getting close to Stone's two-hour mark, but he'd almost reached the end of a junk pile and he wanted to finish checking it. He knew he'd have to head back soon. Evening visiting hours at the hospital started at 5.30, and he wanted to see his mother that evening. For him to have time to get home, clean up, and get to the hospital, he'd have to leave no later than 4.30. He stepped up his pace, tossing aside junk until his arms grew sore, but found nothing. Sighing, he ran a hand through his hair in an unconscious imitation of Stone's habitual gesture. He'd have to accept it. Maybe there was just nothing here to find. Disheartened, he trudged back toward where he and Stone had first separated. Idly, as he got closer, he thought of the footprints again, wondering where they'd come from. They seemed oddly familiar somehow, but he had no idea why. He'd certainly never been up here before. He'd remember if he had. But there was something about that mirror. And then a thought came to him. The kind of thought that made you smack your head and go, Of course! His breath quickened, as did his pace. He had about ten minutes before Stone was due back at the rendezvous point. Would it be enough time? Arriving back at the footprints, he followed them to the mirror. It was taller than he was, intricately carved and very fancy. It also looked quite heavy. It hadn't even occurred to Stone to try to move it. But what if... He took hold of one side of it and pulled. Nothing happened. Disappointment washed over him. He'd been so sure. He moved over, took hold of the other side, and pulled again. The mirror swung toward him. Ethan grinned. Yes! He whispered, pumping his fist. Quickly, he slipped behind it and pulled it back to its original position. There was no secret room here, no fancy ritual circle or anything like that. Just a continuation of the same pathway through the junk. But at the end of it, his gaze immediately fell on a small stack of books and papers piled in an untidy heap on the floor. He hurried over and dropped to his knees, picking up the first book and examining it. It was small, the size of a diary, bound in cracked red leather. There was some kind of strange sigil on the front of it, and a lock holding it shut. He turned it sideways, and on the edges of the page he could see something written. Pulling his flashlight close, he shone it down and was rewarded by the initials S.D. Selina Darklight. It was all Ethan could do not to whoop in elation. He turned to make sure Stone wasn't coming up behind him, then stashed the little book in the inner pocket of his parka. He was sure Trin would very much like to use it, and she would be very happy with him for delivering it. Quickly he turned his attention to the other books and papers. There weren't many papers. They contained diagrams of circles and densely packed handwritten texts that were nearly impossible to read. None of the rest of the books looked like diaries. They were all large, thick, leather-bound tomes, and all of them had the look of magic to them. 
he picked up a couple and riffled through their pages. They looked very old, but professionally printed, not written in someone's hand. He couldn't make out much of what they were about because they weren't written in English, but by the diagrams it seemed like they had something to do with summoning. Unfortunately, all but two of them were too big to fit in his backpack. He stuffed those two in along with the papers, but there wasn't anything he could do about the rest of them. Ethan? It was Stone, and he was very close. Ethan's gaze darted around, but he didn't see any way to get out of here unseen and hide his find from the mage. Instead, since there was no way he could take the rest of the books to Trin, he decided to try to allay some of Stone's suspicions about him. Over here! Dr. Stone, I found something! Where are you? His voice was closer now. He sounded like he was near the point where they'd separated. Behind the mirror! I found some books here! He could hear Stone's footsteps hurrying toward him. In a moment, the mirror swung open and the mage appeared, grime-streaked, sweating and flustered. Bloody hell! He swore. You mean it was right here all along? Ethan grinned. I guess it was, he said, pointing at the books. How did you find them? Stone dropped to his knees and picked up one of the books, paging through it as Ethan had. I thought about the footprints, he said. I figured maybe if there was nothing special about the mirror, maybe there was something behind it. Stone let out a long sigh. I must be tired, he said. Either that, or I'm an idiot. Well done, Ethan. I'm glad one of us is thinking at least. Even knowing what he was planning to do, Ethan felt a swell of pride at Stone's words. He really did like and respect the mage, he realized. He just didn't agree with his method of teaching. He glanced at his watch again. Uh, Dr. Stone? Stone was still focused on the books, looking through one after the other. He didn't look up. Yes? I kinda need to get going. I want to see Mom tonight, and visiting hours start pretty soon. Stone shut the book he was examining, and began gathering up the rest of them. Yes, of course. Sorry. Here, help me with these. I'll take them home tonight and look them over. Hopefully there's something useful in here somewhere. Ethan helped him pick up the rest of the books, and together they carried them back downstairs. Adelaide and Iona were still in the sitting room watching television. Iona looked up as they came in. Oh! she called. You two are a mess. I hope you found what you were looking for. Stone nodded. I hope so, too. Adelaide, is it all right if I take these books with me? I'll bring them back when I'm finished. You keep them, Dr. Stone. I have no use for them. Are they what you were hoping to find? Not yet. I'll find out tonight, but it's quite possible. They said their goodbyes and headed out. Home or straight to the hospital? Stone asked as they exited back onto the winding road toward Los Gatos. Home, he said. I gotta clean up a bit. Thanks, Dr. Stone. Thank you, he said. Good job finding that hiding place. Give my best to your mum. I should come and see her sometime soon. Tell her how well you're doing with your studies. Ethan grinned. Yeah, but maybe not tonight, he said, looking Stone over. What did you do? Take a dust bath? Damn close, he muttered. Got a bit overzealous in my search there toward the end. By the time Stone dropped Ethan off at his apartment building, it was already nearly 5.30. Ethan hurried inside, tossed his backpack and parka on his bed, and dug fresh clothes out of his pile of clean laundry. He'd have preferred to have a shower, but he didn't want to be late. He hoped Mom was doing better today, maybe even well enough that they could talk. He had a lot he wanted to talk to her about. He threw on jeans, t-shirt, and hooded sweatshirt, ran a comb through his hair, and headed straight back out. Less than five minutes later, he was on the road, and fifteen minutes after that, he reached the hospital. On a whim, he stopped at the gift shop on the first floor and bought a bouquet of flowers. His mother had never been much of a flower type, but he figured they'd brighten up her room and give her something nice to look at when she was awake. Then he took the elevator up to the fourth floor where her room was. He knew something was wrong when Matilda the desk nurse for the shift, spotted him and rose from her chair. Ethan, she said softly. Hi, Matilda, he greeted, waving the flowers. How's Mom doing? Is she awake? Her dark eyes met his, and she came out around the desk. Ethan, I'm sorry. We've been trying to reach you. We called your place, but there was no answer. You didn't get the message to call us? 
His blood froze. What's going on? She reached out and gently took his arm. I'm so sorry to have to tell you this, Ethan. Your mother passed away about an hour ago. Chapter 37 The three were three again, and Trin, for one, was glad. She would never have told him, but she'd actually been concerned that Oliver would succumb to whatever stone had hit him with back at the old woman's house. Not that she loved him or anything. In truth, Trin didn't love anything but herself and power. But she'd gotten used to having him around. He was like a comfortable old shoe that she liked to slip into when she needed a good fuck. In any case, he blew the doors off that geeky little virgin, Ethan, sex-wise. She consoled herself that she'd only have to deal with the kid for one more day, and then it would be over. If she played her cards right, she might not even have to fuck him again. It was getting harder to pretend she was enjoying it. They picked Oliver up at the hospital Friday morning. About fucking time they let me out, he complained, climbing into the SUV. They wanted to keep me an extra day because they still can't figure out what the hell was wrong with me. I got this close to telling them that some asshole mage whacked me with a magic sledgehammer and that I just needed to sleep it off. He leaned back in his seat. I need real food, no more hospital shit, and you guys need to tell me what I've missed. They stopped at a favorite diner near their ritual space. Oliver ordered the biggest breakfast they had and demolished it while Trin explained what had happened over the last few days. Let me get this straight, he said through a mouthful of pancakes. This twerp Ethan's gonna try to grill Stone for information about whatever's in the house, and we're gonna get whatever he's got to tell us and get him to let us in for this ball thing on Saturday night so we can find it. I take it that's why you guys haven't killed Stone yet? We'll kill him once we get what we're after, Tren said. But how are we going to do that? Oliver asked, shoveling in another mouthful. Do you really think the kid is going to be able to get enough info out of Stone so we can do it? He seems like kind of a fail to me. You're putting that much trust in him not fucking up? Miguel smiled. A nearby waitress got a look at the smile and quickly found somewhere else to be. Nah, Oliver. See... If he doesn't come up with the name, we've got a plan B. We do? He nodded. Yeah. I've been doing some research on this place, and also on enslaving big spirits. It's best if you have their true name, but there's another way to do it, too. Yeah? Oliver looked mildly interested, but still more interested in his breakfast. What's that? Human life force. Like the kind you get from a ritual sacrifice. That was enough to bring Oliver up out of his pancakes. You're shitting me. Nope, Trin said, looking satisfied. And not any old human sacrifice, either. You get the best power when you use somebody who has power. Like a mage. Oliver stared at her. We're gonna sacrifice stone? She shook her head. Believe me, I'd love nothing more than to slice that bastard open and watch him bleed but it's too dangerous. Too much chance he'd get lucky and fuck us up. No, I was thinking of a little more... inexperienced mage. One that has a puppy crush on Trin, and he'd walk into a wood chipper if she told him to, Miguel added with a nasty grin. Especially if she fucked him before he stepped in. Oliver grinned. Ah, okay, I get it now. And if he does come up with the name? Trin shrugged. We might sacrifice him anyway, just for extra insurance. We need to get rid of him somehow, because if I have to fake being hot for him more than another day or two, I'm gonna hurl. Oh, that reminds me. I should call him today, make sure everything's set, find out what he knows, and figure out the plan for getting us in. I hope you guys have decent suits. Thursday night and all of Friday passed as a blur of indistinct images for Ethan. He remained at the hospital until Thursday night, answering questions, signing papers, and talking to a kindly counselor that Matilda found for him. He didn't even remember what he said or what he signed. He stumbled home and fell into bed, sobbing and exhausted. Friday morning, he briefly thought about calling Stone, but decided not to. He didn't know what the mage would say, whether he'd insist on coming down and helping Ethan deal with things, or whether he'd offer perfunctory condolences 
but be so distracted by the business at Adelaide's that he'd remain distanced from the situation. Either way, Ethan didn't think he could stand it. The hospital had introduced him to a woman who would help guide him through the process, and he was grateful for that because he was mostly numb. He didn't have any relatives that he knew of. It had pretty much always just been his mom and himself since his father had died. He supposed he should contact Walter Yarborough, but it hardly seemed right to drag him all the way over here from England just to hold Ethan's hand. He was eighteen now, an adult. He should be able to deal with this. But not too many eighteen-year-olds had to navigate the confusing seas of administering their mother's last wishes and making sure that things like funeral arrangements and burial details were taken care of. The woman from the hospital, Mrs. Jackson, probably got him through the day. She gently explained what needed to be done, told him he didn't need to make every decision right now, and helped him make the ones he did have to make. He drifted through the day on a fog of confusion and grief, signing where they told him to sign and going where they told him to go, and didn't arrive back at home at the apartment until after eight o'clock that night. He threw himself down on the couch, wishing he had a big bottle of something alcoholic to help dull the pain. Once again, he thought about calling Stone. At least the mage might take pity on him and buy him a bottle of booze. His answering machine light was blinking. Blink, 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 blink. Two messages. He thought about not playing them. He'd already listened to the one from yesterday from the hospital. The carefully professional voice of Matilda the nurse, letting him know that he should go there as soon as he got the message. These two were new. He didn't want to listen to anybody right now. He dragged himself over to the machine. Better to get it over with. He stabbed the button. Ethan, Stone here. I forgot to ask if you wanted us to pick you up for tomorrow night or if you'll be driving yourself. Let me know when you can. Give your mum my best when you see her. Hot tears formed, and he angrily forced them back, clutching one of the couch pillows so hard he nearly split it. He doesn't know, he reminded himself. Nobody's told him yet. A beep sounded, and then the second message. Ethan, it's Trin. You there? Pause. Okay, well, I was just wondering if you found out anything about that stuff we talked about. Give me a call tonight whenever you're home, okay? Can't wait to see you tomorrow. Bye. He slumped back into the couch cushions. He hadn't even thought about Trin all day. He wasn't sure he wanted to call her now, but he supposed he should let her know what was going on. He didn't know if he could bring himself to even go to the ball tomorrow night. The last thing he wanted was to put on a monkey suit and stand around in the middle of a bunch of old rich people pretending to have a good time. Stone would understand, he was sure. And as for Trin, she could just come by tomorrow and pick up the stuff he had for her. He didn't even want to go outside. He picked up the phone and punched in her number. She answered on the third ring. Hello? She sounded distracted. Trin? Is that you, Ethan? You sound weird. There was a muffled voice in the background. You left a message, he said. I'm calling back. Oh, um, right. So, did you find anything? Yeah, I got you some stuff. We found it up in the attic. And I saw the thing in the basement. In a monotone, he described what he remembered, including the existing prison, Stone's efforts to reinforce it, and the massive summoning circle in the basement room. That's great, she said. You're awesome, Ethan. So when can I see you so I can get the stuff? We need some time to look it over before the party. You can get us in, right? He paused. Trin, I don't think I'm going to the party. Now it was her turn to pause. What do you mean, you're not going? I... He waited to make sure he could keep his voice from betraying him. My mom died yesterday, Trin. Oh, man. There was a long pause and some muffled sounds in the background again. I'm sorry, Ethan. Really, I am. He nodded, even though she couldn't see that. Thanks. I just... Don't think I can go, you know? I still need to call Dr. Stone and tell him I'm not going to be there to help him. Ethan, her voice sounded careful, we really kind of need you there. We planned the ritual with four. If you're not there, we can't do it. 
I'm really, really sorry to ask you. I feel like the world's biggest heartless bitch for asking right now. But is there any way you could come for even a little while? We can probably figure out how to get inside on our own, but we can't do this without you. And we won't have another chance. I don't know. Look, she said softly. I know this is horrible for you. I'm so sorry. If you can just help us out for a little while, we'll go somewhere after and hang out. Just the two of us. We'll just talk, if that's all you feel up to. You really should be talking to somebody about this, Ethan. I take it Stone's being his usual hard-ass self. I don't know. I didn't tell him about it yet. Well, don't worry about it. I'll help you, Ethan. What are friends for? We can talk all night if you want to. But if you could just do this one little thing for me. He sighed. Right now his libido, which usually did his thinking for him when Trin was around, was silent. But the kind tone in her voice did reach him. Okay, he said. I'll come for a while and let you in. I'll bring the stuff too. I think it'll be helpful. Great, she said. Thanks, Ethan, really. And if there's anything I can do to help you out, just let me know, okay? I will. Thanks. He hung up the phone and stared at it for a long time before he finally fell asleep. Chapter 38 Stone spent the rest of Thursday evening and all of Friday studying the books Ethan had found and powering up as many magical focus objects as he could. He knew he had to be careful. Every bit of his power that he put into them was that much less he'd have to draw from within himself. So he'd have to make sure he had time to recharge before the ball. It wasn't helping that he hadn't slept after Wednesday's nightmare, and barely at all on Thursday night. He didn't tell Megan how much the nightmare had affected him, especially since it was the second one he'd had in less than a week. He wondered if he'd even be able to fall asleep before he was so exhausted that his body just took matters into its own hands. He didn't have time for rest this weekend anyway. Megan had a couple of finals on Friday, so he had the day to himself. The books, unfortunately, turned out to be mostly useless for what he needed, though they were fascinating magical texts in their own right. One in particular, bound in brown leather with a red gem on the cover, was unusually potent and contained detailed information on how to summon several different types of powerful and useful creatures. Of course, the book practically reeked of black magic, but that was where Stone had gotten most of his pale gray distinction. If it had to do with magic, it was like catnip for him. He didn't care if it was good, evil, or somewhere in between. He wanted to know its secrets. And besides, there was a big difference between knowing how to perform a particular technique and actually doing it. That was why he was pale gray instead of dark gray, because he didn't have any particular lust for power beyond what he could get from white magic techniques. He just wanted to be able to recognize the others and understand the mechanics and philosophy behind them. He caught himself wondering idly how much old Stefan Kalinsky would offer for these books, but immediately dismissed the thought. Sure, it would make things easier, since he'd probably take them in payment for his last bit of very useful help instead of some of the more interesting means of repayment he usually came up with. But Stone wasn't ready to let them go just yet. Maybe, if he was able to get his hands on the ones from the basement summoning room, he might offer a couple of them to the Black Mage but that would come later. Mrs. Oliveira showed up at midday with his tuxedo, which she'd picked up from the cleaners, and stuck around to make him lunch when she saw that he'd gotten so busy with his research that he'd forgotten to eat. She shook her head in mock maternal concern. You should marry that woman, Dr. Stone, she told him. You need somebody to look after you. He chuckled. Come on, Mrs. Oliveira. You know better than that. We'd drive each other mad if we got married. I'm too much of a hermit for that much togetherness. Besides, what makes you think she'd even have me? I'm not exactly the world's best catch, am I? I think you sell yourself short, she said, but let it go at that. She'd learned long ago to leave him alone when he got like this. It was easier for both of them that way. By evening, he'd managed to get through all the books with at least enough comprehension to tell that they didn't contain the true name of the thing in Adelaide's basement, and probably wouldn't be of any help in dealing with it. 
He had just called Ethan and left a message asking whether he wanted to be picked up tomorrow night when the phone rang. It was Tommy Langley. Hey, he said. A couple of the other guys and I were going to go out and have a few drinks. Thought you might like to join us. You know, get your mind off all this heavy hocus-pocus shit for a while and talk about boring stuff like the old days. He almost said no, but realized that his only real alternative was to crawl into bed and probably not sleep. At least if he got drunk enough, he might not have the nightmare. All right, Tommy, he agreed. That sounds like just the thing. And it was. They met at a little pub where they usually got started, and Stone bought the first round. The other guys were three fellow professors, one from the computer science department, one from mechanical engineering, and the third from journalism. They were all around Stone's age, give or take a few years, and their interests were eclectic enough that even when drunk, they were full of fascinating stories and anecdotes. It felt good to be back together with them again, to be normal, even if it was just for an evening. Every once in a while, not that often, admittedly, Stone caught himself wondering what his life would have been like if he hadn't been born with the potential to be a mage, and raised among those who had the ability to recognize and nurture that potential. Sometimes he felt like his life had been mapped out for him from the time he was a small child, and occasionally he resented it. Sometimes he just wanted to be mundane, with no idea what kinds of things were out there in the world, right beyond the edge of where those who didn't have the talent could see them. At times like that, blissful ignorance seemed like a pretty damned good idea. The feeling never lasted long, though. He loved magic, loved using his will and his training to shape and control the world around him, even in his own small way. He knew it was an occupational hazard of mages, and worse among those at higher power levels. They often succumbed to arrogance about their own abilities, believing that there was nothing out there that they couldn't handle. Though he had succumbed himself on more than one occasion, Stone usually knew better. That's why he had accepted Langley's invitation. He just wanted to forget about it all for a night, before it all came crashing back down on him tomorrow there was a very real possibility that he might not survive the weekend. That was a good enough excuse to get roaring drunk the night before. Hey, it worked for the Vikings. He'd lost track of how many Guinnesses he'd downed when Langley took him aside for a private chat. Not that it mattered, since the other members of their group were busy entertaining each other with a raucous tale involving, as near as Stone could pick out of their slurred delivery, a naked woman, a rabbi, and three goats. You never did tell me what you wanted me to do tomorrow night, Langley said with a goofy grin. You want me to punch that ghost a good one in the nose? He pantomimed this activity, flailing his fists around so wildly that Stone had to lean back and nearly lost his balance on his chair. It's not a ghost, and I'll figure it out as we go along, he said, writing himself. What? You don't have a plan? Not really. Stone finished his pint and contemplated whether he wanted another. Hoping nothing happens at all. Probably won't. We'll just have a nice night with your aunt and a bunch of elderly rich people. Langley nodded, suddenly looking melancholy. I'm scared, Alistair. I want to help you, but I'm scared. Stone nodded. So am I, Tommy. You are? His look of surprise was almost comical. But you're Mandrake the Magician, Master of the Mystic Arts. Or whatever. No. Stone shook his head. I'm just a poor sod who's out of his league. And I'm afraid that if I bugger this up, people will die. You're serious? Langley leaned in close. Die? Die, Tommy, Stone said softly. His pleasant buzz was threatening to morph, as it sometimes did when he got drunk while in the wrong frame of mind, into a black depression. Not too late for you to back out, you know. For you either. You could still just tell them to cancel it. Aunt Adelaide would do it if you said so. She's pretty impressed with you. He shook his head, staring down into his empty glass. Too late now for that. I think it'll be all right. He rubbed at his eyes. 
Ignore me, tell me. I get like this sometimes. Just tired, I guess. Langley patted his arm. It's okay. Come on. Have another drink and forget about it for a while. No, I think I'll be heading home, he said, dragging himself to his feet. Got a lot to do tomorrow, and I'm already going to be wasting half the morning fighting off a hangover. Shortly after that, he sat in the back of the cab heading back to his house, window rolled down, deep in thought. Even through the fog of alcohol, he couldn't help thinking that there was something he'd forgotten, some factor in all this that he wasn't including in his plans. And as the cab stopped in front of his townhouse and he got out and paid the driver, he suspected that, whatever it was, he was going to regret not remembering it. Chapter 39 by the time Stone dragged himself out of bed slightly before noon on Saturday, Ethan still hadn't called back. He tried again. To his annoyance, he got the machine. He'd swear that boy was avoiding him. Ethan, this is Stone, he growled. I really need you to call me back, and... The phone picked up. Hi, Dr. Stone. Stone frowned. Ethan's voice sounded very strange, colorless. Though he supposed he shouldn't talk. His own probably sounded like someone had run his throat through a cheese grater. Are you all right, Ethan? You sound odd. There was a very long pause on the other end. Ethan? Are you still there? I... Uh... Yeah. My... My mom died, Dr. Stone. For a moment, Stone was speechless. If someone had asked him to list the top ten things he thought the boy might say, that wouldn't even have made the list. Ethan, I'm so sorry, he said at last, dully. When? Another long pause. Thursday afternoon. I found out when I got to the hospital. She was already gone by the time I got there. Stone closed his eyes and bowed his head. Ethan's mother had died while he'd had the boy poking around through rubbish in an attic, chasing some obsession that he had no right to even involve him in. Why didn't you tell me? He asked, his tone gentle. Have you been all alone down there? No. The people from the hospital have been helping me out, helping me deal with stuff that needs to be done. I'm... okay. You don't sound okay. Do you want me to come down there? I could help you... No, it's okay. Thanks, but I'll be all right. Yesterday was kind of rough, but today's a little better. I guess I knew this was coming. That doesn't make it any easier, though, I know. Stone sighed. If there's anything I can do, anything at all, don't hesitate to call me. You shouldn't be handling this sort of thing alone. Thanks, Dr. Stone. I appreciate it. I mean it. Any time of the day or night. You take care of yourself, Ethan. Don't worry about anything else until you're feeling up to it. Oh, right. You wanted to know if I needed you to pick me up for tonight. You don't have to. I can drive myself. Stone stared at the phone. Ethan, you don't have to come tonight. I wouldn't expect you to... No, it's fine. I want to. It'll take my mind off things. I kind of want the excuse to get out of the house for a while. If it's still okay, I mean. Of course it is. If that's really what you want to do, please don't feel any obligation. I can handle it without you if you'd rather not... I'll be there, Ethan said. Six o'clock. See you then. Stone hung up the phone and slumped back onto the bed. Guilt clawed at him. If he hadn't insisted that Ethan help him hunt through Adelaide's attic, he could at least have been there with his mother when she died. Bloody brilliant job I've done, helping him deal with anything. No wonder half the time it seems like he doesn't even want to talk to me. I don't blame him. Despite the fact that he had a lot of things he needed to do before that evening, he couldn't bring himself to rise from the bed. He lay there, half-dressed and face down in the pillows, 
for nearly an hour before he could rouse himself sufficiently to get up. When he arrived at Adelaide's house a little after two o'clock, the place was teeming with activity. There were so many cars, catering trucks, and other vehicles scattered haphazardly around the front part of the grounds that he had to park the Jaguar halfway up the driveway and walk to the house. He found Adelaide in the living room, seated comfortably with Iona on a couch, dealing with a stream of service personnel flowing in and out. She smiled when she saw him. "'Well, hello, Dr. Stone,' she called, waving. "'You're a bit early for the festivities.' Just thought I'd do a last-minute check on things downstairs, he told her. To be sure. Well, as sure as I can be. She nodded. Of course, go right ahead. And when you're done, come back. I want to have George, he's sort of the stage manager of our little event here, show you around so you'll know where everything will be in case you need something tonight. Stone noticed that she looked radiantly happy and more energetic than she had in a long time. Obviously, this party, and the money it would bring for her charities, meant a lot to her, and he planned to do everything he could to make sure things went off without any trouble. He slipped out and headed down to the basement, negotiating the maze of hallways and furniture until he reached the summoning room. This whole situation was a new one to his experience, which was part of why he was being so careful with it. He'd never seen such a powerful spirit, demon, or whatever this thing was imprisoned between two dimensions. He couldn't be completely sure that it wasn't just biding its time, pretending to be more weakened and confined than it was, just waiting for the best moment to spring free. And that was the nagging worry that wouldn't leave him alone. Beyond trying to contact it and dominate its mind sufficiently to compel it to tell him, something he had absolutely no desire to attempt, he'd just have to trust that the measures he'd taken would be sufficient. He knew the hard work would begin after the party was over, but right now he was only allowing himself to think one day at a time. He'd keep the charity ball and its guests safe, and after that, perhaps he could call in some help and see if between himself and some of the other mages he knew, they might be able to send this thing back permanently to where it belonged. He spent about half an hour prowling around the room, magical senses on full alert, checking and reinforcing his defenses. He realized that what he was doing was the mystic equivalent of building a fort out of random two-by-fours and pieces of corrugated metal. But elegance wasn't something he had time for right now. The spirit, for its part, was silent. He could feel its presence, but it seemed to be dormant at the moment. Maybe reaching out and giving him nightmares strong enough to make him physically ill was taxing it in its half-present state. You just stay asleep he murmured to it as he put the finishing touches on his reinforcements. We'll talk again tomorrow, after all these people are safe in their homes. Back upstairs, he found Adelaide again and was introduced to George Fayette, a tall, stoop-shouldered older man with an easy smile and dark, lively eyes. George is the president of our foundation, Adelaide told Stone. He's in charge tonight. I just provide the place for us to hold the ball. Stone noticed that she introduced him to George as a friend of my nephew's who's doing some consulting work for us. Yes, well, consulting mage and banisher of extra-dimensional horrors might be a bit much, he decided wryly. Besides, he hadn't banished anything yet. He followed George around the lower floor of the house as the other man pointed out the grand ballroom where the party would be held, where the band stand and the bar and the tables would be, a crowd of people were busy setting up all three as they went through, where the guests' coats would be stored, the location of the items up for auction, and the bathrooms that would be used for the ball. Then George took him into the dining room and kitchen. We won't be having a full dinner, of course, just various cookies, candies, hors d'oeuvres, eggnog, that sort of thing. Stone had seen most of these areas of the house, of course, but George's tour gave him a good idea of the logistics of the party, where the guests would be and where they wouldn't be, and ways he could get around without anyone noticing if he needed to. So, George said as he took Stone back to Adelaide when the tour was over, what sort of consultant do you do, Dr. Stone? Stone shrugged. Oh, this, that, he said. Sort of unconventional security. George tilted his head. Unconventional? We got a full security force tonight. 
to keep an eye on the guests and make sure no one who isn't invited gets in. We wouldn't want anyone's jewelry or purses stolen while they're having a good time. I'm here more in an advisory capacity, Stone said. Ah, and here we are back where we started. Thank you so much for the tour, George. He shook the man's hand and made his exit before he'd have to answer any more questions. It was now almost four o'clock. He was supposed to pick up Megan at 5.30, which meant he'd have to hurry if he didn't want to be late. He said his goodbyes to Adelaide and Iona and told them he'd be back later. Chapter 40 Stone knocked on Megan's door promptly at 5.30. When she answered it, all he could do was stare. You look amazing, he said, and she did. She was a lot like him. She preferred casual clothes, but she could dress up with the best of them when she wanted. Her dress, black and shimmery, clung to her like a second skin, and she wore her stiletto heels with the same confidence as her usual sensible slip-ons. Her hair, usually worn long, was swept up in a graceful, elegant updo that framed her face beautifully. And you're ready on time, too, he added. That makes you a true rarity among women. She smiled, motioning him in. Flatterer. You look pretty damn sexy yourself. If I'd known you looked that good in a tux, I'd have gotten you to take me to more formal affairs. Shame about the hair, though, she said with a grin. Hey, I tried, he protested. He had, too. It was just that his hair was every bit as stubborn as he was, and he felt that plastering it down too forcefully made him look like a nerd. If you're ready, though, we'd best get going. I don't want to be late. Well, early, she pointed out, but I'm not complaining. She grabbed her little bag and wrap from a table near the door, then locked it behind her. Are we picking up Ethan? she asked as they drove off. He shook his head, looking troubled. No. He's going to get up there himself. He paused. Megan, I called him this morning. His mum died Thursday afternoon. Her eyes widened. What? Oh, no. That's horrible. He nodded. He didn't even tell me until I called him to find out if he wanted me to pick him up. Why not? I don't know, he sighed. You're not making him go to this thing tonight, are you? No. I told him I didn't expect him to. I offered to help with anything he needed, but he said he was fine and that he wanted to come. Said it would take his mind off things. She glanced over at him. His eyes were fixed on the road ahead, his jaw set. You're feeling guilty about something, aren't you? He continued to watch the road. A light rain was falling, and the oncoming headlights made dazzling patterns in the droplets on his windshield. He wasn't with her when she died. Because of me. Because of you? What do you mean? I had him at Adelaide's place searching through her attic with me for some information I wanted to find. He spoke softly, his jaw still set tight. She touched his arm. Alistair, that wasn't your fault. You didn't know. No, he said, I didn't. But I did know she was ill. She sighed, as if knowing there was nothing she could say that would change his mind. Instead, she just squeezed his arm and said, I'm sorry. He didn't reply. The house was ablaze with festive lights that they could see from the road even before they reached the gate. They were still early, so they didn't have to wait in a line of cars, but a few other early birds were already showing up. Uniformed teenagers with light sticks waved them in, and a valet took charge of the car near the door. Megan, who had never seen Adelaide's house before, gaped. Wow, she said. You didn't tell me your old lady lived in someplace this fancy. Normally it doesn't look quite this good, he told her, taking her arm and escorting her up the steps to the front door. There he showed their invitation to the doorman, and they were bowed inside. They fixed it up quite a bit for the party. I've never seen all these lights before. If I win the lottery, I'll buy a place like this, she said, stopping to gaze up in wonder at the twenty-foot-tall Christmas tree standing in the entry chamber. Another uniformed attendant took their coats and gave them claim checks. And you can be my kept boy. Complete with ravening demon imprisoned in the basement? 
I'll take that deal, he said aloud with a wicked grin. But trust me, you don't want a place like this. Adelaide and Iona greeted them warmly from the dining room, where Stone introduced them to Megan. You two make a lovely couple, Adelaide said with a smile. I do hope you'll be able to enjoy yourselves tonight. Don't spend all your time working. There's no need, is there? I just want to keep an eye on things, Stone said. But don't worry, we'll make sure to enjoy your hospitality. Tommy Langley came in then. Unlike Stone's tuxedo, his fit like a rental and looked a bit like he'd slept in it. But he grinned when he saw Stone and Megan. Oh, look, it's Beauty and the Beast. Good to see you, Megan. You look fantastic. Stone raised an eyebrow. Hey, now, I thought I was your date for the evening, Tommy. I'll share you, Megan said, laughing, but I get the first dance. Ethan arrived a few minutes later, shown into the room by one of the uniformed guides. He looked sad and preoccupied, still wearing his parka and carrying his backpack over his rumpled tuxedo. Hi, Dr. Stone. He waved in greeting to the others. Ethan, I was so sorry to hear about your mother. Thanks, he mumbled without looking at her. Right then, Stone said, realizing that the last thing Ethan wanted right now was to be reminded about what he wanted to forget. Ethan, if you're feeling up to it, why don't we head off and check things out before too many people start arriving? You can leave your stuff there if you like. Ethan nodded. Sounds good. Check what out? Megan asked. We won't be long, Stone assured her. Just some of the work we're here to do. Back in fifteen minutes or so. Tommy, you'll keep Megan company, won't you? With pleasure, Langley said, grinning. Come on, Megan. I'll show you where the food and the bar are. Aunt Adelaide really went all out with the spread this year. Stone led Ethan downstairs, through the basement to the summoning room. I've already checked it once today. Just wanted to get a last look. I'll probably come down again sometime tonight but I want you to keep your eyes open, magical and mundane, and let me know if you see anything unusual, all right? Anything at all. If it looks odd, let me know right away. Ethan shrugged out of his parka and backpack and tossed them in a corner. I will, Dr. Stone. Stone turned around, faced him. Ethan, he said, his voice gentle, you really don't need to be here if you don't want to. I hope you don't think I'm going to hold it against you or somehow think you failed me if you'd rather be doing something else. No, really, it's fine, he said, still looking at the floor. His eyes looked haunted in his pale face. There really isn't anything else I could be doing. I'd just be sitting home at the apartment. I've done enough of that already. All right, if you're sure, Stone said. But you have to promise that if you need anything or if you change your mind, you'll let me know. If you want to leave, just tell me, or leave word with someone before you go so I'll know not to look for you. I'll do that. Stone nodded. All right, let's take a look around here then, and get back upstairs before Megan comes looking for us. Nothing had changed from the afternoon. The thing in the armoire still seemed to be sleeping and all the reinforcements Stone had put into place were still undisturbed. He waved Ethan out, and they headed back up to the festivities. By a little after seven o'clock, many of the guests had already arrived, and the areas designated for the ball were starting to feel comfortably crowded. Stone tracked Megan down and liberated her from Tommy, who was telling her a long-winded story about one of his students. They got drinks and circulated among the crowd. "'Have you noticed that we and Tommy are the youngest ones here?' Megan asked Stone after they made a slow circuit around the ballroom. By many years, Stone agreed. It was true. Most of the party's guests were older, and many were quite elderly. The women all dripped with jewels that were almost certainly genuine, the men clad in classic old-fashioned tuxedos and dinner jackets. There were a few younger guests, but even they were in their fifties. I guess those new computer billionaires I've been hearing about don't get invited to things like this, Megan said. Stone raised an eyebrow. Perhaps they were, and they just opted to make a donation. Seriously, he added, glancing around. I don't think I'd be here if I wasn't working, would you? The band, warming up on the little bandstand he'd watched the workmen erecting this afternoon, were limbering up big band-style instruments, not an electric guitar in sight. Well, it is a little slow, 
she admitted. Nice, though. Very old world. She smiled at him. It's just nice being with you, Alistair. We should do more formal things. It's fun to play dress up sometimes. And maybe later we can play dress down, she added with a suggestive grin. Ah, oh, something to look forward to. They continued circulating, sipping their drinks and greeting people as they went. As time went on and nothing horrible happened, Stone began to feel a bit more relaxed. Perhaps this evening would end up all right after all. Chapter 41 Some distance off in the forest, the three stood watching the house. Look at all those fancy-ass cars, Oliver said. This thing's bigger than I thought. That's good, Miguel said. It'll make it easier for us to get in without being noticed. Ethan said to go around back, Trin said, pointing. He said he'd meet us at eight near the back door on the west side of the house. He better be there, Oliver growled. If he skips out on us, he won't, Trin assured him. She began walking, careful not to trip over anything. Damn these fucking shoes anyway. All three were dressed in evening clothes. Trin even wore long opera gloves to cover up her distinctive tattoos. They planned to use their blending spell to get inside, but wanted to be careful in case anyone spotted them. Oliver carried a leather bag containing some notes, ritual materials, and other gear. It also contained rope and a long, wicked-looking knife in a leather sheath. "'You think the kids come up with anything we can use?' Miguel asked. Trin shrugged. "'I don't care at this point.' If we don't get its name, then we'll just go with our other plan. Either way, it should work fine. Oliver didn't look so sure about that, but he didn't voice his misgivings. In the three, it never paid to go against what Trin had decided. Inside, Ethan glanced at his watch. It was almost eight. Almost time. He lurked near the buffet table, trying to be as unobtrusive as possible. A couple of the elderly people who'd come by had mistaken him for one of the caterers, and he was fine with that. If he could have blended into the walls, he would have, but Stone hadn't taught him that spell yet. He knew that once he let the three into the house, there was no going back. This was his last chance to back out. Was this really what he wanted to do? Is this what his mother would have wanted? He feared his attraction to Trin was clouding his judgment. He really should just go to Stone right now, tell him everything, and then try to start fresh once he'd had some time to recover from his grief. The mage had been kind and sincerely concerned about him, both on the phone and in person. Ethan didn't doubt that both he and Megan genuinely wanted to help him. But Trin did, too. She also sounded shocked when he told her about Mom's death. He didn't resent the fact that she'd asked him to be here. He knew they needed him, and they wouldn't be able to do what they were planning without him. She'd offered to talk to him afterward, and maybe talking to someone closer to his own age might be preferable. Less lecture, more understanding. He picked up a plate and put a couple of hors d'oeuvres and a chicken wing on it, nibbling as he agonized over what he should do. Glancing around, he almost hoped to see Stone coming in looking for him, but the mage was nowhere to be seen. Five to eight. He had to go now, if he was going. He bit into some sort of little sandwich thing and chewed. It tasted like cardboard and his mouth was suddenly dry. He thought of stone, then of Trin. He set the plate down on a nearby table and headed for the back part of the house. The three had made it to the edge of the tree line at the back of the house and now stood impatiently waiting, watching the door. The little twerp isn't coming, Miguel muttered. He'll be here, Trin said. No way he's going to let me down. Oliver glanced around. I hope they don't have security patrols out here. If we're spotted... If we're spotted, we'll drain them and hide their clothes, Miguel said. His tone was matter-of-fact, like he was talking about what he wanted from a buffet. Nobody will find the ashes. We're pretty topped up already, Oliver pointed out. It had been a little early to go to a club for their usual shot of energy, so they'd hit a local mall and pulled power from the crowds of Christmas shoppers. We'll need all that for the ritual, Trina said. Much as I like the sacrifice idea, it would be easier if we had... Shh! Look! Miguel hissed, taking her arm and pointing. The door was opening. That 
That's it, Trin urged. Go! Blending spell in place, they hurried across the open yard and slipped inside. Ethan stood there, looking breathless and miserable. Good job, Ethan, Trin said, squeezing his shoulder. How are you doing? He shrugged. I'm okay, I guess. Good. I'm really glad you decided to come help us out. This shouldn't take long at all. Then we can leave and go find some place more private to hang out. Ethan nodded. Okay, she said. Come on, let's get this over with. Can you show us the place? Yeah. Come on, this way. Just act casual. Nobody will pay attention to us as long as we don't go through any crowds. Ethan tried not to look nervous as he led the three of them down the back hallways toward the kitchen. The sound of the band and the low hubbub of people's conversations filtered in from not far off, and every time he turned a corner he expected to run into a knot of partygoers, or worse, Stone, who would probably see right through the three's blending spell. Guilt racked him, and indecision. He still wasn't sure he was doing the right thing. Too late to turn back now. They reached the kitchen without incident. A couple individuals returning from the bathroom passed them, but those people just went by with a nod to Ethan and no indication that they thought anything was odd. Be careful here, Ethan whispered to Trin. The kitchen's busy tonight. Just keep going. He led them through and down the hall toward the basement. He lingered there for a moment until he was sure nobody was watching, then quickly opened it and waved them through. He slipped in behind them and closed the door. Trin immediately summoned a light spell. Ugh, no lights. No, they don't work. Oliver dug in his leather bag and came up with a flashlight. How far is it? Just follow me, Ethan said. He'd only been down here a couple of times, but following his and Stone's footprints in the dust on the floor, he was able to navigate them down the hallways and through the big room full of stacked furniture. Holy shit. Miguel breathed. This old bat must be loaded. Look at the size of this place. Be careful, Ethan told them as he turned the corner to the narrow passage leading to the summoning room door. That stuff stacked pretty high. Don't bump anything. Oliver looked up, nervous. This shit isn't going to fall on us, is it? Hasn't yet, Ethan told him, picking his way over the corpse of the player piano. But like I said, be careful. He pulled on the bookcase and it slid open. In here. They all crowded inside, with Ethan coming in last. He let the bookcase return to its closed position. This is it. His statement was unnecessary. They all stood there, taking in the huge circle set into the floor, the bookcases and tables, and the armoire at the end of the room. Oliver pointed at the ornate piece of furniture. That's what we're here for, isn't it? Can't you tell? Trin asked. She took a few steps closer, seemingly fascinated by the sight. She smiled, but it didn't come close to her eyes. Sit tight, she told the thing in the armoire. We're here to let you out, just like you wanted. Behind her, Miguel smirked. Okay, she said. Let's get the circle set up. Ethan, you said you had something for us? Oh, right. He'd almost forgotten about the stuff in his backpack. He hurried over to it, dug out the books and papers he'd shoved into it, and offered them to her. I haven't looked at them yet, but I hope they're what you wanted. She took them, motioning for Oliver and Miguel to get to work setting up the circle. Only one way to find out, she said. She took them over to one of the candles Miguel had lit along the wall and began examining them. Ethan, unsure of what to do, just loitered near the circle and watched the two other guys work. They were setting up candles, incense burners, and small items that looked uncomfortably like dried body parts, every once in a while pausing to consult a sheaf of papers. "'It's great that this permanent circle is here,' Miguel said. "'It makes things a lot faster. Otherwise, this would take at least an hour to set up.' As it was, it only took about twenty minutes before they finished. There was a wide-open spot in the middle of the circle— the two of them cleared some books and papers off one of the tables, hefted it, and placed it there, parallel to the armoire. "'What's that for?' Ethan asked. He'd been amusing himself watching the room with his magical senses. 
The thing in the armoire seemed to be waking up and taking an interest in its surroundings now. The light coming out of the crack pulsed in anticipation. Just for putting some of the stuff we need for the ritual, Oliver told him. He moved over behind Ethan, toward the door. Hey, Stone isn't going to show up down here, is he? He's busy, Ethan said. I don't think he'll be down for a while. We should be done by then. You getting anything out of that stuff, Trin? Miguel asked. We're about ready here. She shook her head. Nah, nothing. This is good stuff. I want to try some of these summonings later, but nothing about what we're doing here. Ah, well, plan B then, Miguel said. He didn't sound upset about it. What's plan B? Ethan asked, and then he noticed something else. Hey, why are there only three spots in the ritual circle? I thought you said you needed... Oliver grabbed him from behind, pinning his arms behind his back. What the hell? He yelled, struggling. What are you guys doing? Miguel smiled. Don't worry, kid. You're about to find out exactly what Plan B is. He reached into Oliver's leather bag and pulled out the rope and the knife. Ethan struggled harder, his eyes wild, but Oliver was much stronger than he was. Trin! He yelled, his terrified gaze locking on her. What's going on? Why are they doing this? Tell them to stop! She smiled. It wasn't the beautiful, twinkle-eyed smile that had so captivated Ethan's lust, but a snake-like grin more at home on Miguel's face. Sorry, kiddo, she said, shaking her head. I guess you picked the wrong side. But don't worry. You're going to be a big help for what we're doing tonight. A really big help. And hey, cheer up. Before too long, you'll get to see your mommy again. Ethan screamed, but now the other two were there. Oliver clamped a hand over his mouth, and they hustled him forward toward the prepared circle. Chapter 42 Upstairs, Stone glanced at his watch. 8.45. The party was in full swing now, with people dancing, standing in little groups chatting, getting tipsy, and generally having a good time. Truth be told, he felt a bit out of place among all these elderly revelers. Megan had convinced him to dance with her a couple of times, but even she was looking like she'd rather be somewhere else. What time is this over? she asked him. Isn't it getting close to bedtime for some of these folks? No such luck, he said ruefully. Adelaide told me that the auction doesn't even start until ten, and things don't wind down until after midnight. He glanced around. Have you seen Ethan lately? She thought about it. Not for a while, she admitted. Though I haven't exactly been looking for him. What did you tell him to do? Just to circulate and keep his eyes open? He sighed. I should probably go check on him and make sure he's all right. Mind being on your own for a while? Not a problem. I'll go see what they've got for the auction. Maybe I can get us a nice weekend in the wine country or something. Or dance with some guy old enough to be my grandfather. Stone headed off. He had no idea where Ethan had gotten to, nor even where to start looking. He made a quick circuit around the ballroom, then checked the dining room. No sign of him. He looked outside where a small group of men and a couple of women were smoking cigarettes on the porch, but he wasn't there either. He's probably in the bathroom or something, he thought, though part of him wondered if the boy had just decided he couldn't handle the party anymore and taken off, possibly having left word with someone who hadn't made it back to Stone yet. He went back inside and was moving back toward the hallway leading to the bathrooms when he saw Langley coming out. Hey, Langley greeted. Having fun? No spooks yet, I hope. No, no spooks. Have you seen Ethan recently? He shook his head. No, but I'm not too surprised. There's a lot of people here. So he didn't tell you he was leaving or anything? Nope. He tilted his head. Why the concern? You think something's up with him? His mother died a couple of days ago. He's rather distraught about it. I told him he didn't have to come, but he insisted. I want to make sure he's all right. A thought occurred to Stone. Hmm. What? I wonder if he's gone down to the basement. Why would he do that? Langley asked, perplexed. There's nothing down there but spiders and... Oh, shit, he added, eyes growing fearful as light dawned. That's where it is, isn't it? The spook. 
Stone nodded. Yes, and he knows it. Perhaps he went down to check on it. Wait a minute, Langley began. He's a... Uh, he waggled his fingers. Two? He's my apprentice, yes. He paused, taking another look around. I should go check on him, I suppose. I was planning to go down there to check on things at some point. This is as good a time as any. I'll go with you, Langley said. Tommy. Hey, don't argue. I kind of want to see this spook anyway. And besides, no offense to Aunt Adelaide, but this party is a major snooze if you're under sixty. I could use the diversion. Stone shrugged. Sure, come along then. But be careful. It's quite dark down there. Don't trip over anything. He summoned a light spell, making Langley gape in awe, and headed down the stairs. When they got to the end of the first hallway, Langley asked, How big is it down here, anyway? I've never actually been here. I took Aunt Adelaide's word for the spiders. It's big. Just stay close. Langley did as he was told, sticking so close behind Stone and his light source that it wasn't long before it got annoying. Back off a little, Tommy, he grumbled. I keep thinking you're going to grab my ass. I told you I don't put out on the first date, he protested, but he did move back just a bit. Before long, they were standing in front of the bookcase. Stone motioned Langley back. It's here? he asked. What is this, some kind of secret door? In answer, Stone slid it open and waved Langley in. Wide-eyed, he entered. Holy shit, he breathed. Stone, thinking Langley was just referring to the room in general, squeezed in behind him. He froze as he took in the scene before them. The three were arrayed evenly around the big summoning circle, all focused on the armoire at the end of the room, where the thin crack had increased to nearly a foot wide. A roiling cloud of glowing energy swirled around the opening, probing outward. The three were too far apart to clasp hands, but their arms were stretched out toward one another. With his magical sight, Stone saw shifting, reddish energy flowing around the outside of the circle, moving between them. It was what was in the center that drew most of his attention, though. Lying spread-eagled, tied to a table that had been dragged into the circle, his chest bared, was Ethan. Blood shone on his side from a wound there, but he was still alive because he was writhing in pain. His eyes were clamped shut. The lines of pulsing reddish energy that ran between the three also extended from each of them and into the center, where it converged on Ethan like eldritch wheel spokes, dancing around him as if looking for a way in. The three were all chanting something in the same unintelligible language and ignoring the newcomers. "'Holy shit!' Langley said again. We have to help him. He stepped toward the circle, but Stone grabbed his arm and yanked him back. No! He snapped. Don't break the circle, Tommy. If you do, you'll kill everyone inside it, and probably yourself as well. What do we do, then? Langley's voice began to take on an edge of panic. It looks like they're going to sacrifice him or something. Why are they noticing us? They're focused. Stone muttered, thinking hard. His gaze fell on the books open on the table books he hadn't seen before. Stay here. Just don't do anything for a minute. I need to think. But stay here, Tommy, he ordered. He ran across the room and snatched the open book on the table, skimming over the information on the page and then riffling through other pages near it. The reddish energy was growing more distinct, the lines clearer and thicker. Stone was very much afraid he knew what was going to happen next. They had already opened the thing's prison. It was coming through. Their next step would be to try to bring it into the circle and control it. That was where Ethan came in. Stone berated himself for not seeing it before. It was the only other way that might allow them to deal with the spirit if they didn't have its true name. To kill a mage and generate sufficient power for their circle that they could wrestle it in by main force and subjugate it while it was still weakened from its trip through. The frightening thing was... They had a chance of succeeding. Alistair, come on, hurry up. I gotta do something, Langley pleaded, continuing to stare at the circle. We can't just let them kill that poor kid. What can I do? Stone was distracted, still paging through the book in the vain hope that he'd find something useful in it. I don't know, Tommy, he growled. If you want to help, find a way to disrupt the circle without breaking it. Langley nodded. 
He looked around until he found a heavy stone gargoyle candle holder sitting on a nearby bookshelf. Shaking, he picked it up, hefted its weight, then drew his arm back. His football days were long behind him, but he aimed at the head of the closest circle member, an athletic-looking blonde man, and let fly. Stone glanced up just as he did this, his eyes going wide with shock. Tommy, no! he cried. He tried to summon a spell to grab the gargoyle and pull it back, but it was too late. The heavy projectile flew unerringly to its target, smashing into the back of Oliver's head with a sickening thud. Several things happened nearly simultaneously at that point, so quickly that for a moment Stone could only stare in horror. A bright light flared in the circle as the red energy conduit was disrupted. Oliver died instantly. He pitched forward, his arms and legs jerking, as his body had not yet realized he was dead. His flailing right leg struck one of the thick black candles around the outside of the circle, sending it rolling off to the side of the room where it ignited a pile of papers and one of the wall tapestries. Dry and brittle, they flared up like kindling. Oliver's body continued lurching forward, crashing into Ethan's table. The table, its rotting wood barely strong enough to hold Ethan's weight, collapsed to the floor. The reddish energy flared and died. Miguel and Trin clutched their heads, fighting crushing psychic feedback. Both had but a second to erect their mental shields, and both had done so, but imperfectly. Miguel screamed, staggering around half-blind. Trin, meanwhile, her eyes blazing with rage, recovered fastest. She pointed at Langley and snapped out an unintelligible command. The terrified professor lifted off his feet and flew toward her. She clamped her hand on his shoulder and locked her gaze on Stone. Stone regained his wits just in time, and was able to raise his shield just as Trin screamed something and pointed at him. Langley's screams rose above hers as he bucked under Trin's touch, as if she were running a strong electrical current through him. His scream pitched into a shrieking crescendo, and then suddenly he was gone. His badly fitting tuxedo fluttered to the floor, along with a swirling pile of ashes. "'Tommy!' Stone cried, lunging forward despite knowing there was nothing he could do. Trin's spell struck his barrier and pulverized it, sending him careening back into the wall. He slammed into it and fell to the floor, scrambling sideways, his whole body alight with pain. Her eyes wild with power now. Trin advanced on him, pressing the attack. Stone wasn't giving up that easily, though. Stunned as he was by Tommy's sudden and horrific death, he knew he couldn't let his guard down. If he did even for a second, he'd be dead. Grateful for all the time he'd spent infusing his crystals and other power objects, he summoned a lightning bolt and directed it at Trin. She dived aside and got her own shield up just in time, but the bolt flew past her and struck Miguel a glancing blow. He staggered again, swaying alarmingly close to the rising flames. Blinking sweat out of his eyes, Stone saw that the opening in the armoire had grown wider, and the swirling mist a little more substantial. It was coming. He had to finish this fast. He dragged himself back to his feet and faced Trin, breathing hard. She laughed, still brimming with the power she'd sucked in from killing Langley. She pointed both hands at Stone and let loose with another concussion attack. Die, you bastard! She snapped. I already killed your pet. Maybe I can use you in his place. Stone had once again barely managed to get his shield up, but the feedback from her spells made his head feel like it was splitting in two. Not yet! He breathed, aiming his own concussion beam at her. This time it hit her, and he was rewarded with the sight of her being flung back and slammed into one of the bookcases. Her shield flared and died. Neither of them noticed Miguel making his slow and painstaking way toward the door. He'd swiftly taken stock of the situation and realized things were not looking good. Oliver was dead. The fire was rising. There was a very real possibility that Stone would beat Trin, even if Miguel stayed to help. But half-blinded, his head splitting from the circle's disruption, he was forced to be a realist. Realists survived, and Miguel was nothing if not a survivor. With one last glance at the two combatants locked in their battle, he shoved open the bookcase door and slipped out. Chapter 43 Upstairs, Megan was beginning to wonder where Stone had gone. 
It had already been longer than 15 minutes, and she was growing bored with listening to the enthusiastic war stories an old man in a plaid tie was trying to regale her with. Politely excusing herself, she hurried off, thinking she'd find Stone somewhere nearby. She didn't see him anywhere, though. She didn't realize it, but she nearly retraced the steps he'd taken searching for Ethan. Dining room, grand ballroom, outside smoking area, hallways leading to the bathrooms. A little concerned now, she ranged out further, taking another hallway that she didn't think was strictly part of the party area. Maybe he found Ethan and they're having a talk, she decided. If that were true, she'd just find them, verify that they were both all right, and then head back to the party and wait for them to rejoin it. She kept waiting for a security guard to stop her, but none did. She guessed there probably weren't enough of them to cover the whole house, and in any case, she didn't think the elderly guests were much to worry about security risk-wise. The worst that might happen was that one of them might get lost on the way to the bathroom, or maybe stroke out in the punch bowl. She was about to turn around and go back the way she'd come when she smelled something unexpected. Smoke? That's strange. Maybe I'm near where the smokers are. But she wasn't near the smokers. They were up at the front of the house, and she was somewhere in the middle. She moved back, following the smell until she saw something that made her gasp. Wafting up from an ancient floor register were tendrils of foul-smelling black smoke. Not a lot, but she knew enough to know that this was not the cheery smoke from a fireplace, even if there had been a fireplace for it to be coming from. Oh, my God, she whispered. For a second she froze. Then she hurried back down the hallway and back into the party area. She grabbed the first blazer-clad security guard she could find. Come on, you need to see this, she breathed. He looked at her oddly. Here was a pretty young woman in a tight dress and heels, looking like she'd just seen a ghost. Or a murder. What's the problem, ma'am? I think there's a fire, she whispered, not wanting to start a panic if she were somehow wrong. She grabbed his arm and tugged. Come on, let me show you this. The man followed, his expression suggesting he was humoring her. That lasted until he saw the smoke wafting up from the register. Holy shit, he growled, stiffening. He turned back to Megan, already pulling his walkie-talkie from his belt. Listen, lady, you need to get out of here. I'll call it in. We gotta start evacuating people. Oh, holy hell, this is gonna be a nightmare with all these old people. I'll help, she said. I'll start getting people to leave, to go outside. I'll tell them there's a, there's a gas leak or something. Yeah, okay, he said, already focused on talking into his radio. He waved her off. Megan hurried back toward the party, realizing as she did that she still hadn't found Stone or Ethan. She hoped very much that the fire and their disappearance weren't related. Outside the summoning room, Miguel hurried as fast as he could down the aisle back toward the main large room. He was in full panic mode now. All he wanted to do was get out of here alive. The fire was already burning through the wooden wall of the summoning room, providing flickering light that made the shadowy piles of furniture loom eerily above him. He glanced upward and tripped over a piece of the ruined player piano, falling forward. He tried to throw himself sideways, but in his disorientation he miscalculated. His reeling body slammed into a tall pile of stacked furniture. It swayed alarmingly, and then something large dislodged from the top and tumbled down, crashing onto Miguel's legs. He screamed as he felt bones break among the splintering wood, and a wave of agony washed over him. He went down and lay still. Inside, Stone and Trin were still locked in their battle. "'Give it up, asshole,' Trin growled. "'You can't fight me. You're soft, like all your type. Can't handle the power.' She flung another bolt at him. His shields were weaker now, and most of it got through and smashed into his arm. He staggered back, falling over the top of another table. Scrambling up, he didn't bother answering her. More than ever now, he knew he had to end this fast, before Trin killed him. She didn't have a chance of controlling that thing now if it came through. Not by herself, and not in her weakened state. If he failed, all those people upstairs would die. And probably a lot more, too. She was right about the combat-type spells. They weren't his specialty, and they were tiring him out fast. Instead, he went with his strength telekinetically snatching up the same stone gargoyle that Langley had hit Oliver with. He flung it at her, putting all his will behind it. She wasn't expecting that. It breached her shield and hit her leg hard, taking her down with a pained shriek. Stone struggled up again and tried to press the attack before she could get her bearings back. Unfortunately for him, 
The power black mages drew when they killed their batteries was immense, and she still had quite a bit left. Without getting up, she put her two hands together, aimed them at stone, and let fly with a spell that looked like a whirlwind full of tiny knives. It sliced through his shield, weakening considerably as it did, but what was left flayed at his body, opening up myriad small bleeding slashes all over. He tried to ward them off, but couldn't concentrate enough to cast anything. He lurched backward, hit the wall, and slumped to the floor in a bloody heap. He lay unmoving as his consciousness faded. Trin threw one last concussion blast at him, laughing as she watched his body jerk and writhe on the floor against the wall. Then she turned and quickly left the room. Megan did the first thing she could think of. She found Adelaide. The old lady was holding court in the main ballroom near one of the large Christmas trees, laughing with some old friends while Iona stood beaming next to her. Megan hurried up to her. Mrs. Bonham? She smiled. Oh, you're Dr. Stone's date, aren't you, dear? What was your name again? Mary... Margaret? Megan, she said. She ducked down to whisper in the old woman's ear. Mrs. Bonham, there's a problem. There's a fire somewhere down below. I've already told security, and they're calling in help, but we need to get everyone out of here quickly. It won't be safe much longer. She glanced around, her eyes growing wide and fearful. A fire? Megan didn't have time to wait for it to sink in. She hurried over to the bandstand and snatched the microphone, startling the band leader. "'Ladies and gentlemen,' she said, feeling herself shaking. "'Please listen to me. We need everyone to exit the house and go outside onto the front lawn. There's been a small kitchen fire, and we want to make sure everyone's safe. Please go now in an orderly fashion and help those who can't make it out on their own. Thank you.' She handed the mic back to the band leader and climbed down off the stage. There was a murmur of conversation among the guests, occasionally punctuated by a louder, Fire? or Fire! Meanwhile, the security force was coming in, attempting to usher people out of the ballroom and toward the front lawn. It was slow going. Some guests didn't believe there really was a fire, and some couldn't move very fast. Others were already heading toward the door. Megan looked around. Where was Stone? Where were Ethan and Tommy? Suddenly everyone she knew had disappeared, and in the middle of a potential disaster, this didn't bode well. Trin found Miguel outside the circle room, his legs crushed, moaning in agony. Trin, he whispered, help me, for God's sake, get me out of here. He reached toward her. She looked at him, then back at the fire. Sorry, man, you're on your own and then she was past him in a way, running back past the growing flames toward the exit. Chapter 44 On the shattered table, lying under the dead weight of Oliver's body, Ethan regained consciousness. His whole body was in pain. He was pretty sure at least a couple bones were broken, and he'd lost a lot of blood. Struggling free of the bonds that no longer held him, he rolled Oliver's body off, trying not to scream with the effort. He looked around, coughing and struggling for breath. Why is it so hot and smoky in here? Then he saw and heard the blazing fire, and it all came back to him. Trin. Trin had betrayed him. She'd intended to betray him all along. And he'd fallen for it, because she'd smiled at him. Because she'd made him feel like he was worthwhile because he'd wanted so badly to believe it that he'd ignored everything else. He looked around. The crack in the armoire's doors was nearly two feet wide now, the swirling mists almost reaching the edge of the circle. He had to do something. But what? He continued looking, and his gaze fell on the still form of stone, lying broken and bleeding against the wall. Was he dead? Ethan couldn't tell. Painfully, he crawled toward him. Even if he was alive, though, what could he do now? He couldn't do a sacrifice, and he didn't have the spirit's name. There was no way he could... And then he saw his parka, lying there on the floor close to stone, and he remembered. He hadn't given Trin all the books he'd brought. He'd forgotten he'd even put one in his coat, with all he'd been through in the last couple of days. The news about his mother had driven nearly everything out of his mind, but now he remembered. The diary... Selina Darklight's diary. 
If it was anywhere, it would be there. He had to hurry. He continued crawling toward the parka and stone, aware of the spreading flames behind him and the ever-widening crack in the armoire door. The evacuation was proceeding a little more effectively now that the house's smoke detectors had at last registered the fire and gone off. Megan joined the security guards in hustling the elderly guests outside, herding them out to the porch, where the more able-bodied among them helped the others into the yard. In the distance, she could hear the sirens of fire trucks approaching, but she knew it would take them a while to make it all the way up here. Grimly, she realized she still hadn't seen Stone. Now she was beginning to worry in earnest. If he were here, he would be in the thick of the action, doing whatever he could to help out. The fact that she couldn't hear his distinctive British tones cutting through the panic, giving orders and hustling recalcitrant oldsters out the door, told her everything she needed to know. He wasn't here. But where was he? Ethan had the book. Clutching it in his trembling hand, fighting to stay awake, he dragged himself over to stone and rolled him over on his back. The mage was unconscious. The white front of his tuxedo shirt shredded and soaked in blood. Ethan shook him. Dr. Stone, wake up! Please don't be dead! Stone moaned. Ethan shook him again, harder. Dr. Stone, please wake up! Sweat ran down his face. The smoke was everywhere, darkness settling over his head like a warm, heavy animal. Please, you have to wake up! Stone's eyes flickered open. He seemed to be having trouble focusing for a moment. Then he saw Ethan. Uh, Ethan... Tears streamed down Ethan's face. Oh, God, Dr. Stone, I'm so sorry. I've been such an idiot. Now we're... What? Stone tried to rise, but couldn't manage it. Ethan held up the book. Dr. Stone, this is Selina Darklight's diary. I found it the other day in the attic. I was gonna give it to Trin, but I forgot I had it. You gotta take it, Dr. Stone. You gotta stop this thing. Look! He pointed with great effort toward the armoire. It's gonna get out. It's gonna... get... His energy spent, he trailed off, slumping over. Stone fought to make sense of what Ethan was saying. He forced himself to an elbow, focusing on what he had to do. He saw the thing in the armoire and stiffened. He could suffer through his pain later. He could even die later. Later didn't matter. All that mattered was right now. And right now, he had to do this. He picked up the diary in a shaking hand and used a small spell to break its lock. Painfully, he began paging through it. The crack in the armoire grew wider. Give up, little worm. You will not stop me now. You have lost. You will die. And so will everyone you ever cared about. Bugger off, Stone muttered, continuing to turn the pages. The first of the fire trucks were arriving now. Small groups of shivering guests huddled together in the front yard, their eyes full of fear. Megan was still inside. She was moving from person to person as they left the house, asking them if they'd seen anyone matching Stone's description, or Ethan's, or Langley's. Sometimes she got an affirmative, but it was a vague one. Oh, yes, I think I saw him earlier tonight, or... Yes, he was in the ballroom when I got here. But nothing definitive. It was as if all three of them had vanished from the face of the earth. She wondered if she should head back upstairs and search for them. Stone kept having to blink blood and sweat from his eyes as he struggled to read the blurry, cramped print in the diary. This was taking too long. Already the flames were growing so high that he wasn't sure he and Ethan could even get out safely anymore. If he didn't do something soon, none of this would matter. In frustration, he growled and gave the book a hard shake. A piece of paper, probably used as a bookmark, poked out from between two pages about three-quarters of the way in. Breathing hard, Stone opened the book to the indicated page and shoved the bookmark aside. On the page, written in thicker, embellished text, was a single word surrounded by diagrams of magical circles. Even looking at the word made Stone uncomfortable. The thing in the armoire made a low, rumbling, warning sound, as if anticipating his next move. Yes, Stone whispered in triumph. Gathering his will, he grabbed the edge of a nearby table and pulled himself up. 
He staggered to the center of the circle, leaving a trail of blood behind him. He opened the book and faced the armoire, and he began an incantation. No, whispered the thing in his head. You will not. The swirling mists, which had now reached the circle, solidified into tentacles with clawed appendages, raking at him. He held his ground, bellowing the incantation as loudly and forcefully as he could manage. The creatures slashed at him, moving in. He reeled backward, fighting to hold his balance, barely remaining inside the circle as more and more forms boiled out of the armoire's opening. The horrific sloth creatures came through, along with the sticky, searching tentacles from his bedroom. But there were more things, too, things he could barely look at, things that made his sanity recoil and begin to crack. His voice faltered, the incantation dying on his lips. You will fail, small one, the thing in his head said. You have no hope. You cannot stem my power. You are too weak. I was old when your world was new. I will destroy you and everything you ever cared about. The creatures were drawing closer now, moving around the circle, testing its boundaries. Stone was forced to divert energy to strengthen the wards around it, but knew he couldn't do that for long. His limited power had to go toward taking his best shot at sending the thing back before he simply collapsed his formidable will no longer able to sustain his failing body. Already the grayness was closing around him, his legs beginning to buckle. One of the creatures, a new one with wicked claws on the end of multiple whip-like tentacles, breached his shield and slashed at him, opening up a deep gash across his chest. He cried out, raising his hands to ward off the blows, clutching Selina Darklight's diary with all his will. If he dropped it now, he knew everything would be lost. Faster than he could see, another tentacle lashed out and slashed through his hand with surgical precision. The diary, his severed fingers still attached to it, fluttered to the floor, landing in a puddle of blood. Stone screamed, dropping to his knees. Jamming his wounded hand under his opposite arm to try to stanch the bleeding, he lunged for the book with his good hand. The creatures were getting through now. He couldn't hold the shield around the circle anymore. Had he broken it somehow? Smudged it when he'd fallen? or when he dropped the diary. It shouldn't work that way. Either the shield was up or it was down. He blinked blood from his eyes again, his gaze cutting madly around to locate the source of the breach as he scrambled for the diary. You will die, little mage, the thing's implacable voice spoke in his head. You will die screaming in agony, and your power will feed my birth into this world. No! Stone shouted. His eyes were nearly clamped shut now, sweat pouring from him, his hand fumbling for the diary. The heat from the fire seared him. Something flashed in the corner of his vision. He braced himself for another creature, forcing his eyes back open. But it wasn't another creature. It was Ethan. The boy lunged forward with an inarticulate war cry. Stone tried to yell a warning, but his body wasn't responding properly to commands anymore. The creature tore Ethan to pieces in seconds. Stone screamed again, trying to gather energy, to move forward, to do anything. But he could only watch in horror as the claws and tentacles snatched at the boy's shirt, his pants, his hair, and then slashed and pulled at his limbs until they tore free, spraying Stone with hot showers of blood and worse. The last expression he saw on Ethan's face was one of accusation. Why don't you help me? Ethan! he shrieked. No, I can't! He watched helplessly as the boy's dismembered body crashed to the floor, his shredded white shirt drenched red on his torso, his severed arms as they, too, moved of their own accord and began crawling toward him. Stone felt his mind beginning to let go of the last of his sanity. He couldn't do this. The creature was right. He was too weak. This thing was eternal, ageless, immensely powerful. Even at his best, there was no way he could fight it. How did he ever think he could... Wait. Something was wrong. 
something he desperately needed to notice. His fogged brain struggled to latch onto it as the creatures continued to assault the circle. Not all of them were getting in, but he knew it was only a matter of seconds as his will failed. Think! Something. Something about Ethan. His blood-soaked shirt. His severed limbs. And then he had it. His mind flitted back to when he and Tommy had entered the room, when they'd found the three's gruesome ritual laid out before them. Ethan hadn't been wearing a shirt. Ethan had been chained to the table, chest bared for Trin's knife to slash him, to spill his blood for the ritual. How could he be... No. Stone spun, nearly upsetting his precarious balance again. The room shifted crazily, its angles somehow going wrong. Everything about this was wrong. Ethan, the room's strange geometry, his hand. He looked down at the ruin of his hand, pulling it free from where he'd shoved it, bleeding under his arm. For a moment he flinched, expecting to see severed, bloody stumps again. His hand was there, whole and undamaged, still clutching Selina Darklight's diary as if letting go would bring about the end of the world. Because it might. This was all wrong. His mind was playing tricks on him. This whole thing was like some kind of mad vision. It was like some kind of... dream. And then it was clear. All of it. In a bolt of searing lucidity, he understood. If anyone had been looking at Stone at that moment, they would have seen his expression change. Where before it had been beaten, demoralized, racked with pain, his face now took on a kind of fierce resolve. There was still pain there. He was dead pale, blood-soaked, grievously injured. But now he knew. All of this took place in the space of a few seconds. The knowledge, the rock-hard certainty, slammed into him with the force of one of his own concussion blasts. None of this was real. This was simply a battle of wills, with the creature using everything at its disposal to try to divert his mind, to make him falter, to destroy his resolve, because it could not yet destroy his body. Not until it was through. It was not going to get through. He would see to that, because what the creature didn't realize, couldn't realize, because all of the mages it had dealt with since it had touched this plane of existence had been black mages, was that when it came to willpower, white mages had it all over their darker counterparts. They had to. How else would they continually force themselves to take the more difficult path, to resist the temptation to seek the easy road to power? Stone gritted his teeth, breathing hard, and forced himself upright. "'I've got you, you bastard!' he cried. "'Nice try, but you can stuff your illusions. They won't work on me any more.' A surge of energy ran through him. A glow suffused his body. He could see it radiating out from him as if he were some sort of beacon. But even as it did, he felt himself fading, his legs turning to jelly beneath him. For all his confidence, he still didn't know if he'd be able to do it, if his body would fail him before he could finish the job. He began the incantation again, pulling in all the power from all his remaining items, weaving it into his words, yelling them in defiance. The claws and tentacles continued reaching for him, but he no longer noticed them. They were nothing more than smoke and mist, and no more dangerous. The only danger now was that he would be too weak to do what he had to do. He spat out the words of the incantation in a strong but shaking tone, speaking as fast as he dared. And then, at last, it was time. This was it. Either it would work, or it wouldn't. He wouldn't get another chance. As the thing screamed in his mind, thrashed at his body, tried with increasing desperation to break his will, he threw back his head and barked out the last words into the mist. Be gone, foul thing! and he followed it with the name from the book, praying that he was pronouncing it correctly. He knew instantly that he had succeeded. The tentacles and creatures and apparitions drew back as if they'd contacted the burning sun, withdrawing into the armoire. A last scream rose, so loud and terrible and soul-searing they could be heard throughout the entire area. And then the armoire exploded. The weird, sickening light expanded and then contracted, and everything in it was sucked back into itself until it reached the size of a pinpoint and disappeared. The room was silent except for Stone's labored breathing 
and the crackling of the rising flames. And then there wasn't even that as he finally allowed himself to fall. Chapter 45 Ethan awoke. He didn't know how long he'd been out this time, but his body seared with pain, and everything was even hotter than before. He could barely see anything through the thick, acrid smoke filling the room. What was happening? Where was Stone? Where was the thing in the armoire? He rose up a little and looked around. The armoire was gone. Stone lay in the middle of the circle, his limbs haphazardly splayed out, a puddle of blood spreading beneath him. Around him, the flames licked at the walls. It was getting hard to breathe. He crawled over to Stone, checked him. Against all odds, he was alive, but not by much. His chest barely moved, and under the streaks of blood on his face, he wore a gray pallor. Ethan took a deep breath. He did it. He got rid of it. He didn't know how, but he didn't care. He just knew that they had to get out of here, and he had to be the one to get them out. If Stone could rouse himself sufficiently to do what he'd done, then he, Ethan, could do no less. He struggled up, grabbed Stone under his arms, and dragged him toward the door. He was barely able to get him through it, holding it open and pulling him through without allowing it to close again. When they were out, he sat down again next to the mage's body, puffing with exertion. He didn't know what to do. The smoke wasn't as bad out here, but he knew how far it was back to the door. And once he got there, he'd have to deal with dragging Stone up a flight of treacherous stairs. Even if he could somehow manage it, Stone would never survive the trip. I can't do this. Wait. He was a mage. Mages could lift things with their minds. But I can't. I got tired lifting a book. How am I going to lift him? He's bigger than I am. He said he could lift a car if he had to. Maybe you can too. You have to try at least. So he did. Focusing the last scraps of his willpower, he fixed his gaze on stone and attempted to levitate him off the ground. The mage's arm and part of his shoulder rose, then fell back again. Ethan's head lit up with pain. I can't do this. I can't. Nearby, a moan. Ethan stiffened. Dr. Stone? But Stone was still unconscious. Besides... The mage was behind him, and the sound had come from in front of him. He crawled forward. Is someone there? He croaked. Help me, came a weak voice. Ethan crawled closer. Miguel lay there, buried under debris, pale and sweating. His legs had been crushed by a falling piece of furniture. Ethan, he begged. Help me, man. Get me out of here. Ethan looked at Miguel. He looked back at Stone. He made his decision. Reaching out, he leaned toward Miguel. Give me your hand, he rasped. Miguel reached out, wincing, and grasped Ethan's hand. Ethan concentrated like he never had before, remembering the other night, remembering what Trin had told him. Don't take too much, or you'll kill him. By the time Miguel realized what was happening, he was too far gone to do anything about it. His weak scream as his body was consumed barely reached beyond the pile of furniture that had crushed him. More fire trucks were arriving now, and the firefighters had taken over the evacuation as they set about fighting the fire. The flames still weren't visible on the ground floor, but the smoke rose everywhere now. It was getting harder to see and harder to breathe. Megan grabbed one of the firefighters as he was going in. My friends are still in there, she said. Please look for them. There are three of them. Two men around my age and a boy about eighteen. I can't find them anywhere. He assured her that he would look, but then he was gone, into the swirling smoke. Megan stood there, out of the doorway, and tried to decide what to do. Think, she ordered herself. Where would they be? And then she knew. Of course. If the fire was in the basement, then that was where they would be. Would the firefighters even look for anyone down there? She hurried back inside, hoping she wasn't making the biggest and last mistake of her life. Ethan brimmed with power. It wasn't that he didn't still feel the pain and the fear and the exhaustion. They were all still there. But they just didn't matter right now. 
He felt like he could do anything. He turned back towards Stone, who hadn't moved from where he'd left him. Focusing his mind again, he carefully formed the pattern and then fed it power from the vast reservoir he had at his command. Was this how Stone felt when he really got going? He decided that Stone couldn't possibly have ever felt this kind of power surging through him. It felt wonderful. He sent the command. Stone's body rose and hovered there, about a foot off the ground. Ethan began to move. Megan blundered, coughing through the antechamber, back toward the kitchen. She had a vague idea of where she was going, but the smoke was getting thicker. She grabbed the decorative runner from one of the tables and put it up to her face to breathe through, kicking off her heels and crouching to stay low. Her eyes streamed. Around her, she could hear the voices of the firefighters as they called to each other, but she ignored them. Down the hall, through the dining room, and then she reached the kitchen. She looked wildly around. The place looked eerie, deserted in the act of preparing more hors d'oeuvres and plates of cookies as the chefs and caterers had evacuated. Now that she was in the kitchen, she had no idea where to go next. Alistair! she yelled in frustration, and then a coughing fit seized her. <coughs> Ethan! Tommy! Where are you? <coughs> a door on the far side of the room opened. She spun to face it, in time to see two bloody scarecrow figures shove themselves through. One collapsed on top of the other, and neither moved. She raced over and dropped to her knees next to them. She could barely identify them through all the blood, but she realized in horror that Stone was on the bottom, and Ethan was lying across him. Oh my god, she whispered, and then she screamed, Help! Please, somebody help me! Ethan raised his head just a little and moaned. Don't talk, she urged. Help's coming. She wondered if Stone was even alive, or if Ethan would be for long. Tell him, Ethan whispered. She leaned in close. What? Tell him what, honey? She brushed his bloody hair off his forehead. Tell him I'm sorry I let him down, he whispered and then his head fell on top of stone. Chapter 46 Two weeks later, the basement lab was dark, except for a single candle guttering away on the table. There was a knock on the door. You have a visitor, Megan called softly. No, Stone said. No visitors. Tell them to go away. I'll just leave you two alone, she said, departing. The deadbolt turned and the door opened. It closed again, then footsteps sounded on the stairs. Alistair? The British-accented voice was familiar. Slumped and shadowed, Stone had his back to the door, staring at the flickering candle. I said I didn't want any visitors. His voice was colorless, monotone dead. The room smelled strongly of alcohol. Walter Yarborough sat down on the ratty leather sofa. Your lady friend let me in. She thought you might want to talk to me, since I've come all this way to see you. She was wrong. Yarborough sighed. I know it's been a rough couple of weeks for you, Alistair. Stone made a contemptuous sound, halfway between a mirthless laugh and a snort. Who cares? I do. You're an old friend. I want to help. Then go away, Walter. I don't need help. I don't need coddling, or kindness, or someone to hold my hand. I just want to be left alone. Stone spun the chair around toward the sofa. He knew he was barely recognizable as himself. Thinner, paler, his face all dark haunted eyes and wild hair and several days' worth of stubble. The bandages were gone for the most part, at least the visible ones, but the many small cuts and slashes were still evident on his face, neck, and arms. I didn't come here to coddle you, Alistair. I came to talk some sense into you, because nobody else seems to be able to do that. He sounded stern but kind, like a loving father. I'd have thought you wouldn't want anything to do with me. 
why is that? His eyes came up to meet Yarborough's. I got your apprentice killed, Walter. You sent him to me, and I got him killed. You know, Yarborough said, meeting his gaze, I still don't know what happened down there. Not exactly. You're the only one left who can tell me. Stone turned his chair back around so he faced the candle. Did you attend the memorials? The doctors wouldn't even let me out to do that. I did. Ethan and his mother, they had their services together. And I'm sure they would forgive you. Recovering from surgery is a valid excuse to miss an event. Stone blew air through his teeth. <sighs> Walter, just go, please. I want to be left alone. You can't hide forever, Alistair. He paused, and then... Miss Whitney says you barely speak to her. Shrug. I didn't ask you to be here. She took that on herself. She cares about you. So do I. Why won't you let anyone care for you? Once again he spun to face Yarborough. His eyes were chilly. I got my apprentice killed, Walter. I got my friend killed. I should have died down there. It's only because Megan had her wits about her that a whole house full of people didn't die. I talked to Adelaide Bonham, he said softly. She said she tried to contact you, but you wouldn't answer her calls. She also told me about what you did. What I did. She told me about the thing in the basement. It isn't there anymore. The bloody house isn't there anymore, Walter. Yarborough shook his head. Be honest with me. How bad was it? The spirit or demon or whatever it was. Bad enough. He didn't look at Yarborough. The truth is, I've never seen worse. And how many people would have died if you hadn't done what you did? Stone glared. It doesn't matter, Walter. Because you think you killed Ethan. And Tommy. Yarborough sighed. Alistair, come back home with me. Back to England for a while. Get away from all this. Bring Miss Whitney if you want to. Sitting here in your study, drinking yourself to death, isn't going to bring Ethan back. Or Tommy. And deciding you don't deserve to be alive because they aren't is just lazy thinking. It's not worthy of you. Stone's gaze came up. Is that what you believe, I think? It's pretty obvious. You've got a bad case of survivor's guilt, my friend. Stone stared at the other mage for a long time, then sighed, pondering. Perhaps... perhaps you're right. Maybe I do need a change of scenery. I haven't been home in a while. Yarborough smiled just a bit. That's more like the Alistair Stone I know. He rose, his expression growing serious again. For what it's worth, I don't believe you got Ethan killed. I'm not stupid. I knew he'd be a handful when I put him in touch with you. Let me guess, he got himself involved with some things we'd both have disapproved of. It doesn't matter what he did. He saved my life. I know that. As far as I'm concerned, that's all I need to know. If I'd paid more attention to what was going on in his life, I might have been able to prevent some of what happened. Or you might not have, Yarborough said gently. And that's the trouble with apprentices. They have the unfortunate habit of being human. And you know as well as I do that any time you add humans to a situation, there's no way to know where or how it will end up. We're an unpredictable lot. He paused, then came around behind Stone and put a gentle hand on his shoulder. Remember, Alistair, when a master agrees to take on an apprentice, it's not only the apprentice who learns valuable lessons. Stone looked up at him. His eyes were still haunted with guilt and pain, but something subtle in them had changed. That's very profound, Walter, he murmured. Did you get that in a fortune cookie? Magic for dummies, he said mildly. Now come on. When was the last time you had anything to eat, not counting alcohol? Stone thought. Sometime yesterday, I think. 
Megan tried this morning, but I haven't been much to live with lately. Come on, then. Get yourself presentable. Let's go out for a nice steak if you're feeling up to it. Just the three of us. Then we can talk about getting you back home where you belong for a while so you can recharge. And after that, I think you should look for another apprentice. I believe the expression is, get back on the horse. Stone shook his head, getting unsteadily to his feet. I'll go out tonight, but I make no promises about the rest. And I'm done with apprentices. You say that now. We'll see. In any case, I think you owe Miss Whitney an apology for the way you've been treating her lately, don't you? Yes, I think I do. It's a wonder she puts up with me, honestly. Yarborough chuckled and headed upstairs. Stone paused for a long moment, gazing into the dying candle. Then he leaned down, blew it out, and followed his old friend up out of the lab. The End This has been Stone and a Hard Place. Written by R.L. King. Narrated by Kevin R. Zarnicki. Copyright 2013 through 2015 by R.L. King. Production copyright 2016 R.L. King. Interloper by Kevin McLeod at Incompetech.com. Licensed under Creative Commons by Attribution 3.0 creativecommons.org backslash licenses backslash buy backslash 3.0 backslash If you enjoyed this production, you can find more books in the Alistair Stone series at rlkingwriting.com Thank you for listening. Audible hopes you have enjoyed this program.